The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> to uh, Thelma Darling. Last name, Sam. Roger. Thelma Roger. Darling. I only asked, Sam. Let's get on with it. Yes, Sam, I'm sorry. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject? Uh, subject, the uh, quarter eagle caper. Uh, dear Thelma Darling. Sam. Yes, Seth? Isn't that redundant? Again? The salutation, Sam. Shouldn't it be dear Thelma or Thelma Darling? But not both? Now, uh, get this, F. It's real deep. Her name is Thelma Darling. I have that, dear. Thelma Roger. Darling, it's a name. Her father was a darling before her. Oh, really, Sam? Can't you take a joke? On the egg type, you should taste the label. Grade double A, fresh. <laughs> uh, dear Thelma Darling, I'm stubborn. Not all of this will be news to you. The part that is will be bad news. The start of it was not a quarter eagle, but a bald eagle. He swooped in through the door of my office, landed in front of my desk, perched on the edge of a chair, and said... My name is Eagle, Mr. Spade. Junius J. Eagle. My card. Uh-huh. Eagle Vending Machine Company. Huh? And they call me the Gumball King. I'm proud of it. Uh, care to join me in a ball, sir? Uh, not while I'm on duty. Ah, oh, that's very good. Our new avocado flavor. <laughs> well, yes, I've kept the Bay Area chewing for 20 years. And I will not be swerved from my purpose. Bully. Mm. I intend to fight them tooth and nail. Hand and tongs. To the last ditch. Bravo. But I'll need help. That's why I've come to you. My competitors, Mr. Spade, are leaving no stone unturned in their contemptible campaign to drive me out of business. Uh -huh. Now they've resorted to outright sabotage. In short, they have hired hoodlums to destroy my gumball machines. Mm -hmm. They've already smashed eleven... And they won't be content until they've demolished my entire equipment. Uh, it sounds like a police case to me, Mr. Well, Eagle. No, I've been to the police. No, they don't understand my problem. Gave me a lot of double talk about juvenile delinquents. Ha, my foot. Cutthroat competition. You're sure of that? Well, what would you think? If theft were their motive, they most certainly would steal the pennies from the machines. But what do they take? My gumballs. And why do they do that? Uh, I'll buy it. Oh, well, by all means. Oh, here. Try this. Our best seller in Chinatown. We call it uh, Subgum. Uh, better not. I have to drive later. No, you don't. Have. <clears throat> now, I had the foresight to buy up a three year supply of chewing gum at non inflation prices. So I see. Well, you can see with what thoroughness they encompass my ruination. They are not only smashing my machines, they're making off with my gum. And uh, you want me to try and stop them? No, I do not. No. I want you to catch them in the act and find out who is paying them. Well, okay, Mr. Eagle. I'll uh, see what I can do. Good. Good. Now, in this envelope is a list of my machines and their exact locations together with a check for your retainer. Thank you, Mr. Eagle. I'll uh, keep in touch with you. Yeah. Oh, uh, Mr. Eagle, I meant to ask you, how many of these gum machines do you operate here in town? Three hundred. Mm -hmm. And guard them well. Three hundred? Three hundred nuts. Three hundred nuts, Sam? No, uh, 300 gums. Uh, gumball machines. Sam, mm -hmm. isn't it wonderful you took this job? I mean, because of my penny card. Mm hmm I'm sorry if I wasn't listening. My penny card, Sam. My new one, that is. I've already completed my Lincoln series, and now I'm collecting Indian heads. <sighs> Scalps? No, Sam, pennies. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the card. And these little slots, you see right there? That's where you put the pennies. Mm. And they're classified according to the date and the mint where they're manufactured. Mm. Now, you see, Sam, see where the little S is on these? Mm. Now, that's for the San Francisco mint. Mm. And uh, the D, that's for Denver. Figures. And the ones with nothing, that's for Washington, D.C. Yeah, well, that's a very nice hobby. Uh, pardon me. Uh, um, 300 gumball machines. You see, that's what I had in mind, Sam. All those pennies. Indian head pennies are scarce, Sam. You have to go through a lot of pennies to find even one. Honestly, sometimes when I go past one of those penny machines, that's all I can do. Oh. F, this is all right between you and me, but don't ever mention your hobby to Mr. Eagle. No, no, I won't. Riddle me this, sweetheart. How does one detective guard 300 gumball machines scattered all over the city? Well, if they're going to smash all of them, you could just pick out one in the middle and somewhere and wait. No good. 
If it's an organized plan of sabotage, there might be some pattern. You seem to have given us some thought, though, Effie. How would you pick them? In the busy places, where they'd have more pennies. But they're not after the pennies. They take the gum. Well, then, maybe the quiet sections, where they don't sell much gum. Well, they've knocked over 11 so far, here, there, and everywhere. Busy spots, dead spots, no pattern at all. You know, Effie? Hmm? Maybe I've bitten off more than I can chew? I uh, wasn't sold on Mr. Eagle's theory that the caper was organized sabotage, but I decided to test it out anyway. I learned the operation did follow a pattern, unless it was coincidence that the 11 machines knocked over the previous night were the same 11 machines that had been refilled that afternoon. I checked with the Eagle Company's maintenance man and learned that only five had been refilled today. I picked the one that looked like the easiest to knock over. It was the one in the doorway of a darkened loft building near the Siemens Hiring Hall on Drum Street. At 9 in the p.m., I strolled down there. The block was deserted. I took a plant in the adjacent doorway and talked to myself until just before midnight. Then I shot up. My uh, heart skipped a beat as she passed under the light. Red hair. My secretary? Then I noticed how she was dressed. Not on the salary I pay. She paused before the gum machine, opened a large handbag, stripped off her long black gloves, dropped them in her purse, and took out a small Boy Scout-type hatchet. with the enthusiasm of Carrie Nation busting up a saloon. I edged around the doorway as she bent over the mess of pennies and gumballs at her feet. When she reached out her hand, I took one more step, and that was all. She was up on her feet facing me, and I saw that hatchet sailing through the air straight at me. Hey! Now see what you've done. Yeah, I'm sorry. I won't let it happen again, I hope. Well, don't just stand there. Let's get out of here. That noise, it'll bring the police down on us. Yeah, you're right. Uh, No, not that way. The alley. And that's how I met you, Thelma, darling. Pausing only to pick up an Indian head penny for luck, I escorted you through the alley to Washington, up Washington's salon, jogged through Front Street, and followed that to Market, where we entered the happy hour bar and grill by way of the kitchen. You proceeded unfalteringly to the darkest booth. We sat down and caught our breath. You ordered a pirate's dream. Uh, By the way, I did get that recipe. Lime juice, grenadine, passion fruit, a sprig of mint, and six jiggers of rum. After two swallows, I heard myself saying, Now aren't you ashamed of yourself? But, Sam, why should I be? After what I've been through, I think I deserve a drink. Uh, I didn't mean that. I uh, meant throwing that hatchet at me. I thought you were Merle. Who's Merle? Why, he works for Mr. Chiselhurst. Yeah, that figures. Now tell me who Mr. Chiselhurst is. Not who he works for, just who he is. He was acting as my agent for the sale of the pearl. Well, Natch, Natch. Now, look, please, don't make me say what pearl. It's called the Black Pearl of Galila Bay. Uh, My brother brought it back from the South Pacific when he was in the war. Oh, yes. When he went to prison, he gave it to me to keep for him. Uh Uh-huh. So you decided to sell it. I had no choice. I needed the money desperately to finance his appeal. It comes up next week. Mm -hmm. If I don't get that pearl back, I don't know what I'll do. You've got to help me. Uh, What makes you think it's in a gumball machine? Mr. Chiselhurst took the pearl to show to a man named Junius Eagle, and that's when it disappeared. Mr. Eagle decided not to buy. And when Mr. Chiselhurst returned to the hotel... Eagle had farmed the pearl and substituted a ball of blackjack gum. Then what? Mr. Chiselhurst had Merle follow him. Nothing happened the first two days. But day before yesterday, he followed him to his warehouse and saw him drop a single ball of gum into a barrel of them that was waiting to be loaded onto a truck. The pearl must have been hidden in it. Why else would he do a thing like that? Uh Uh-huh. He would put a valuable pearl in a machine where anybody could buy it for a penny. I suppose it'd be safe for a few days. I don't know how these machines work. Well, now you know why I had to break those machines. No. You don't believe me? Mm Mm-mm. Well, what are you going to do? Check the psycho wards and find out which one you escaped from. Hello? Uh, Mr. Eagle? Are you speaking? Spade. Oh, yeah, I just got in. I, um, I've been out making my monthly collection. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to talk to you. You're falling down on my job. Another of my machines. Yeah, I know. Drum Street. I nailed the hoodlum. Ah, 
for who's he working for? Uh, let me ask you one. Did a man named Chiselhurst ever try to sell you a black pearl? Hello, you still on the line? You stopped chewing. Uh, yes. I think you better come over to my house. Oh, right away. Hello. Hello. Nuts. When I came out of the phone booth, I wasn't surprised to find that you had flown the coop, darling, if I may call you by your last name. But I was surprised at what I found at my client's house. I rang the front doorbell and waited. Nothing happened. Then, through the glass door, I saw a man rush out on the landing at the top of the stairs. He half ran, half stumbled down the long flight to the entrance hall, yanked open the door, and tried to shove past me. I grabbed him. Hey, hey, get out of my way. Wait a minute. Let go. i got to get a doctor. You're bleeding. No, 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 not me. I've got to get a doctor. Why don't you phone? They've ripped the wires out. Now let go, or it'll be your fault if he dies. I memorized his mug, lifted his wallet as we unclenched, and let him go. On the way upstairs, I checked his ID cards. Higgins, Morris L., employer, Eagle Vending Machine Company, occupation, maintenance supervisor. On the floor of the room at the top of the stairs was quite a sight. The floor of the room was covered almost completely with pennies. In the middle of it, sprawled forward like a miser who had been attacked while counting his hoard, was Junius J. Eagle. The wound in the back of his neck could have been caused by a small hatchet. There was a bookkeeper's account sheet open across the desk and scrawled across the neat rows of figures. There were three words. Spade, quarter, and eagle. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. to the Quarter Eagle Keeper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. That's you, Higgins? Uh, yeah, yeah. Save yourself the trip upstairs. There's nothing you can do for him. Oh, dead, huh? Yeah. Well, I guess he won't need that doctor I called. We can use one anyway. Did you tell the Doc Eagle had been stabbed? Yeah, sure, sure I did. Yeah, well, that means the law will come with him or ahead of him. But I don't get it. He must have been killed for the money, but why didn't they take the pennies? They should have. It would look better for you if they had. You're that detective he hired, huh? That's right. Now, look, Higgins, we haven't got much time. If you want to find out who killed your boss, spill everything you know to me now before the cops get here. Because they're going to hold you, and they'll hold me, too, if they find me here. But I don't know a thing, Spade. I just found him like that. How did you get in the house? I have a key. He gave me one, so when I came here to pick up the pennies, he wouldn't have to come all the way down to let me in. For now, tell the cops the door was open. Did he always collect the pennies from the machines himself? Yeah, yeah. He was a coin collector as a hobby. He liked to go through them and save out the odd ones. You always pick up the money at 1 in the a.m.? Oh, no. No, he called me tonight a little past midnight, and he asked me to come right over. Hey, look, look, you've got to believe that. I do. He said the same thing to me. What do you know about a man named Chiselhurst? Chiselhurst? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the name of the guy that ran into my truck yesterday coming down the California incline near Grant. He slammed right into the rear of my truck. I tangled with his chauffeur, some punk kid. Named Merle? Yes, yeah, that's what they called him. And there was a dame in the car, too, a redhead. Any report on the accident? No, no, the cop took it down on the, on the beat there. There wasn't no damage. Sounds like we haven't got much more time here. Oh. <laughs> what exactly happened the night the first gun machine on your route was smashed up? Come on. Well, first off, I went to a bowling alley on Turk Street and removed our machine there. It was discontinued. Wait a minute, where did you take it? Back to the shop? Oh, wait a second. I got it here in my book. Come on, come on. All right, I'm hurrying. Uh, here it is, 11864. Mm -hmm. No, no, I exchanged it for an out-of-order down on Drum Street. Did you leave the pennies in it? Oh, sure, sure. They only get collected once a month. How much gun was in it? About half full. I didn't refill it until today. Yeah. What's your system on the refill operation? Well, I carry about four extra machines in the truck. When I go to fill a machine, I take one of the extras already filled out of the truck and trade for the empty. Yeah. Then I fill the empty one in the truck, and that saves me from carrying the bag around. Now, is there anything else I can tell you? Yeah. Huh? Does uh, Quarter Eagle mean anything to you? No, no. Okay, now where's the back door? That Quarter Eagle... What was it? Was it a wrestling hole like the half Nelson? I thought of asking Effie, but I was afraid she'd know. I was sure that if I could find Chiselhurst, I could get all the answers at once. That collision between his car and the rear end of Higgins' truck was a good lead in more ways than one. It meant that at least part of your story, darling, was true. But you neglected to tell me that you, Chiselhurst, and Merle had been tailing Higgins' appointed rounds of the gumball machine. 
I checked the police report on the accident. The car was registered in Great Britain. The report said transient, no local address, and so to bed. I dreamed it was next Thanksgiving, and I was eating a roast of quarter eagle. Then it turned into crow. Good morning, sir. Do you wish to place a classified ad? Uh, good, good morning to you, madam. Indeed, I do. Kindly write it on this blank. Uh, kindly read it off this blank. Well, Quarter Eagle, interested parties, apply Sam Spade. Sutter, 37596. Three, That's right. That's uh, nine words, sir. I'll have to charge you for three lines anyway. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, but it's not fit the print. <laughs> Barney's Beanery. Uh, Mr. Spade? Uh, yeah. Uh, you got it for sale, the quarter eagle? Who's speaking? I am speaking. Sergei Zacharias. Zacharias. Uh, you are numismatist? Uh, no, this is Mr. Spade himself. Uh, look, I'd like to talk to you personally. Where can I reach you? Oh, I am by my shop, two doors from Belvedere Coffee Shop on O'Farrell Street. Okay, Mr. Zacharias, I'll be right over. <laughs> You. Why don't you do more talking last night? My client might be alive if you had. Oh, it's terrible. But how could I have known? You knew about the quarter eagle. Why did you spin that yarn about the pearl? How did you find out about it? Dead men sometimes do tell tales. Surely you don't think that I had anything to do with that. He was only hacked to death with a hatchet like the one you threw at me. That makes you look fine. All right, I killed him if that'll make you listen to me. Sam, don't go into that shop. Please, it's, it's a, a trap. Suit. You don't know that man, Zacharias. He's the cause of all our troubles. You mean he sold you that hatchet? Sam, please! Quit clawing me. Let go. I won't allow you to go in there. I won't. I won't. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here? What's the occasion of the squabble? Oh, well, no, it's Mr. Spade. Yeah, Clancy, this dame here just tried to pick my pocket. Oh! Ah, <laughs> Pickpocket, is it? Glory be in such a pretty one, too. Never mind that, Clancy. Just have it locked up. I'll be down later to prefer charges. Come on. Uh, hello? Anybody home? Okay, Shums. Just keep on walking. Straight through the back room. One move and I rip you wide open. Yeah, yeah. Better not, Merle. Your boss might not like that. Smart guy. Knows everybody's name. Oh, my dear sir. Uh, a most propitious meeting. Uh, you, you've uh, brought the quarter eagle? Where's Zacharias? Uh, he's uh, resting at the moment, in yonder closet. Oh, no, 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 uh, not dead. Merely under restraint, uh, bound and gagged. A necessary precaution. Well, uh, uh, shall we talk turkey, or rather, uh, 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 eagle? Tell your punk to take that knife out of my ribs. Who's a punk? Uh, now, 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 Merle. There's been quite enough violence. Check. I think I'll take that knife. <laughs> Leave it there. Now, sit down. Merle, Merle. Oh, headstrong boy. Uh, now, as to the quarter eagle, I'm willing to pay a reasonable reward for its recovery, but first I must tell you that Miss Darling, for whom I'm acting as agent for the sale of the coin, is indeed the legal owner, despite anything Mr. Zacharias may have told you to the contrary. Uh, what would you say to uh, $500? Uh, I would say no dice. Uh, 1000 I would say I'm still listening. Uh, sir, you you seem to exaggerate the value of that tiny gold piece. It was worth one human life to somebody. That sounds like more than a thousand bucks to me. Uh, you may find the market valuation of that particular mintage of the quarter eagle in my coin catalog. Ten thousand dollars. But, sir, uh, that valuation is based upon the mistaken belief that there were only two in existence. It was while rummaging in her grandmother's attic that Miss Darling came upon a third. Uh, when she brought it to me, I could scarcely credit it. It was a matter of official record. The two specimens had been stamped out when the die broke. And then it came to me. There must have been a third. Uh, namely, the coin which was in that rude stamping press when the die broke. Uh, closer examination of the quarter eagle now in your possession uh, revealed certain markings. Yeah. Some uh, defective feathers in the war bonnet on the obverse. Uh -huh. And a cleavage in the numeral four of the date, 1841. Yeah, yeah, all right. So how much is it worth? Uh, uh, well, as I say, the, the price last paid was 10000 I think we may safely assume it will bring several times that amount in today's market. But only, mind you, if, if but two specimens, not three, are in existence. Uh -huh. So you decided it would be more profitable to clam up about it and see what the owners of the other two coins would pay to keep this one off the market. Precisely, sir. How did it get in that gum machine? Ah, 
therein lies the tale. Uh, keep it short, will you? I'm getting hungry. Uh, well, sir, I brought the quarter eagle for Mr. Zachariah. Yeah. Who was acting as agent for the owner of the other two coins. Um, uh, an Australian sheep herder, I believe. Mm -hmm. Retired now. Yes, I'm uh, glad. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, Mr. Zacharias's offer was so poor that uh, I, I, I took umbrage. Oh, you didn't? Uh, I gave him a caning and left the premises. Really? But I'd gone no farther than the half a league up Turk Street when I became aware that two ruffians were skulking at my heels. No. Uh, sent, I had no doubt, by Mr. Zacharias uh, to rob me of the quarter eagle. Egad, sir. Uh, precisely. Uh, knowing full well that they would not dare to strike in a populous, well-lighted resort, yes. I entered a bowling alley at the corner of Hyde Street. Uh, uh, no pun intended. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, but there upon the wall, I spied a penny vending machine, and the word eagle caught my eye. Uh, association of ideas, no doubt. No doubt. But that, sir, is how I came to put the quarter eagle into Mr. Eagle's gum machine. Yes, I think I can take it from there. When you went back, the machine had been taken out by the Eagle Company's maintenance man, right? Uh, not quite. I caught him in the very act of removing the machine and followed him out of the building. Yeah, but then you lost track of the machine. I uh, found out why. Never mind that now. What I want to know is who followed Mr. Eagle home the night he was killed? Oh, uh, uh, I I'd rather not say. Then all bids are off. Uh, uh, one moment, Mr. Spade. Yeah? Uh, am I to infer that your price for the quarter eagle necessarily includes uh, uh, bringing the murderer to justice? Just that, Mr. Chislehurst. <sighs> Well, I suppose there's nothing for it but to make the supreme sacrifice. Merle. Me? You double-crossing pig? But now, Merle, you know perfectly well you did away with poor Mr. Eagle. Shut up. I'll cut you to pieces. Gross insubordination. You deliberately exceeded your instructions. I wanted you to apply only sufficient violence to recover the coin. Instead, you seized the opportunity to satisfy your nauseating bloodlust. Really, Merle? I'll cut you to pieces. I'll cut you to pieces. Oh, uh, All right, drop now. Drop the shim, Merle. <laughs> Knife happy punk. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was a near thing, sir. The base ingratitude of that boy. Oh well, what's done is done. Uh, when may I expect delivery of the quarter eagle? I uh, didn't answer him. To cover my embarrassment, I gagged him. Manacled him to Merle and delivered the package marked one murderer, one accessory to the dumbfounded minions of the law. And that, Thelma, darling, I regret to inform you, is still the crop. After I'd sprung you from the pokey, I got hold of Higgins and we went through every coin out of every eagle gumball machine in the city of San Francisco. It couldn't happen, but it did. Your quarter eagle is, shall we say, no place? Period. End of report. Say. I'm disappointed in you. Well, so am I, sweetheart. But I'll forgive you if you found even one Indian head penny from my penny card. Yeah, yeah, just one from that machine on Drum Street. Oh, uh, thank you. There you are, sweetheart. Oh, thank you. And it's an old one. And older than I feel. Go type that up. Sam, this money is, is counterfeit. Are you sure? It's joke money. It says two and one half dollars. Hmm? You see where it should say one cent? Two and a half dollars. Let me see that. Two and a half dollars. If an eagle is a ten dollar gold piece, what is a two and a half dollar gold piece? Oh, no, let me see. Five dollars would be half. <gasps> Damn. Right. A quarter eagle. Yeah, that's just dirt on it, see? It's, it's gold, Ooh, really. Oh, look at it shine. Like the stars in your eyes, sweetheart. Oh, you darling. Hmm. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Very funny. Certainly took you long enough. Oh, thank you, Sam. Well, do you like them? My oh. curls? Yeah, I guess so. It's your own hair, I trust. Oh, yes, Sam. When it's brushed out, you'll never know anything happens. Whenever you're ready, uh, curly. Oh, gee, you like it that well? Yeah, very cute. Well. Huh. It's a business. Yeah. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, subject, yeah. the bouncing Betty Caper. Uh-huh. Dear Dundee. It all began on a Wednesday. My uh, secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, tiptoed into my office and laid an engraved calling card on the desk in front of me. The name on it was Randall Carruthers. She said he looked like money, so I said show her in. Or him in. She did. Good morning, sir. Do you wish the morning paper? Uh, thanks. I've read it. Dear me. What's the matter? This ashtray, sir. Um, have you a silent butler? I don't even have a noisy one. Oh. In all my years of service, it has been my constant endeavor to keep things neat and tidy, down to the smallest detail. I see. Well, if it bothers you, just dump those butts into the wastebasket. Very well, sir. Uh, If you will pardon the presumption, sir, you could use a well-trained servant in this establishment. <laughs> Waste paper baskets clean and empty at all times. Never allow refuse to accumulate. That's not refuse. That's this month's bills. If so I notice, sir. I also notice that you have not opened them. From this I conclude that your services are immediately available. Yeah, and I conclude that in spite of your glad rags and fancy handle, you are somebody's butler. Oh, that is correct, sir. I am first butler in the household of Dr. Mark McGraw. First? Yes. Bleakcliff is the name of the estate. It's near the village of Squid Beach, some 50 miles in a southerly direction on the Pacific coast. You know, I think I'm going to like you as a client, Mr. Carruthers. I mean, it's uh, refreshing to get a few accurate facts without, shall we say, uh, priming the pun. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank You're you. welcome. To continue, not counting the staff, there reside at Bleakcliff three persons. Mm. Dr. McGraw, master of the house since the death of his wife. His stepson, Mr. Anthony McGraw, of whom more later, and Mr. Anthony's sister, Miss Carthy. It is on her behalf that I've come to you, sir. Uh, what is her problem, uh, Mr. Carruthers? Uh, the correct form of address is Carruthers, uh, not Mr. Carruthers. Check. <laughs> yes, thank you, sir. Now, as to Miss Carthy's problem, sir, uh, someone is attempting to murder her. Specifically, she has, upon several occasions, been shot at from ambush. Twice she has awakened in the night to feel the hands of an assailant closing about her throat. And only yesterday, she narrowly escaped death when her motor car went out of control owing to some blackguard tampering with the steering mechanism. And upon numerous other occasions... That's enough. You have convinced me that she indeed has a problem. Uh, What do the local police think? No one has been to the police, sir. Why not? It's a delicate situation, sir. Uh, Miss Carthy's brother, Mr. Tony, is undergoing treatment for um, uh, nervous disorders. Mm -hmm. The family did not wish to place him in an institution, and since Dr. McGraw, his stepfather, is a psychiatrist, he is allowed to remain at home. I see. He's flipped. Uh, Where do I uh, fit in, Carruthers? Uh, Well, sir, if a reputable gentleman such as yourself were to come to Bleakcliff and witness these persistent attempts upon that girl's life, uh, perhaps they could be forced to put the boy away where he belongs. It's possible. I'm willing to try, for money. Oh, splendid, sir, splendid. I I took the liberty of drawing, in your favor, a draft upon the First National Bank of Squid Bay, one week's remuneration in advance of your services to the Bleakliff Estate in the capacity of chauffeur. uh, Uh, Chauffeur? uh, Yes, sir, I thought that might be a capital disguise. Um, Have you a better suggestion, sir? Well, uh... No, no, that's okay. Uh, This check. Yes, sir. Uh, Two hundred bucks. It's a pretty big weekly salary for a chauffeur, isn't it? Well, you will be allowed to shop for the vegetables, sir. Your cut has been added in. I told him I didn't know one vegetable from another, that I was a lousy driver, and in more time than it takes to tell, I was installed at Bleak Cliff, in a room above the garage, and told to wait there until summoned. I put on my pearl gray uniform with the brass buttons and leather puttees, looked in the mirror, and decided I had missed my calling. But not by much. Nothing happened for nearly an hour, and then I got my first buzz. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, garage. Phillips, the car, quickly. The main entrance. Keep your motor running. I have him locked in the living room, and he's breaking off. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, miss. Uh, I'm sorry, miss. Well, uh, get going, please, please. Uh, darn it, miss. Uh, uh, where's the spark on oh, this? Oh, what's the uh, matter with it? Well, it, it's it's uh, flooded. The house, you know. Uh, uh, oh, he's got the meat cleaver again. Can't you get the door? Well, I'm trying. Get out, I tell you. Get out. Stop it. Stop it. You're hurting him. No. All right. All right. Put it down, kid. Put it down. Come on. Give it to me. No. What's going on? I say, who are you? <laughs> Haven't you been instructed not to disturb my patient? I'm sorry, I'm new here. When I saw him coming at Miss McGraw with that meat cleaver, I naturally thought Oh, that well, I... no harm done. Come along, Tony. Huh? Come along now. Come huh? along, boy. We'll have a nice long talk. And uh, what shall I do with this? Oh, uh, we'll put it back. Oh. You all right? Oh. Oh. oh, sure. I should be used to it by now. By the way, you're new here, aren't you? What's your name? Sam. Sam? That's nice. Uh, turn to the left outside the gate, Sam, and drive straight out to the shore road. Well, if I can just... Uh... <laughs> hey, I just turned that little key. Look, Ma, I'm driving. I adjusted the rear view mirror so that it showed more of her and less of the rear view. A mile from the house, she ordered me to stop, moved up to the front seat with me, and asked me to drive on. By the time we got to the shore road, she was driving, and I was resting my head on her shoulder. Where are we going? I've got a little hideaway down the coast. It's right on the beach, the foot of a tall cliff. Hmm. There's a fireplace, a little bar, some records. Got some bot? It's so wonderful there with the surf pounding outside, hidden away from the world. You feel so safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't stop. Oh, you like it there. You feel as if there's no one else on earth. Time standing still. Oh, if I could just be sure that Mother wouldn't worry about me. <laughs> You're impossible. Okay, Kathy, I'll be serious. Uh, what's with that brother of yours? Tony? I'd rather not talk about that if you don't mind. Well, uh, maybe I can talk about your stepfather. I really should know what kind of a man my boss is. I go for these drives to forget all that. Please don't spoil it for me. Okay, Kathy, okay. Please. The sharp turn into this driveway. Oh. Now, we get out here. Yes, ma'am. Down this path. Uh-oh. Matt, are you afraid of high places? Yeah, you just pushed me off of one. Oh, Sam, don't be like that. You're pouting like a little boy. Come on, I want to show you my little house. What's so special about your little house? Oh, Sam, if you only knew what my life is like. You only know what mine is like. I need someone so much to talk to, Sam. As long as you can steer the conversation, you mean. Come on, Sam, I'll show you the house. The path led to a flight of wooden steps that clung to the face of a sheer cliff. There was something like the stairs you find yourself falling down in nightmares. They dropped maybe 200 feet to a crescent of white sand. Watch out for that one step. It's broken. Yeah. You have to make your dream house this hard to get to? Because of Tony. He has vertigo. What? When we were kids, he used to chase me, and I'd run down here, and he was scared to follow me. Afraid of heights. He still is. Oh. Well, you light us a fire, Sam. The wood's there in the box. I'll go make us a drink. Fire? Who needs a fire? I'm hot. What'd you do before you took up driving? Oh, I, I was a private eye for a while. Oh, how exciting. Nah, it's a sour racket. Tell me about it. Nah. Nah, let's talk about you. Here's your drink. Thanks. Well, what do you want to know about me? Uh, oh, me? Come here. The scent she was wearing was 20 carat, but the story of her life was heavy melodrama. It seemed that Dr. McGraw, a handsome fortune hunter, was a folly of her mother's middle years. But she had come to her senses shortly before she died and cut him out of her will. But that was not the end of it. 
When Kathy's brother had been faced with the alternative of entering an institution or remaining at home under his stepfather's care, she had begged the doctor to remain in spite of his warnings that her brother might take a notion to kill him. But uh, get this, Dundee, it's real deep. In spite of visible evidence to the contrary, she was convinced that her brother was not out to kill her, but that the doctor was. I couldn't sell myself on that part of the yarn, but she looked so awfully pretty while she was telling it. And suddenly, she didn't look so pretty. An expression of terror was on her face. No! 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 Get down! I rolled around to the floor and kicked the lamp out. By the glow of the embers in the fireplace, I could still see the gleam of the gun barrel shoved in through the broken window. I hoped he couldn't see so much. I knocked over a chair to give him something to shoot at. He was already halfway up the face of the cliff on those rickety wooden stairs. At the top, he turned and looked back. Who was it? It was Mark, wasn't it? The doctor? You know better than that. It was Tony. I thought you told me he was afraid of heights. Couldn't come down those stairs. He never did before. Don't you believe me? Yeah. Yeah, Kathy. I may wind up believing the rest of your story. I took Kathy back to Bleak Cliff and stashed her in my quarters over the garage. Then I went into the main house via the back stairs, found her room, and shook it down. In a cabinet, a bunch of war souvenirs. German helmets, grenades, rifles, and other lethal gadgets. In a desk drawer, I found a letter headed U.S. Army, Office of the Surgeon General. It certified that one Anthony McGraw was unfit for military service. Vertigo. Origin, childhood injury to middle ear. Downstairs in the library, I found a shelf of medical books. Vertigo. Vertigo was almost incurable, and there was certainly no quick cure. But some patients had lost their symptoms temporarily under hypnotism. Then it said, see narcosynthesis. I did. Oh, Spade. A uh, big pardon, sir. Uh, Mr. Spade. Yeah, whatever are you doing in the butler's pantry, sir? Looking for a butler. Namely you, Carruthers. Oh, may I serve you, sir? Yeah. How do I get an interview with Dr. McGraw? Well, sir, I should... Oh. <laughs> Strange. After all my years of service, I, I still start as a master summons. Hey, you did it again. Eh, well, I'm sorry, sir. I'd better see what Dr. McGraw wants. Forget it. I'm answering this one. You're not going to drop your disguise, sir. Why not? Who am I kidding, anyway? You rang, Dr. McGraw? Eh? Oh, I didn't ring for you. I rang for Carruthers. I ordered him to tidy up my office while I was at dinner. And look at it. Looks neat as a pen to me, Doctor. Oh, yes, you're new here. Chauffeur, eh? I'm only wearing his uniform. Here's my card. Oh, detective, eh? That's right, Doctor. And this one's just about ready to wrap up. Well, you interest me. Uh, Go on. I will. I think you've been trying to use that boy as a murder weapon against his sister. Oh, and you call yourself a detective? If you can call yourself a doctor, I guess I can. You've been treating him with narcosynthesis, haven't you? Yes, that's right. Hypnotic drug. While he's under it, you brief him on his activities for the day, and he follows through, including assaults with deadly weapons. That would be possible with certain very suggestible patients, but I'm afraid impossible to prove. I think I can prove it, Doctor. You shouldn't leave your textbooks lying around loose. I found out the only way Tony could have walked down that stairway to Kathy's beach house without falling would be temporary relief of his symptoms due to hypnotic suggestion, unquote. I see. What do you intend to do about this theory of yours? What do you suggest? You see this row of buzzers here on my desk? Mm -hmm. This one is for my secretary. This is to summon Carruthers, and when I press this buzzer, two of the most hideous plug uglies you've ever seen will rush into this office, beat you to a pulp, and dump you outside the front gate. That's what I think of your theory. Buzz away, Doctor. I think I like them better than I do you. (laughs) As you wish. From where I was on the other side of the room, I didn't know what had happened at first. All I saw was a lot of paper gushing out of the wastebasket. The doctor sure was dead. His midsection was perforated like a shower drain. And in the walls, fanning out around the end of the room, about a yard up from the baseboard, there was a straight line of holes. I dug into one. What I took out wasn't a bullet. It was a perfectly round steel ball. Then I remembered the wastebasket, the paper flying out of it just before the explosion. In the bottom of it, I found the answer. The base of a steel mechanism with German lettering on it. It was a wartime anti-personnel mine that the G.I.s called the Bouncing Betty. The 
United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. I didn't wait for the Squid Beach Law to arrive. Who could? I went straight back to San Francisco. You, Lieutenant Dundee, were waiting at my office. Uh, morning, Sam. Hello, Dundee. Uh, about that McGraw killing, Sam. Mm-hmm. The chief down at Skid Beach has asked us to cooperate with the department down there at Skid Beach. Squid Beach, Dundee. Squid, that's right. They say you caught a bus at Skid Beach. Squid, at, uh, Squid. That's right. At a quarter of two in the company of a young woman answering the description of the McGraw girl. Uh-huh. They say that, do they? Uh, they say they got a statement from that butler, rather... Uh, or others. Yeah, well, it's open and shut anyway. The butler hired you, the girl is wanted, and you're hiding her out. Why? Why not? Well, it's established that the girl hated the deceased and bickered with him constantly. The doctor and the boy were pals. That girl's guilty as You've been able to place her in the murder room? Well, no, but here's an item. She worked with an army ordinance uh, during the war mm-hmm. in research. Subject? I made a note of that. Uh, enemy landmines, anti-personnel. One of the reports she helped put out was on the bouncing Betty. Yeah? Definitely. Hey, hey where are you going, Sam? Sam, oh, Sam, it's been so lonesome cooped up here all day. Why didn't you tell me you were with Army Ordnance during the war? Well, I don't know. I suppose it thought it was unfeminine or something. Try again. All right, I'll tell you the truth. I had a copy of that report with instructions for the operation of the bouncing Betty in the desk in my room. What the devil are you doing with a thing like that? I don't know. I was proud of it. It was the only report I worked on with the general. Should have got rid of it. I did. I burned it in the fireplace as soon as I learned what had killed him. You didn't burn it good enough. Sam, they found it. Yeah. Have they arrested Tony? Not yet, but he's definitely sane. He'll have to take the rap for anything he's done. I see. Well... I guess there's no other way. Tony didn't do it, Sam. I did. I want to make a confession. Not to me, please. Not to me. After what happened down at the beach when I knew I was no longer safe anywhere, I realized I had to do it. For Tony's sake as well as mine. When we arrived back at the house, I looked into the dining room and I saw Dr. McGraw eating dinner. I knew it was my chance to get into his office. Yeah? Then what? Well, the bouncing Betty was in my room. There was some wire in the tool chest, and I knew that Carruthers always went tied to tidy up while the doctor was at dinner. So I waited until I saw him come out, and then I went in. And I looked around for a place to plant it, out of sight. Then I saw the wastebasket full of papers. It was the perfect hiding place. The whole thing didn't take more than five minutes. Well, say something. Go on, say you hate me, say it. I don't. Wish I did Help me, help me. I'm sorry, lady. I am sorry. I don't know how long we sat there. I held her in my arms until she cried herself out, then we just looked at each other. I knew if I put it off another minute, I wouldn't call you at all, Dundee. So with my arms still around her, I reached for the phone. Uh, Lieutenant Dundee, this is Sam Spade. Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, hello. Hello. Give me that. Lieutenant, this is Catherine McGraw. I wish to make a full confession in the murder of my stepmother. I walked out while she was still talking to you, Dundee. I knew she'd wait for you, and I didn't want to be there when you took her away. As I walked over to my office, everything she'd said kept coming back to me. I could see her sneaking into her brother's room and getting that contraption out of the cabinet. I could see her hiding behind the door until Carruthers came out after tidying up McGraw's office, dumping ashtrays, emptying waste baskets. And that's as far as I got. I went back to my office to wait. And sure enough, 20 minutes after the papers hit the streets with Kathy's confession, the door opened and he came in. Well, sir, I believe it's turning a bit raw out of doors. Gardner was saying only this morning that we should order out some shrouds for the Sapphic Glows to see no after. Uh, am I discommoding you, sir? No, Carruthers. I've been waiting for you. Uh, uh, with your permission, sir, the ashtray. Just dump it in the wastebasket. Uh, well, uh, 
I am gratified to note that your secretary has been looking after things and has emptied your waste paper basket. This is right and proper. Quite, quite. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, speaking of waste paper basket... Allow me, Carruthers. You have come to apprise me of your part in the death of the late Dr. McGraw. Am I in error? Uh, you've already divined my purpose, sir. Yes, it was I who placed that infernal machine. In the wastebasket, Carruthers, yes, I know. And it struck me as a bit of poetic justice that the buzzer, which that dreadful man used as a symbol of his despotism, should be the instrument of his own destruction. I'm sorry, Carruthers. I'll do all I can. No need, sir. No need. I'm aware that there is no final justification for taking the law into one's own hands. Every man is entitled to trial by jury of his peers. But where, Mr. Spade, where could be found twelve good men and true who would allow themselves to be called the peer of that monster, Dr. McGraw? Period, and of report. Sam! There must be some mistake. Mistake, Effie? Mistake? No. Well, well the, the butler can't be guilty. The... That's old-fashioned. He was an old-fashioned butler, sweetheart. Where today can you get help like that? Somebody who empties the ashtrays, keeps the waste paper baskets clean, tidies up around the place. Well, I'd be only too happy to do the same for you, Sam. Well, I know you would, Doc. Well, considering what happened to Mr. Carruthers' employer, I... Effie, you mustn't allow your mind to dwell on such matters. It's wicked. Sam! Hmm. Who emptied an ashtray in that waste basket that I just finished cleaning out? Pay it no heed, sweetheart. I'll buy you a silent butler. I'll go tight that up. Hmm? <laughs> I haven't made any mistakes. I'm in such a hurry. Whatever did you do to your hair? Well, I brushed it out, Sam. What happened to the pen curls? I told you, Sam, when it was brushed out, it wouldn't be noticeable. Hours of torture sitting under a hot dryer for something nobody will notice. But, Sam, it, it puts bounce in your whole makeup. I get it. The bouncing Effie caper. Oh. Hmm, eyeshadow, new shade of lipstick. You look real gone. Oh, no. Whom is it tonight? Well, it, it's this friend of Maud, Sam. Of course, she's not really serious about him, so it's all right. You're conscious about him? Oh, no, Sam, no. He, and he's, um, he's definitely not serious about her. I mean, he... Well, uh, have fun, sweetheart, while Maud Byrne. Oh, well, she, she, she won't. Um, I suppose you'll be seeing that girl at, uh, what was her name? Oh, yes, Kathy. Well, at least, uh, if I'm not playing in someone else's garden. No. Well, have fun anyway. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Private Detective, is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. In to uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police from Samuel Spade, license number 17596. Uh, subject, the betrayal in Bumpus Hell. Fred Gillis was a raw boned poke from the border country. He was a stranger to Bumpus Hell, but he was no stranger to trouble. He jogged his pinto down the narrow main street, not liking what he saw, and reined up in front of the sheriff's office. He dismounted and slapped the trail dust off his Levi's. Then he hitched up his gun belt and ambled inside. He looked at the heavy-shouldered, uh, blue-jowled man behind the desk, and he didn't like what he saw. Neither did the sheriff, Rance Blaggett. State your business. Ah, I can do it better than that. State your business and get out, he snarled. Red smiled thinly and drawled, uh, I'm looking for my brother. And uh, what be your name outside of Red? Here, I can do that better than that. And what be your name outside of Red? Red Gillis's hand slid toward one of the six shooters as silently as the sun coming up over the butte. Gillis, he sneered. Red Gillis from the Tonto Rim. That's pretty good. The sheriff's muscles tightened like steel springs and pulled him erect. Ain't no Tonto Rimmer welcome hereabouts in Bumpus Hell, he cursed. That was real good. And then the slap of four hands on leather was followed by the simultaneous roar of four six guns. Hey, hey wait a minute. The sheriff. Hey, Ruff, I know her in there. Well, who is it? The sheriff is just. It's a spade. Miss Kelton, next door. Right in the most exciting part. Mr. Spade, now see here, I won't take no for an answer. It wouldn't be neighborly. What is it, Mrs. Kelsey? Never you mind, come along. What are you up to here, anyway? Who, me? Oh, nothing. I'm just relaxing with an apple and a good book, I that's all. I don't see no apple, and the only reading matter I see is some western trash. Trash? Now, come on, there's trouble on the third floor. Well, there's trouble in bump as hell. Don't you swear at me. Enough. I know my duty, and I know your duty. Now, come on, get moving. Ouch, okay, let go my ear. And that dandy so helped me is how it started. Effie had just read a book called How to Relax, and it said there that Western stories were relaxing, and that's how I happened to be at home at 10 p.m., riding herd on a copy of Sheriff and Outlaw, Rip Roaring Adventures of the Old West. But bump as hell hath no fury like my neighbor, Mrs. Kelsey. I left Red Gillis and the sheriff face to face, and vice versa, eyes flashing and guns ablaze, and followed her meekly up to the third floor. <laughs> Hours they have. Won't yeah. be a stick of furniture left in the room, lesson there's cops. You speak to them? Get out! Speak to them! You see this lot? No, here, under my transformation. Oh, well, why didn't you call a cop? Well, I wouldn't be neighborly. Hit me, the did. You see this lump? Yeah, yeah, you showed it to me. Put your wig back on, I'll see what I can do. And tell them about my lump! It's evident! Yeah, yeah, put it back! Hey, open up! You That's big slob. Uh, From now on, you and me is strictly on the cool beady. Well, get on principle. Uh, 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 hey, let go of me. Uh, don't throw me it. A... Hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Don't I remember you from someplace? No, I'm only being neighborly. Why did you beat up on kind, nice Mrs. Kelsey? That is a gross falsehood. I did not lay a hand on the old wag. It was that odious stinker, Joe Donegan, who was just left. And you can tell him, as from me, that I'm extremely unimpressed with his cheap threats to rub me out. And that I intend to continue on seeing Mr. Hobson or any other Johns which I care to. That's pretty good singing. Oh. Well, uh, you better tell him that yourself. I don't imagine I'll be seeing him. You won't. Hey, wait a minute. Who are you, anyway? Uh, just another tenant. I uh, live downstairs. Oh, well, now I recall whom you are. You are that Seamus, which lives on the second floor. Really. Uh, Seamus, we call it in the radio. Seamus. Would you care to come in and discuss a certain matter? Well, uh, thanks. Another time. i got to get back to Bumpus Hell. Ooh, whoever she is, let her cool her heels for a few moments. No, you don't understand this Bumpus Hell. This is an urgent matter, which I would like to hash over right now and without further delay. Well, I, uh... May I invite you in for a straight slug? Well, uh, okay, but just one. Uh, in a glass. All right, make yourself comfy. <clears throat> now, say when. Uh, just up to the lipstick mark. Here you are. <clears throat> Well, now to make a long story short, Mr. Spade, my name is Rosemary Fell, which remains my stage name, notwithstanding the circumstance that I am legally married to that barnacle which has just dusted this joint. Now, being as you are in the detective business... Now, wait I a ro- minute. 
kindly permit me to finish, honey? Sorry, sweetheart. I'm not the type to jaw about my troubles just to pass the time of day. I'm sure you are. I am an actress. I knew that. And although I'm low in funds due to being between jobs right now, on account of that knothead making a scene in the last joint at which I worked... <coughs> Chief Ginger Whale. <coughs> <coughs> just to show you how the brakes fall, Mr. Spade, Belita Wilkerson, who just happens to be about the biggest talent agent in this city, if mm. you have the time, I'm phoned me, phoned me on the telephone, I'm and arranged an audition. Ah. She also advanced me the sum of 100 clams. 100? Which I will pay you to put the B on that dog, Joe Donigan, the rat. Now, which is he? Uh, what do you mean, put the B on him? Listen, Sam, that grifter has got a record as long as my arm, and what I have got on him is longer than his arm. Please. In short... I should like him thrown into the can so that I can feel safe to sing on him. Uh, look, uh, Rosemary, so you had a fight with Joe. You're sore. You want him to pay, you want to pay him off. Now, right. why don't you just wait until morning and uh, see how you feel? Sam, then? listen to me. That knuckle duster remains at large. I will be feeling no pain. Now, I, I know that from my flamboyant manner, you'd never guess it. But that is only the actress in me. In actuality, that flea intends to do me in. Oh, now, come, Rosemary. What? You disagree? Well, now, really, Rosemary. Why, you big pain in the neck. Rosemary. I am drinking my... Pour that back in the bottle. Come on, put it back in the bottle. Uh, well, I'll be going now. Only trying to be neighborly. Well, back to bump as hell. <laughs> Rance Blaggett, the smoking colt still gripped in his hairy fists, suddenly pitched forward like a fallen Joshua tree at Red Gillis' feet. Red leaned over with a thin smile playing at the corners of his mouth, not liking what he saw, and lifted the badge off of Blaggett's cowhide vest and pinned it on his own. Bumpus Hell had a new sheriff. Hmm? Uh, hey. Hey. Then I heard it. It sounded like a man sneaking up a fire escape. I went over to the window, raised it, and looked up. I didn't like what I saw. An overcoated figure reached the third floor landing and stood silhouetted against the lighted window of Rosemary's apartment. He was about the height and weight of that rat, Joe Donegan. By the time I'd rolled out the window onto the fire escape, his right hand had come out of his coat pocket. Donegan! Donegan, watch it! floor ahead of me, and I didn't want to get too close to him until I passed that lighted window. He made the roof just as I crossed in front of it. The flashes from his revolver told me that. They also told me he had two slugs left to throw at me. The only light up there was a feeble glow from the skylight dead center. I headed for the cover of a brick chimney just to the left of it. I had two things in mind. The skylight was his most logical avenue of escape, and I hoped I could tease him into emptying his gun at me. It didn't work. I stuck my head out. No shots. But he did use his gun. Oh. I should have stood in Bumpus Hell. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. that rat do to you, the uh, dog, Sam. Sam, speak to me. Uh, Here, uh, come on, uh, send an Indian to start his mouth. Uh, huh? yeah, tell the governor the sheriff of Bumpus Hell is turning in his bag. Listen, honey, you've got oh. to pull yourself together. Now, come on, come on, come on. These delirious Trumans will get us no place now. Come on, uh, Sam. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come on. Now, oh. Oh. now do not rush things, oh, honey. Oh, that was oh. quite a clip he gave you. Uh. Yeah, where were you? I was combing my hair out of the window. Yeah, and he was on the fire escape, not four feet away. Not a very good shot, is he? No, he isn't. Oh, Sam, look at your poor little head. Here now, let me kiss it and make it well. Hmm, wild root. Yeah, see how it gets me ahead socially and on the job? Oh, uh-huh, well now, what next, Sam? <sighs> Rosemary, I am going to the top now. My dander is up. Let's have a moment of silence while I put through a call to Lieutenant Thomas Dundee of Homicide. It took your boys less than an hour to locate Joe Donegan and haul him in, Lieutenant. Rosemary's charges were not enough to hold him on attempted murder, and all I could identify was the back of his neck. But you were good enough to bag him anyway so Rosemary and I could relax. I went downstairs to bed and started Chapter 4. Aha. Red Gillis didn't trust Curly Mallard, the foreman of the Crooked S. Aha. Oh, 
Uh, unique garage, Harry speaking. Uh, Sam, this is Dundee. Yeah, uh, Dundee. Uh, what time is it? Uh, uh, oh, uh, 8.30. Uh, in the morning? Uh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, uh, it's daylight. Say, about that, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh Donegan? Uh, anyway, that fellow that we booked last night on your say-so. Uh, well, what about him? That was a bad beef, Sam. How come? Uh, you, you better tell me. Man was alibi, Sam. When did that happen? Well, a fellow named, uh, um, got it written down, yeah, Hobson. Warner Hobson says Donegan was with him at the time. Who else says so? Uh, Hobson's words are good enough for the commissioner. Ran for assembly once. Did you know he also ran for Donegan's wife? You don't say. Well, that's a real puzzler, Sam. The human mind is unpredictable, Dundee. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I hope you figure it out, Sam. <laughs> While I was shaving, I fought and fought. I wondered what Red Gillis would have done if such a situation had cropped up in Bumpus Hell. A thin smile began to play around the corners of my mouth as I climbed the stairs to Rosemary's apartment. When I got there, I didn't like what I saw. It was a note pinned to the door. It said, Dear Sam, I have been called to do another audition. If anything crops up, you can reach me at Grace Strewn, 34292. <laughs> The Belita Wilkerson Talent Agency. Hey, I want to speak to uh, Rosemary Fell. Hello? Yes, I'm still on the line. Who's calling, please? Uh, Sam, a spade. I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Miss Fell can't come to the phone. Who's in charge there? This is Miss Wilkerson speaking. Yeah, well, uh, why can't she come to the phone? She's in the middle of her audition. Well... Is there any message? Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell her uh, Donegan's out and it's Hobson's choice. Yes? Mr. Hobson? Yes? My name is Spade. Oh, yes, Mr. Spade. Come in, come in, come in. Why did you phony up that alibi for Rosemary's husband, Mr. Hobson? Huh? Oh, because I knew he's not the man who fired those shots at her. Were you there? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was. Would you like to hear about it? I would. Well, first, I'd better tell you a little about myself. Now, for the past year, I've been interested in politics. If I do say so yes, myself, Yes, yes, I... I know. You ran for assembly. Come to the point. Well, in a way, this is the point. My wife's a professional woman, and her own career keeps her busy a good deal of the time. Mm. Well, like the movie magazines say, a clash of careers and so on. Mm. That's how I happen to take up with Rosemary. I didn't know she was married. And, of course, when I found out, I dropped her like a hot, hot potato. potato, yeah. Potato, yeah. And then she started blackmailing me. Did you know about that? I still don't. Well, I think I can convince you. Go ahead. Well, I received a series of threatening phone calls from Rosemary. And I finally decided to go to Donegan and tell him the whole story. Oh, he was as mad as a wet head. Wet head. Well, he said he'd stop her. And I believed he was the right man to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, last night he phoned me. He said he'd had a little, uh, little caucus meeting with her and assured me I'd had no more trouble. But no sooner had I hung up that phone when she called again, making another outrageous demand. I decided then and there to take things into my own hands. So happens I'm a crack shot. And I knew that I could come close enough to frighten her without actually hurting her. Uh, you were laboring under a false impression. Huh? Oh, 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 yes. Yes. Well, uh, you believe me now? Up to a point. Well, I'm afraid that's all I have for you, Mr. Spade. Well, uh, I have something for you. Oh, what, oh, what's that? Look up here. You see this bruise on my head? Oh. Well, all in the game, you know. Touche. Now, hold it, hold it. I, I only... Lie uh, still. I'll get it. Uh, yeah? This is Rosemary again. Listen, now I want to talk... to you, cheap ward healer. Uh, if you don't have that dough for me tonight, I will have no other recourse but to smear your fat puss all over the front page. Yeah, look, Rosemary... And I am just the individual to do that. You may think you are a wolf in sheep's clothing, but in my opinion, you are nothing but a worm. Yeah, well, look... Goodbye, you rat. And rat. Hey. Hey, Rosemary. Hello. Nuts. Oh, wait a minute, Spade. Well, what did she say? You're going to read it in my report, along with a bill for my services. No, I'm so sorry she had me in. You do that, sugar. Hello there. Likewise. Are you talented or just interested? I could be. 
Uh, in the meantime, is uh, Rosemary Fowl still here? Did she have an appointment today? Uh, yes, honey. I uh, called this morning. Uh, she oh, was here then. You must be mistaken, darling. Yeah. The office didn't open till noon today. <laughs> yeah. Well, could I uh, talk to Miss Wilkerson? She hmm? isn't here just now. Oh, she she never gets in until one. Not until one. She's over at KQW cutting a transcription for our new show, Goal of the Girls and Gay. Oh, no. I mean, Gail of the Girl and Gold. Uh, don't you mean Gail of the Golden Girl? <laughs> Gail of the Golden Gate. You said it, and I'm glad. Well, anyway, she and him. Oh. Good morning, Maggie. Any calls for me? Oh, yes, Miss Wilkerson, your husband. Oh, well, Miss Wilkerson, I was telling the German you weren't here. <laughs> Obviously, I am. Did you have an appointment? I uh, talked to you on the phone this morning. Spade. Oh, Rosemary's friend. Well, you might throw. Uh, she'll be out in a moment. Oh, what a distressing business that was last night. Rosemary tells me you saved her life. Well, uh, that's a slight exaggeration. In fact, the whole thing was a mistake. Oh, really? I understood that... Oh, here she is. Rosemary, here's your oh, friend. Sam, I ever glad to see you. Yeah. What's the matter? Plenty. Oh. Well, thanks loads, Miss Wilkerson. I hope the recording is better on this one. I'm sure it is, Rosemary. We'll call you when the client makes up his mind. Oh, well, thanks again. Come on, Sam. Goodbye, Mr. Spade. Goodbye. Sam, what is this new development that appears to be griping you? Uh, why didn't you tell me you were shaking Hobson down? Uh-huh. And who's been feeding you this pile of gross falsehood? Look, Rosemary, you may be an actress, but with me, your audition is over and you did not get the part. And just what are your future intentions in regards to me? None whatsoever. I'm sorry I ever met you and I'm going back to Bumpus Hell. <laughs> Went back to the office, swiveled my chair into a comfortable position, opened the February number of Sheriff and Outlaw to page 112, Betrayal and Bumpus Hell, Chapter 5, Stampede. It was disappointing. There was a lot of stuff about bawling cattle and dust clouds and flow and curly standing on top of a butte, not liking what they saw, when somebody yelled, Stampede. Red Gillis was riding ahead of the cattle and his horse stepped into a chuck hole and he sprained his ankle, red of the horse, it didn't say which. But Red was lying prostrate on the path of the avalanche of tossing horns, not liking what he saw. Uh, uh hold it a minute. Let's see. Uh, it's on page uh, 113. Uh, uh, learn to be a private... Uh, hello. Spade, this is Hobson. Come out here right away. Something terrible has happened. Such as? Rosemary is here, and I, I think she's dead. <laughs> In here, Spade. Oh, I don't know how she got in. Oh, yes, I do remember I must have left the door unlocked. Where were you? Why, I, I uh, just stepped out to get some cigarettes. Did you prove it? Why, uh, no, I'm afraid not. I got halfway and found I didn't have any money and came back. You came back, walked through this room, went in the bedroom and didn't see the body until you started back? Well, yes, the lights were off. I, uh, I stumbled over it. This is the gun? Yes. She did it with my own gun. Oh, I never dreamed her love for me would drive her to self-destruction. Of course, now it's clear what really lay behind our poor, clumsy effort to blackmail me. It was a desperate move to get me back. Oh, I'll never forgive myself for driving that poor girl to this. Don't worry about that, Hobson. This isn't suicide. Murder? Oh, great heavens. What will Belita say? Belita? Yes, my wife. Belita Wilkerson? Yeah, professional name, you know. I was explaining to you before that... Oh, that's my wife now. What in the world will I tell her? Never mind, I'll get it. Hello? This is Rosemary, for the last time. And Ooh. I'm just calling to tell you that you have stalled around too long. I have talked to your wife and told her the whole sordid pitch. Why she wants you back, I will never know. But I sold you cheap, and you weren't worth a cent more. I am a girl who does not like to do things halfway, but you were just too late. Goodbye, you fathead. Yeah, Rosemary, I guess we were all too late. I called you, Dundee, and then, like the rat I am, made off with your prize suspect before you and your boys from Homicide arrived. We arrived at the Belita Wilkerson Talent Agency just as the boss was shutting up shop for the day. She had the recordings under her arm. All right, Belita, <gasps> I'll take those. Well, what are you... Warner, yeah. Mr. Spade... Unlock the door, Belita. We're going back in. Warner, why are You'd you... You better do as he says, Belita. Well, all right, but... Give me those keys. I don't... Inside, both of you. Where do you play these records? The recording studio is just through there, but you can spare yourself the trouble. I admit I tricked Rosemary into recording those blackmail speeches and then played them back over the phone to Warner. If trying to hold on to my husband is a crime, then I'm a criminal. Oh, now, believe it, my dear. Come on, <gasps> oh, dear. stop that. we got to get busy. 
I phoned the Hobson house and you were still there, Dundee. You said it was an open and shut case against Hobson and deliver him at once or kiss my license goodbye. But when I told you my diabolic, <laughs> diabolically ingenious scheme, you said yes, you'd be glad to because it was a sure way of getting rid of me once and for all. It took us nearly two hours to get things ready in Belita's recording studio. We took the parts of Rosemary's so-called audition records that we thought would fit the occasion and dubbed them onto a single side. We played it back once, then I phoned you at headquarters. Homicide. Lieutenant Dundee. Spade, Dundee. Everything's ready here. Did you pick up Donegan? Oh, yeah. He's here. Donegan? Hold on. Okay, Belina. Start the record when I give you the nod. Yes, Mr. Spade. I didn't say it, Donegan. It's for you. Thanks. Yeah, who's this? This is Rosemary. Huh? I forgive you for everything, oh. but there are some things I cannot it's forget. You Rosemary, love. it sounds like We have meant a lot to each other, but after what you have done to me, it is time you came through the nose. Rosemary, I didn't mean it when I followed you to his house and you went right in like you lived there. I just went nuts. After what you have, have, there, what you have done to me, it is time you paid through the nose, you Listen. rat. I am a girl who Listen, does not Rose. like to do things halfway. Listen, honey, you're, you're not going to throw a look at me, are you? I'm glad to hear your voice. I thought you were dead. We have meant a lot to Okay, kill it. Rosemary, are you listening? Rosemary! Hey, no, she's still on the line. I want to talk to her. Take him, Pole House. Wait a minute. Take him. Uh, Sam? Yeah, Dundee. Congratulations. That was a brilliant piece of work. Hey. Sam, you still on the line? Yeah, I'll be all right, Dundee. I just fainted temporarily. Say it again, will you, pal? Yeah, as I was saying, congratulations on a brilliant piece of work. Well. But I have never in all my years on the force heard of such a wild, insane, illegal, unethical, and downright cruel method of extorting a convention. Thank you, Dundee. I feel better already. Period. End of report. But, but Sam, what happened? Effie, I thought I had made that abundantly clear. No. In order to discredit her husband's paramour... Belita gave her a come on about an audition and had her play the part of a blackmailer reading lines from a script which she, Belita, had prepared and thereupon proceeded to play said records over the telephone, well knowing that her husband would erroneously believe Rosemary to be a blackmailer in fact and would drop her like a hot spud. No, Sam, no, I don't mean... Don't interrupt. It was my inspiration, I, Sam Spade, to use... Belita's fiendish device for a higher purpose. No, Sam. No, yes. that is what I'm... No, Sam. I, I meant the Western story. Betrayal and Bumpus Crick. It is not Crick, Effie. You can't say H over the radio, Sam. Oh, yes, you can. Bumpus Hell is the post office designation of a hamlet right here in California. It is? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, well, anyway, what happened? Did Red Gillis ever find his brother? I didn't quite finish, Ev. Go type that up and I shall. <laughs> Sam, what's the matter? You don't look at all well. It can't be. It doesn't happen. It's a misprint. That's what it is. What, Sam? What? Maybe the writer was tired. Oh, Sam, it's only a story. That's what you think. Well, did Red Gillis find his brother? I won't tell. Oh, no, Sam. Now, don't be childish. Oh, well, all right. Remember the sheriff he shot on page one? What? Yeah, it turned out to be the new school mom. Oh, how ornery. A woman, huh? <laughs> nice, Sam. Get off. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Since the world began, woman, 
was meant for me. Well, Sam, I must say, this is the shortest honeymoon in my experience. Yes, have you been keeping something from me? Well, I wouldn't blame myself if I did. You didn't exactly telegraph this punch. Come on in, Angel, and I'll tell you as much about it as I think you should know. And what, may I ask, is a large parcel with a pink ribbon around it? Love letters, what else? Well, I must say, for a whirlpool romance. Whirlpool? I mean, writing all those letters. When did she find time to get acquainted? Stop pulling at that blouse. What's the matter? Does it itch? Sam, now that your marital status is no longer quo, well, damn these little routine informalities. Don't you think we should be a little more stilted with each other here? In the hereafter? Then, perhaps, and not a minute before. To Sergeant Joseph Walsh, Bunko and Fugitive Detail, San Francisco Police. From uh, you-know-who, license number 137596. Subject, the, uh... Easy, yet. Subject, the, uh, love letter caper, or how to be happily married, though single. The start of it was last Wednesday morning. I had just arisen, shaved, bathed, weighed myself in the bathroom scales, and decided on a breakfast of black coffee and rye crisp. Noisy stuff. Oh. <clears throat> Special delivery. Sign here. Oh, now hold this, will you, Sonny? Yeah, but, but, but what do you call this? Some kind of Italian soda cracker? Rye crisp, low in calories. Take a bite. Oh, you no, could no, lose thanks. a pound or two yourself. Mm. There you are. Eat the change. Thanks. I'll smoke it after dinner. The first thing that fell out of the envelope was a photograph. Glamour type. It was inscribed... To Sam, body and soul, Ella. The letter was in the same tone of voice. Sam. Sam. Oh, Sam, my darling. Last night was so beautiful, but now my arms are empty and I'm filled with strange fears for the future. Unless I see you soon, I don't know how I can go on living. Come to me tonight, my darling. Wait until the house is dark. Then slip in through the west gate and I'll meet you beside the fountain. If you fail me, I don't know what I'll do. But I know you won't. All, 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 my love, forever, Ella. I uh, read it over again, looked longingly at her picture, and shook my memory down. I couldn't even remember ever meeting a girl named Ella, but I did remember that last night was definitely not beautiful. In fact, I had dropped 35 bucks in a blackjack game, not deductible. After I had tested the letter for invisible ink, codes and ciphers, etc., with negative results, I decided it was either A, a crank letter, or B, bait, or C, a camouflage call for help from a damsel in distress. I took another look at said damsel's photograph and decided I would investigate her distress. I then phoned my secretary and told her to look up the night bus schedule to Atherton, the return address on the envelope containing said love letter. It was around 11 in the p.m., and the moon was just clearing the treetops behind the Comstock mansion when I slipped in at the west gate for the instructions in Ella's love letter and took a plant beside the aforementioned fountain. The house was in darkness, and I didn't see the ladder until the moon cleared the chimney pot. There was a girl climbing down the ladder from the second story, and she had a suitcase in her hand. When she reached the ground, she looked around anxiously, spotted me, and flew into my arms. Oh, Sam, my darling, you didn't fail me. Oh, my precious, hold me. Never let me go. I love you. I love you, too, but now look. I'll explain it all later. We'll have to hurry. I think he suspected something. Who suspected Please, what? Please, there isn't time. Come on. Oh, the watchman. Hey. We'll have to go out the back way. Come on. Hey, there. Come back here. Hey, you. Hey, hold it. Get down. No, let me go. we got to get out of I here. I said get down. Oh. Shut up. My lady, what's going on down there? Oh, a couple of pounds, Mr. Comstock. They had a ladder up to the second story in the hall window. But I scared them off. Oh, is that all? Well, let's have no more shooting. I'm trying to scream. Yeah. Come on. It's our last chance. If he looks in that room, I love you. I love you. What room? Wait. Well, my room, of course. Where are you planning on going? Anywhere. Just so I get away from him, I love you. I love you. Who's him? My uncle. He's been holding me prisoner in that house. Oh, come now. I tell you, he's insane. He'll kill us both if we're caught. So please, come on. <laughs> I went, because A, I don't like being shot at, and B, there was a wild possibility that she was indeed a fairy princess on the lamb from a dragon. I discounted half a B when we reached her getaway car. It was parked in the alley with a motor running. 
When she insisted that I drive, I hesitated whether to head directly to police headquarters or nail her the stupid way. I was weak from being on a diet, so it was Hobson's choice, more familiarly known as Spade's Folly. What is this place? It's where I live. You wouldn't lie to me. Not about that. Look at the address. Your love letter arrived here. Come on. Here, let me carry your bag. No, no, it's all right. I'll carry it. Hmm. Come on, come on. It's okay. No cops, no booby traps. Now, let's have a look in that suitcase. No, you must Come on, come on. Give it to me. No, you can't. Why not? Because you'll get the wrong idea. Oh. Well, well, well. What have we here? I knew you'd get the wrong idea. The only thing you seem to have missed is the Hope Diamond. That jewelry is mine, every piece of it. Uh -huh. It's all I have in the world. Poor kid. Let's see now. Diamond bracelet, not more than ten grand. Emerald necklace, second hand, of course. All told, I don't imagine this stuff will net you a penny more than a hundred thousand bucks. I know, but I'll just have to get along as best I can. I don't have any money of my own. Yeah, why did you write me that crazy love letter? Because my uncle reads all my mail. I didn't want him to know I was hiring a detective. Why did you? I couldn't very well walk around with all these jewels without some protection, could I? Oh, my uncle, he followed me here. I suppose it's the cop. Oh, no, it's he. I know it. Where can I hide? In here? Don't you have a bedroom? Yeah, but it has a window and a fire escape in here. Uh, go on. But, but go I... on, go on. Speed. Yeah. I... I suppose she's told you about me. You were uncle? Oh, good heavens, no. I'm Stuart Mason. I'm a fiancé. Or was, till she ran away with you. Uh, maybe you'd better step inside, Mr. Mason. Thank you. Uh, sit down. I'd uh, like to... No, 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 no. I just brought a few things I'd like to leave for Ella. Here. This bundle of letters. Her uh, love letters to me. I suppose she'll want to destroy them. <clears throat> now, wait a minute, Mr. Mason. Don't jump to any rash conclusion. I saw her come down the ladder. I saw her throw herself into your arms. Yeah, but... I I can't blame her. I've been a coward. I oh. told myself it was for her own sake that I discouraged her from escaping with me. But now I know that... Well, it was at least partly fear for myself. But I might die as the others did. Yeah, but... Uh, what others? The men she's known. They've all died under mysterious circumstances. And Didn't she warn you? Well, uh, all she told me was that her uncle was insane and wouldn't let her out. <laughs> Crazy like a fox. As long as she remains unmarried, he controls her money. Three million dollars of it. Uh-huh. Well, only the brave deserve the fare. Alas, if you'll just give her these letters and tell her that I... You, uh, tell her yourself. Come on out, Ella. No, why did you come here? Your letters, my dear. And I... I wish you every happiness. Stuart. You too, old man. Good night. Oh, Stuart, Stuart, darling, I can explain everything. Don't try, my dear. Oh, Stuart! Stuart, come back! Hey, Ella. Hey, Ella, your jewelry. Your, your love letters. Hey, we'll take care of those letters, Spade. Keep the gun on him, Riley. Inside, you. Over there, sweetheart. What do you want? Mr. Spade, I've been aware for some time that you've been carrying on a surreptitious love affair with my niece. Look, uh, Mr. Comstock. What, Jim Riley? Don't worry, Mr. Comstock. I advise you against trying to jump him, Spade. Why should I? You're both nuts, but not crazy enough to take a shot at me here. Try me and see. I wouldn't waste the energy. I haven't made a penny on this caper so far, and it doesn't look like I will. Ha! Not a penny, he says. The king's ransom and jewels extorted from a foolish, lovesick girl. Oh, how did I manage that? Don't you play the innocent with me. This packet of love letters will satisfy the police. Blackmail. You're crazy. Those letters weren't written to me. You deny that Ella has ever written your letter? One too many. In fact, one. Well, how do you explain me? Darling Sam. Sam, my dearest one. What? Sam, my great, big, beautiful detective. Dated last October. Hey, let me see those Watch things. It. I told you not to move. Yeah, yeah, so you did. Well, uh, what now? Very well. Give me the... Give me the police department. Yes, it is. Hello? This is Hugo Comstock. I want to make a complaint. Uh, uh, blackmail. Oh. Hello. I want to... Uh, 
Yes, yes, Sergeant. The name is Hugo Comstock, and I'm making this complaint on the behalf of my niece, Miss Ella Comstock. The name of the offender is Samuel Spade, a private detective. Huh? Well, of course I'm sure. Yes, I'm holding him at his apartment now. The address is... Uh... Oh, you have it. Well, I'm not surprised. You better hurry over here. Right away. He's threatening violence. You really think you can make that stick? Mr. Spade, I'm sure I can. Dirty words and foul imprecations were forming on my trembling lips. But he had letters from his niece to one Sam, a great, big, beautiful detective. And I had the jewels, and before the night was over, Sergeant Walsh, you had me. Booked, bothered, and bewildered. What bewildered me was how to raise the $2,500 bail. Sam Spade, innocent dope. I mean dupe. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Up the times into my breakfast of rude prison fare. They didn't serve any rye crisp, but what they did serve was even less fattening. I thrust my emaciated arms through the bars of my cell and clawed at the lapels of a passing bondsman and begged him for sucker. He says I didn't need any because I was it. I hurled him aside and sat down to think. About then, you, Sergeant Walsh, hold through in front of my cell. Okay, Sam, get moving. You're free. Gee, thanks. Who stood my bail? Great kidder, aren't you? Sergeant, am I to understand that the charges have been dropped? Get out of here. All right, I know when I'm not wanted. Mine, not the reason why. And don't come back. Your inhospitable words cut me to the quick, Sergeant, but I bit my lips, swallowed my pride, very low calorie, and strode bravely out into the sunlight, a free man. I fought until I bought a newspaper. Right there on page one, it said, Heiress reveals secret marriage to private detective. Blackmail charges against Sam Spade dropped. All a mistake, says Uncle. Next to the item was a picture of Ella leaning over a hot stove in my kitchen. It was captioned, Surprise bride prepares breakfast for incarcerated mate. We'll keep things hot for him, says Mrs. Spade. Sam, darling, your breakfast is ready. I'm on a diet. Take off that apron and sit down. I did it for your sake, Sam, darling. Wouldn't it have been simpler just to have dropped the charges? Oh, it wasn't difficult. The nicest man forged the license and the certificate for only $10. I know a guy who would have done it for five and thrown in some fingerprints for free, but that's not the point. But, darling, don't you see? If you'd just gone free without being married to me, Uncle Hugo might have done something worse to you. Like kill you. Nuts. Who are these ex-admirers of yours who are supposed to have been knocked off by your uncle? Name three. Well, there was Ralph Bettinson. He died of vapor lock. Of what? It happened in the mountains. Something went wrong with his car, but they couldn't prove it because it blew up and burned after it went over the cliff. Hmm. And then there was poor Freddie Push. They called him the piggy bank suicide. Why? They found five dollars worth of pennies in his stomach. Oh. And then there was poor Nicky Nato. He was a ballet dancer. That's and... enough. Now about those letters. Why was your friend Mason returning love letters you'd written to some detective named Sam? Well, that was just coincidence. He always went by his initials, you know, like GBS for George Bernard Shaw, SAM is for Stuart Andrew Mason. Stuart Andrew is his pen name. He writes detective stories. And the rest of the coincidence was that that love letter you inadvertently mailed to Sam Spade Detective, thereby sending your uncle out gunning for Sam instead of S.A.M.? What could I do after he read my diary and my confessions to myself about S.A.M. and the references to his brilliant mind on criminal subjects? Well, you were a natural stand-in for S.A.M. Pronounced S.A.P. But I wasn't going through with it, Sam. Not after I met you. Why not? Because the moment I saw you, I, I knew that all those things I'd said in that love letter were really true. Really? Last night was so beautiful? Oh, I think I... I think I must have dreamed of you. Exactly. Oh, Sam, darling, I, I'm so lost and frightened. Tell me. You don't know what my life has been. Oh, I can imagine. Boyfriends dropping dead right and left. You're the only one who can stop it. If Uncle Hugo thinks we're really married and he can't use my money anymore, then he'll stop having accidents happen to people. Won't you please be my husband, Sam? Is that so much to ask after what I did for you? Yeah. Uh, go on. You spring me out of that blackmail frame so I can help you compound a felony. But, Sam, what am I going to do? You forge the marriage, go forge a divorce. <laughs> Where are you going? Back to jail. I'll see you there. Ow! Oh! oh, dear me. Hit your foot, did it? Cast iron. 
Don't make them like that nowadays. My foot. Eh? Your foot. I meant the strong box. Oh. Oops. Uh, coming in or going out? I think I'll sit down for a minute. Oh, Sam, you poor dear boy. Here, let me take off your shoes so it can swell if it wants. Get away from me. I only wanted to help. I love you. Well, I don't love you anymore. Oh, ho, ho. first little spat, is it? Who is this guy? Oh, Sam, I'm sorry. This is Curtin. You can say that again. Curtin's. Harwood L. Curtin's L. for Lacey, attorney at law. I represent the estate of the late Gertrude Comstock, Ella's mother. Uh, you, Mr. Spade, have married into, uh, shall we say, money. Look, Curtis, it's time to raise the blinds on a couple of things. In the first place... Please. I... As you know, Ella, your grandfather, the late Commodore Ezra Comstock, uh, left his fortune to be divided equally between his legitimate heirs, that is, your mother and your uncle Hugo. Upon your mother's death, the residue of her part of the estate was left to be administered by your uncle Hugo as he saw fit until your marriage. At which time it should go to you. Well, where is it? Yeah. All in good legal time. First, here is this old strong box. You mean strong box? <sighs> Containing family mementos handed down to you from your grandmother. <clears throat> it was your mother's wish that this be delivered into your hands upon this uh, auspicious occasion. <clears throat> Here is the key, in addition to which, I leave with you both my best wishes for your future happiness. Good day. Uh, Mr. Spade, I shall forward along to you the statement of my fees for services in this case. Wait a minute. Who's paying my fee? No more questions, please. Good day. Well, I guess we might as well open it. Oh, I'm sleepy. Oh, no. Let's see what's in here. All right, let's... It didn't take long to go through Grandma Comstock's mementos, and I got more and more wide awake as we went along. The strong box contained four items. A teapot, a bundle of letters, a photograph album, and a family skeleton. The letters were love letters from one Elmo Pinckney. There was a tin type of said Pinckney in the album. He was a dead ringer for Uncle Hugo, which might have been a coincidence, but wasn't. I started scanning through the love letter. Find any money yet? Huh? Well, there's a Confederate ten spot. I'll let you know if I hit any pay dirt. Well, at least she left me a pot to make tea in. What? But if there wasn't any money, why wouldn't Uncle Hugo let me get married? Now, look, why don't you go and wash out that pot and make some tea, huh? Probably leave. Oh, something in it. Hmm? No money. The grandmother's marriage certificate and the mother's and Uncle Hugo's birth certificate. Let's see those. Oh, crap. I might have known. I wonder who that is. That will be your Uncle Hugo. Well, that doesn't need to worry us anymore, does it? Yeah, put these things back in the teapot and put the teapot on the mantelpiece. But it's cracked. So am I, so do it anyway. Come right in, Uncle Hugo. You too, Cousin Riley, you fool. Very funny. Now, now, don't be silly, Riley. Mother, accept your poor old uncle's blessing on this happy occasion. I don't want your blessing, Uncle Hugo. You're a mean old man, and you killed all my fiancés. Well, it appears that Mr. Curtins has already brought you a legacy. I believe I recognize your grandmother's strongbox. Mementos of a strange romantic chapter in the history of a great family, Mr. Spade. You, who have joined that family so uh, unexpectedly, will have a privilege that even I was never granted. Oh, how come? My mother was a strange woman in some ways. I'm sure she was. I suppose we shall never know what prompted her to leave these personal allotments to Ella's mother, nor why my late sister chose to keep their contents a secret from me. I... <laughs> I don't suppose I might be allowed to just a peek into that Pandora's box. Go ahead. Help yourself. Really? Well, uh, <laughs> there's nothing but a photograph album and a bundle of letters. Love letters, Uncle Hugo. They seem to run in your family. Would you like to read them? You, uh, you have no objection, Ella. Me? Why should she have? And I can give the whole story to you in a nutshell, Uncle Hugo. It seems that Grandma Comstock fell in love with a handsome rascal named Pinckney, a deserter from the Confederate Army, and eloped with him to New Orleans. Her family pursued her there, had Pinckney arrested, got an annulment, and whisked her back home in time for her scheduled wedding to Ezra Comstock. These letters were written to her by Pinckney while he languished in prison awaiting court-martial. Here's the last one. Read it for yourself. Oh. Lydia, my darling, in a few hours I face a firing squad. Please, no tears, no regrets. I'm glad that you are married to a man who is worthy of you. Comstock will be a better father for our child than I would ever have been. Farewell, my love. Huh. So that was a secret. Nothing so extraordinary about that. Oh, I think it's very tragic. 
think of her married to a man she didn't love about to have a child. And her lover facing a fire in squad. Nonsense. Sentimental nonsense. Well, what do you know about such things? I should know a little. After all, I was that child. Oh, I'm sorry, Uncle Hugo. I... Ah, wow. Fine old piece of spoon. What? This teapot. I don't remember seeing this here before. Uh, just something I picked up in a junk shop. Uh, it's a very rare piece. Do you mind if I look at the mark? Go ahead. Ah, indeed. A genuine example. Pity it's cracked. Oh, oh! Now, that was clumsy of me. Well, there's no good saving the pieces. I'll just toss them in the fire. Wait a minute, Comstock. I'll take care of it. Oh, it's no trouble. Well, well, what's this? It's uh, your birth certificate, Uncle Hugo. You got it. Oh, no. What are you going to do with it? Put it back where it came from. Roddy. Yeah, Mr. Comstock. Spade, I'm going out of here, and I'm taking that strong box with me. And don't think I won't kill you to get it. He will, Sam, just as he did the other. And you, too, if you don't shut your trap. Hand it over, Spade. Sure. Come and get it. Okay, let's have it. There you are. Ah! Riley, what's wrong with you? Oh, my foot is broken. Oh! Sit down and rest it. Oh! Uh Hold it, Comstock. I've got the gun now. Well, Spade, seems you've won the day. How does it feel to be a rich man? You'll have to tell me, Comstock. The reports of my marriage to your niece are slightly exaggerated. And that's about it, Sergeant. I'm sorry I can't furnish you with the forged papers Ella used to back up that phony story of her marriage to me. A fire broke out in the wastebasket, and I accidentally dropped him into it. As for Comstock and his Gunzel Riley, I will gladly press charges against them on the blackmail frame until Homicide decides whether it has a case against him on the mysterious deaths of Ella's previous fiancés. Period. End of report. But, Sam, why? Why what if? Did he want that old cracked teapot? Well, because Grandmother's love letters plus the documents on that teapot prove that Hugo was not a Comstock but a Pinkney and hence not entitled to one red penny of the Comstock fortune, which was left, if you recall, to Grandpa's legitimate heir. Well, who was? Entitled, I mean. Ella. But if she never married, she'd never find out, you Well, see. she doesn't deserve it. Mm-hmm. After making a pigeon out of you the way she did. I agree, sweetheart. But how else could she afford to pay my fee? Well, I certainly hope you so, Chris. I fully intend to. Go type that up while I falsify an expense account. No, still a couple of fingers in there. Break out another glass. Oh, no, I meant the expense account. Oh, that. Well, it was nothing much. Just bus fare. Uh, free breakfast in the pokey? Nah, no, that would be the sign. Well, I took the liberty, Sam, of drawing up a statement. Did you look it over? Yeah. Hmm. New letterhead. Well, it's only a sample I had done in uh, sending your approval. Do you? Well, uh, yes, yes. Very classy. I like the coat of arms, but I'm not quite sure about the motto. Oh, but Sam, you are the greatest private detective of them all. Well, <laughs> you know best, Effie. And then, for an extra dollar a hundred, we could have it printed in Rady Ink. In what? Luminous Ink, Sam. Shines in the dark. Even as you and I. Oh, Sam. I'm glad you're still a bachelor. Go home. All the same. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Private Detective, is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Quote the Raven, nevermore. Yes. This is me. Is this Mr. Spade? Yes, but is this Miss Perrine? Oh, yes, but... Why are you eating a peanut butter sandwich at this time of night? Why the illusion to pose Raven? Was your assignment among the literati? It certainly was. There was uh, Rowena from Ivanhoe, a lost Lenore, a no-place Ralph, and a Boris from the Karloff of the same name. Oh, how distinguished. Have you got a cold, F? No. Well, uh, then there was a carnivorous plant, a hideous meat-eating specimen of the botanical world, trying to take two fingers off me. <gasps> well, I've got three fingers all poured out for you here. Ah, oh, pretty hep. I can see you intend to be terribly amusing tonight. But even so, I intend to come right down and dictate my report on the stopped watch caper or time stood still. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, Join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Well, in a few weeks, many of us will be going bareheaded now and then, meaning we'll have to pay more attention than ever to the appearance of our hair. The best way I know to always keep your hair in trim is to use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, removes loose dandruff, and relieves dryness which may be even more prevalent when your hair is exposed directly to the wind and sun. So, right away, get the 25-cent get-acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Mighty sharp routine you give a purring on the phone. Where's Effie? Who are you? Sam, don't you remember me? Buffy! Certainly not. I never saw... Buffy, Buffy, wait a minute. Do I uh, sense a certain family resemblance? No, you can't be Effie's little sister, Buffy. Yes. The girl now. But thanks, anyway, for the tinker toys you sent me last Christmas. I'd kill myself. (laughs) I intend to start having children of my own just as soon as it's practical. Hmm. Where's Eff, Buff? She had to go to L.A. to visit a sick friend. A likely story. No, really. Chapter and verse, please. St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank. They went to school together, and her name is Lorene Tuttle. She's an actress. Yes, I know. A very fine actress. Is it serious? I hope not for Effie's sake. They're very close. Yeah. Well, uh, what now? Uh, you uh, take shorthand, Buff? Sort of. Spoken like a true perine. Come on in. Well, I hope it's good and gruesome. <coughs> I take it back. I meant the caper, not what you're drinking. Okay, Buff, you win. Ready? <laughs> Why not? Uh, date April 10, 1949, to uh, Deputy Sheriff Bill Woodington, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California, from Samuel Spade, license number... Uh... 137596. Oh, steady listener. Uh, subject, the stopped watch caper. Dear Bill... Here's how it turned out. And if I ever phone you for advice again, I'll take it because you were right. She was loaded. What about those threatening letters, Sam? Don't give another thought. Old Lady Raven has had me up there a dozen times the last six weeks. She got threatening letters, she got prowlers, but when I got there, she can't find the letters, and the way that house is tucked away in the woods, I don't think a prowler could find it. How do I find it, Bill? Huh? Well, the Gray Line bus goes right by the gate. Mount Tama Palais Road, about three miles this side of Rock Spring. Well, that sounds pretty rugged. You, uh, say she's a crank. But she's got money, Sam. Oh, the poor old soul. And she got a niece. Oh? Yeah. Over 23, but she's stacked. Hmm, the old lady's loaded, the niece is stacked. Who else lives there? Well, there's a butler. Somebody flattened his head when he was young, and he wears bangs to call attention to it. 
Throw the shuffles around the house. You ought to see them out in the woods chasing them old ground squirrels. Quick as a deer hound. Yeah, and, 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 and Never mind, never mind. You sold me. All these marvels I have got to see. It was only 3 in the p.m. when I skulked in through the gates of Ravenswood, but it was so dark the hootie owls hadn't gone to bed yet. The fog snaked in and out through the dripping trees, long, chill ribbons of ghastly fog borne on a sobbing wind. I mushed on into the deepening gloom of the forest primeval. After 10 minutes of that, I began to wonder if there was any house there. When I saw it, I still wondered. It looked more like a fungus growth. Speak of English? It is chilly, isn't it, sir? Won't you come in? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I expected that. If you'll be so kind as to wait here, sir, I'll inform Miss Rowena of your arrival. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny Stewart. Forrest, who's out there? Is it the man with the hemlock? Answer me, you brute! I... Oh, where is it? Did you say Hamlock? Oh, you must be my aunt's detective. Spade, was it? It is, right. I'm Ralph Raven. Come along with me, Spade. I have something interesting to show you. Ralph Raven was the one member of the household you hadn't described to me, and no wonder. The wasted figure that looked up at me from the wheelchair was more like a ghost than a man. His face was chalk white. So white it seemed almost luminous, and the skin clung so close to his skull there seemed to be no flesh beneath it. And his wide, staring eyes looked like two cups of black coffee on a snow-white tablecloth. I followed him into a glass-enclosed room, only slightly larger than the garden court at the plaza. The humidity was several points higher than the dripping woods, and the temperature was several degrees lower. But the plants he had growing there seemed to thrive on it. As I edged nervously through the dense, quivering foliage, I noticed a strange-looking yellow-green pod about the size of a milk bottle at the end of a long, tubular stem. It leaned over, opened its red mouth, and said, Hey, what is that thing? Oh, that's my Sarantinia gigantosa. Meat eater. Carnivorous plant. Don't be frightened. I just fed it. Uh, don't tell me. You know what it eats? Uh, acts like it needs a dose of bicarb. No, perfectly healthy. Merely part of the digestive process. Even as you and I. Not me. But over here... You're a detective. These plants should interest you. Oh, oh, don't touch that mandrake. Never thought of it. It won't cry out. No vocal cords. Oh, I see. Very sensitive. Oh, sensitive. And deadly poison. Oh. And, and see here, these pretty purple blossoms? Yes, very pretty. Source of an alkaloid poison favored by the Borgias. And these, white hellebore. Watch your language. I use it in compounding veratria. A poison so ancient it would probably go undetected in the police laboratories of today. Mm -hmm. And here, here's a charming one. Both a killer and a medicine. Belladonna, or deadly nightshade, source of atropine. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, commonly known as Nux Vomica, well. produces not one but two deadly poisons. The well-known strychnine and the rare and not easily detectable Brucey. Yeah, well, it's uh, quite a hobby, Mr. Ray. Well, it's uh... not a mere hobby, Mr. Spade. It's a practical science. All the plants in this conservatory have their fatal properties, and all have played a role in the great times of history. Did my aunt get another threatening letter? So she says. Odd that she should fear death at her age, and odd that she should hire a bodyguard. How does she know how it'll come? It might be poison. Speaking of poison, brother dear, it's time for your medicine. Oh, Spade, my sister, the lost Lenore. How do you do, Mr. Spade? How do you do? Here, Ralph, drink up. Why does it always have to be in milk? And look here, it's not time anyway. Oh, it's confounded. Watch it stopped again. Spade, what time do you have? Why, it's uh, three. Uh... Oh, that's funny. My watch has stopped too. I didn't know then what that meant. In fact, if you look on the last page of this report, Deputy Dear, you'll see that the stopped watch was the key to the whole puzzle. I protest that my failure to realize its significance at that moment had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that my client's niece, Lenore Raven, was, as you so roguishly put it, sacked. 
About there, uh, Boris the butler bobbed up and beckoned me from the balustrade. I followed him upstairs and was ushered into the austere and regal presence of my client, Rowena Raven. That would be all, Boris. Yes, madam. Oh, Boris, I just remembered. Yes, madam. There on the occasional table, my watch. I want you to take it around to the watchmakers in the morning. It's on the fritz again. Yes, madam. Mr. Spade, I must apologize for keeping you waiting. Oh, it's all right. My watch hasn't been keeping proper time ever since those threatening letters started. Could that be a clue, Mr. Spade? Uh, maybe we'd better start with the letters, Mrs. Raven. I can't find them anywhere. I think that young man from the sheriff's office must have pinched him. Bill Woodington? Oh, I'm sure not. Well, all the same, it's very odd that every time he comes here, he can't find them. Uh, well, where did you put them, Mrs. Raven? Right there on the occasional table. Yeah, well, uh, Mrs. Raven, sometimes uh, people have very vivid dreams. Huh? It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with their minds or anything like that. You but... talk just like Dr. Slosser. That young sawbones my niece sent around looked my sciatica. Sciatica is nothing but a pain. How can you look at it? It's a lot of bull. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do the letters say, uh, Mrs. Raven? That's why I wondered about my watch, Mr. Spade. The letters always contain some reference to time. Your time is running out. Beware when time moves slowly. Soon it may stop altogether. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. You think there could be a connection? I mean, has someone been tampering with my watch? The repairman doesn't know what's causing it to lose. Yeah, did he think it might have been tampered with? No. He thought it was something in the mountain. Magnetism or something. Well, that sounds logical. That's now, a lot of hooey. I lived here 40 years and my watch never lost a minute. Something in the mountain, my eye. Something in this house, more like, or somebody. You ask me, he's not half so sick as he pretends to be. Your nephew? Uh-huh. What do you think? Well, I think he's a very sick man. No wonder. Sitting in that damp conservatory day after day, pattering over those fiendish poisonous plants. You see the one that eats mice and hamburgers? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, what's supposed to be the matter with your nephew, Mrs. Raven? Oh, he was in an auto accident. Injured his neck. He had to remove part of a gland or something. His neck. But Dr. Slosser says he's in good condition aside from that. And if he takes his medicine faithfully, there's no reason why he should... Come in! Ah, Mrs. Raven, how is that pain this afternoon? Worse, thank you. Dr. Slosser, this is Mr. Spade. Ah, Yes. The detective you engaged to investigate those uh, letters you've been receiving? Mr. Spade thinks it's an inside job, don't you, Mr. Spade? Uh, well, that depends on what you mean by an inside job. There, you see? Inside that romantic imagination of yours, my dear lady. Hold still now oh, while I give you your shot. I loathe being jabbed. Well, now, that wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, uh, can I work how, on? How is Ralph getting on, Doctor? Not well, I'm afraid. He doesn't uh, seem to be responding to the... the uh, Mrs. Raven, what is it? Uh, poison! You poison me! Uh! The cry she uttered was only half as terrible as the expression on her pain-contorted face. She pitched forward on her chair with both fists clenched and shaking as if in anger at the doctor standing before her. He put down the empty hypodermic on the occasional table. Yeah. Help me carry it to the couch. Yeah, sure. The, take away that pillow. Oh. She must lie perfectly flat. Uh, there. That's better now. Uh, She's relaxing. I'm dying. There was poison in that needle. Please, Mrs. Raven. It was only sedative. Um, to make you sleep. Sleep. The time is running out. The poor woman. Malignant condition. Only a matter of time. Does she know? That she has only a short time to live? Oh, yes. Well, I have another call. Do, do you have the time my watch seems to stop? Another one? I beg your pardon? Uh, nothing. I left my watch at home. Oh. Ludwig. Well, I... Ludwig, something terrible Shh. is happening. Your aunt is sleeping. You'd better come down to the conservatory right away. Ralph is in terrible pain. What kind of pain? He keeps saying he... He's been poisoned. What? Well, come along. Take that hypo to the kitchen door and sterilize it. Where is it? On the table there. I... He stopped on his tracks. His mouth fell open and he gave to the tabletop where he put down the hypodermic. In its place, it appeared two items. An old-fashioned lady's watch and a note written in green ink. The note said, time must have a stop. 
I picked up the watch and held it to my ear. You guessed it. It wasn't ticking. I had a hunch my client wasn't either. And I was right. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the stopped watch keeper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Ralph? Ralph, where are you? Where did you leave? Oh, oh. Hey, wait. Oh. Over here. Oh, Spade. Keep them away from me. Ralph, I came as soon as I could. T- tell me your symptoms. No. I phoned for another doctor. He's on his way now. Spade, my aunt. Take me to her. I must tell her. Tell her what? I'm afraid we have some bad news for you, Ralph. Your aunt is dead. Oh, so you poisoned her, too. Oh, Ralph, you're sick. You don't know what you're saying. She's been to every specialist in the country. They all said the same thing. They all said she was good for another three months. My dear boy, in these cases, any doctor's guess is as bad as the next. No. Oh, please, Ralph, you're very sick. Please let Ludwig examine you. If it's what you think, the other doctor may be too late. <laughs> Why not? Why should I fear death? <laughs> That's better. Now let me see your eyes. Uh-huh. So. So. Open the mouth. So. What is it? What is it? He's right. It is poison. You see? You, you know, see? my dear. Yes? When you sterilized that needle for Ralph shot this morning, did you pick up the wrong bottle? Of course not. Strange. It's very strange. But don't worry, Ralph. There's a very simple antidote. Oh, thank heaven. You should, my dear. Indeed, you should. <laughs> that was that, Deputy Deer. Two doctors in the county coroner took one look at my late client's medical history and decided on death due to natural causes. I didn't think so, and neither did you. So there really were threatening letters? I saw one. You sure now, Sam? Sure, I'm sure. Where'd you say it was? On the occasional table. Yeah. What was it doing when it wasn't a table? Not occasionally, occasional. Oh, just any old table. No, Bill, now, Bill, get this. It's real deep. An occasional table is a table that a woman picks up at a bargain and puts into a room under the mistaken impression that it may come in handy someday. Mrs. Raven used hers as a catch-all for her unanswered correspondence, threatening letters included. And what happened to the one you saw? I don't know. I put it right here in my coat pocket along with a watch. It just disappeared. Well, that might be tampering with evidence. Listen, Bill, things were disappearing from that table almost as fast as other things showed up. Yeah. Yeah, sounds like pack rat. You follow that up, Bill. I'm going to pack up and rat out of here. Now look, Sam. My client's dead. It's officially okay. I haven't made a penny out of the caper, and now I'm not likely to. So do you give me a lift back to the toll gate, or do I hitchhike? There's your answer. Come on. When we reached the second bedroom, whence the scream had come, we found the lost Lenore looking well found and something comfortable. She's standing center stage, regarding herself with horror in a full-length mirror. She looks awful pale, Bill. You better get downstairs and get some ice water. She might faint. You think so? Yeah, hurry up. I'll stay here and keep up her circulation in case anything happens. Yeah, you're right. Beat it. Oh, oh, it's you, Sam. I thought... You thought what? Look. Look, I found these on my pillow. Mm. 
One watch, one threatening letter. Whose watch? Mine. I left it on the dressing table when I went in to cream my face. I came out, somebody had slipped this under it. On the dressing table? No, under my pillow. You said on your pillow. I meant under. I mean on. I don't know what I mean. What are you trying to do to me? Just trying to get things straight. But the note. Look at it. It's exactly the same as the one he left in my aunt's room. Why do you say he? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. It's because I don't trust Ludwig. Dr. Schlosser. That figures he doesn't trust you either. But he pretended to think I might have picked up the wrong bottle. Mm. Oh, he was acting. Couldn't you see? You're not doing a bad job yourself. I'm not acting. Not anymore. Listen to me. Listen. He's acted strangely ever since I foolishly said I'd marry him. I would myself. Oh, Sam, darling, don't joke. I don't mean like that. How did you meet him? He, he got me out of a jam once. The accident. Oh, well, my brother was hurt. I went for a doctor and he happened to be the nearest one. Well, I'd been drinking and he took over and he sent me home before the police arrived at the scene. Didn't Ralph know? He blanked out. He doesn't know to this day. Ludwig never forgot. He forced me to recommend him to my aunt. He got into her good graces, practically moved into the house. Then he pretended to make love to me. Pretended? He didn't care about me till he found out about my aunt, didn't have long to live. He knew half her money would come to me. Sam, do you think he poisoned my aunt? Officially, she died from natural causes. But you said she spoke about being poisoned. And Ralph, too. What's that medicine you give him in milk? I don't know. It's... it's... Prescription, just some drops that come in a in a metal container. Where do you keep those drops? Here. Here in my room. I have to hide them. They make Ralph feel so much better. He used to overdose when the doctor trusted him to dose himself. Let me see that medicine. It's just here in this cabinet. Here it is. It's right. Don't tell me. It's empty. There, there was a glass bottle inside the container. Mm, small but heavy. Lead yet. Hey, what are you doing with that gadget? The thing with the dials and the speedometer. Oh, that, that, that's something medical. I have to make a test on Ralph every day to see how he's getting along. Do you know what that actually is? Yes, I do. It, it detects anemia. Well, I wouldn't know about that, but a Geiger counter is generally used to detect something else. Well, what, what, what are you going to do with it? I'm going prospecting for that missing medicine. Ah, there you are. I've been looking everywhere for you. I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Lenore. Well? My diagnosis was correct. Pernicious anemia. Dead. What is that you are carrying, Mr. Spade? Oh, uh, nothing special, doctor. Just an old Geiger counter. Lenore, did you let him take it? He said he was going to use it to find Ralph's medicine. What happened to Ralph's medicine? I don't know. It's just gone. Mr. Spade, that machinery is my property. I must ask you to hand it over. No gun necessary, doctor. Here, take I'll it. Take your gun, too, sir. Lenore, carry the machine this way. Walk ahead of us. First, we try the conservatory. He was an amateur with a gun, but I didn't jump him for it because I'm an amateur with a Geiger. I did notice that the indicator on the dial got nervous the minute we walked into the conservatory. Ralph Raven's body was still in the wheelchair, no paler in death than in life. His sightless eyes were fixed on that obscene plant. The plant looked sick, too. It was drooping, and his red mouth was hanging open. As we walked past the wheelchair, the indicator on the dial of the Geiger counter moved forward and then slipped back again. Then it took a sudden big jump. Ah, so that was his hiding place. The maw of that disgusting carnivorous plant. Well, it's not pleasant, but there's only one way to get it. Don't move, either one of you. My eye is on you. Yes. Yes, it's here. At first, I thought the plant had bitten him. But then he pulled his hand out, and I saw what had happened. There was a hypodermic outfit stuck in the heel of his hand. It surprised him no end, but he still managed to hold on to that gun. He swung it away from me and was holding it on Lenore. You... You knew? No. No, I didn't. You must have. Ralph knew. He must have told you. No, I swear he didn't. What do you think I did this for? You... To die and leave you behind. To enjoy the money I got for you. No, you will come with me. Oh, no, you don't know what you're doing. There's someone Shut right... Shut up. Here. What are you looking at? What's behind me? Don't bother to rush him, Sam. I've got it. Hold it, Bill. Yeah. How's that for shooting, Sam? Yeah. You find a bullet hole in him, Bill, and I'll call it good. Good. <laughs> 
And that, Deputy Deer, is the crop. And it's all carnivorous. In case you're still wondering what dropped him when your shots missed, it was the poison in that hypodermic needle which Ralph had planted there for that very purpose and then baited the trap of the all-important missing medicine. Later on, I learned that what the doctor had been feeding him was the right medicine for what ailed him, an isotope of iodine. It seems it's radioactive like uranium, but if you take too much of it, you die. Not of poisoning, but of pernicious anemia, which is how the doctor planned for Ralph to die. It also magnetizes watches so they don't keep the right time. And if they're cheap ones, like mine, they may stop altogether. Uh, period, and a report. Got all that, Buffy? Mm-hmm. I got it, Sam. But I don't get it. Uh, Buffy, people have studied all their lives to learn about atomic stuff like isotopes, and you expect me to teach you everything in one easy lesson. Oh, no, Sam, I know about that. But who killed who? Whom, dear? The doctor killed everyone, but Ralph loaded the needle. And they were accomplices? No, Buff, get this. It's real shallow. Ralph knew there was no way in the world to prove that the doctor was killing him and hastening his aunt's demise. So he saw to it that she got a dose of detectable poison and did himself the same favor. Oh. Now, uh, like a good girl, go type that up, hmm? And now, listen to this. More and more millions agree every day. Wild Root Cream Oil has become America's favorite hair tonic because of the neat, natural way it grooms the hair. Because of the quick, easy way it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Get non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with lanolin right away. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. I certainly hope that butler was brought to justice. What for, his dialect? Oh, for helping to deliver the threatening letters and then stealing off the occasional table. A brilliant deduction. How did you deduce? Sam, that's for kids. <laughs> if Ralph was too ill to walk, then somebody had to push him upstairs in the wheelchair. Well, wouldn't it have been easier just to carry him? That's how he did it? Or uh, just go up himself? That's how. Possibly, and then again, we may never know. But uh, do we care? Hmm? Yes. I hate loose ends, Sam. Then keep it up. <gasps> Good night, Sam. Spoken like a true perine, so I'll say to you, good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. To Dr. Ludwig Zoya, 1241 Leavenworth, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. 
Subject, Edith Hamilton. No caper? No caper. Dear doctor, if I owe you an apology for not keeping you informed on the progress of the assignment and for letting it drag on as long as it has, then I'll have to go on owing you, which makes us even because you don't owe me anything. The start of it was a month ago. 32 days, 8 hours, 3 minutes, and 45 seconds, to be exact. Ah, uh, Mr. Spade. Dr. Zoya. Good, good to see you. Let me think. Uh, how long is it? Uh, three years since I visited your office. That was when you were my leading suspect in the Denov case. Ah, uh, yes. Poor Denov. Uh, it was he who pointed out that we psychoanalysts are not unlike you detectives. Uh-huh. We probe, we question, we follow up clues in order to find out what is the dark secret which has nervously disturbed the human mind. <laughs> but we are limited. We have only our patients' words and our interpretations. Sometimes that is not enough. And that is why I need your help in this particular case. What case is that, Dr. Sorry? Uh, please do not interrupt the free flow of my thoughts. Pardon me. Naturally, my ego feels a certain resentment against my id for asking you for your help. What makes me think I need a detective? Well, uh, my head was just asking my ego the very same question. Oh, you too feel resentment. We must analyze that later. Bring yes. me your dream material. Right, well, well. Now, now, now to the case. Oh, yes, okay. This woman was referred to me by her physician. She has suffered a complete nervous collapse because she thought she recognized a certain person crossing the street, a person she had not seen for years. Who was that? My patient's son died under mysterious circumstances three years ago, and the woman she thought she saw was her Mm daughter-in-law. It was widely reported in the newspapers at the time. Perhaps you remember it. Carter Hamilton? Carter Hamilton. Oh, Roanoke, Virginia, Mm -hmm. 1946. The uh, mother accused the son's wife of murdering him. Daughter-in-law was hauled up before the grand jury, but not indicted. Dropped right out of sight uh, afterwards. Good, you know that case. Well, actually... My patient is suffering from an agonizing sense of guilt. Unconsciously, she thinks that she herself murdered her son. Did she? Well, there may be something tangible at the bottom of so profound a feeling of guilt. You mean you want me to help you convince her that she really is guilty? No, 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 no. That is for me. But first, we must find out. What we must find out is somebody else, whether they are guilty. What? Go all the way to Virginia, solve a crime that's been off the books for three years? No, 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 no. The daughter-in-law is actually here in San Francisco. Well, if I remember right, uh, she wasn't the only suspect. Well, whether she is innocent or guilty is of no importance. It is only important that we know. What? Excuse me. Yes, Miss Case. Mrs. Hamilton is here, Dr. Zoya. Oh, oh, good, Miss Case. Send her in. Uh, This is my case. I I mean, my my, my patient. I want you to meet her. Uh, Oh, Good afternoon, Mrs. Hamilton. Good afternoon, Doctor. The woman who stood framed in the doorway was a tall, commanding figure, impeccably dressed in black, with an easy hundred grand worth of black pearls wound around her neck and a black veil covering her face. She walked in ahead of you, displaying not a sign of nervousness, and stopped directly in front of me. Very deliberately, she lifted the veil, revealing a youthfully old face, deeply tanned and set off by snow-white hair. Only her enormous violet eyes showed any expression. She stared at me for what seemed like a full minute. Yes, you do. You look like the other one. Uh, Well, perhaps you had better explain, Mrs. Hamilton. My daughter-in-law, Edith, was very much in love with another man before she married my son, Carter. He jilted her. Carter was second choice. It was I who talked her into marrying him. That's why I'll never rest until my son's death is avenged. Ah, we must analyze this desire for vengeance. Oh, yes. Yes, I had a dream last night. I dreamed that Edith was dead, stabbed with the same bone-handled hunting knife she used to kill my son. Oh, yes, yes. Well, no, no, no. You just lie down on the couch and relax, Mrs. Hamilton. I'll be with you in a moment. Come, Mr. Speaking. This is the most disturbing new development, her dream. You must get to that girl as soon as possible. Her life may be in danger. You mean the old lady is mixed up enough to take a shot at her? Here. Here is the address. And take this briefcase. Why the briefcase? Well, there are legal papers in it regarding the Hamilton estate. They require her signature. I had Mrs. Hamilton arrange for you to take them to her instead of the attorney. Uh, I'm supposed to pose as a lawyer. While I'm there, I'm supposed to shake a confession out of her. And while I'm typing it up, I'm a bodyguard. You're getting a lot for your money, Dr. Zoya. I 
I spent the next hour or so in a newspaper morgue briefing myself on the old Hamilton case. The victim, Carter Hamilton, was the 28-year-old tail end of an old Virginia family whose blood was as rich as it was blue. The accounts of the killing were sketchy. At the old plantation, Carter Hamilton had been found one morning by his mother dead in bed of a stab wound. The knife was never turned up. Somebody had wiped everything in the room clean of fingerprints, which sounded like robbery until it was established that nothing was missing. The state was counting heavily on Mrs. Hamilton Sr.'s testimony in their case against the daughter-in-law, but an odd angle I'd forgotten. The old lady had clammed up in front of the grand jury, and the case was dropped for lack of evidence. Then there was a picture. She was the kind of a girl who looks her best in a riding outfit with her freckles showing, and then surprises you by looking even better in full makeup with her shoulders showing. Candid is the word that best describes her features. Large, widely spaced eyes, a generous mouth, and an expression of unaffected sincerity. It was with a certain reluctant eagerness that I kicked myself up Stockton Street to Pine, across Pine to Bush, and up three flights of stairs. Yes? Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Edith Hamill? Yes. You must be from the attorneys. They wired me you were coming. Come in. Thank you. Not that I'm in hiding, but I'm curious as to how they got my address. Would you like a drink? Oh, well, not right now. Can I fix you one? In about 20 minutes, maybe. I'm still wondering how... How they I... located you? I, uh... I think the elder Mrs. Hamilton saw you on the streets. Oh, is she here in San Francisco? Yes. Is that so surprising? No, it's a large city. What is surprising is her staying on after learning that I was in town. She's not very well. In fact, I uh, think she's had some kind of a nervous breakdown. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm very fond of her, you know, in spite of everything... No, I didn't know. Uh, maybe I should explain. I'm a private detective local. I was hired here in San Francisco to bring these papers to you. Oh, you found me. I seem to be a little slow in introducing myself. I'm sorry. Sam Spade. Well, if it had to be a detective, I'm glad it's you. But I can't help wondering why they didn't send a lawyer. <laughs> Lawyers cost $50 an hour. I only cost 10 Oh. In the private eye stories, it's always... Twenty-five bucks a day and expenses. I wish those writers would get abreast of the times. I'm sure they'll catch up. But if you're being paid by the hour, perhaps I can keep you here a little longer. I'm glad you said that. You remind me of someone. Pleasantly, I hope. Yes. Oh, yes. And sadly, too. Your husband? If you don't know about that, I hope you'll never find out. I'll leave that up to you. His hair was like yours. He was thinner. And his eyes were blue. Maybe we shouldn't wait till five o'clock for that drink. It was a funny kind of a drink. I'd never been hit by one before, black velvet. After two of them, I even began to hate myself a little less. And after the third, I decided there was some mystical connection between the drink and the color of her eyes. Black velvet. much about music, but the way she went at the piano, you knew she wasn't afraid of it, and probably wasn't afraid of anything. The pieces she played were like her, bold and at the same time delicate, simple but with a web of complexities in the background, brilliant but always colored with sadness. What's the matter? I want you to take me someplace. Where? Any place. Dinner. I don't, I don't care. I... I just want to go someplace with you. With you. Hey. What is it, Sam? I, uh, thought we were going out. I never paid much attention to San Francisco before I met her. It's quite a place. There's a little park up on Russian Hill where you can stand and look out over the houses of the marina to the Golden Gate. 
There's an island in San Francisco even worse than Alcatraz. It's in the middle of the lake at Flyshacker Zoo, and instead of gorillas, the population is nothing but monkeys. There are only two laundries in Chinatown. And out at Golden Gate Park, they have a band concert every Sunday afternoon. Maybe it was just the bright weather, but everything looked clean and shiny, as if somebody had taken a scrubbing brush to all the buildings. We even fed seagulls. At first, she never went any further into her past than the day before yesterday. I couldn't very well charge her for the progress I was not making on the case, so when I learned that you'd sent old Mrs. H. to a nursing home for a two-week rest and Edith did not need bodyguarding for the time being, I took a job that took me down to Los Angeles for a few days. I was awful glad to get back, and not because I don't like L.A., Oh, darling, you were gone so long. Hey, hey, the posies. Oh, don't give them to me. <laughs> well, I like that. This is the last time I make a fool out of myself buying flowers. I'll love them later. Hey, you're trembling. What happened while I was gone? What happened to me happened before you went away. You know that. Sam, while you were gone, I had a lot of time and I did a lot of thinking. And I came to a very important decision. There was something I knew I had to tell you. And I wasn't so sure I could get through it. Oh, well, look, Angel, it sounds serious. I don't think this is the time. Oh, but it is. Yes, it is. Here, take it before I change my mind. What is it? I wrote it all down. Sit here, facing away from the piano. And don't say anything until you've read it through. Oh, well, okay. sentence hit me straight between the eyes. It said, I, Edith Hamilton, of my own free will, make the following confession. It was addressed to the district attorney of Roanoke, Virginia. Dr. Zoya was when I headed back to your office. Not to have my head examined, it was too late for that, but to tell you that I was resigning this caper. On the way, I placed two ads in the classified sections of three papers. One under office space for rent and one under situations wanted. Ex-private detective desires position as night watchman, prison guard, asylum attendant, or any more pleasant line of work. And I really meant it. United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Mr. Spade, what is it? You are disturbed. Disturbed is not the word, Mr. Zoya. Is it because you've been with her a week and a half and there's yet no progress? Let us analyze the situation. The whole setup has been rotten from the beginning. You send me to that girl under false pretenses. You tell me to worm my way into her confidence. Now, one moment. Did I tell you this? How else did you expect me to get a confession out of her? Should have got the play when that old lady said I looked like a man Edith was once in love with. You thought she'd fall for me, didn't you? You thought I'd take advantage of her, didn't you? Well, you could hire somebody else to make love to her. I'm a detective, not a gigolo. So she did make a confession to you. Why do you say that? When a patient comes to a psychoanalyst for help, a situation develops which we call transference. Now, this means that the doctor represents to the patient someone in whom he can confide, to whom he can unburden himself, such as a parent or a loved one. Well, then let's but don't go on with it. Point. No. Well, at the moment, at the moment, that is... What you feel toward me at the moment is what we call negative transference. You wish to continue to make love to her, but you feel guilty about it, so you blame me. Well, what then? What are you driving at? In this love affair of yours, we have a similar situation. Uh, but what she feels for you only resembles love. It is transference. You resemble a former lover. Yeah. And that is why it only took a week and a half for her to reveal everything. Oh, sometimes I think I am too ethical, or too old. Come now, why don't you tell me? You'll feel better. There's nothing to tell. She had it written down. I didn't read past the word confession. Well, what did you do with it? I destroyed it. I see. Well? <laughs> now Miss what? Miss Case, 
Miss Case, Miss Case, what, what is it? Miss Harrelson, she's... It was Mrs. Hamilton, all right. But she didn't look much like the dignified old lady I had met in your office ten days before. Her high-piled white hair was hanging in two ratty pigtails. She was wearing a nurse's cape over a flannel hospital nightgown... And in her hand was a thirty-two caliber gun. Mrs. Hamilton, why did you leave the nursing home? You lied to me, Dr. Sawyer. That place is nothing but an asylum. Well, you know that isn't true. Come, give me the I... gun. You're tired. You must rest. Yes. Now I can rest. I've killed her. What? Well, Miss oh. Casey, she's fainted. Get some water. Let me see that gun. I'm going to Edith's place. Get an ambulance over there and don't stop to analyze anything. <laughs> Edith was slumped forward over the piano keyboard. She was barely breathing. The old lady wasn't much of a hand with a gun. Four of the slugs had punctured the big studio window. One had torn a flesh wound in the shoulder. The other had penetrated the right side, just below the rib cage, and there was not much bleeding at the wound of exit. Her face was pale and the skin cold to the touch. I gambled on a hunch she was suffering mainly from shock, moved her over to a couch, drew a blanket over her, and poured hot coffee into her. After a bit, her color started coming back. Then she opened her eyes. Oh, I thought you went away. I I must have dreamed it. Lie still, Angel. Don't try to talk. Oh, well, that's the... Please, please, don't let them know what happened. Take it easy. It's only the ambulance. I've got to save Mother Hamilton. You see, I've got to get rid of that knife and I can't let it hang I rode in the ambulance with her. She was still unconscious when they carried her into surgery. They told me she was out of danger. When they threw me out that night, I went back to her apartment. What she'd said about saving old Mrs. Hamilton and getting rid of the knife gave me a new slant on that confession I hadn't read. The pieces were still on the floor where I'd thrown them. It took me nearly an hour to put the jigsaw together. And when I did, it was still a puzzle. In her story of that morning three years ago, she confessed to finding the body before the official discovery, to hiding the knife and wiping the doorknobs and surfaces in the death room to get rid of fingerprints. She couldn't remember anything that had happened in the eight hours between 1 a.m. when she had left her husband drinking in the library and gone upstairs to bed, and approximately 9 in the a.m. when she found herself standing over his body with a knife in her hand. I stretched out on the sofa to think it over, and then I drew a blank. Wake up. Uh, what? How did you get in here? Well, I've been reading that so-called confession. Very interesting. We must analyze it. You analyze it. I'm going to call the hospital. I've just come from there. How is she? Uh, physically, nothing serious. Mentally, she's not so good. She keeps asking for you. Yeah? She thinks you can help her. Uh, it's definitely there, the delusion that she's in love with you. What makes you so sure it's a delusion? Uh, don't answer that. When can I see her? Well, it's best that you wait until she comes home. That will be next Tuesday. Look, you're supposed to be a first-class head doctor. Can't you cure this amnesia of Edith's? I thought I explained to you last night when we were discussing transfer. Please, Dr. Zoya, please. I know you mean well, but don't. I beg of you. Well, it's not important. When she gets to know you better, she will realize that her love for you is irrational. And then she will remember everything. I kept myself busy like crazy until Edith checked out of the hospital. There wasn't much talk between us at first. Even her music was reticent, little rambling improvisations that sounded like children's songs or lullabies with something just a little acid mixed with their simplicity. Then as the days went by and her strength and confidence started to return, her music became serene and graceful. It became like her as she sat there at the piano in front of the big window with its afternoon sun streaming down on the San Francisco hilltops, while at the same time the April fog bank started its nightly prowl in through the Golden Gate. And that was like her, too, and like her music. Brilliant, but with a touch of melancholy. And then one day it was all warmth and brilliance, and she was smiling. Sam, 
Yeah, Angel. I remember now. So that's it. I woke up this morning feeling so happy. And then I knew I was on the verge of it. Because I knew that however bad the truth might be, it was worth not remembering. Even if I was a murderer, you'd rather know, wouldn't you? No, no, I wouldn't. Why? I thought I knew you so well. Well, Darling, are you angry? Yeah. But at me? Yes, you. The first time I came here, I tried to give you a fair warning. You should have figured the score when I told you I was a private detective. You'd even read the stories where in the end the detective doesn't have any choice but to turn in the beautiful dame, no matter what his personal feelings are. Maybe you didn't think they were true to life, or maybe you thought I was an exception to the rule because you are. Well, I'm not. Truth is, I was hired to get a confession out of you any way I could, and I think in the back of your mind you'd known it all along. You want to have your confession and eat it, too. You probably learned as a child that it's smarter to tell all and be patted on the back than to be found out and get spanked. How can you be so smug and so self-satisfied and so... Whatever made me think I was in love with you just because you looked a little like someone who I... Zoya was right. Only he thought you were kidding yourself, too. Zoya called it transference. I call it baloney. Goodbye. You come back here. You can't just leave like... And that, Dr. Zoya, is why I never heard a confession that turned into a lover's quarrel. But I understand she paid $25 an hour to rattle it off to you. I have before me your telephonic message. I haven't had time to analyze it, but at first glance, I take it to mean that Edith was innocent of everything except destroying evidence. Motive, to spare her mother-in-law the anguish of knowing that her son was a suicide. I'm sorry, now that I know what her story was, that I didn't stay to hear her tell it. But that, as you would say, is not important. At least I cured her of that love delusion you were so worried about, even though it took a month to do it. Period, and a report. Oh, Sam, sacrificing herself so self-sacrificingly, rather than shatter a mother's delusion. F some other time, huh? I'm sorry, Sam. I'll go type this up. Sam! Where did he go? Sam Spade Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. Sam, where did you go? I'm downstairs in the bar. Well, Sam, there's so much noise on the line, I can't... I'm drowning my sorrows. Well, you don't need to shout. Oh, hold the line a minute. Yes? May I help you? Oh. No, I'm sorry. I was hoping I might find Mr. Spade in. Hello? Oh, would you like to leave a message? Oh, Tell him Edith Hamilton called. Oh. Oh! Yeah, are you still on the phone? Who? Oh, pardon me. Y- yes, dear? What happened? Are you taking a bath? Nothing, nothing at all. One moment, please. Miss Hamilton, I have him on the line. He's, he's downstairs in the bar. And if you'll hurry, you can just catch him, I'm sure. Oh, downstairs? Well, I will hurry. Thank you. You're welcome. Sam... Are you still on the line? What's the matter with you? Nothing, nothing. Just go ahead and drown your sorrows. But don't get loaded. Good night, Sam. Well, uh, good night, sweetheart. I'm going to take piano lessons. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Marine Tuttle is Effie. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Date. Uh, two, Deputy Sheriff Bill Weddington, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California. From Samuel Spade, San Francisco license number, 137596. Subject, The Battles of Belvedere. Dear Bill, by this time I should have known better, and I did. Per square mile, there are more screwballs in your stamping ground across the bay than should happen even to me. But Belvedere Island is very small, and I'd always been very curious about it. I can see it from my office window. A little green hump rising out of the water just around the corner from the Golden Gate Bridge and connected to the mainland by a narrow causeway. But I got there the stylish way. The sign on the dock we made for said Battle Landing. I thought I knew what that meant because my client's name was Jonathan Battle. But I was not quite prepared for the beautiful welcome I got. Golden is the word that best describes her. From the gold sheen of her complexion to the gold sandals on her delicate little feet and the heavy oriental-type gold jewelry gleaming from her ankles, arms, throat, and earlobes. Her jet black hair was partially covered with a gold-embroidered sari, and as she came nearer, I saw that her eyes, with their slight oriental cast, were not green as they looked from a distance, but blue with flecks of gold in I am Chandra Leslie, Mr. Spade. Welcome to Belvedere Island. Thanks. I think I'll like it here. If you will accompany me, I will take you up to the house. Thank you. I am sorry my foster father could not be here to greet you. But he is an artist, you know. Oh. You're uh, Jonathan Battle's foster daughter? Yes. He was my father's closest friend. When I was left alone in the world, he came out to India after me and brought me here. I see. How do you like San Francisco? I've never crossed over to the city. I wish I could. Well, why can't you? I am only a woman. I must do as I am told. I see. I wasn't told not to go down to the landing to meet you, but uh, perhaps it would be just as well if you did not mention it. Mum's the word. That is his studio down that path. I'd better not go any farther. Hey, wait. Uh, Want I see you again? That is for you to say. With that, she vanished. I wasn't surprised. She was much too beautiful to be true anyway. What did surprise me was what I saw through the big studio window at the end of the path. A man stood with his back to me, daubing paint on a big canvas. Across the room from him, two models were posing. They both looked familiar. I couldn't remember then who the dark-skinned, but turbaned male giant squatting with a rifle between his knees resembled. But the feminine one in the oriental dancing girl type pose was a dead ringer for Chandra Leslie. The girl who had just left me going in the opposite direction. I couldn't figure how she could have gotten in there so quickly. And if she was too good to be true, how could she be too? The answer proved to be absurdly simple. Interruptions, nothing but interruptions. If I ever finish this picture, it will be a miracle, even if I live to finish it. Just look what I'm forced to use for models. Wax dummies. Uh, that one is a good likeness. That girl? Where is she? I can never find her when I want her. Always out chasing birds somewhere. And that dark-skinned fellow just disappeared. Had to copy him from memory. Yeah, he looks familiar, Mr. Battle. Who was he? I never asked him. Just came wandering out of the woods one day, soliciting our jobs, and there he was exactly what I needed for the figure of the Sikh soldier in my painting. Sikh soldier? You mean he wasn't well? Oh, no, Mr. Spade. Sikh, man. Sikh, S-I-K-H, as in India. Oh, oh foolish I me. I can see you're interested in my work. Have a good look at it. See here? The figure of the dancing girl against the sweep of the desert in the setting sun. Mm. The weary soldier tries to submerge the horrors of battle, I mean, uh, war, in the contemplation of feminine beauty. But the sun's rays, refracted in that crystal, focus themselves upon the weapon in his hand. And he is reminded that he must revel while he can, for as surely as the sun rises on the morrow, he must answer the call to the, I mean, arms. Great conception, isn't it? My son's idea. Mm-hmm, Yes. Uh, well, uh, exactly why did you ask me to come over, Mr. Battle? Mr. Spade, supposing you knew a man who had committed the crime of murder in order to realize a reward beyond the wildest imaginings of the Occidental mind. Well, Suppose, uh... then, that just as he had that dream within his grasp, you had snatched it away from him. Me? Suppose, further, 
that your enemy had then devoted his life and his fortune to searching you out. And you suddenly learned that he had caught up with you at last and was actually living a stone's throw away from you. What would you think? I think I'd move. Where? To a crowded city where he or his hirelings could be lurking for you around any corner? Well... I think not, Mr. Spade. I think I would stay right here on this island and hire myself a detective. Bully for you. And I would send that detective to warn him that his presence is known and his designs anticipated. Uh, who is this sinister character and where is he ambushed? It's the property adjoining this one on the north. The name on the mailbox is Patterson, but don't you... Uh, oh, good Lord! It's 1247. It's time. It's time. Go, go, go. The sun is approaching the proper angle. By only these few moments, you understand, each day, when the sun's rays fall directly on that crystal from the clerestory window up there, perhaps today I will capture it with brush and canvas. He hurried back to his place before the easel and started messing with his palette, squinting intently at the wax models in front of him. There were still a lot of questions I wanted to ask him, but this was obviously not the time. I left quietly and closed the door behind me. Quietly. Hey, you. Wait a minute. Yeah? I think you're a detective. You don't like detectives? <laughs> Hard boiled type, huh? James Kane, Raymond Chandler. Dashiell Hammett, please. Who are you? I'm Bob. Oh, Bob's on a battle, of course. Yeah, but if you think I haven't heard that gag before. Good, then it shouldn't bother you. Oh, I don't mind. What kind of crazy line did the old boy hand you? How crazy is it? <laughs> He's been acting half batty ever since he started painting that picture. It's nothing but an excuse for not finishing it. And why? Why? Because it's too lousy to show. Oh, I didn't think it was that bad. He does. He asked me. He's leading up to some kind of a publicity stunt, hoping that'll sell it. He's just making a sucker out of you. That's okay with me, as long as he pays for it. Well, we'll get a few days out of it. Well, if you need anything, let me know. All right, Sonny. Right now, I could use the telephone. It's up there in the main house. Help yourself. Oh, but uh, you're hoping to run into my beautiful stepsister, save yourself the climb. She went over to the next-door neighbor's for lunch. Uh -huh. Your father mentioned them. Who are they? Somebody she knew in India named Sherry. Yeah, well, not uh, Captain Sherry. Yeah, retired. Captain Theophilus Sherry. Captain Theophilus Sherry. Twice before in my wild, unpredictable career, I had crossed the path of and swords with Captain Sherry, and we had both lived to regret it. I wondered which one of us the third time would charm. I knew one thing for certain. With Captain Sherry on Belvedere Island, it would be a good idea for the natives to apply immediately for more life insurance. Not that he was any great criminal mastermind, but people just had a way of dying while he was in the vicinity. This time, instead of waiting for the mountain to come to Muhammad, I decided to move Muhammad off Belvedere Island, altitude 352 feet. But I didn't even make it as far as the mailbox before something stopped me. Hey, Battle! Battle! Anyone in there? Battle, can you hear me? Okay, I'm coming in. He was dead before I got to him. The front of his artist's smock was so gowed up with paint it was hard to tell which red was which. I finally located the wound. A large caliber slug had torn through him after entering just below the breastbone. It was a locked room puzzle. The one door bolted from the inside, the windows locked and unbroken, no marks of tampering. In fact, no possible way for the killer to have made his escape. I didn't know it then, but he hadn't. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. After I'd phoned you, Deputy Deer, I went back to the studio to pit my wits against that locked room puzzle. I was glad I hadn't brought my stupid pills with me because when I got there, the mystery was not quite as deep, or so it seemed. The first time around, I'd made very sure the room had been just as I left it, up to and including the two wax dummies. But I hadn't given them a fingernail test. And now I blush to say that one of them, namely the giant-sized, dark-skinned, but turban Sikh that had been squatting with a rifle between his knees, both before and after the murder, was now resting under a studio couch. His turban and the rest of his costume had been hastily stuffed behind a cushion. That's when I remembered why that dummy had looked so familiar to me. 
I thought I knew where to find the original. <laughs> Hello, Marcus. Where's Captain Sherry? You, you go home. Uh, thanks, I won't. Out of my way. Master will not allow. You will have to hurt me. Okay, Marcus, I always do. Let's get that part of it out of the way. <laughs> oh, delight. Very delight. Now I break you back, I think. Hey. Oh, oh no. uh, stop kidding. Uh, hey, Sherry, where are you? Call him off. It's out there. Oh, Marcus, stop being naughty. Put him down. <laughs> not that way. I said put him down, not drop him. I say, old fellow, I'm frightfully sorry, my man here. What? Oh, it's you, Spade. Yes, yeah, Sherry. Here, let me help you up. I oh. wish you'd found a head. I'd have had Marcus prepare tea. Oh, tea. Very delight. Rose petal, orange blood. Oh, how many lumps? Thanks, I've had mine. Oh. Hush, Marcus. Yes, yeah, shut up, Marcus. Oh, oh, imagine a man nearly eight foot tall acting like a little child. Yeah, like a child. Yeah. Uh, come on, on uh, come on out on the terrace. The view is extraordinary. The agent informed me that this is one of the few spots in the San Francisco area which commands the view of both Alcatraz and San Quentin. Yeah, well, you'd better enjoy it while you can, Captain, because when you're in either, you can only see the other one. I once spent a fortnight in the brig out in India, and I can tell you the prison life is not for me. Then why don't you stay away from people who get killed? Oh, I say, you mean old Battle? Has it happened so soon? Okay, what's your alibi this time? I'm sure you have one. Oh, drat it, man. Why do you always commence by taking such a dim view of my activities? However, I will not allow you to goad me into letting you make a fool of yourself. As always, I shall place my cards upon the table. Face down, as always. Well, you've only to turn them up. I'll be brief. Uh, <coughs> Twenty years ago... Oh, here we go. Marcus and I were having a go at the east slope of Nangaparbat in the Himalayas when our pack train encountered an avalanche which swept us bodily across the border into Tibet. Oh, bet. Our carriers were decimated, but luckily most of our gear remained intact. What kind of contraband were you carrying? Contraband into Tibet? Oh, I say, really... No, uh, matter of fact, we were traveling light in the hopes of bagging a few brace of bar-headed geese. Foul play, eh? Allow me to finish. We arrived in Serar, a valley adjacent to Lhasa, to find the religious community in an uproar. Mm -hmm. It seemed that in their haste to create a new Tashi Lama, the native astrologers had misread their stars. In short, they had vested in the holy monastic robes an infant girl. She's not 16 years of age. And you to make a public appearance with a thunderbolt of Vajra. <coughs> oh, please, please, interruption. Sorry. Uh, to make a long story, a young adjutant in my company by name Leslie became smitten with her charms and offered to take her off their hands. Uh. Uh, unfortunately, from that point of view, certain irrefutable temporal awards had been conferred upon her at the time of her accession. Uh. Among them, uh. a mountain worth several billion pounds. Uh. On our journey back to the Punjab... Hey, wait a minute. Did you say this girl owned a mountain? Uh, precisely. A most amazing... Worth several billion pounds? Uh, yes, it's the gold, you know. Uh, the presence of gold in the Serra has long baffled geologists for the simple reason uh, that it's an unnatural deposit. Unnatural? Uh, synthetic, that is. For 13 centuries, the devout have made pilgrimage thither to implant in the mountain small gold nuggets in the ignorant belief that they will grow into large lumps. Mm -hmm. How many centuries did you say? Uh, Thirteen. Oh, very well, twelve. Much better. And uh, needless to say, the small nuggets never do grow into large lumps. Needless. But until they do, the devout, with the exception of the aforementioned and or her nearest relative, are forbidden to carry off any of the gold. And who is the aforementioned? Uh, that dear little girl whom Leslie carried off to the Punjab as his bride. They had one daughter, Chandra, the girl who met you at the landing this morning. Mm. How did Battle get hold of her? Well, sir, a few years back, as our company was marching along the east face of Nanga Parbat... There was an avalanche. Precisely. And poor Leslie perished miserably. Mm. But the ungrateful scamp, in spite of his many promises to me, had left instructions that Chandra should become the ward of that presumptuous paint puddler, uh, Jonathan Battle. He forbade her to see me, and finally left India under cover of night, taking her with him. So you finally tracked them down on Belvedere Island. Exactly. 
Now, my plan, if all else failed, was to win her hand in marriage. What if she objected? Ah, uh, you little comprehend the Oriental mind. Uh, she's a woman. She must do as she's told. All I had to do to turn the trick was to frighten Battle into giving her the necessary fatherly instructions. So, you see, uh, his death has come at a most awkward time. Uh, by the way, uh, who do you think did old Battle in? I think he was killed by the rifle held by that warrior he was painting, the figure your boy Marcus posed for. Oh, hello. Well, that's nonsense. Marcus was with me at the time. I don't think Marcus had to be there. I don't think anybody had to be there. Well, that settles that. Marcus, <laughs> Marcus, pack the marmalade. We're leaving. Never mind the comfort. We'll leave them for the poor. Oh, delight, baby, delight. You've been. Oh. The police are here, and I have been all alone in the house. Where did Bob go? They took him away. They arrested him. What for? They found a pistol hidden in his room. They say it is the weapon that killed his father. Pistol? Please. You are not going to leave me alone. I'm so frightened. Being alone with my conscience. Conscience? But how could I have known what my foster father had in mind? Just what did he have in mind? Suicide? Oh, please. Do not say that. Even if it were true, I cannot bear the thought that I had made him so unhappy. I did not want to disobey him, but I could not. Oh, I could not. Oh, no, come on, come on, Shanna, don't do that. The Orientals are supposed to be without feeling. But you see, it is not true. Of course not. Please, take me to the house. Sure. And you will not leave. You will stay with me. Sure, sure I will. You do not think I am a wicked girl to refuse to marry the man of my father's choice? If it was Captain Sherry... Oh, but... no. I thought you knew. He wanted me to marry his son. I spent the rest of the night keeping her insomnia company, and a very pretty one, too. I didn't get to you on the phone to ask you about that pistol of Bob Battles that you'd tagged as the murder weapon until just after sunrise. What I learned from you was that the rifle that had posed with a dummy warrior was an old-fashioned Belgian-made browning with a smooth bore which could use revolver ammunition. But the fatal slug did match the test slug from Bob's revolver. What I told you was that ballistics can lie and that you should take another look at the metal clamp and the trigger guard of the rifle. You said you would, had the lab run tests on both guns, and by noon you had freed Bob Battle and released the exhibits into my custody. By 12.45, I had the stage set exactly as it had been set for Jonathan Battle's murder, except that the door was not locked. Chandra was standing at the easel as near as I could figure in the spot where Jonathan Battle had been standing when the slug tore through him, and Bob Battle was standing just close enough to her. You, deputy dear, were lurking in the shrubbery outside, observing the whole colossal spectacle. Nevertheless, I plunged unblushingly ahead toward my Agatha Christie finish. But, Sam, I do not understand. What are we waiting for? You won't have long to wait, Chandra. You must be off your nut. I've been cleared. Nobody ever suspected Chandra. What do you hope to prove? Maybe that I'm wrong. Well, why isn't Sherry here? If I'm right, he will be. Okay, about 15 seconds. 15 seconds? Mm, 12 now. And if we're lucky, we'll find out how your foster father was killed. Chandra, he has no right... You, you don't have to do this. Five seconds. Whatever happens, it'll mean your license, Spade. You have no right... Two to... seconds. Chandra, get down! <laughs> you can't, sir. Of all the high-handed, dishonest, reprehensible... How badly she wounded. Take it easy, Captain. Oh, trusting little girl. She's all right, Sherry. If she keeps away from you, she'll stay that way. Come on, Chandra, give me a hand. You all right? Yes. Yeah. But poor Bob. Yeah, poor Bob. He only killed his own father. But, but why? There, there. Now, don't fret about but it. I'll take care of you, my dear. Uh-uh, oh. Captain. Hands off. My dear fellow, you mistake my motives. What this poor girl needs is a father. And what better guardian than myself and my vast knowledge of the Orient and my deep understanding of the Eastern mind? Nuts. Well, Sam, I sure got to hand it to you. It worked. I guess this just about cleans up this caper. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, too, Captain. You've been a great help. Oh, thanks, Woody. No pleasure knowing you. Same Why, way. you dumb bunny. Who, me? Standing there, shaking hands with the most sinister international dope smuggler on the Pacific coast. Now, see here, Spade. That will take some proving. Frisk him, Bill. Go on. See what you find on him. I sure. welcome this opportunity to prove my innocence. Go ahead, deputy. 
Well, what do you know? A hypodermic kit. See? Well, this, is, this, is, this is an outrage. You planted that in my pocket, Spade. Well, maybe. Even if I did, the deputy here will have to take you in for questioning, and that'll mean answering some questions for the federal men, won't it, though? Well, now, if you planted that kit, Sam... I haven't admitted it yet. You'll have to prove it, and you may not be able to before the federal men get involved. Not that Captain Sherry has anything else to hide. Uh, <coughs> well, sir, never let it be said that a royal fusilier didn't know when to blow retreat. Marcus? <laughs> Master, yes. Pack the marmalade again. We're off. This time to Africa. <laughs> Period. End of report. But, Sam, you let him go. I know exactly what you're going to ask, Effie. It worked like this. At a certain time of day, the sun rays were refracted through the crystal directly on the spring metal clamp and the trigger guard of that rifle. This caused the metal to expand thus pushing the trigger and discharging the rifle, which had previously been aimed at the spot where battle customarily stood while painting. But, Sam... Don't interrupt. To further confuse the issue, as well as splitting an infinitive, not to mention a hair, Bob, son of battle, loaded the smooth bore rifle with a cartridge containing a slug previously fired from his revolver, thus drawing attention away from the rifle and onto the revolver, which could not be placed in the locked room at the scene of the crime. Sam... Please, these interruptions. It's motive. He thought his father was, in fact, going to force Chandra into marriage with Captain Sherry. Oh, that poor boy. He did love... Perhaps, but don't forget the billion-dollar mountain. But he leapt in at the crucial moment and interceded with the bullet man for her. He died, perfectly. He undoubtedly will have, but at the expense of the state and not of my conscience. In short, I loaded that rifle with a blank cartridge. He was not dead when he hit the floor, merely in a dead faint. Oh. No, please, please, no applause. Business as usual. Go type that up. Whatever's going to become of that poor, bewildered girl? Yeah, poor little thing. Nothing to fall back on but a billion-dollar gold mountain. And I can't help it, Sam. You know, east is east and never the twain. Ah, uh, ah, uh, you're wrong. She's starting a twaining course tomorrow as a sales girl in the jade department at Gump's. Oh. Doesn't that make you green? Oh, really, Sam, you're jaded humor. <laughs> and so, Tibet. Oh, no, Sam, now stop. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> Murder, eh? Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Private Detective, is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you transcribed by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Any uh, calls, messages, alarms, or excursions? Well, uh, just one, Sam. Which? Well, I suppose you might call it an excursion, Sam. Mm-hmm. He loves some literature. Travel agent, eh? Well, a little trip somewhere might be nice. I feel as if I could sleep forever. Oh, Sam. Well, I'm not gone yet. Oh, Sam, you mustn't talk like that. I've been sitting here reading this booklet, and it says 
It's later than we think. It can't be. My watch says three minutes of nine. Now, there, you see, it is later than we think. I was slow, too, till I said it by the radio. Well, pick it up and set it in your favorite chair. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the overture caper, or Fiffy's Folly, or Who Put the Corpse in the Murphy Bed? What? <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer and director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Ah, June, the month of vacations for all the family. Here's hoping you've planned yourself a good one and that you'll remember to take along plenty of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. In spite of heat and winds, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Ask for it in the big, economical, family-sized bottle and handy tube that's easy to pack in your suitcase. Be sure to ask for it by name. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all. In the adventures of Sam Spade. Sam. Oh, Sam, you poor darling. Don't say that word again, Effie. I didn't mean in a financial sense, you darling. There you go again. I meant we poor mortals, as it must to all men, Sam. Mm -hmm. We're all clay-footed, after all, merely leaving footprints in the sands of time. You need a vacation, Eff. Maybe you better take that excursion. Oh, no! Now, don't act like that. I'll hardly miss you. Oh, Sam! Now, come on, come on. Let's see those travel folders. Where are they? Oh, don't... Now, uh, here we are. Uh, plan now for that long, long journey. Our carefree layaway plan relieves the burdens of those left behind. <laughs> well, nice of them to think of me. Uh, luxurious accommodations. Funny-looking stateroom. Why does that bunk have a lid on it? Let's see. It uh, probably explains here somewhere. Our, uh, our special nylon-tufted couch-type model with chrome-plated magnesium handles and lightweight alloy liner has been called by many satisfied customers the Paul Bearer's friend. Yeah. Well, of all he... Well, I... Uh, who brought this into my office? His name was Converse Etheridge. What? He's with the Dardanella Mortuary. Don't mention his name in my presence. That man has no live friend. Now, Sam, don't be too rash on him. After all, it's his living. He is a worm in the apple of contentment, a roadblock in the highway of life, a meter in the taxi cab of happiness. Are you ready, Sam? No! I already have the date, Sam. To whom is this addressed to? Hmm? Oh, uh, to uh, Mrs. Uh, Joy Overjoyed. Uh, no, you better make that uh, George Overjoyed. Uh, Mrs. I'll make up your mind, Sam. I said Mrs. Yes, sir. But is it Boy Overboard? I mean, um, Joy Over George? Or is it, um... It is Judge Overboard. Now, wait a minute. Just let me get this straight, Sam. I have Judge George. Mrs. Oh, well, to avoid any further confusion, Sam, wouldn't it be just as clear to address it as Mrs. O.G. Judge? The name is not Judge F. It's Overgorge. Uh, George. Uh... Now, wait a minute, Sam. Now, wait a minute. Just let's be very, very quiet for just a minute. Now, look here. I won't have you putting the blame on... Shh, now, wait. All right. <clears throat> Mrs. George Over George. Hyphen. If it'll make you happier. Oh, thank you, Sam. From, uh... Yes, Sam. License number 137596. That you can get. Uh, subject, your jewelry. Uh, dear Mrs. Overture... Uh, Overture... <sighs> Enclosed, you will find my statement for services rendered, which you will no doubt be as surprised to receive as I am to be sending it. It started, as such things often do, with that curse of civilization, that broken spring in the couch of privacy, the telephone... Yes? Mr. Spade? Speaking. This is Mrs. George Overjord. Hmm? That's O-V-E-R-J-O-R-D. I have it. I'm staying at the Hotel Belvedere, Mr. Spade. Mr. Stover, the house detective, was good enough to recommend you. Oh, then he's good for something. I beg your pardon? A good friend of mine, Mr. Stover. And uh, uh, what was it you had in mind, Mrs. Overjord? George. But you're warm. That's my first name. I uh, beg your pardon? 
Joy. Oh, I got it wrong. When you uh, spell it out, I thought... That... I think you better come over here right away, Mrs. Spade. I have a rather serious problem to place before you. Mm-hmm. These little details can wait. Of course. And come right up. I'm in room 315. Mm-hmm. A mysterious woman with strange sounding names. Mm-hmm. Blow the man down. Mm-hmm. 315. 315. That's better. Knock, knock. Who's there? Uh, Mr. Spade. Just a moment. Come in. Oh, uh, uh, pardon me. Uh, come on in, Mrs. Spade. Uh, whatever you say. Sit over here, won't you, please? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just bring this... Oh, don't uh... bother with the chair. I'll make room here. Oh. oh. Thanks. Here. Now. Isn't that nice? Uh, yeah. Oh, don't worry about George. He's on a gray line tour and won't be back for hours. George? Yes, poor dear. He's my husband. Oh, well, uh, well, Mrs. Overjoy. You're uh... sweet. Call me Joy. I feel that since you're a detective, you'll know my secret sooner or later. So why hide anything? Well, what what are these? Uh, feathers? <laughs> right, take a look. Sort of. Mm-hmm. Now, listen, Sam. To begin with, my husband must never know. Yeah, well, uh... Oh, all right, then, yeah. About the jewel. Oh. You see, he gave me the money for a floater policy on the necklace, and I was naughty. You were. I sank it in a wild mead. Sam, are you listening? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah, yeah, you uh, sank somebody's mink. Uh, tell me, uh, what does you want to do with me? No, Sam. Mm-hmm. I sank the floater. So now it isn't insured, and it's gone. Uh, ran away, huh? Not the mink, Sam, the necklace. What shall I do? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's worth $30,000. At least. But uh, what about your husband? Uh, he'll be awfully angry. He's an absolute bog on insurance. Uh-huh. And he'd be very upset if he knew I was not fully covered. Uh, what time did you say that gray line bus gets back? Sam, we just can't while away precious hours. We've got to find that necklace. Mm-hmm. My husband... Oh, darling, you're not comfy. Mm-hmm. My husband... Mm-hmm. Who? What? What? But, darling, George Overjord is the richest man in the state of Wisconsin. He'd be very hard... To replace. Mm, you're absolutely right. Husband should be kept in that place. Sam, if you don't take more interest in this problem, <sighs> I just have to get another detective. Huh? Oh, no. Hey, hey, don't do that. Now, what? What are you looking for? Uh, the, the telephone. I uh, want to check those gray line bus schedules. <laughs> Around 5 in the p.m., after we phoned room service with some sandwiches and a pitcher of martinis, I uh, got my assignment. It seemed that the hotel thief who had made off with a necklace had been surprised red-handed and had dropped the rest of the swag valued at around a hundred grand while making his getaway. My problem was to recover the necklace before, quote, George, unquote, tried to put in a claim on it and found out it hadn't been insured. I agreed that it might be smart to put the rest of the jewels in the hotel safe under my name. This I did. About then, somebody breathed down my neck and said, Hello, darling. Hello, hello, hello. I froze. A second ticked by before I even had courage to turn around and face it. It couldn't be, but it was Feffy Valerio Emanescu, a con merchant so slick that he finally swindled most of his competitors out of business and even succeeded in selling himself in the oldest con game of them all, the Spanish prisoner game. The last time I had locked horns with him, yellow diamonds were turning white faster than the hair of the policeman he was suing for false arrest. Peffy's hair was still very black and very oily, and the big smile he wore was very white and very oily. Sam, darling, do not look so shameful. 
I am angry on you. You're not angry on me. You can fool with parts of the people some other time, but you can't fool Fassi for long. Mm. You did a trick on me to lure me out from San Francisco. Mm. A gold mine, you promised me. <laughs> a gold brick mine. Mm. But you see, I am humorous. Well, so I don't was. hate you. In fact, I am contrary. You are. And just to prove that I have no harbor of hard foolings with you, mm. listen. What do you think of this one? Never mind. We buy a printing press. And what are we pressing? Your luck. No. Tickets. Vouchers and the Romanian National Lottery. Vouchers? Vouchers. With the Iron Curtain, darling, who could see through it? Feffy, darling, where are you staying temporarily? I, I am a guest on this hotel. I'm sure of that. May I inquire which room the management is losing money on this time? I think I changed. The neighbors have got noises. 317? Also the plumbing. 313? Stop beating around these bushes. What have you caught me doing? Come on, let's have a look at your room. On the way upstairs to his room, Feffy gave me a rundown on the noises in the room adjoining his, 315. On one occasion, according to his story, he'd heard a woman scream. But the rest of it was all in Norwegian. According to him, Overjord was a Norwegian name. But all the same, it sounded fishy, and I don't mean loot fish. When I gave him a rundown on the missing overjawed necklace, he threw up his hands in anguish and said, Oh, Sam, darling, I, I think we'd better have a couple of drunks and talk over this. Sit down, Fabby. Aren't we thirsty? No. Look, Feffy, how did those Jimmy marks get on that connecting door? Jimmy, aha, uh -huh. now I see it. Not only do those Norwegians have noises, they have bad habits. And this a client from you. Feffy, why would the overjords break into their own room from this side of the connecting door? Don't interrupt me, I, I am thinking. Where does that door lead? Uh, to the bed. A bedroom? Don't speak on it. Don't go near it. What's in there? A Murphy. Let's have a look. Hey, Sam, darling, I don't want you to get hurt. Feffy, are you threatening me? Worse. I am warning you. That makes it easier. The same, darling, don't. Remember Pandora? Oh, be quiet. And that, Mrs. Overjord, is when if I had to live over, I wouldn't have taken the case for all the fish in Norway. The Murphy bed that flew out at me as I opened the door was occupied. The occupant was wearing a dark blue suit, a conservative tie, a small white chrysanthemum in his lapel, and a peaceful expression on his face. He had a very healthy color for a dead man. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Tonight, for the first time, Wild Root announces a big double bargain combination package to introduce amazing new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo. Here it is. You get a 60-cent bottle of exciting new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo plus a 60-cent bottle of famous Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, a $1.20 value for only 59 cents. It's a wonderful chance to get acquainted with brand new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo. The shampoo that combines the best features of liquids and creams and soapless cleansing plus soothing lanolin. A shampoo that leaves your hair beautifully clean, soft, radiant, easy to manage. Remember, this big double bargain combination package contains a 60-cent bottle of the popular new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo plus a 60-cent bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, a $1.20 value for only 59 cents. But the offer is limited, so don't miss out. Go to your drug or toilet goods counter today or tomorrow, sure, and ask for Wild Root's big double bargain combination package. A dollar twenty cent value, only fifty nine cents. And now, back to the overjoyed caper or the corpse in the Murphy bed. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. As I stood there looking at that well-dressed corpse on the Murphy bed, I asked myself some leading questions. Who was he, for a start? Had my client's husband returned from his gray line bus tour and stumbled into the wrong room? And then what was really my client's problem? To recover an uninsured necklace or get rid of an insured husband? And what was the function of Feffy? Was he an accomplice, a goat, or a body snatcher? At that moment, he was in no condition to tell me because he had fainted dead away. When I had revived him... Where, where are I? In a bad spot, Fevy. Now stop clowning and try to make sense. Make sense? Why not? You never saw a man so sensitive. 
but frankly, I am discouraged. Help me up. Now look, Furby. I, I am looking. You realize what means that Joker, who's finally resting on my Murphy, I will be disported to Bucharest. You should be so lucky. Lucky? A Romanian in Romania? At the mercies of, of thieves, gypsies, and Hungarians? Okay, Fabi, you don't want to go home. I do. The ticket for both of us is my client's missing necklace. Did you swipe it? Necklace? Who necklace? Darling, talk about him and I listen. Don't worry about that stuff. He'll keep. What, what about I? He is comfortable. But where will I sleep? In another city, if you're smart. Now, don't bother to check out. Just drop your bags out the window, hang the do not disturb sign on the door, and dissolve. That should give you about a 24 hours head start. But that would be dishonest. I know, I know. But it's a sacrifice you have to make. Okay. Here. Take the necklace. That's better. And you'd better take my advice, Fabi. Start packing. Like I told you, that corpse is in good shape, but you're not. There was nobody home in room 315, so I glass-keyed my way in and had a look around. I turned up only items that were worth anything. A pair of passports issued respectively to one George Overjord and one Joy Overjord. Also, item and insurance policy with inventory attached on the Overjord jewels. What made that interesting was the fact that the necklace, which my client had told me was uninsured, was there in the inventory. After that, I wasn't at all surprised at what I found in the closet. Okay, okay, take it easy. I'll get you loose just as quick as I can. Here, I'll get these gags out first. There you are. Joy, are you all right? Yeah, Oh, there you are. Here, let me help you up. Oh, oh my back. Four hours in that place. Those villains. Uh, who did this to you? We don't know. They jumped on us when we were coming home backwards. What? Joy! Look at the time. Our boat sails in an hour. If we don't hurry, we will miss it. Yeah, yeah, I will pack. You go now, young man. Thank you. Yeah, goodbye. Uh, well, just a minute. I want to get a few things straight. Uh, you are Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Overjoy? Yeah, 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 yeah. But we don't worry. Insurance will take care of all. Goodbye. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm annoying you, but I'm just not quite ready to leave. Now, if what you had in mind was picking up a little ready cash from the insurance company, I'm afraid I've bollocked up your cable. Uh, bollocks? Again? In other words, I'm a detective, and I have your jewels. Yeah? You're you here? Yeah, yeah, that is good. Just leave them on the table. Yeah, good. Well, it's not quite as good as all that. Before I can hand them over to you, I've got to clear a few things up between you and my client and another guy with a dead man in his room. Uh, we don't know any dead man. Not in California. Oh. We are from old country, Wisconsin. Oh, well, that's different. Is, is, is that everything yours? Yeah, yours. Call, call the bell boy. Uh, don't be in such a hurry. Well, why not? The ship don't wait. Now, look, this will only take a few seconds. I'll have to make a report on this, you see. So I have to know exactly how it happened. Now, uh, you say you just come into that room. Uh, now, you must have been standing about here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Overjoy? Uh, not so close to the closet. Uh, well, that's near enough. Now, you just stay where you are. Will you uh, step over this way, Mrs. Overjoy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hurry, please. Mm -hmm. Just a little to uh, the left. There. There. Ah, oh, shut up. I'll report you to Afro for bad dialects. Oh, I thought that would do it. Good, good. And now to meet the troll. Just a moment. Oh, it's you, Sam. Mm -hmm. I thought I heard voices next door. I was afraid to go barging in. Where have you been, darling? A most wonderful thing has happened. Mm hmm? My husband left me. He never came back from that gray line tour. Uh, that might be because he never went. Oh, sit down, darling. There's something I must tell you. Yeah, but uh, you sit there and I'll sit here. Darling, you've changed. It makes, it makes it so difficult, this gulf between us. Joy, if I may call you Joy, we must face it. We live in different worlds. It can never be. Cigarette? I understand. 
But there's no reason we can't meet occasionally and remain good friends. Sure, I'll come to see you on visiting days. Sam, I'm afraid you're making a terrible mistake. Oh, I made that when I took you at face value. Your name may be Joy, sweetheart, but you are not Overjoy. Who are you? Darling, does it matter? But I rather like Joy. I think I'll keep it. Yeah, okay, suit yourself. How does, uh, Feffy fit into this caper? Oh, Sam, darling, it's... Terrible the way that man deceived me. Mm. I should have known he wasn't a Norwegian. Well, don't feel too bad about that. He thinks he's Romanian. He told me his name was Overjord and that it'd be all right for me to stay here because his parents were in the adjoining room. Uh, now, let's get this straight. Feffy checked in the room 313. The Overjords were here. I take it you were in 317, all with connecting doors. Sort of a... Uh... Pencils movement, shall we say? Uh, well, I thought it rather strange that I never met them, especially after Faith had brought me the jewels and said they were a present from his mother for my true soul. Oh, now, wait. Before you go any further, Angel, how are you going to get out of that corner without getting paint on your little feet? Well, he finally told me everything. Mm. And that I was as deep in it as he was. That's when I called you. Why? I was panic-stricken. I had to get out from under. And, baby, look at you now. Well, Sam, you will have to admit that I could have done worse. Unless I misjudged you, we do have a jewel. Yeah, that part of it's all right, but what about that corpse? Oh, that. That was in case Seffy got rid of that necklace before he was caught with it. The police would have something else to hold him on so you and I could get out of the country with the jewel. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. How'd you get him up here, piggyback? A bellboy helped me. I told him it was my husband that he was stiff. Yeah, how stiff can you get? You don't believe me? Nope. Oh, I love you. Stop that. All right. Go ahead. Torture me. Why don't you hit me with your fist? You're a big, strong man. I'm only a woman. What have you got to lose? Look, all I want to know is who put that corpse in the Murphy bed. How dare you? How dare you make love to me and then insult me and push me around like an old shoe? Oh, I did not. I don't have to put up with it. And I'm not going to. I'm going back to Fatty. He's a crook, but he loves me. I hate you. Hey, you! Hey, my ear. Oh, no. You're choking me? I am not. Yes. I can't breathe. Oh. Oh. Darling, oh. darling, what are they doing to you? You, you deduce this poor girl to her condition? I guess so. I don't know how. <laughs> Sam, darling, we are no longer friends. Our relations are short, nil and void. Oh. But you, my love, oh. I forgive you. Come away with me. We will start life for you with a better scheme. But, Betty, dear, aren't you forgetting something? Those jewels? That old man and that old woman lied to us. They are not overjoyed. They are crooks and robbers. Betty, no. Sam. I think he's right. But how did you... I found them in there and untied them. Instead of phoning the police, they started packing. So you see, darling, we couldn't take the jewels anywhere. But why now? The MS to motto inscribed on our family crest. Honor among thieves. Except for gypsies and Hungarians. But, Fetty, dear, I tried to steal them from you. That was another horse call, my darling. Between you and I is a technical difference. This is known as a double cross. Double that cross. is expectorate for my woman. But from you, Sam, darling, I am aghast. I am appalling. You have behaved without charm. I don't hate you, but it is all I can do to forgive you. Come, my lord. Now, wait a minute. For what? You have the jewels. You can prove nothing. There's still that corpse. Sam, darling, come, I show you. You see? I didn't. All I saw was a well-made Murphy bed. The well-dressed corpse was gone. When I turned around, so were Feffy and Joy. Period. End of report. Next week, uh, Sweetie's dialect. But Sam! Yes, Evie? Well, I hardly know where to start. Oh, uh, P.S. I have turned your jewels over to the robbery detail of the San Francisco police, together with Sven and Marta Lagerson, who were still in the closet when the police arrived. But Sam, don't you... Oh, yes. Add this. The uh, Lagersons told the cops here that they had worked as household servants in your home in Wisconsin and had hit on their bright idea of making off with your jewels while you were away on a month-long canoe trip through the Chain Lakes, which gave them ample time to make their getaway. They switched passport pictures and used your name to justify their possession of the jewels in case they were questioned. 
That plus the insurance policy, complete with inventory, was good enough to fool even the nefarious Feffy. But, Sam... One question, Effie. No more. But if it's about that corpse, save your breath. What else? Go type that up, Angel. I'm still working on it. And now, listen to this. Don't delay. Get your Wild Root Cream Oil now. The nation's leading hair tonic with Wild Root's big bargain combination package. For a limited time, you can get a 60-cent bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic plus a 60-cent bottle of Wild Root's sensational new liquid cream shampoo. A dollar twenty cent value, both for only 59 cents. Get it today for the whole family. get any place? Well, there's a couple of fingers left in there. Will you join me? Oh, thank you. No, I meant a different kind of stiff. Oh, the one in the Murphy bed. Well, uh, I'm expecting a break on that any day now. Well, you have a wall-type bed in your apartment, Sam. <clears throat> a similar proximity will inspire you to greater mental thought. Please, I won't sleep a wink. That's just what Mr. Etheridge said. But I told him you were busy on this big jewel robbery. What was his problem? The man from the mortuary, you know. That vulture. He is a razor blade in a parachute pack of optimism. He is a sandbar in the river Styx. He Well, is... as I said, Sam, it's his living. But I promise to give you the message. It seems he, went, he wants to find this woman. Now, mm. she did a very strange thing. Yeah. I mean, she came into the Dardanella mortuary and said her name was O'Rourke. And her husband was there and that his parents had arrived from Ireland right when he dropped dead. And the Irish relatives were mad because she sent him out for embalming before they could have a wake. And she wanted to know if Mr. Etheridge could sneak him into the hotel before they found out. Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, Sam, I didn't want to clutter up your mind when you were busy on a big jewel caper. And besides, he learned that she was a practical joker and got his body out. <gasps> Sam. Yes, Ep. Sam, could it... Uh, the one in the murky bed, I mean... Is it the short arm of coincidence, Sam? Yeah, probably is. You know, everything that happens in hotels doesn't get in the papers. Hardly a day goes by that some joker doesn't plant an embalmed body in a Murphy bed. If it isn't that, it's frogs or salamanders, or sometimes it used to be crackers when so many of them were on the American plan, you know. Crackers? Oh, really? Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Renee and Pierre Garrigank. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you transcribed by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. WTRY, WTRI FM, Troy, New York. Sam, how impotune. Hmm? I was just thinking of you. 
Me and who else? Both my ears were burning. No, Sam. No. With regards to our shortage of office supplies... Don't give it another thought, Ep. This was going to be a short report. Short and sweet, Sam? Hardly, Angel. In fact, barely. Well, Sam, if you had asked me, I could have told you. That girl was merely trying to stir up a tempest in her boyfriend's teapot. Again? It was perfectly observant to me, Sam, that, that she had sour grapes written all over her. Sour apples, Abby, but you're warm, and that's why I'm so fond of you. Oh, thank you, Sam. I'm glad I could be of help, though I must confess the apples are over my head. Well, don't feel bad about it. That's how Newton discovered the law of gravity. Stay where you are, and I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Apple of Eve caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Remember the Romeo of yesteryear? Hair parted in the middle, all plastered down? Man, what a difference today. Today, all a guy has to do to impress a gal is use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. If you are still using old-fashioned hair tonics, or none at all, then for her sake, spruce up today with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. In bottles or the handy new tube, it's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Oh, oh, Sam. Uh, come right in. Sure. Why are you so nervous? Oh, nothing, nothing, really. I'm just glad to see you, dear. Oh, I'm glad to see That's you. That's all. Come on, out with it. What are you hiding behind your back? Well, it's, it's a surprise, Sam. So you just run along into your office, and I'll be right with you. Surprise, huh? Let me think. Uh, Father's Day? No, surely not. Oh, no, Sam, no. It's just as regards our shortage of office supplies. I do hope you'll be able to mince your words. What's all that junk you got stuffed in between the pages of your notebook? Where? Oh, oh well, Sam, you see, improvisation is a child of necessity, so... Uh, to stretch our supplies, I just cut up some old strips of waste paper in case we run out of a genuine. Well, well, very ingenious. Uh, shall we commence? Hmm? Yes, but not too many corrections, Sam. I'm afraid this eyebrow pencil might not last. Well, don't bear down on it. Uh, where was I? No place, Sam. Uh, date? Uh... I already have that, Sam. Oh, uh, this one goes to... Hey. Yes, Sam? The calendar, where is it? Calendar? Which calendar, Sam? You know perfectly well which calendar. It's been hanging there on the wall for three years. The one from Harold's Club in Reno. Oh, that old calendar. It was out of date anyway, Sam. That calendar was timeless. It was not, Sam. It was vulgar. That's a lie. I met the girl who posed for it. In more modest circumstances, I hope. Put it back. Now, no, Sam, don't. F, what did you do with that calendar? Well, you mustn't incite yourself, Sam. Let me see that notebook. Yes, Sam. Uh-huh. Old waste paper, indeed. An art treasure mutilated, and for what? To serve your own base purposes. <laughs> Just because you were too absent-minded to order a few office supplies. But I frequently alluded to our dwindling resources, Sam. But no, you were too proud. Take these and put them in a safe place. You can put it back together with scotch tape on your own time. But we're out of scotch tape, Sam. We've got a first aid kit, haven't we? We used to. Use the adhesive. Date, June 19, 1949. I won't soon forget that. <laughs> Two, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Uh, subject, the Apple of Eve caper. Dear Dundee. The start of it was yesterday when Eve Adams first walked into my office. She was angry and she was terribly, terribly hurt. In fact, she had a shiner, a swollen jaw, and somebody had bitten her on the arm. And furthermore, she had the audacity to suggest 
that there was something shady between I and Mr. Hagen when it is an item of public information that her and Gorse Hagen was washed up practically before they started. And I might just add in passing... Uh, just a minute, Miss Adams. You say this girl came to your apartment in a jealous rage and attacked you without provocation. None whatsoever. I never opened my trap to her except to remind her that it would have been a blessing to the human race if her old man had never met her old lady. And if she thought those three layers of pancake on her puss could fool a blind man as to her true age and seeing as what her mouth was, she should never open it for fear of what might come out. <clears throat> I see. And the girl's name? Down at that flea bag where she works, she's built as dream of love. And is she ever a nightmare? Dream of love. That's uh, D-R-E-A-M-A? It says there. But I do not intend to take this episode lying down on my chin, Mrs. Bates. Why, if it had not been for the timely arrival of my concert, G, that cheap nail would have brained me with my own gin bottle. I see. Landlady broke it up. And you say uh, she threatened to return with a gun and blast you if you continued seeing Mr. Hagen. That is a fact. And she is just cheap enough to try some low trick like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, what do you want me to do, Miss Adams? I want you should pay a formal call on that dame and tell her that upon the very next occasion of any violence or threats thereof out of her, I'm going to yell cop. In fact, Mr. Spade, I am placing my life and limbs in your hands, and if you are anything of what you're cracked up to be, you will have no difficulty in giving that creepy crow the bums rush straight out of my life. Uh, pardon me, Miss Adams. My secretary seems to be calling me. Out of my way. I know who's in there, and I'm going in. Out of my way. Mrs. Spade, it's her. Keep her off. You should have hired the 4th Marines, dearie. Now, now, ladies. Ladies, oh, please. No, no, uh, no, break no, it up. You don't. You, I'll show you who to get tough with. Help me, you don't call me shamus or I'll let you have it. Now, now, ladies, please. Now, let's talk this over calmly and sensibly. Okay, you ask for it. Now, ladies. Oh. Please. Awful. Water, Sam. Oh. Where'd they go? Well, they chased each other down the hall. I thought you'd gone out. I did. What did she hit me with? Well, she took a sap out of her purse and let fly before I could prevent it. Yeah. But you were still on your feet when you told me to close the door. Fine thing. Help me up. Yes, Sam. Easy, easy. Oh, when I think of you lying in here unconscious all that time while I went out to lunch. What? If anything had happened to you, I'd never forgive myself. You call this nothing? Oh, you poor dear brave boy. Now, you just sit down and relax. Now, the ambulance should be here any minute. Ambulance? Don't you know these things cost money? Well, I'm sorry, Sam. I lost my head. When I saw you lying there all of a heap, forget I couldn't Forget it. Forget help. it. What's that gadget there on the floor? Oh. Oh, it's lipstick. Must have dropped out of her purse when she opened it for the sap. Huh. Apple of Eve. It's a ghost color, Sam. Apple of Eve. Mm. Unique Garage. Harry speaking. Spade, this is Dream of Love. Keep your distance. Look, uh, you left your lipstick, but don't bother to come after it. I'll mail it to you. What kind is it? Apple of Eve. Sorry, I've never used it. Good, then I won't give you another thought. Oh, but you got to. She's dead. Eve Adams? Yeah. She jumped into a taxi in front of your building. I went straight after her. But I got caught in traffic where they're tearing up Market Street. That could be anywhere between the Embargadero and Twin Peaks. Fine alibi. What comes next? Well, I'm at her apartment now. And she's dead. Sam, Sam! Hold on. Yeah, Effie? There's your ambulance. Shall I send him away? What shall I do well, with him? Well, it's ten bucks now, anyhow. I'll use it for a taxi. Hello, Miss Love. Yeah? Stay there and don't touch a thing. I'll be right over. <laughs> Dream I hadn't waited, if that was really where she'd called me from. Eve Adams was on the bedroom floor in front of a dressing table. There was broken glass all over the floor. The place reeked of perfume. The front of her negligee was splashed with red. I looked for the wound, but I didn't find any. Then I looked at her hands. All the nails on her left hand and two on the right were the same color as the stain on her clothing. Evidently, she'd been seated at the dressing table putting on nail polish when the murderer entered the room. The back of her head had been creased by the well-known blunt instrument, such as a heavy sap. I felt the bumps on my head and looked at the overturned nail polish bottle on the dressing table. It was called Apple of Eve. The 
makers of Wild Road Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Apple of Eve caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Second time around the murder apartment, I noticed something I hadn't caught the first time. Some smears of Apple of Eve nail polish that didn't show very distinctly against the rust-colored carpeting, but left a clear trail across the kitchen linoleum. When I opened the back door, I smelled burning cloth. There was an incinerator just outside, and from it I fished a man's shirt, partially burned. The initials in the pocket were still intact, so were the red stains under them. The initials were G.H. The stains were, you guessed it, Lieutenant Deer, Apple of Eve. <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking for Miss Dreamer Love. Is she home? No, she isn't. Thanks. I'll come in and wait. Hey, wait a minute. You... Okay, you're in. What do you want with her? She's in a little trouble. You a cop? Why do you expect her back? I don't know. What's this trouble? She threatened to kill a woman, and now she's dead. Who? A girl named Eve Adams. Why would she want to kill Evie? The way I got it, they were locking horns over a guy named Gorse Hagen. You know him? Yeah, and I wish I didn't. Who is he? He used to run a gambling ship down at Malibu till the law turned it into a bait barge. Now he calls himself a yachtsman. But if you're trying to connect him up with my sister, it's a bad connection. She hasn't seen him in years. His idea or hers? Hers? And mine. Then what was the beef? And who are you? I'm her brother. Eddie's my name. And why would there be any beef between those two? Evie was my sister's best friend. And she was engaged to me. Then this news must be quite a shock to you. You're taking it like a little soldier. She was asking for it. I warned her. I begged her to leave town with me. But no, she couldn't sneak off like that without letting Gorse know the score. I told her he'd kill her before he'd let her go. Mm Mm-hmm. You live here, Eddie? Yeah, what of it? Where do you keep your shoes? In a closet, kidder. Where do you keep yours? Under the bed? Which closet? In here? Hey, wait a minute, you... Get your hands off of me. Let me see your warrant. That better be good or you're going out of here on your head. Take your hands off me, Eddie. Let's see that warrant. All right, I got a warrant, Eddie. Here. I didn't find what I was looking for, a pair of crepe-soled shoes with traces of Apple of Eve nail polish on them, but in one of his coat pockets, I found a sales slip from a department store cosmetics counter. There were several items, but the one that interested me said, one lipstick nail polish set, Apple of Eve. About then, I smelled brandy, and a voice behind me said, what happened to the kid? Huh? Oh, uh, he asked for my warrant. <laughs> Well, when you come to see me, I'll know better. <laughs> your name is Gorse Hagen. I'm headed for your place right now. What are you looking for? A pair of shoes with crepe soles. What do you want with my deck shoes? I thought maybe they'd match up with this piece of a shirt with your initials on it. Give me that. That's a fact. Where'd you get that? In the incinerator at Eve Adams' place. Well, that don't prove anything. Lots of people got the same initials. Have you talked to, uh, oh, uh, George Howard? He's alibied. He's out of town. That proves it's a frame. I don't know any George Howard. I thought so. Okay, let's cut out the monkey business. Give it to me. It's evidence. Give it to me. All right, I'll give it to you. I did. 
but he gave it right back to me. I was only losing on points until I tripped over poor old Eddie and lost my balance. That's when he gave me the coup de grace. I wasn't quite unconscious, but somehow I just didn't feel like getting up. And when the apartment door opened, I opened my good eye just wide enough to see Dream of Love walk in. Of course. What are you doing here? I come to help you, Dreamer. I don't need any help from you, Gorse. I told you that three years ago. You killed Eve Adams. Why? You're wrong, Gorse. I haven't seen Evie in ages. Why did you kill her? I... All right, I did it. Yeah? Why? I was jealous. Seeing the two of you together after all we'd been to each other. <laughs> Go on, laugh at me. I committed murder out of love for you. It's very funny, isn't it? <laughs> I'm very fond of you, Dreamer. My poor little Dreamer love. I'd give you anything, honey. The shirt from my back. Here. Here's a piece of it on the counter. What? what where'd you... I see you're impressed. Me too. Come on, we'll go someplace where we can be alone and talk things over. Oh, no, Gus, please. I can explain you everything. You can explain in the car on the way down to the boat. Come on. You're hurting me. Oh! Oh! No! Come on, out the door. <laughs> Stupid me, I staggered to my feet and stumbled over to the door. I reached it just as Hagen's car pulled away from the curb. By the time I found a taxi, they were at least halfway to wherever they were going. I didn't know whether the boat he had mentioned was tied up at the Embarcadero, anchored in the marina, moored at Sausalito, or becalmed in Oakland. But there was a seafaring man in our town who knew about such things. My port of call was the Seahorse Bar and Grill just off ahead of Pier 16, or is it the foot? Captain Pasoli? P is silent, son, as in Prasad. My mistake. Salty by name, salty by nature. <laughs> Only one salty thing I can't abide. Salt water taffy. And my teeth, you know. <laughs> Here, have a lifesaver. Well, uh, thank you, sir. You're very generous. No, it ain't money, mate, but it's straight from the mint. Ha <laughs> ha! That joke wasn't. <laughs> hey, what's up, sonny? You in the hole again? <laughs> You catch my drift? Yeah. Uh, what do you know about a yachtsman named Gorse Hagen? Oh, nicely put, matey. If there's anything lower than a yachtsman, he's it. Mm-hmm. Where does he keep his boat? Well, now, she's still afloat. She'd be dragging her hook summers off Sausalito. Now, she's a converted PT, you know. He calls her the Sea Queen. Mm-hmm. She had her bottom planks ripped out in the Battle of the Coral Sea, and they patched her up with plywood. Well, she's got two diesels, she has, and twin screws... Two to one reduction gear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the uh, quickest way of getting out to it? Well, now, there's not much craft for Char to hear about this time of night, you know. There's that Novak fella, but just at present he's sleeping one hour. Figures. Might not be worth your while anyways. Why not? Well, Hagen stopped by here 20 minutes ago looking for his engineer. Said he was casting off on tide engineer or no engineer. Mm, what about your boat? My boat. When a matey, on a plotted course, she'll stand up to any double end of Monterey Dory in the class. Yeah. Without a head C, that is. Then on the other hand, you put her in a bottom race. A buck and a quarter swell. Yeah, well, yeah. How much? Way. How much? Um, Five dollars an hour. And that's with you, man, and the bilge pumps. Okay, let's go. This, um, here Hagen fella now. You on to the trim of his sails? Sails on a PT boat? Oh, not the boat, sonny. The man. Cut of his jib. No, I didn't notice that, but he was wearing crepe soled shoes. Mm. I'll tell you about this Hagen meeting. A fellow once tried to board him. A customs officer, no less. What's up? Picked him up four days later in a gill net with a fish gaff stove clean through his neck. <laughs> Here, have another lifesaver. You may need it. After he'd lashed me to my station at the bilge pump, Captain Pasoli got his double-ender Monterey Dory and a plotted course to Sausalito, he hoped, and we plunged recklessly into the fog. As nearly as I could catch his drift, there was a 50-50 chance that A, Hagen had found his engineer and would be halfway to the Farallone Islands before we could make it past Alcatraz if we stayed afloat that long, or B, that he hadn't found his engineer and might be having trouble starting up those two diesels with the twin screws and the two-to-one reduction gears, whatever they are. Which one? Oh, about five points to port. 
gray one with the high freeboard. Uh -huh. You get up on the port, eh, Major. The ladder's round on the landed side. Yeah. I'll swing round and put you on it. Hey! Anybody home? Uh, he's likely blow, nursing them diesels. You got to rear back in holler, Major, like this. Uh -huh. Talk to you, Hagen. Step <laughs> sorry. Oh, up down, you little clumsy lover. Hit the scuppers. Where'd he get you? Don't write the note. Hurts a midship. Huh? Here. How do you run this thing? I gotta get you to shore. Uh, that's throttle. Uh, uh, there's a forward gear. Uh -huh. no, don't pull her back all the way. She, she'll die. The vacuum tanks. You lie still. What are you looking for? Jump a pocket. Lifesaver. In case you need it. I don't know more. <laughs> Winds on your after quarter, Mitty. Remember okay, that. Take it easy, Captain. If he could see us well enough to drop Captain Salty, he'd let it go at that. And I got it. He was listening. Somebody was pulling out from shore in a rowboat. I didn't waste any more time listening. I dug into Captain Salty's jumper pocket, fished out a waterproof pouch. I took a seaman's papers out of it. He didn't need them anymore. Wrapped it around my gun. And I took off some clothes and eased myself over the side. I didn't swim for speed, but for distance. Stopping now and then to make sure the man in the boat was still covering for me. I felt my way around the hull till I found the anchor rope. Just as I grabbed it, I heard him rest his oars. Hagen, who's that? Eddie Love. What do you want? I've come after my sister. Go on home, Eddie. She's sailing with me. That's the way she wants it. You're lying. Wait a second. Come on out of there, Trevor. What's happened? Your brother's down there in the boat. Talk to him. Well, what am I going to... Talk to him. All right. Eddie. What's he done to you, sis? I'm all right, Eddie. Everything's all right. Gorse and I have decided... Go on home, Eddie. He's lying to you. He knows you framed him. If you sail out with him, you won't come back. No, Eddie. I'm coming aboard. Eddie, no. Gorse, please. No! Drop it, Hagen. No, drop the rifle. I'll drop you, you lousy Seamus. Sam, did he hurt you? No, I've been kicked in the stomach before. It takes a woman to kick you in the teeth. I'm sorry. I don't care what you did. What burns me up, you didn't do it right. I hate a bungler, especially a female bungler. I'm a bungler. You're the one. It would have worked if you hadn't gone poking in the incinerator. I should have called the police. They'd have known what to do with evidence like that. They've been wanting to get something on Gorse ever since repeal. Listen, Angel, any flatfoot could have seen through that setup. Eve Adams was sitting in front of a mirror when she was maced. She saw the murderer enter the room. She got it in the back of the head. That means she trusted whoever walked up behind her. That also means the evidence of a struggle was fake. But the nail polish on Gorse's shirt... You put that nail polish on her fingers after she was dead, laid that trail to the incinerator with a pair of Gorse's shoes where any flatfoot was supposed to think he'd try to destroy the incriminating shirt. But the dumbest thing you did was lying to me about that matching lipstick you dropped in my office. That made you look guiltier than anybody, because anybody could have planted that fake evidence. I didn't kill her. I'm not a murderer. Your brother might have got off easy. Crime of passion. Oh, please, please don't say that. I can't bear the thought that after everything I did, it's all come to nothing. Yeah, here, here, here. Have a lifesaver. You may need it. <laughs> Period. And a report. Oh, Sam. Poor Captain Fasalti. P is silent, Everson. Fasam. Go type that up. All right, Sam. Oh. Last one in the package. And now, listen to this. If you want the well-groomed look, listen... 
Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. God. What stopped you? The last page of my notebook going to our shortage of supplies, Sam. But in a way, I'm glad. Because I didn't have to go through it again. I mean, my... poor Captain Basaldi. Yeah, please. Please. Now, honest, I'll buy you a new notebook, a nice fat one. Would you like that? Oh, yes, Sam. There's always something so final about final pages of things. When, when I think of all the risks you take... To say nothing of my clients... I think I'll put a new sign on the door. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Oh, but I haven't, Sam. Where there's a will, there's a wisp. There's a what? A wisp, Sam. Small amount. Which reminds me, there's a couple of fingers left. Join me? Uh, just a wisp? Oh, no, Sam. One of us has got to have a clear head. Well, it'll be me. All the best. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Howard Duff can now be seen starring with Yvonne DiCarlo in Universal International's Technicolor production of Calamity Jane and Sam Bass. Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. transcription. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Where have you been? I've uh, been tasting the bitter with the sweet at Miss Wigginson's school for girls. Sort of a uh, special course in homicidal apiculture. Apiculture? Mm Mm-hmm. There were apes involved? Effie, where is your Latin? Apis, apianus, of or pertaining to bees. Oh, bees, of course. It was a bee caper? It was a beekeeper caper. Oh, that's funny, Sam. That's the honey. Effie, put these words down in your little book. Honey, sweetness, hives, combs, etc. Never mention them again. What? Keep things humming, sweetheart, and I'll be right down to drone my way through my report on the Queen Bee Caper. Uh, 
Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You know, during the summer, when you spend so much of your time out of doors, it's important to pay special attention to the care of your hair. To keep it right in place, to help keep it from getting dry, use America's favorite hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Use it every day. If you've never tried it, ask for it in the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle, and ask for it by name. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. To be or not to be? Hum. Oh, hello, Sam. Hiya, Sam. How's tricks? Oh, Effie, really, this jargon, this patois. Don't you think it's about time we spoke like educated people? You know best, Sam. Every time I visit one of our institutions of learning, I find out something I didn't know. Oh, Sam, that's incredulous. Well, you just know everything. Yeah, I guess I do when you come right down to it. The bee, for instance. Bees are a genus of insects of the Hymenopterus order. The what? Hymenopterus. Living in society is composed of one queen, or perfect female, a few males, or drones, and an indefinite number of undeveloped females, or neuters, which are the workers. That's me, I suppose. A neuter. Well, that's for you to say. Of course. And you know what else about the bee? What, Sam? Confidentially, it stings. <clears throat> Date, uh, July 10th, 1949... To Miss Elizabeth Cowley, Miss Wigginson School for Girls, Seacliff Drive, San Francisco. I wonder about girls sometimes. And that's bad, Effie. Bad. Oh. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Queen Bee Caper, dear Miss Cowley. I, uh, was singing a medley of sorority drinking songs as I opened the wrought iron gate, walked up the garden path past those cast iron deer and presented myself at the big brass bell pull beside that massive panel door that stands guard between the outside world and your sheltered inmates. A little housemaid wearing dimity let me in and led me to your office. I sat on your chintz-covered sofa and looked at your drapes with their thriving beehive motif and waited for you with my back half-turned to the open door. <laughs> yeah, hello, how are you? Girls, break it up. Break it up now. Go on, go on. Haven't you ever seen a man before? Run along now. You'll be late for physical ed. Go on. Quick. Miss Cowley? No, I'm not Miss Cowley. Oh, no, of course not. No, I was just hoping. You're Mr. Spade, aren't you? Laurie Thomas. I'm Miss Cowley's assistant. A nice day. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't bother to move. I'll lean over you. Mm-hmm. Put this report on her desk. Oh, mm-hmm. sure. Miss Cowley will be here in just a minute. Oh, thanks. It's so warm in here. Next time, wear a mailman's uniform and a 50-year-old stoop. You'll find the temperature's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, yes, ma'am. See that you do, then. Oh, Glory. There seems to have been a misplacement of some of the hockey. Would you check on it, please? Oh, surely. Nice to meet you, Mr. Spade. <clears throat> I'm Elizabeth Cowley. You may sit down. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Spade, I'll be painfully frank with you. A thief is at large in my school. Oh? Well, uh, you probably have a good answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Why not call in the police? I have a good answer, Mr. Spade. My girls come from San Francisco's finest and wealthiest families. Mm-hmm. Miss Wigginson's has had an untarnished reputation for more than three generations. I'm sure. As headmistress, I must handle this matter with the utmost discretion. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I already know the thief. Are there any questions? Well, uh, only one timid one. Who is it? I regret to say a faculty member is to blame. Glory Thomas. 
She was in here a minute or two ago. Oh, really? Well, uh, why, Miss Thomas, you find any of the loot stashed away in her room? Well, no. Uh, no, not exactly. I haven't recovered any of the stolen articles, but I'm sure Gloria's responsible. I'm certain she's the thief. You're just sure? I... I thought perhaps you might establish definite proof against Glory. You mean you, you want me to frame her? Oh, no, Mr. Spade. I, you misunderstand me. I don't think so, Miss Collie. Oh, dear. I, I was afraid this would happen. I told Ursula. But then I... All right, I'll ask. Who's Ursula? Mr. Spade, I... I think I can trust you. It was Ursula who instructed me to call you. Ursula Cavanaugh. You know the name. The Ursula Cavanaugh inherited all the real estate, lives in Cavanaugh Towers penthouse, hasn't set foot out of there in 20 years? Yes. Mrs. Cavanaugh is our school's benefactress. She is, of course, on the board of trustees. She is, moreover, a dear personal friend. Oh, I see. Oh, yes. We were classmates together here many years ago. Ursula's quite unlike myself. Married well, though a widow now. Rather aggressive. Frankly, she wishes to have... Glory Thomas discharged, but her connection with the dismissal must not be known. Now, I don't suppose I can ask you to take the assignment now. I'm a detective, Miss Collie, not a frame-up artist. I had to have my name called up in the lobby, and then two elevator trips later, I faced her on her penthouse terrace. Ursula Cavanaugh looked like a 1910 stock company lead out of Charlie's Aunt. Smoking a black Italian stogie and gripping a cane like a shillelagh. Two men were on the receiving end of her black snake whip of a tongue. A youngish guy, stockbroker type, and an individual in a morning coat who looked practically nude without a butterfly net. Oh, you're a fool and an incomplete, Jelinek. I lost all patience with you ages ago. Not only are you incompetent, but you're also dishonest. Don't mind telling you that when the board of directors meets on Thursday, I intend to instruct well, uh, them really, to have... Miss Cavanaugh, I, I've tried not to uh, discommode you in any way. Uh, I endeavor in every detail to fulfill my responsibilities as manager of this... Don't hotel. interrupt me. Uh, Auntie, I think you've got Jelinek and me all wrong. Now, the truth the is... The truth is, we... Gerald, you're both a pair of thieving scoundrels. Now, get out, Jelinek, before your weasel face ruins my digestion. Very well, madam. I remain at your service. Ah, no back. No stunk. And as for you, my dear nephew... Uh, I think I'll toddle along, Addie. I ought to get back to the office. Control your little impulses, Gerald. I admire a little larceny in any man, but not at my expense. I was beginning to think I'd become invisible in that rarefied penthouse atmosphere. She hadn't even blinked at me while Jelinek slunk back to the lobby and Gerald toddled along to his office. The terrace was a riot of bloom. I don't know much about flowers, but she must have had them all there. Off to one side, a little man in a blue smock putted around a wooden structure on a stand. I'd become aware of bees humming amidst the flowers when she finally spoke to me. You're Tom Spade, aren't you? Sam, ma'am, the fun-loving Spade. Picked your photograph out of the other detectives. Looked like you got spunk. Why'd you come here? Curiosity. I met Glory Thomas out at Miss Wigginson's. I liked her. I wanted to see the type that would strong arm her out of a job from a safe distance. Spunky. Come over here, Mr. Spade. I want to show you something. Take it. Yes, ma'am. That'll do for now. Work at the other end of the garden for the time being. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Piggott's my gardener and beekeeper. Most taciturn individual. You know what this is? Well, I didn't, but now I can see it's a beehive. Yes, my own beehive. Fresh honey from a tea and fruit cake every afternoon. Fine old tradition. Observe this hive, young man. Honeybees are the most intelligent of all insects, surpassing even the ants. And why? <laughs> because one female controls a community of many, many thousands. I am against it. Yes, Mr. Spade. The queen bee reigns supreme. The males are drones, quite useless. The female workers perform all necessary labor. No waste motion. No dissension. Well, some of my best friends are drones, and I just can't I stand them. I think you understand me, Mr. Spade. I wish Gloria Thomas removed from San Francisco for an excellent reason. 
My nephew, Gerald Long, the young man who just left here, has developed absurd romantic notions about her. Yeah, so you want the romance busted up. But if you try to break it up openly, your nephew might get stubborn and even marry her. On the other hand, by framing her as a thief, you ward off the affair until you can figure out some other dirty trick. I knew you'd understand me, Mr. Spade. I admire bluntness in moderation. Well, what do you say to joining forces with me? Just one thing, Mrs. Cavanaugh. Nuts. <laughs> Next morning, I put through a call to Nickinson School for Girls. It had been my intent to talk to you, Miss Collie, to tell you I'd left my hat in your office, but somehow I found myself talking to Glory Thomas. And somehow our talk resulted in a cocktail date at the 10 o'clock scholar bar and lounge. I shouldn't have come, of course. Oh, uh, exam papers to grade, no doubt? Stacks and stacks. Hmm, so velvet-type hands. Well, what's this on them? Stain. I teach our girls chemistry, among other things. Mm-hmm. How about me taking on a night school class for the other things? You're crazy. You don't need any education. Well, I can always use a postgraduate course. <laughs> You're really crazy, Sam. I needed this. We'll make a night of it. Maybe. Gerald won't object, huh? What's that mean? Who have you been talking to? That hateful old woman? Mrs. Cavanaugh wants to put the boots to you, Glory. She called me in to frame you. I could kill her. Oh, easy now, Glory. Don't talk to me. I thought I could take it. I thought I could be patient and wait while Jerry ironed everything out. But not now, though. I hate that selfish, domineering old woman. I hate her nephew, and I hate you. Well, that'll do to start with, honey. Now, let's get down my list. I hate... Oh, the... let me go. I've had all I can take for one night. Wait a minute, Glory. I was... Hey, you forgot your bag. Hey! <laughs> She disappeared around the corner as I came out into the street. It was starting to rain. As I stepped off the curb, I slipped and turned my ankle. As I limped onto Montgomery Street, I saw her disappearing into one of the tall buildings on my side of the street. It could have been the Cavanaugh Towers. I stepped and a half into the lobby thereof a few minutes later. As I came in, Jelinek, the manager, was getting off the elevator. He swatted himself several times in the neck and then went into a door marked private. No trace of glory in the lobby. I looked in the bar. She wasn't there, but Albert Piggott, the beekeeper, was having a stinger. Who? Now I'm beginning to feel good. I feel... Hey, who's this? I know that. Why, it's Mr. Spade. Sit down, Mr. Spade. I don't have time just now, Mr. Piggott. Tell me... Sit down, sit down. Oh, oh, easy, easy. I'm... I'm fired. Have you heard? I'm fired. Just a worker out of work. Turned out by the Queen Bee. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Piggott. I imagine Mrs. Cavanaugh wasn't too easy to work for. I told her to keep away from the bees when I wasn't there. Well, she's gone and disobeyed me. One of the workers must have stung her. She's got a temper, you know. Ooh, why? Must have smashed the eye with her stick. Bees were everywhere, all over. And then she fired me. Well, when was this, and why did she fire you? Oh, about, oh, just... Now, maybe half an hour ago, I knocked, and then there wasn't any answer, and then I let myself in. It was all dark. I couldn't even see her. Heard the bees, of course, but couldn't. <gasps> Who was I? And I said, Mrs. Cavanaugh, you, you disobeyed me. And in this voice, this awful voice, she said, Mr. Pickett, you're fired. Get out. This awful voice in the dark. And Mr. Mr. Pickett, mind you, never before just Pickett this and Pickett that. And they, hey, where are you going? Hey! I didn't bother to stop at the desk to get myself announced. I took the passenger elevator and then operated the penthouse elevator myself. No hands. Nobody answered my ring. The door was unlocked. I was inside. Crossed through the empty apartment to the terrace. The rain had just stopped and the sunset cut a sudden shaft. First I heard it, the humming of swarming bees. Then I saw the overturned beehive. Then I saw Ursula Cavanaugh sprawled back in her chair, a stick and Italian stogie on the floor, while the bees clustered greedily over the fruit cake and honey set out on the table. I wondered if those most intelligent of all insects had the answer to Shakespeare's question, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, 
now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Queen Bee Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Miss Cowley speaking. Sam Spade. Oh, oh yes. You shouldn't have gone to see Mrs. Cavanaugh. I didn't make any promises, ma'am. Ursula was quite upset by your visit. Called me after you left her. Quite angry about it, Mr. Spade. Oh? She wanted to see me today. Our weekly half-day holiday, you know. But I simply couldn't face her. I'm sorry if I sound I finally managed to doze off after everyone left for the afternoon. Have you called before? No, this is the first time. I'm at Mrs. Cavanaugh's place right now. Indeed. Does Ursula wish to talk to me? She can't. I beg your pardon? It might be a good idea if you'd come over here, Miss Collie. Mrs. Cavanaugh's dead. What was that? Mrs. Cavanaugh's dead. And since you're her oldest and closest friend... Yes, Mrs. Spade. I'll come immediately. Well, you came on over, Miss Collie, but meanwhile, nephew Gerald Long arrived, also Piggott, whom I called down at the bar and who sobered up with remarkable rapidity on hearing the news. Gerald was shaken up by his great aunt's demise. We waited for the family doctor to arrive and watched Piggott entice the bees back into the hive. You turned up soon after and tried to soothe Gerald's nerves. The hotel manager, Jelinek, also flooded in. The doctor diagnosed cause of death as shock from formic acid. The secretion bees inject into the bloodstream with their stingers. We all stood around thinking our various thoughts as the doc voiced this verdict. Piggott was the one who voiced an epitaph. She really knew nothing about bees, you know. The queen bee was all important, she thought. But there's always a rebel in every hive. The queen bee is always deposed sooner or later. The worker bees go on and on. But the queen bee... Can't rain forever. After that, we all left and went our various ways. Poor old Piggott shouldn't have said that. But he must have been a lot drunker than he seemed. Because he was found next morning in his garden in Marin County beside his overturned beehive, a victim like his late employer of fatal bee stings. <laughs> Tell Nick you're a fool if you think you'll get away with this. Don't threaten me, Mr. Long. I've been bullied long enough. I don't intend to lose my position here now Mrs. Cavanaugh's gone. I've taken all I could stand from her, and I don't intend to let you walk all over me. I'll do whatever I think needs to be done, Jelinek. Well, if you're trying to insinuate I that I have I can cause you as much trouble as you cause me. Maybe more. With what I found out about you now, Get out I... here. Go on, beat it before I break... How did you get in here, Spade? Door was open. Well, if you're here to collect any kind of bill, I want to know what services you rendered. Nothing's rendered yet. But I figured you might like to know that Aunt Ursula was murdered. Murdered? Uh, you, 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 you can't say that. Not my whole Shut up, Jelinek. You need proof to back that up, Spade. I've got it. Piggott. What? Piggott's dead. How do you know? His doctor just called me. Yeah. Well, that's why I know your aunt was murdered. I've just been out to Marin. I had quite a session with that doctor. Well, where's your proof, man? Who'd want to kill her? Well, I, 
Oh, stop it. Practically everybody will know her. Uh, really, now, I, I must protest this disrespect to the Shut members up. of the... Go on, Spade, go on. Start getting specific. Well, specifically, Pickett's doctor, because of what I suggested, examined the dead man again, found the mark of a hypodermic, plus the fact that a concentrated solution of formic acid killed Pickett. Pickett's next-door neighbor said he'd been stung as often as 10 and 12 times a day. That meant he'd built up a certain immunization to bee sting. Are you suggesting that someone murdered him with an injection of uh, commercial formic acid? I thought I'd made that fairly clear. And what would the motive be? To keep him from talking about his employer's murder. I see. Well, is that all? Yeah, except that his neighbor told me somebody answering your description called on him this afternoon. My... Oh. Well, yes, but uh, Spade, look here. I can explain Allow that. Allow me. I... Hello. Gerald, hello, darling. I'll be through in about an hour. I just got to check supplies in the chem lab, and then I'll be home and show you what a cook I am. You better be brave. I'm up. sorry. Just a second. Here's Gerald. For you, Gerald. Your wife. Oh. I... Hold on a second, honey. Uh, Spade, look here. Now, you, you can't drag her into this thing. When did because... you get married? Yesterday afternoon. Husband and wife. No testifying, huh? <laughs> Well, I don't think I'll need your testimony. Jelinek's face fell four inches into his ascot tie as he heard himself lose exclusive hush money rights to the above information. Pausing only to enjoy a hearty laugh at his discomfiture, I went on to my next and final port of call, Miss Wigginson's School for Girls. This time, there was no girlish tittering as I entered Miss Collie. No dewy young Amazons clutching hockey sticks in their grubby little hands. For a very good reason, as you told me. My girls are dismissed for the day, Mr. Spade. Because of poor Ursula, of course. Really disrupts our routine. First our weekly half-day holiday yesterday, and now today... Yeah, I'd like to talk to Miss Thomas in the uh, chemistry lab she is, I think. Very well. I'll take you to her. She knows nothing of our first meeting. I've talked to her. Oh, well, in here... Oh, what do you want? Thought we might talk. We've nothing to talk about. Well, we could talk about this hypodermic. Put that down. I'm using it for an experiment. Or uh, how about a formula, HCOOH or CH2O2? What? That's formic acid. Mm Mm-hmm. Miss Collie, you said yesterday was a half-day holiday. Did Miss Thomas stay here in school? Why, no. She rarely does on Wednesday afternoon. That's why Mrs. Cavanaugh had a visitor, didn't she, Glory? Did she? After you ran away from me? All right. I, I did go up to see her. I, I was so mad about, about what you told me. I intended to hand in my resignation and give her a piece of my mind, and I, I... But she was dead when I got there. Oh, Glory. No. And I... I just got panic-stricken and ran. Yeah, murder's a pretty scary thing. Murder? What do you mean, Mr. Spade? Mrs. Cavanaugh died from a hypodose of formic acid. Somebody familiar with chemistry would use that method. Then... Then that could mean... Mm -hmm. The acid could be made up in this lab. The hypodermic could be this one here. I didn't kill her. I didn't. You say you were scared. You were so scared, you ran all the way to City Hall and married her nephew. So you found out. Uh, Jellyneck found out first. He intended to squeal the old lady, but she was dead when he got back. He knew her will disinherited Gerald if he married without her auntie's approval while she was still alive. We married after she was dead. But, But that didn't matter. After I saw you, I told Jerry if he was any sort of man, he'd marry me, will or no will. He did. And yet this morning, he drove over to Marin County to see old Piggott. You think he was trying to shield me? I tell you, she was dead when I got into that room. I don't know anything about Piggott. One moment. I believe I recall that Mr. Piggott said Ursula spoke to him when she uh, discharged him. Glory, you must be mistaken about the time you entered that room. She couldn't have already been dead because... Yes, uh, she could have and was. The killer was almost caught by Piggott. She hid behind the curtain in the dark and spoke to him. Miss Cavanaugh was already dead, but... uh... I see. Mr. Piggott thought it was Ursula's voice, but it was yours, Glory. No, it was yours, Miss Collie. What? You committed both murders. You had access to the murder weapon. You had the half-day holiday to do it in. Mr. Spade... Even at that moment, the finishing school school marm had to say, Mr. Piggott. Well, I'm not sorry for it. Ursula misused her power shamefully. And now the queen bees deposed again. You're brighter than most men, Mr. Spade. 
You, too, understood the significance of Mr. Pickett's remark last night. Yeah, I could have been a little brighter a little sooner. You helped give yourself away when you asked me if I'd called you earlier yesterday afternoon. Why, Sam? How could she? Well, Kavanaugh bullied her since childhood. Then you came on the staff and your ability scared her. The queen bee being deposed and whatnot. When Kavanaugh wanted you framed, she saw a chance to get rid of both of you. She hoped her murder would look like an accident, but if it was recognized as murder, you'd be the logical suspect. Oh, you're much too clever, Mr. Spade. Let's get it over with. Yeah, let's. It's up to those drones at Homicide from here on in. Hurry it and a report. Sam? Yes, Evie? How come Gerald went out to see Mr. Piggott? Well, Gerald didn't care about the will, but he didn't want to boot a fortune out the window either. Glory hadn't told him she'd seen his aunt, so he called on Piggott to find out when Piggott last saw Auntie alive. Go type that up. I am completely well, and when you return, we shall Indian wrestle. Certainly, sir. And now, listen to this. Shopping note. Tonight or tomorrow, get a family-sized bottle or handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America. By transcription. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Yes, please, I'm sweetheart. very sorry, but Mr. Spade is not available at this hour of the morning. Effie, you might have better luck if you try in an hour or so, say somewhere around 10.30 or 11. Effie. You see, his work keeps him up nights, and he has to have... His... Miss Perrine, this is your employer. Take a deep breath. Mm. Got it? Mm. Now let's start all over again. This is Samuel Spade up and kicking at 9.30 in the morning. Already? Still. Sam, this is absolutely unprecedented. Mm? You haven't been up this early since 1934. I had to see you, sweetheart. Really, Sam? I couldn't stay away another moment from those roguish green eyes, that windblown hair. Oh, Sam. That gay musical laugh, that cute little upturned nose. Sam, are you giving me a line? I'm about to, sweetheart. A fishing line. A fishing line? Mm-hmm. Where were you with a fishing line? In a closet, of course. Oh. If I had a couple of sinkers and a brand new hook, I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Cuddy Hunk caper. Gotta keep myself away, Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Say, has your family tried Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic yet? That's right, I said your family. For not only men, but women and children, too... Like the neat, natural way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms their hair. The effective way it relieves annoying dryness. The fast, thorough way it removes loose, ugly dandruff. If your family hasn't tried it yet, get Wild Root Cream Oil in the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle. Find out why it's America's favorite. Ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Sam! Hello, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, what's the matter with you? Calm yourself, Angel. Nobody looks good this time of the morning. Just got my hair must. Oh, but all. look at your... your I know, clothes. I know, but don't jump to conclusions. I haven't got two heads. The little one is only a bump on the big one. <laughs> Shall we have at it? You look nice in the morning, Sam. That's a big, dirty lie. Now, what is that bright yellow stuff all over the floor there? Oh, that sunshine. Oh. Uh, date, fill it in to uh, Mr. Terrence Burgess, City Jail, San Francisco, California. Jail? Mm-hmm. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596, subject, the Cuddy Hunk Caber. It seems like only last night that I was strolling up O'Farrell Street through the fog. As a matter of fact, it was last night. 
A night off, I thought. I would sidle up to Dreamland Auditorium and watch two other people break each other's bones for a change. The card looked interesting. A 300-pound ox known to the public as Nasty Norbert was wrestling a new import named the Swedish Pinhead. Extra, night final, convicted killer escapes from city jail. Extra, bludgeon killer loose. Extra. Paper, mister? Not I, son. I am not interested in crime. But wait. How many papers have you left, fella? About 54. Well, you better get going. Somehow, the news of the bludgeon killer's escape touched only the outer fringe of my consciousness since I was determined to leave it all behind for a night. So I strolled toward Dreamland, noting the while that about a half a block behind me, a character in a hat and a long gray overcoat seemed to have the same thing in mind. When you've been failed as often as I have, Terry boy, you develop hindsight. This was obviously an amateur shadow. I'd stop, look in the store window, so would he. I turned off O'Farrell onto Webster, ditto. Then off Webster onto Geary and over onto Fillmore. My shadow was moving closer now, keeping me inside in the crowd. When a police car screamed past, my guy ducked into a store entrance like a rabbit. I turned up Post Street, slid into a dark doorway, and waited. Hold it, buddy. No, no, wait. Let go of me. Just a minute. Here, give me that. You... Okay. Now, what's the matter? Nothing. Honest, I... Why are you tailing me? I... I'm in trouble. You're getting a lot more trouble running around with a police 38 in your overcoat pocket. Where'd you get it? I borrowed it. Who from? A cop. Wait a minute. Raise your hat. Yeah. All right, I'm Terry Burgess. Terry Burgess? Didn't they convict you? Yeah. They were going to sentence me tomorrow. The bludgeon killer, huh? How did you spring? The cop turned his back and I grabbed, that's all. I had to get out, Spade. I had to... Wait a minute now, wait a minute. I had nothing to do with it, so help me, but nobody cares, nobody listens to me. I'm going to the gas chamber for something I didn't do. You got a lawyer, haven't you? Oh, he can't do anything. He tried to, Well, but... what can I do? I don't know, Mr. Spade, I don't know. I saw you back there. I thought if anybody could help me, you could. I'll take it easy. I followed you trying to get up nerve, but... Can't you please do something? You hear that? Those are plow cars, kid. I know that's bad news to you, and it'll be bad news for me if I'm caught talking to you instead of dragging you into headquarters. Yeah, but... I'll tell you what. I'll listen to what you can tell me in five minutes. I'll risk my license just that long. On page one of the Beginner's Handbook for Correspondent School Detectives, it states that it is not okay for a private investigator to conceal a known criminal, much less a convicted murderer. But I couldn't help wondering why this flyweight bludgeon killer would seek out for a confidant, a detective. Especially one whose unfaltering sense of duty and sickening high moral standards have made his name anathema to the underworld and have caused him to be blackballed at gangster canasta parties everywhere. Anyway, I listened to the kid's story. He started right in about Lori about Hanover. Got me. She was beautiful, of course, but I've known a lot like that. Lori Hanover, huh? Uh, what was she, a photographer's model or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Kind of a screwball, according to the papers. Oh, they didn't know the half of it. She'd been giving me the brush for weeks. Well, I thought it was another guy. I tried to talk to her, but she'd just hang up on me. Then what? I couldn't stand it any longer. One night I got tanked up and went over to her place for a showdown. I found her lying on the bed with her head all... It was awful. I... How'd you get in? The door was open. Yeah? Then what? I... I guess I passed out. When I woke up, a cop was standing over me. That's all there was to it. That's enough. What time did you get there? I don't know. How did you get there? I took a taxi. What kind of a taxi? Where's the driver? I don't even remember that. It was some off-brand of a taxi. Some off-brand of a taxi? This is important, kid. I know it is. I try to remember, but I can't. It's... I try to remember... A... 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 Yeah, a nightmare. Uh, what time did you leave your apartment? I don't know. Sometime after dinner. You don't know when you left, how you got there, or what time you found it. I'm telling you the truth. Believe me. I... Your five minutes are up. Come on, let's go. But listen, I can lie to you. I can make it a lot of times and stuff, but I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Hey! Wait a minute. That's a police car. Sure it is. I... Let go of me. I... Take it easy, Burgess. You dirty double grudge. Okay, Burgess. Okay. Uh... What's going on there? Come on, Burgess. Come on. Get up. Burgess? Where? Yeah, let's take him down to headquarters. I should have known better, Spade. Shut up and get in. Well, well, Burgess. Uh, boys will be glad to see you back. 
He's got a great story, officer. He doesn't remember anything that happened the night of the murder, and he's stuck with it. Sure, they're all alike. He's guilty of sin. That's where you're wrong. He's innocent. Huh? But then why are you... Because I'd hate to have a client knocked off by a trigger-happy cop. You'll be safer in jail. <laughs> to headquarters, officer, and please don't let's use the siren, huh? What a night. Put him away, Lieutenant? Yeah. He's in his cell now, talking to Chenoa. Chenoa? You mean the lawyer? Yeah. Well, he comes pretty high. Where's uh, Burgess get the money to hire him? Uh, he's assigned with the court. Chenoa sort of half volunteered, anyway. Hey, you mind if I make a suggestion, Sam? It's your office, Kelsey. Go home and go to bed. You're wasting your time. I don't think so. I got an ache in my bad knee. The case is off the books, Sam. Off your books, onto mine. I think the kid was framed. Framed? Holy cow. He gets drunk, makes a lot of threats against the girl in a public bar, takes off for her apartment, the landlady hears a scuffle, calls us, and when we get there, he's out cold on the floor, not six feet from her body. What more could you ask? One small question. Uh, who killed her? Uh, guys who knock off their girlfriends generally have a few answers, Andy Lieutenant. Burgess has none. So he's stupid. So he was drunk and doesn't remember. Look, Kelsey, old gray-headed friend, I've saved you a lot of trouble tonight. Now, why don't you be a love and get me the transcript of the trial, huh? It's out of my department. You're well thought of around here, Lieutenant. I'll bet you could get it if you try. Oh, Sam, for Pete's sake. And the case file, too, while you're at it, huh? Good evening, gentlemen. I presume this is Mr. Spade. That's right. This is Mr. Chanoa, Sam. How are you? How do you do, Sam? I'll leave you two to hold hands while I rattle up those files. Treat him gently tonight, Mr. Chenoweth. He has an ache in his bad knee. Bad knee? Uh, some people get hunches in their head. I get them in my knee. I wish you were right. How's the kid? Oh, better. You've given him something to hold on to. It's going to be tough when the letdown comes. It's a little early to be digging his grave, don't you think? And it's a little late to be riding up like a knight in shining armor and telling him you're going to get him off the hook. I don't mind telling your spade that I resent your intrusion, implying as it does that... that uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, what, uh? Well, that I haven't discharged my duties as counsel as efficiently as I might have. I want you to know that I volunteered my services on this case because I thought a charge of first-degree murder against this boy was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So you try to get him off on manslaughter? Uh, temporary insanity. Why not manslaughter? Because ten people heard him swear he was going to kill Laurie Hanover in a bar one hour before the crime, that's why. Okay, so you pitch for temporary insanity and the court psychiatrist pins you to the mat. And all the while, you were leaving out the solidest bed of all. Oh? Yeah. That he didn't kill her. That he was innocent. A fall guy for somebody who had a much better reason than he did. And another thing, Chenoweth, if you defended the kid half as well as you're defending yourself right now, he wouldn't be in the can. Good night. Why do I talk so big when I know so little? After spending a couple of hours with the files Kelsey brought me, I began to wish I hadn't stopped in that doorway on Post Street. I'd have had a much more pleasant time with Nasty Norbert and the Swedish Pinhead. Kelsey and Chenoweth were right. The case against Terry Burgess was tighter than a Pullman window. So I went home and I went to bed. My bad, Eve, the bad knee was aching worse than ever when the phone rang. Hello. Hello. Mr. Spade? Yeah. Mr. Spade, I'm awfully sorry to bother you at this hour, but as Shakespeare said, delays have dangerous ends. Yeah, he also said tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Any one of the three will suit me, friend, but right now then I'm... Then you'd rather procrastinate? No, hibernate. I'm in my bare feet and the floor's cold. Very well, then. I only saw you with young Burgess in an alleyway tonight, and I thought you might be interested in what I have to say. Hold it. I'll get my slippers. I, I won't keep you long. As you know, Mr. Spade, the case against Mr. Burgess was particularly strong since the defense was unable to produce any other suspect with sufficient motive. Right. There's an excellent reason for that. They whose guilt within their bosom lies imagine every eye beholds their blame. Burgess? Shakespeare. I have made a decision, Mr. Spade. Two hours of quiet meditation have convinced me it is time to reveal to you that young Burgess is, in fact, innocent. Who are you? If you will call at my office... Room 210 in the Cabrillo building. I shall supply you with good and sufficient proof. Hello? Hello? It took two minutes to throw clothes on over my pajamas and run down to the street. 
And as my taxi cab took off, I noticed that the ache in my bad knee was gone. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. By transcription. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Finita Mast. Mr. Who? Finita Mast. It is finished. Latin. Oh. Sam? What's left of me, sweetheart? Well, where are you? What happened? Who did it? Here. Everything. And what? What? No, I asked you first. Sam. Now you're making sense. Well, did that Mr. Mortuous get in touch with you? The Mortuous Neil Neasy Bonham. Oh, Sam, stop it. Second year Latin, F. Speak well of the dead. You mean he's dead? If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. This one ends up worse than Rigoletto. Have your extra handkerchief ready, get some organ music on the radio, and I'll be down to dictate my report on the tears of night caper. <laughs> Dasho Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You know, just a little Wild Root Cream Oil in your hair can mean a world of improvement in your general appearance. Just try it and see. See how Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Yes, you'll be glad to discover that just a few drops of Wild Root Cream Oil make a big difference. So if you've never tried it before, get the 25-cent Get Acquainted size and ask for it by name. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Sam, you... Oh! Sam, your face! What happened to it? Many, many things, Jeff. But it's also kind of... raw. Oh, Sam. In time, Effie, my wounds will heal. Oh, I'll bet that that, that Mamie Gagan had something to do with it. I could tell when she came in here that she was going the to be... The mortuous Neil Nisi Bonham. Huh? Latin. Speak well of the dead, remember? Oh, she... Uh, one thing at a time, sweetheart. Let's get this over with. I want to find a doctor. Oh, you're so brave, Sam. Carrying on in the face of... Of your face. Sure, sure, sure. You won't be satisfied until you just... Just die for your profession. Yeah, well, if I do, Neil Nizzy Bonham, Effie. Neil Nizzy Bonham. That means... Latin means, uh... Yeah, bony knees. Oh. Uh, date July 24, 1949. To Miss Daphne Arlington from Samuel Spade. San Francisco, license number 137596. Subject, the tears of night. Dear Daphne... I hope this will clear up a few things in your mind. I hope it'll let you know how you got where you are and what happened to put you there. It all has an illogical beginning, middle, and end. At three, yesterday afternoon, my loyal secretary and confidant, Miss Effie Perrine, a doll, who has been rehearsing a cockney play for television, flung open my office door and said, Miss Mamie Gagan to see Mr. Spide. I said, Cooey. Miss Mamie Gagan looked everything the name implied from her lately blonded hair to her genuine alligator shoes. I might add, she weighed in at approximately 160 and was in very good condition. You, Spade. I am he. Uh, sit down, please. Ah. Don't you believe me? I hate gum shoes. They all stink. Uh, something in your background. Perhaps as a girl. I'm just assuming that you were one. Oh, uh, gum shoes are nosy. They talk too much. That's why I don't like them. Here. For me? Who else, stupid? Oh. 
Well, it says, uh, pay to the order of Samuel Spade, $100, signed Mamie Gagan, co-signed Johnny McCall. All right, is it good? You wise guy or something, sure it's good. I'm the treasurer. Get your hat. In this weather? We gonna go see Johnny. McCall? Yeah. Uh, why are we gonna see Johnny? Johnny wants you should do something for him. Oh, what does Johnny want I should do for him? Come on, Spade, what's the matter with you? He'll tell you. I'd just love to hear you talk, Mame, that's all. All this gas ain't getting us nowhere. The boss is waiting. Gumshoes talk too much. Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe we do, but ours is a lonely profession. Mamie led me to a large Cadillac parked in a no-parking zone. She tore the ticket up and ate it. We got in and charged through traffic towards Burlingame. About a half a mile this side of the main highway, we turned off to the left... And pretty soon, we were winding up a private road to a fine old colonial mansion. Two or three private patrolmen were guarding the entrance. They all needed shaves. They kind of nodded as we went up to the front door. Naturally enough, it didn't open, but a peep shutter did. Yeah. Me, Feely, this is the private peeper the boss wants to see open up. Okay. How are you feeling, Mr. Feely? Screw, screw. All kinds of folks around. This way, Spade. Mamie, I got your peeper. Okay. Inside. Here he is, Johnny, flat feet and all. His name's Spade. Hey, I know, know, I know. I picked him myself. Go on, beat it. I hate gum shoes. Boom. <laughs> I don't mind, Mamie. She's kind of bitter. Yes, she is. Yeah. We did a lousy job on her hair last time. It's all streaky. Yeah, I noticed. Go on, sit down. Nice place, Johnny. Nice place. How's the growth? Oh, ain't as good as running beer, but... Them days are gone. I do all right. Two crap tables, two faro games, a little roulette in the living room. But I have to be careful. Yeah, you seem to have plenty of muscle outside to keep you safe and comfy. Ah, punks, all of them. But the best I can get nowadays, no good gunsels left. Guess they all got married and settled down or something. All right, Johnny, it's cool and it's nice out here. You make a living and I got a check for $100. Why? Well, in my line, I don't generally have much use for a private eye. I don't generally like them. Neither does Manny. But I can use one right now. Ever see this before? No? Well, it's a little bit of necklace. Necklace case. Called the Tears of Night or something. Yeah? It's worth quite a chunk of Gitas. These four diamonds are good stuff. Dame named Daphne Arlington left it here a week ago when she went in for a plunge at the roulette table. She left it for a standby till she raised the cash. Kind of screwy, Dame. You know, a widow with a lot of money... Boyfriend named Lenny Epich mm-hmm. paints or something. Mm-hmm. Well, she sent me a check today for the 5G she lost, and I just want you to take this thing back to her. That all? Yeah, that's all. I got my dough, she gets a necklace. You're a licensed bonded investigator, insured, safe with you. I couldn't trust any of my punks with it, and I don't like to be seen in public, so you just take it back. It's all very simple. Uh-huh. Now that you've told me how simple it is, suppose you give me the unexpurgated sequel. Did her uh, check bounce? Yep. On a drink. There wasn't any check, Sam. She called me a couple of hours ago and said if I didn't have this thing back to her by tonight, she'd call a load of cops and come out here and tear the joint apart. Not such a screwy dame at that. You're stuck. You telling me. If she comes with cop, I'm closed for season. I'm getting old. Oh, you're not old, son. Ah, Feely was running the table. I didn't know he'd taken this thing for security until we counted up. Stupid Feely. Uh, I should have pushed his mush in or something. Letting a dame like that make us a setup. Well, maybe you'll do better next time. Oh, ain't gonna be no next time, Spade. Well, here's her address. Here's the ice. Just take it to her and I'll chalk it up to experience. You better get yourself a new boy at that table, Johnny. You telling me. You telling me. Well, uh, bye. Lenny, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at 8.30, and you know how the traffic is, and if we're going to have a bite to eat... You aren't, Lenny. Where's Lenny? I don't know, Miss Arlene. I'm supposed to deliver some jewelry. Jewelry? That would be mortuous. 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 Uh, yes, but I... What uh... are you looking at? Your throat. Really? Well, really, Mr... Mr. Mr... Spade, Sam Spade. Well, really, Mr. Spade. I'm only waiting for Lenny to get here so we can make the first curtain of streetcar. And we're going to be late if he doesn't get here. You can understand that, Mr. Spade. You're going to be a little early. Streetcar doesn't open until Monday. And already, and he hasn't shown up. Well, good night, Mr. Spade. Hey! 
The white ermine cape you were wearing and the black strapless thing made it a touch, but you had it. A diamond necklace. In fact, the tears of night, the same one I had in my pocket, Daphne, was hanging around your lovely neck. I rebuzzed your buzzer and knocked on your door for quite a while until it was quite evident that you were not going to open up. Under the hallway light, I snapped open the necklace case. Mortuous, you had said. And mortuous was what it said stamped inside the case. A gloomy word with a gloomy address. The White Hotel on Turk Street. Hannibal Mortuous, at your service, sir. If ever a man had the look of death, it was this one who had its name. He was older than old, cadaverous, and in his skull-like head, his eyes were white. He was wearing a flannel nightshirt. Uh, you, you find me a bit indisposed, Mr. Spade. The clerk at the desk said it was a matter of jewelry. Therefore, Hannibal Mortuous is at your service. Now then, sir, what is so urgent? I uh, came to ask you about a diamond necklace. I found your name stamp on the inside here. Uh, House of Mortuous, the most respected name in diamonds, as well as all the lapidary arts, most respected. Fine jewels in the name Mortuous is synonymous the world over. I am the last of four sons. Uh, well, but what continues to say? Well, I just want you to take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how do you come in possession of the tears of night, sir? Well, uh, a man named Johnny McCall, who runs a gambling club, hired me to deliver it to a lady named Daphne Arlington. She lost it at the roulette table. She left it there until she could raise the cash. <laughs> deplorable, deplorable conduct on her part. Daphne Arlington, uh, most indiscreet young lady, to be sure, to be sure. I recall my interview with her when her late husband, uh, Sidney, ordered this necklace. A lovely body, propelled by a ridiculous mind. For shame, such conduct, a gambling house, the tears of night upon. Well, this is real, Anne? That isn't phony? Mr. Spade, I am a gemologist. The house of mortuous. Of course, it's real. Take a good look. When an artist creates a dazzling thing of beauty such as this, would he be so unlikely as to forget the time, the patience, the agony of his creation? See how each stone is carefully mounted to capture every single pinpoint of light. Mm -hmm. An incomparable masterpiece. Mm -hmm. An incredible money. How much money? Well, no wholesale market, about 10,000. Arlington? He paid 25, but he had it, as I say. Incomparable. Yeah. Yeah, well, I uh, saw another one just like it tonight. Ridiculous. The finest workman is best could only create a crude resemblance. This kind of work demands an artist or an artist. Uh, but tell me, uh, Latin in Angus Elba, huh? Oh, my second year Latin escapes me. A uh, snake in the grass. Uh, something wrong? Uh, something wrong, yeah. You you were concerned for the safety of this piece. I have a small safe in my room. You may have the key if you care. I'll take it with me. Thank you, Mr. Mortuous. My pleasure, Mr. Spain. Omnia mortuus bonum vocat est. All speak well of mortuous. A panza. Good evening. In the dismal lobby of the White Hotel, I asked the night clerk for some wrapping paper and 20 cents worth of stamps. It was a hunch, plus the fact that outside in the street, I spotted two of Johnny McCall's unshaved gorillas. They were looking up at the front of the building. Mr. Mortuous must have switched off his light or something because their eyes suddenly dropped and I saw them separate, one on each side of the front door. With shoulders carefully hunched, I stepped out into the lonesome night. I hoped they would think I was carrying my thirty-eight, which I was not. They didn't. Here's the paper, Candy. You want to ask him for a match? Candy's nearsighted. That's too bad. This him, Ernest? You got a match, Spade? Yeah, not so close. Candy ask if you got a match. He's a dummy, Candy. He don't answer. Got a match, Spade? What did I tell you? He's a dummy. He don't look like no dummy. Take your hands off. He's a dummy, all right. Ain't you, Spade? See, he's a dummy, Candy. I told him about you being nearsighted and he wouldn't answer. He don't talk. Go on, smart boy. Tell him, tell Candy how sorry you are about him being nearsighted. I told you he was a dummy, Candy. 
All private eyes like you. And he asks you a question. He wants to know if all private eyes is like you. I don't like no dummy. We ask questions and he ain't told us nothing. That makes him a dummy. Maybe we find out something if we went through his pockets. Yeah, even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold him, Candy. <laughs> All right, boys. You played the scene real good, and I'll see what I can do for you. Hey, you talk. Yeah. Make him talk again, Candy. Yeah. Make him talk bigger, Candy. <laughs> bigger. Bigger. Hey, he, he talks real nice, but he don't say much. Think maybe he's tough, Ernest? Right? Yeah, maybe. Hold him up. <laughs> see? He ain't so tough. feel like talking on that quiet little street where the only noise was my face pounding on their fists. I didn't have the necklace anymore, but they had to find out the hard way. The hard way for me. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Tears of Night caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I remember trying to wake up a couple of times... I was dreaming that we were driving along in a giant Cadillac. Big Mamie was sitting on my lap. She was eating a diamond necklace and spitting out cherry pits, which Mr. Mortuous grabbed, looked at through his jeweler's glass, and then tossed into a roulette wheel. (laughs) Then we had a blowout, and the whole car vanished with everybody screaming, The Mortuous, The Mortuous. Somewhere around 7 in the a.m., I began to get a feeling several feelings, and all of them hurt. I had been dumped in the grass in a fairly nice neighborhood. In your neighborhood, as a matter of fact, Daphne. And five minutes later, I was climbing the steps to your apartment. I thought maybe you'd let me wash my face in your bathroom. Also, you seemed the logical one to question, since nothing else made sense. You were sitting in a large chair. The drapes were drawn, the door was slightly open, and only the light from the hall seeped in. You had the phone on your lap. The receiver was off. My guess was right. You were looking at nothing. <laughs> oh. oh, Mr. Spade. It's you. You came back. You've been in an accident. I don't think you'll need this. Oh, yeah. Well, then, Mr. Spade. Well, then, I... I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. A gambler, a jeweler. Did they tell you about Lenny Epich? No. He's really a dear, Mr. Spade. Qu- quite the nicest boy I've met since Sidney was killed in that horrible automobile accident. Sidney and I had so many things together. I-, I do think he enjoyed being alive with me. I mean, 
I, I cried when Sidney was killed. I really did. I cried. Miss Arlington, I... I, I didn't know what to do. I, I cried. That, that was three years ago, but Miss... now I have Lenny. He's really a dear. I do think that Lenny will be a very prominent artist someday. I, I do. L- Lenny asked me to marry him tonight. He did? I- I've been very lonely since Sidney died. Lenny isn't interested in, m- in my money. Lenny has some m- m- money of his own. What? What? I not My tongue adjusted to my mouth. Did, did that ever happen to you, Mr. Spade? Sometimes, yes. Perhaps I should see a correctionist. I'm glad you came by again. I didn't know you were a detective the first time. Who told you? Why, Mr. McCall. He lay there. I really can't understand, Mommy. Please, Miss I, I know it must be strange to you, but look at them. But, but some people live. Some people die. Please, but please, Miss Arlington, we can't get anything done. Look, look, they, they do look so funny. So very funny. I, I've seen them count money, so much money, and I, I, I really believe that, that that is all they live, live for. Oh, oh, look, look. We were pointing at something across the darkened room. It took me ten seconds to find the light switch. Stretched out on your floor, they looked funny, all right. Candy and earnest. Both of them as dead as you can get. Your name, uh, Lenny Effich? Well, well, yes, but I was expecting... My yes. name's uh, Spade. I'm a private investigator. I'm calling from her apartment. Daphne's? Now, listen. There's been a couple of murders here. Murders? She's had quite a jolt. She's going to need you and all the help she can get to bring her out of it. I've called homicide, and it might be pretty rough for her. I'll be right over. Bring a doctor. Right. And a lawyer. I'm afraid she'll need one of those, too. I've got a good one. We'll be there. Thanks, Mr. Spade. He showed up about the same time the crew from Homicide got there. Your fiancé is a good guy. He talked fast and urgently, as did the doctor and lawyer he brought with him, and through their combined efforts, you were removed not to police headquarters, but to the private hospital in which you are now a patient. It was obvious from the powder test that you could not have fired the forty-five which ended the lives of Candy and Ernest. It was also obvious that the murders had been done elsewhere. But who had done them remained to be seen. Spade, I've been expecting you. Come in, come in, sir. I've been amusing myself with your chessboard. Sit down, sit down. Oh, you've had a hectic night. Yeah, your boys are pretty rough. Uh, candy and earnest. Uh, two men of another world, Mr. Spade, not our world. Allow me to apologize for that action. I uh, want more than an apology, Mr. Mortuous. And if that's my gun and it looks like it, it's got a hair trigger. And if you'll pardon me for saying so, your hands are a little shaky. I underestimated you, Spade. Such an ingenious method of protecting the tears of night. Why, sir, by the simple expedient of placing it in an envelope and mailing it to yourself from my hotel lobby, you hired as guardians the entire United States Postal Service, not to mention the armed forces. Thanks. What happens now? We wait for the mail. Just tell me where I'm wrong, will you, Mr. Morris? McCall wanted me to get caught with it. He didn't know it was real. You'd made a phony for him. Only you found out it wasn't phony when I came to your place. Then there was a double cross. If you can bear my vanity, I have invented a new word. Triple cross. It has a ring to it, hmm? Oh. Including Mamie, hmm? Mamie and her friends have been very valuable to me, but I must necessarily exclude them from sharing the profits. Mamie knocked off candy in earnest? A better by the last of the house of mortuous. You planted them in Daphne's place. Mamie and I. A crude touch, I thought, but it had a purpose. I happen to know that Mrs. Arlington has for a long time been on the verge of a nervous breakdown. With two cadavers in her living room, she was very unlikely to discuss a bogus necklace with the police. 
And I doubt very much if she knew she was wearing the original or the imitation. Righty girl. That's the lousiest thing the House of Mortuous ever did. She walked in and found it. If you had merely returned the real necklace to her, it would have been simple to make an exchange, and none of this would have been necessary. But then... I know, I know. You just sit here and wait for the mail. We wait for the mail. What about your other playmate? I'm afraid I'll be sought for a murder or two or three this night. Mimi. She got it, too? Yes. Where are the police going to find her? Oh, in my hotel room, which I departed hastily once the room clerk had informed me of your ingenious method for protecting the necklace. I shot her there. You work cheap. Cheap, sir? I don't understand. A $10,000 necklace? It's not quite a king's ransom, you know. The tears of night are worth five times that. I'm afraid I misinformed you as to their value. I didn't want you to become suspicious. You are a really horrible, terrifying old man. I suppose you think you'll get away with it. I don't intend to get away with it. An old man, yes, but I intend to spend my remaining years... They'll pick you up before you get to the airport. I doubt that. I shall turn the tears of night into cash. And with a well-laden purse, I shall guarantee to elude the police over half the world. In two years, perhaps three, they'll get me. But I have spent the money and... We have a visitor. Caution, Spade. I do shoot well. I'm sorry to tell them to go away. I'll be right beside you. All right. Open it. Look, one side, Spade. I got a gun. Obvious. Me, me. I thought I'd find you here waiting for the mail. You dirty... You didn't do such a good job on me. Caution, my dear. I have a gun, too. Everybody but me. I can last long enough to let you have it. Not so good, my dear. Your loss of blood has made you groggy. You're still good enough to... Wait, wait. It was almost a photo finish. He kind of leaned into the wall with a pained and amazed look on his face, and he seemed to try to walk. Uh, Mr. Spade. Mr. Spade, sir, I believe I've been shot. I don't need a little assistance. I could... I can't seem to hold my feet, sir. I can't seem to hold my feet. <laughs> it was an awkward plan at best. The mortuous nil nisi bonum, Spade. Or if your second year Latin escapes your memory, speak well the day. Oh, all those people. Four and all. And that poor girl, Daphne. How she must have felt when she saw it. Oh, Sam. Yeah, that was pretty bad. You, you poor darling. Well, it's about time. And you go right home. In fact, I'm going to take you home. Yeah? Then what? Well... You are a registered nurse, maybe? Hmm? Well, I... Go type that up. I am completely well. And when you return, we shall Indian wrestle. Certainly, sir. And now, listen to this. Shopping note. Tonight or tomorrow, get a family-sized bottle or handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite hair tonic. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Detective Agency? Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, I'm so glad you called. Why? I don't know. I always am. Was it a good case, Sam? I didn't like it. Where are you? Morgue, San Mateo. Oh, was somebody killed? Yes. And, well, do you know who did it? Yep. That's good. No, that's bad. Bad? Believe it or not, F, I wish I didn't know who killed who. I don't understand. Oh, Sam, you sound so downhearted. Well, I'm sorry. I'll try to loosen up. Stay where you are, sweetheart. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the champion caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, 
and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Before bringing you tonight's mystery, I'm going to take 28 seconds to tell you something that isn't a mystery. It's no mystery why so many millions of men, women, and children have well-groomed hair these days when America's favorite hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil, costs so little. Just 25 cents will buy you a Get Acquainted bottle and show you how neatly and naturally Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair, how it relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. the afternoon paper. I don't understand it either. Stop that. Really, after all this time, you'd think I'd be acclimatized to all kinds of human storms. I've got my pencil already. I'm myself again. I'm ready, Sam. Sam? Date? Date, August 7th, 1949. To... To whom, Sam? Jack Manelli. To Detective Lieutenant Manelli. Homicide <coughs> detail, San Mateo Police. From Samuel Spade, license number 127596. Subject? Are you listening, Sam? Subject, the champion caper. Dear Manelli. You were there for the end of it, and I was there for the start of it, which is in the reception office of Elliot Champion's brokerage house in San Mateo, and where I first met Mildred Champion. Remember that old salve, how a woman in love is always beautiful? When I went in, I had no idea she was in love and no idea she was beautiful. Not because she'd lately been crying, but her sallow face without makeup, framed in a wisp of blonde hair, wasn't flattered by the shapeless black dress, cotton stockings, and low-heeled shoes she was wearing. Certainly not the going idea of beauty. Nor did her conversation reveal anything to indicate love. Oh, Yes. May I help you? Uh, Mr. Elliot Champion. My name's Spade. Spade. Uh, S-P-A-D-E? You don't have to write it. He's expecting me. Your business, Mr. Spade? Private. I have to have a little more than that, I'm afraid. Oh, is this hot here? Uh, Mr. Champion can't stand fresh air. Obvious. Uh, that's what makes it so warm in here. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is hot. Uh, just flip the switch and tell him I'm here. Uh, well, what is it, Mildred? I was just going out. Uh, Mr. Spade is here, says you're expecting him. B but I don't find him listed in your appointment book. Don't be an idiot. Send him in. Send him in. You may go in now, Mr. Spade. He always liked that? He's nice today. Sorry, Mildred. That's your name, isn't it? Uh, his office is the first on the right. Don't bother. I'll find it. Thank you. I'll, I'll just go to lunch. Mr. Champion? Well, don't just stand there. Come in and shut the door. What I have to discuss with you is private. I don't want that snoopy niece of mine listening to our conversation. She's out to lunch now. But does she listen in often? All the time. Why? She didn't know who I was. <laughs> I outsmarted her there. I called you from the drugstore on the corner. I don't want anyone to know who you are, why you're here. Oh, now, where did I put that light, huh? Behind the inkwell. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm a dangerous man to play games with. Joseph's found that out once, and if he keeps this business up, he's going to find it out again. No games? You're dangerous. Say, are you mocking me, Spade? Just wondering what you're talking about. I just told you, you got ears, haven't you? Joe Joseph's is back in town, and I'm not going to fool around with him. Mildred told me you were nice today. Oh, she did, did she? Well, Mildred talks too much. That's what's the matter with her. She talks too much. And you'd fire her, only she's your niece, and you'd have to pay somebody else three times what you pay her to take everything she has to take. Get out of my office. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute, Spade. Oh, it's just hot, I guess. I... Uh, who has turned on the heat? It's Joe Joseph's. 
He was released from San Quentin this week. And I've been receiving telephone calls from him telling me to beware and to watch out and a lot of other nonsense. What was he doing at San Quentin? Two to five on an embezzling count. He's an ungrateful scoundrel, that's what he is. Why, I took him into my office as a junior executive, and six months later... He got tired of the $20 a week you were probably paying him and decided to dip into the bin. Only he did a bad job, got caught, you testified against him, now he's out and he's sore, and he's threatening you. Uh, And every time you yell cop around this town, there's always some snoopy reporter hanging around the sergeant's desk. Ain't that the truth. Listen, Spade, I've got a half a million dollars tied up in this business, and I don't want anybody thinking I might get knocked over by some loony with a grudge. And uh, that's why you didn't tell the police? Don't you believe me? It'll do for now. You'll think of something better. Now, see here, impertinence is 25 one thing... Forty-five a day and... No. That'll be forty-five a day in expenses. I want you to find Joe Josephs and bring him to me. Nuisance warrant? More than that. I've got enough stuff in that desk drawer to send him back to Quentin if I have to. Oh, what kind of stuff? Left over from his trial. It'll be grand larceny this time, and they don't stop at five years for that kind of thing. You withheld evidence? I withheld... Uh, 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 get out! My back was only eight feet from the window, and it came through from the other building across the court. The silencer either ruined the marksman's aim, or he was just a bad shot, because out of six tries, he didn't connect with a thing but the desk lamp and a wastebasket. By that time, Champion and I were both on the floor. Champion on top of me. I kicked out to get loose, and he kicked me back. I gave that up and twisted around for my gun. Across the court, a window was open about six inches, one corner of which was full of a dark-sleeved hand and a gun arm. I fired at it from what is known as number six position. It's him! It's him! Get him, Spade! Get him, Spade! What do you think I hired you for? I didn't bother to answer him. I went through the window, onto the fire escape, and over to the next building. I did more. I went in that building, which was apparently vacant, down the stairs, and started out the back entrance. Hey, hey, Shirley, watch it, watch it, will you? What's the big hurry? Hey, he came out of this building. Which way did he go? Who came out of what building? This building, right here, just a second ago. Here? Yes. Who? Him. Who? The guy who just ran down these stairs. What did he look like? Well, he... Well, what did he look like? I say, what did he look like? Huh? Who? What? Where? Thanks. Don't mention it, Curly, any (laughs) time. I couldn't tell her what he looked like because I hadn't seen him. After a careful search of the building, which revealed nothing, I decided my suspect had eluded me for good, and I returned to the office of Elliot Champion. He was sitting on his green leather chair, wearing an expression to match. Uh, missed him, huh, Spade? What does Joseph's look like? Oh, I've got a couple of snapshots here somewhere. I... Oh, yes, here. Let's have a look. I was later to regret having those snapshots in my person. They showed a tall, thin-faced, haunted-looking guy. An old-looking 28, good face, shock of black hair and dark eyes. I've seen plenty of cons and bezler type, and he wouldn't have been cast in a part in my movie. There was nothing about him to indicate that he'd embezzled $2,000 or use a silencer on a gun. I dug two thirty-eight slugs out of Champion's wall and went down to the street. Spade! Oh, Spade! He was a heavy-set man in a dirty white Panama hat and seersucker suit that didn't fit him around the middle. Hey, just a minute, Spade, just a minute. <laughs> he crawled out of a black sedan, jammed a cigar in his mouth, and began sweating. He needed a shave. He'd always need a shave. Hot afternoon, ain't it? Yes, sir, sure is hot. Sure is a hot afternoon. Here, here, my card. Lemuel Drigger, Confidential Investigations. Guess I should ought to have some new ones printed up, huh? I guess you should ought to, Lem, and change the name while you're at it. Huh? Didn't the commissioner bounce you nine years ago for rolling a pack before you did the booking? Oh, let bygones be bygones, Spade. I, I'm in business for myself now. How's business, Lem? Punk. Try another racket, Lem. Uh, uh, Spade, you've been in to see old man champion, maybe? Maybe. I was just going to go in to see him myself when I spot you pull up. I recognize you from the pictures in the paper last week. I figure maybe you and me ought to talk. Uh, what did you figure you and me maybe ought to talk about, Lem? Oh, you make it tough for a guy, Spade. We're we're in the same business, you know. What'd you go see him about? So long, Lem. Hey, wait a minute. I'm an old gumboot, huh? A fat old gumboot who couldn't get a trick as a housekeeper or tail in a punk. Is that it? Okay, Spade, okay. You're full of vinegar now, but just you keep my card. You'll want to see Lem Drigger before it's all tied up. You'll want to see me. Scroll, Lem. But he was right. 
I did want to see him because when I got down to the Chronicle office and looked up a morgue on the Joe Josephs trial, the first thing that jumped out at me was the name Lemuel Drigger. Lemuel Drigger, private detective who had been employed when Mr. Champion had become suspicious of Joseph's account irregularities. And who, together with Mr. Champion, caught Joseph's red-handed. And who willingly offered his testimony the same at the trial which convicted Joe Josephs to San Quentin for five years. The file also gave the name of Joseph's lawyer, a man named Anthony Spezer. The phone book showed an apartment address on Geary. That you, Aggie? Hold on a minute. I was just trying to get dinner over before you showed up, but I guess I'm late tonight. Who are you? Mr. Spezer? That's right. My name's Spade. I'm a private investigator. I'm trying to locate a former client of yours, a man named Joseph. Come in, come in. I was expecting Aggie, but come in. Thanks. I always fix my own dinner, poached egg and half and half. Ulcers. Name Spade? Yeah. Want an egg? Uh, no, thanks. I'm on duty. Mind if I finish? It's up to you. Uh, who's your client, Spade? Elliot Champion. Joe Josephs is back in town, and he's been making telephone threats and throwing 38s around. 38s, huh? Mm hmm. You know where he is? Joe was a nice kid, but a calendar job. Born with one war going on, a depression on deck, and another war in the hole. Makes a difference. The calendar got him. Everything was against him at the trial, too. I couldn't do anything. He thought I let him down and told me so. He got real sore when they read the book at him. Threatened champion and that private dick, uh... uh Lem Drigger. Drigger and everybody else. Said he was railroaded. You were his attorney? I know, I know, but he didn't have a chance in a million of beating that rap. He thought I ratted when I took the guilty plea in court's mercy, all for a lousy two grand. Well, he's done his time and he's out now. He hasn't gotten in touch with you? Nope. No threats? Nope. Have a right to you from prison? Nope. Any idea where he'd be in time? No. Is it possible he has a mother? No. Or... Then I guess i leave you to Aggie. We play records. Aggie used to be a violinist. Well, it's up to her. Uh, Spade. Uh, Spade. Yeah? If you find Joe, tell him where I live. I'd like to see him. Why? I don't know. Maybe I just want to see what five years in the pen does to a kid like that. Yeah. I'll bet you do. Yeah? Is this you, Mr. Spade? Who's this? This is Mildred Champion. Uh, remember me in my uncle's office? I remember. Mr. Spade, you're looking for Joe, aren't you? Oh, I know you are. You don't have to answer me. I think I can help you find him. I must talk to you right away before something terrible happens. Please come out to the house before something terrible happens. It's right in the corner. I got out to the house as fast as I could, but not before something terrible had happened. Oh, Spade. Spade. The front door was open and all the lights were on and Elliot Champion was lying at the foot of the stairs in the front hall holding his lapel as if it would get away from him. Spade, Spade, don't touch me. Don't try to move me. It's in my lungs somewhere and I... I never thought... It didn't look like there'd be much use, but I beat it up the stairs to the hall phone to call emergency ambulance. Hello? Hello? What the... Uh, this is Joe... So you hired a private eye to look me up, huh? <laughs> well, he'll never find me, but I'll find you. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Champion, I'll be seeing you real soon. I uh, didn't get it then, but I got it a second later. I grabbed for the banister, missed, and hit the top railing. A pair of hands held me up long enough to go through my pockets and then let me go, and that's the last thing I remember. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen... Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. 
Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the champion caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The neighbors had complained of gunshots, which was fortunate for me. I still might have been lying at the bottom of those stairs in Champion's house, Lieutenant, if you hadn't walked in, applied first aid, asked me my name, and listened to my story. You considered the threatening phone call after my client's death as a cover-up and promptly sent out a general alarm on Joe Josephs. I took an aspirin and a taxi cab for home. Halfway uptown, I discovered the pictures of Joe Josephs were missing from my wallet. And that is why I was absent at the medical examiner's inquest this morning. Instead of going home, I went out to San Mateo, jimmied the lock of Champion's office, and violated city ordinance number 352B. My dead client's desk revealed one important item. An income tax voucher dated August 17, 1944, noting him delinquent. Then I found another important item. Same for 1943. His secretary's desk was even more interesting. What I found there led me to, one, call her home. Result, no answer. And two, to revisit Attorney Spezer. I found him poaching another egg. All right, all right, I'm here. It's late, Aggie. What's the idea? Unless it's Beethoven, I don't... Oh, Spade. Aggie, ever show? Yeah, left early. Has to work tomorrow. Oh, it's too bad. What's with you? Still looking for Joe? Yep. Any leads? Wish I could help you, Spade. Elliot Champion was shot and killed in his home tonight. No. That all you have to say? Joe do it? Maybe. Well. You uh, don't seem scared for a mouthpiece Joe didn't like. If you mean should I be next, no. I'm not scared, Speed. The kids should realize by this time I liked them and did all I could. You've been here all evening? Aggie. Could you prove it? Yep. You may have to. Did you know Mildred Champion was married to Joe Josephs? Yeah. How'd you know? It's a secret. I found this marriage license in a desk drawer. Nosy, eh? Huh? I found something else. Champion didn't pay his income taxes all the time. Well, a lot of people are like that, Spade. Me, Glenn I... Glenn Drigger testified against Joe at the trial. So did Champion. Mildred worked in the office, but she didn't testify. Wife can't testify against husband. Real good story, Spade. But uh, what about Joe? Champion had something on Lem Drigger, and Drigger had something on Champion. Joe's in between. You tell me, huh? Huh? All right, I'll tell you. It's all about a green kid hired into a brokerage firm to be framed on a phony embezzling charge to cover up a tax delinquency. You want to finish it? I can't. I don't know it. You've got ideas, though. Yeah. Yeah, Spade, you're right. I've got ideas. And all of them make me sick inside. That kid stood there and told me he was innocent. He said it a million times if he said it once. And he told me he thought Champion was short with the income tax people. And if Champion was short, he could phony up a book and get a worn-out private detective like Drigger to testify that there'd been a fraud and Joe takes the rap. If that's what happened, they did it pretty good. Did you uh, mention anything like this at the trial? Surmise is not admissible. There was no way to investigate it and no way to prove it. Joe was a nice kid, Spade, and he told a good story. I've been fooled a lot of times. What do you think? I haven't met him yet. All right, he's done his five years. He came out. Now they want him for killing the man who sent him up. His whole life's gone. And for what? Spade, I hope you don't find him. I hope nobody ever finds him. But we did find Joe Joseph's lieutenant. He was right under our noses all the time. When I called you, you told me to come on down to the morgue of the county hospital. We both stood and looked at Joe Joseph's. Ah, uh, it's a funny thing, Sam. We had an alarm out for an hour on this guy. We've been looking all over for him, and he turns up right here. Only he's dead. He's been dead since last night, about seven. Seven? 
Same time Champion was killed. TB. Just got the whole story. Had it awful bad in prison on a sick ward his last two years. Mm-hmm. Wanted out awful bad. When his time was up last week, he made him release him. But he wound up here. Died in the hospital. He looks awful young to be a con and all. I don't know, Sam. He's just a kid, isn't he? Up until then, you had some kind of case against Joe Josephs. But when the medical examiner reported that my client had been shot with a 32, the rest of it began to fall into place. Lem Trigger's office was a dirty room over a shoe repair shop on Mission Street. The glass on the door hadn't been washed in five years, and neither did anything else. You can hardly tell where the office left off, and Lem began. Oh, hello, Spade. I have been waiting for you. I thought you'd get over for some talk-talk. What made you think that, Lem? Well, you're here, ain't you? All right, let's make talk-talk. Did the silencer ruin your gun? Huh? Come on, come on. I want it all. Hey, you're... You phoned tonight after Champion was killed. You've been phoning him right along, saying it was Joe. No, just a minute, Spade. We're in the same racket. And you shot at him with a silencer on your 38 this afternoon to make it look real good. You can't prove anything. I didn't kill him. One slug out of your gun will match that up. Every cop carries a 38. You were a cop once. Now, Spade, you got this all wrong. You him because you thought he'd call you in for protection. He called you in once on another job. Listen, I know what you're thinking, but I... And business was so bad, you had to drum it up, didn't you? Joseph was released from prison and it was unnatural, only it didn't work. Champion called me instead and you tried to shake me down. Well, I only thought we could kind of work together, you know, make it a good thing. And I, I told I... you once you should try another racket, but you didn't take my advice. Now you're going to have to. What do you mean? Because your license will be revoked pretty quick. You got into a lot of trouble about two minutes from now. I did? I, I was right here. What are you trying I to... I swore out a complaint on you for assault and battery. Hey, wait a minute. I ain't done nothing to you. Champion's dead, and yes, I tell you... Yes, you did, Lamb. You tried I... to strike me, and I had to defend myself. But I... And I did make out a complaint, Lieutenant. I phoned your office, and two of your men were on the way out to pick him up when I heard a footstep outside the door. I knew who was there and what she was there for, and I did the only thing I could think of at the moment. And it was lucky I did it. Her own thirty-two was in her hand when she came in the door. She looked at me and Lem's smoking gun in my hand, looked at him stretched out on the floor, then she looked back at me, and the gun fell from her hand, and she began to cry. (gasps) Hello, Mildred. I wanted to do it. I came here to do it. I know. Why? Why did you... Stop you. Why? My bullets went into the ceiling. He's just knocked out. No. No, he ought to be dead. Dead. Uh, 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 uh. No. No, no. Not anymore, Mildred. You tricked me. You knew I was coming here. And you know he should die. You know it. That won't bring Joe back. How many real tramps have you met in your life, Mr. Spade? (sighs) Lots. And some who just thought they were. Well, you met the genuine product yesterday. My uncle, for example. He stole money from himself and made it look like Joe did it. I know about that. And this one? Why didn't you let me kill him, too? Why? Easy, easy. When I I went over to see him in the hospital the first time, I knew he was dying. He had that look in his eyes. Helpless. And he knew what they'd done to him. And he couldn't do anything about it. But you figured that you could. So you killed your uncle when you found out Joe died. And you came here to kill them. They killed him. They killed Joe when they sent him to prison. Five years I waited for him to get out of that awful place. I waited to hold him in my arms and tell him it was all over. Five years I waited to help him forget his hate. My hate. Five years I loved him so much every day. Oh, easy. And then he came back to me the way he did. Those pictures were all I had left of him after five years of waiting, loving him. Now he's dead. What can you or I or anybody do about what they've done to him? Look at me, Mr. Spade. Go ahead, look at me. I'm not what you'd call beautiful. I'm not even very pretty. Nobody would ever look at me twice. Well, Joe looked at me. And he loved me. Now he's dead. And I'm dead inside. 
I'm dead inside, and I'll be glad when I'm dead outside. Period and a report. Oh, Sam, they were so unhappy. Yeah. Add a notation that I won't be around for the coroner's inquest. But Sam, you can't do This that. report, when duly notarized, should be admissible as testimony. I want to get out of town for a few days. Sour ragged. And now, listen to this. Later this evening, if you happen to stroll down to the corner for cigarettes or ice cream, why not also pick up some Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic? Your whole family will like the way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Didn't make any mistakes. Of course you didn't. Are you really serious about getting out of town for a few days? I am. The world's too much with you, huh, Sam? Effie. Well, I know it's poetry, Sam, but it seems kind of appropriate right now. I don't care if she did kill those two men. I feel sorry for her. What's that got to do with poetry? Well, it's kind of poetic justice. Oh. Why did she dress the way she did in, in, in that black dress and low heels? A uh, form of penance, I guess. Uh, mourning, absence of her missing lover. Lover? Yeah, no, no, no. Look, look, you'll have to type it all over if you keep that up. But, Sam, it's all so beautiful and tragic. Yeah. And you watched it all happen with such understanding. I'm so proud of you. Hmm. Oh, Sam. Come on, now. Come on. Dry up and go home. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade was written for radio by E. Jack Newman. Music was directed by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Renee and Pierre Garrigang. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men... And women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get wild root cream oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get wild root cream oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Charlie. Get wild road right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam! It must be telepathy. I was just thinking of you. You know, sometimes I think I can tell what you're thinking. That's an invasion of my privacy. Oh, when two people are as close as you and I... I think that often you can almost read one another's minds. Well, you may be right. I can see what you're doing all the way from here. What? Put those paper clips back where you found them. Oh, certainly, Sam. Oh, not that. You purloined pencils, absconded with erasers, pilfered stationery, filched stamps for your personal use. I only write to Mother when there's nothing else to do around the office. Besides making unit phone calls and charging them to me, you've tapped the petty cash drawer for lunch money. Sam! And you've been filling your pen with company ink. Well, I didn't think you'd mind, Sam. I'll pay it all back. When I have a big heart and boundless compassion, stay where you are, sweetheart. I'll be down on my unlimited generosity with your back salary. Really, Sam? And two tickets for us to go to the fights tonight and dinner... And last, but by no means least, my stirring and vivid report on the prodigal daughter caper. Uh, 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 uh.
Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Here's a smart resolution to make. First day back on the job after your summer vacation. From now on, every single day, I'm going to pay special attention to the way I look. I'm going to use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Yes, folks, smart's the word for that resolution. For Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. It helps give you that successful look that's so important to getting ahead. So, if you've never tried Wild Root Cream Oil, get the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men... And women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Where are you now that I need you? Effie! Come on, come on. Bring your book. Got a pencil? We got to hurry if we're going to make the fight, you know. Well, I've got one of the new retractor kind of pencils. Well, get the lead out. <laughs> Are you really going off the post, Sam? It's Ma'am Ma'am McShelley versus Cluck Face Duffy in the main event. Ready? McDuffie? <laughs> Sounds like an MP. McShelley. What? Aim and fire, Sam. PBX. F, you've been out with somebody else. A military man. Well, how did you ever know? Date, August 2-8-1949. I don't know whether we'll go out or not. You're clairvoyant. To Dr. Albert Kensington from Samuel Spade. I only had a cope with him, Sam. He was on furlough, and we... And had license special... number 137596, subject... And he was from Elkhart, Indiana. And I used to live in Pleasant Lake, and... Down! So much to... oh, Down, Effie. Subject, Helen Scully of the Prodigal Daughter. A coke yet. Dear Doctor... Everyone in San Francisco knows the castle-type hill house that Casper Scully lived in, even if they didn't know him. When I got there, there was an all-black 49 convertible in the driveway, and slightly smaller, same color, a Russian wolfhound wearing a spiked collar and expression to match. He broke his chain when he saw me and ran in the back of the house. That should have told me something, but I plunged the doorbell and was admitted by a butler named Stanley, who left me standing in a draft in the library looking at a cold television set. I pulled up my coat collar, took a plant in front of the fireplace, and lit a cigarette. Pretty soon, things started. A blonde girl in a yellow suit was having a one-sided argument with a gray-haired man in a gray suit. Nobody paid any attention to me. Oh, stuff about how you forbid it, and it can't go on. Well, let me tell you, it can go on, just as long as I want it to. And there's nothing you can do about it, so don't, whatever you do, try to interfere. Oh, stop it. That hurt look again. I've seen it too often, and I'm sick of it. Do you hear me? I'm sick of it. He looked mad, but he didn't say anything. I saw them walk around the garden once, shake fists at each other, and finally part. He disappeared up a narrow stairway, and she came storming back through the library. Who are you? How do you do? Who are you? Uh, Sam Spade. What are you I, doing here? Uh, waiting to talk to Mr. Scully. Well, I... I just talked to him, and he isn't very nice. Let me tell you that. Uh, yes, He's but He's a I... nasty, stubborn, bull-headed old man, and you won't like him. Oh, uh, yes, but Nobody I... likes him. Go back where you came from, whatever your name is. I'm the nicest person you'll meet around this place. Yes, but... Don't wait around. Oh, goodbye. But I did wait around, Dr. Kensington, and I did talk to Mr. Scully when you came in the room with him, only Mr. Scully did not talk to me. He glared at me through black, smoldering eyes, sniffed the air, frowned at my cigarette. I frowned back. Mr. Spade, I'm Dr. Kensington. I wrote you the letter. This is Mr. Scully. Oh, uh, please, this cigarette. Mr. Scully suffered a severe accident many years ago that affected his throat and his respiratory tract. He smoked. Oh, of course, I understand, Dr. Sorry, Mr. Scully, I... Uh, did... Yes, thank you, Spade. Uh, this is not generally known, but the unfortunate accident in the chemical plant also robbed Mr. Scully of his vocal power. I see. Yes, the modern doctor, the physician of today, is a far cry from the general practitioner of yesteryear. Today, we must know the mind, the psychological quirks, the, uh, well, he must follow through completely on a case. Mm -hmm. He is sometimes, as I am today, a confidant, an executive officer for his patient. He is a, well, a friend, to say the least, eh? Oh, yes, yes, to say the least. <laughs> Eh? <coughs> oh, of 
course, Mr. Scully, to the point, of course. Uh, sit down, Spade. Oh, thanks. Now then, Mr. Scully, as you well know and the world knows, has made several fortunes in his lifetime. And he didn't accomplish this by allowing people to run roughshod over him. <clears throat> but, Mr. Scully, I'm just backgrounding, Mr. Spade. Please be patient. Uh, Mr. Scully intends leaving his daughter Helen his entire fortune. A great deal of money, to say the least. To say the least. But Helen doesn't care about the money. She's foolish, young, headstrong, and impetuous. Huh? I heard her arguing with Mr. Scully a bit. I, uh... Now, 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 Mr. Scully. We'll straighten all this out. Mr. Spade will help us. Well, then, Spade, you have half the problem right there. She is a headstrong, impetuous girl. And, uh, lately she's done several things to displease her father. Right, Mr. Scully? <coughs> Uh, you see, Mr. Spade. Well, I gather that much, but what kind of thing? Helen's been singing in a cheap nightclub called the Blue Goose. What? Oh, it's very embarrassing. Low class, eh? Yes. There's a man named Torpy. He owns the club. A man named Chick Torpy? <coughs> oh, you know of him? Well, I've heard of him. Mm. Contrary to all her father's wishes, Helen insists on seeing this man Torpy. Mm -hmm. How old is she? Well, that's beside the point, Mr. Spade. But a sordid affair now might rob her of a future of wealth and security. Mr. Scully's at the point of exasperation. He might well change his will over this matter. Uh, correct, Mr. Scully? <clears throat> at best, this is an embarrassing situation and most indiscreet of Helen to have brought it about. So, uh, I'm supposed to go talk to Chick Torpy, is that it? In a word, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you sound rather reluctant, Mr. Spade. <sighs> Chick Torpy's a little too old for the Boy Scout. Well, I... Uh, we want you to see him. Find out how much it'll take to stop seeing Helen. Uh, tell me, what happens if Torpy isn't for sale? Oh, everyone has pride, Mr. Spade. Matter of character. You get paid for work like this, that's your pride. Yeah, that reminds me. Fifty a day and expenses. Five days guarantee, uh, to say the least. Of course, to say the least. And, uh, Mr. Scully, I happen to have a standard client's contract with me here. If you'll just sign on both pages, I'm sure... Uh, <laughs> never mind, Spade, not now. Mr. Scully will mail it to you later on today. Ah, <coughs> oh, dear, Mr. Scully's fatigued. Well... You'll contact me as soon as you have any information for us. I said I would. Mr. Scully sounded a final cough, and I left the two of you in the library. It was interesting meeting this voiceless tycoon who must have made and broken many a man with a nod of his head or a shrug of his shoulders. The same black dog with the same spiked collar was still outside the house doing the same thing. Ah, oh, Spade. Mr. Spade? But uh, something new had been added. A pair of well-tailored shoulders, diamond stick pin, and a gray felt hat with a snap brim. Hello, Spade. You uh, don't know me. Uh, now, now, wait a minute. There's something about a guy in a lineup. Uh, you're a dapper Danny Cavillo. When would you get out of Folsom, Danny? <laughs> a while back. They gave me a kind of uh, rain check. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that 38 make you a parole breaker? Oh, uh, is that showing? Unless your ribs grow in different directions. Sam, I'm here to save you a lot of trouble. Uh, what trouble are you here to save me? You want to see Chick Torpy, don't you? You've got business to talk with him, no? News gets around fast, Danny. No. No, it's just that Chick had been expecting somebody like you from the old man, and, well, I'm here to see that you see him. So, uh, why don't you kind of get in the car? And I, uh, kind of did. Danny smiled, lit a cigarette, shifted his shoulder holster so he could shift gears better, and drove me back across town to an apartment house on LaSalle, the Metropolitan. A good-looking guy who stood about six feet four, black hair, answered the knock. Hello, Chick. May I present Sam Spade? Sam Spade, meet Chick Torpy. Yeah, that'll do it, Danny, thanks. Hello, Spade, come on in. See you, gentlemen. Danny's Gabby. Hello, Chick. Your taxi service always free? Just when I'm in a hurry to get things settled, soldier. You saw the old man today, huh? I uh, saw him and talked to his doctor, Kensington. All right. You're here to tell me how worried the old man is, right? If you're talking about Helen and you, yes. You're bad company. <laughs> yeah. What else? He wants you to stop seeing her. Well, suppose I don't want to stop seeing her. Suppose I told you I love her. Let's see. She comes in at three million bucks when he kicks. Uh, you love her. I'd be crazy if I didn't. I wonder what she'd say if she heard you say that. Why don't you ask her, Spade? Hmm? Ellen. Hello, Mr. Spade. Told you to leave my house today, but you didn't listen. Vince Spade? Well, I'm uh, wondering, anyway. Maybe this will help. When you get back to my father, tell him I think Chick would be a fool to brush me off. Tell him that someday I expect to inherit all of that wonderful money he spent a lifetime making. Tell him that Chick's tired of working. Got all that? Yep. 
How do you feel, Spade? Like I'm earning my fee. Well, you've already earned it, Spade. There's no use trying. I've told her myself, now you can tell him. She's not for sale, and I'm not for sale. Got it? You got it. All right, then you're finished, dear. Hello. Oh, you. Well, I'm not sure I want to talk to him. Give him a pill and... And it was on that happy note, Doctor, that I went downstairs, found a drugstore, and tried to phone you and tell you what Torpy had said. Your line was busy, and while I was waiting for it to get unbusy, I spotted Chick Torpy out in front. He looked madder than when I'd left him, and there was a bulge in his coat that hadn't been there before. He got into a black sedan near the curb, and I hailed a cab and followed him across town up to Knob Hill. A half a block from the Scully residence, I left my taxi and took the rest on foot. He was still a couple of hundred feet ahead of me as he disappeared into the garden entrance. I heard a cry for help, and then... Chick was standing over something on the ground. When he saw me, he streaked for a break in the hedge. I stopped long enough to have a look at the body he'd left. My client. He still had gray hair, and he was still wearing the gray suit. But half his face had been shot away. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the prodigal daughter caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. My five-day contract arrived in the morning mail signed by Casper Scully. The headlines were no surprise. Chick Torpy sought in shooting of multimillionaire. Item. Ballistics matched up slugs taken from body with weapon owned and licensed to one Chick Torpy. And item... Because of a city ordinance regarding disposition, the body of Casper Scully, found off the immediate premises of his home, had been removed to the city morgue and would remain there until claimed by nearest of kin. Hey, Sammy, Sammy, my boy. It's good to look on you. Hello, Maxie. What brings you, Sam? Scully stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Checked him back in. Autopsy. Were you in with this, Sam? Do you know Scully? I just met him yesterday. Well, like I say to you before, you do collect queer ones, eh, Sam? Oh, such a mess. Woohoo, such a mess. Yeah, I know. I found him. They tell me he has to be claimed. City ordinance, Sam. Nearest of kin. It would be his daughter, Helen. She called or anything? No, not yet. But to get back to him, a real queer one. Maybe the tops this season. How so? Barbarianism, Sam. That's what it is. The world is moving backwards. You can get deader than dead. Huh? You'd think the slugs in his chest would be enough, but no. Four also in the head, too. Kill him twice. Say it again, Maxie. You mean the... Twice, twice, Sammy. In the chest, maybe 20 to 30 hours ago. In the head, maybe 12 hours later. You see what I mean? I saw what he meant. I didn't like what I saw, but things did begin to make some sense. In the morgue, I found the Chronicle office confirmed that Scully did suffer from a throat ailment, was publicity shy, was never interviewed or photographed for that reason. I asked them if they had a specimen of his handwriting by any chance, and they did. I had it sent to me by special messenger, and the signature compared to the one of my five-day contract with Mr. Scully made interesting reading. But what was even more interesting was the DOA Maxie was ushering in. As I was saying, Sam, it's awful the way these homicides are turning up nowadays. In gray suits, it's fashionable now. Hey. I... What's the matter, Sam? You know him. Yeah, I know him. What's it say? Toe tag says unidentified, accidental drowning. Found off Pier 14, time 8.15 this a.m. Accidental drowning. You don't think so? Why do you think he's dead? 
I think he's dead because he didn't cough when the doctor asked him to. I left Maxie to his newest customer and looked up the police officer who had found the unidentified man. All they had on him was uh, New York clothing labels and a silver identification bracelet with name Julio engraved on it between two small indentations of the comedy tragedy drama masks. It wasn't much, but it took me to a theater on Post Street featuring a special company of Spanish actors on tour. I am the manager of the company. What is it, please? I'm sorry to trouble you. I'm trying to locate a certain man. I have uh, good reason to believe he's with your company. We are a small group. His name, please? Uh, one name might be uh, Julio. Oh, Julio C. de Vasca. He's... Gray-haired, medium build. You are from the police? No. If you are looking for Julio C. de Vasca, why are you not from the police? Two days ago, Julio, who does not speak any English, is asked of all things to appear on the uh, tele- television uh, television program. Mm-hmm. He reads his lines. I am proud. But yesterday morning, a man on the telephone, they speak, and Julio goes out with no words. I, too, am looking for him. He missed his performance the afternoon. I see. He drinks too much sometimes, I know, and he missed the evening. Where he is, this I do not know. But if you find him... I, uh, I have found him. You have found Does he have a wife? I am the Senora Cedivaca. What is it, Senor? What has happened to my husband? You better get your coat, Mrs. Sedebargan. I went back to the morgue with Mrs. Sedebargan, doctor, and after that I went over to the Blue Goose Club. How are you, Spade? Tired, Danny boy, tired. <laughs> well, come on in and relax. <clears throat> nice place. You run it for Chick? When he's away. Seen Chick lately? <laughs> Two sets of cops, three reporters have been here asking the same question already this morning. What are you trying to prove? Chick's in trouble. You're his partner. Uh-huh. Now he got himself into this one, Spade. Look, we make a nice dollar running this place. It's legitimate. And no cop's going to raid us or close us up. Chick started fooling around with that Scully woman. And I told him just once. It's dynamite, I said. You know how the old man is. Let bygones be bygones. But Chick didn't listen. And... Tell me about the bygones that should be bygones and why Chick should know how the old man is. Well, Scully sent him up five years ago. Didn't you know? No, I didn't. Oh, Chick owned some property south of Brazito, and Scully wanted it for oil drilling or something. Chick asked too much, and Scully figured a way to get it from him in court. Had it condemned or something. Mm-hmm. Well, Chick got kind of sore. He met the old man on the street one day, and... Well, they convicted Chick of attempted murder. Two and a half years. And Chick looked up Scully's daughter when he got out of prison and started making love to her to get even. Why, yes, Spade, that's just the way it started. <laughs> Only Chick was the sucker after all. He really went for the creature. He married her three weeks ago in Reno, the poor sap. Anybody else know about that part of it? Only me. I was best man. By the way, Danny, did you uh, wrap Julio Cedabaco over the head last night and toss him in the bay? Who's Julio, uh, whatever his name is? An actor who happened to look something like old man Scully. Enough like him to keep his mouth closed when I was there, but who might want to open it later. I, uh... I don't know what you're talking about, Spade. Didn't think you would. But, uh, I don't like it. Yeah, boy. Timmy? Joe? Yeah? Throw this bum out. I'm sick of looking at him. Get out of And they did. It was two against one, and I'd been up late the night before. I was doing very well, though, until somebody stooped to a form of subterfuge I have long since grown to hate. I was born on two swarthy shoulders out of the club and into the open air. I was on a balcony, and a good stiff sea breeze was blowing. I didn't enjoy it long. One, two, three... The water was cold but refreshing, and I managed to swim the five feet to shore. And that was my limit. I hung onto a slippery piling which supported the blue goose above me and partially hid the antechamber in front of me. 
It had been a wine cellar once and a loading dock, I suspected, during Prohibition. This time it was a hideout. Keep your hands up, Spade. Close the door. Six, please. Keep out of this, Helen. Yeah, you're crazy, Thorpe. You got this all wrong. Mr. Spade, right, please. There's probably a five grand reward out for me right now. They want me dead or alive, and you're here to tell me how wrong I am. Well, it'll be dead, Spade. They'll never take me, and you aren't going to. Listen to reason. I've listened to all the reason I'm going to listen to. From now on, I'm doing things my way. I've got nothing to lose now. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> so long, baby. He leaned over to kiss her goodbye, and that is when I rediscovered that my wet revolver, even though it wouldn't fire, still had plenty of power left. <laughs> Mrs. Spade, thank you. Thanks for doing that. As you know, Doctor, I turned Chick Torpy over to the police along with Danny Cavillo and took Helen Scully home. You ran upstairs with many tears, and I met you in the library. You seemed relieved when you heard that Torpy had been apprehended. However, I had some other questions to ask. You answered. All right, Spade, all right. I, I suppose it'll all come out anyway. Two nights ago, Chick Torpy came to the house to have it out with Mr. Scully. He told him about their marriage. There was an argument. I was the only one in the house. I heard shots, ran in the room, and found Mr. Scully dead. The marriage certificate was in his hand. I knew this would involve Helen, and so I did what I did. Oh, it was a nightmare. I hid the body, hoping to find a way, perhaps a death certificate on accidental shooting or something. I... In other words, you were helping Torvey get away with murder. Uh, yes, but I was thinking only of Helen. Her, her father did love her. But and... you'd already sent a letter to me. You knew I'd be here the next morning. You'd seen an actor on a television program. He resembled Scully. You hired him for a job. You told Helen the chick had killed her father and told her what kind of acting she had to do. Oh, it was crude, perhaps, but... I didn't want you to become suspicious when a death report did show up. I intended to hire you and fire you. Only it didn't work out. I followed Torby here and found the body. Oh, I've been such a fool, Spade. Helping a man get away with murder, I... I want to confess it all. I suppose this will make me an accessory to murder. Not exactly. You mean there's a way out? There's a way out, and you were going to take it. What? I was over to your apartment before I came here. You're all moved out. The doorman tells me your luggage has been at the station all morning. What'd you do, Kimmy? You had a rifle that's safe? No, see, here's space. Stop it. You were waiting around to see if they took Torby dead or alive. Dead, he couldn't talk, and you'd be okay. Alive, you're ready to blow town. You bumped Scully. No. Get back there. Then you did your best to hang it on a chick. Helen thought he really did it and played along with you. You're not an accessory to murder. You're a murderer on a double count. That actor was knocked on the head before he drowned. Oh, just a minute, Spade. This can be fixed if you... Shut up! <laughs> Period. End of report. Sam, I don't understand. What, Angel? I don't understand, Sam. What, 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 what? Well, you say you turned Chick Torpy over to the police, yet Dr. Kensington was the murderer. A formality, F. He will be released and cleared in short order. Anything else? Well, yes, yes. What about Danny Covillo? An innocent bystander. But he had you beat up and knocked on the head. And he has already made amends for those uh, tickets for the fights. But I... No more questions, F. Pipe this up and I'll give you the happy ending. And now, listen to this. School days will soon be here, mothers. To make sure Junior's hair is always neat and well-groomed, get after those cowlicks and stray strands with Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. And remind Dad to ask his barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. What is it? Look, Sam, look! All right, I shall rephrase the question. What? Oh, I see. You mean the magazine look, huh? They said an advanced copy. Not even out till next Tuesday. What's it doing here? Oh, look at them. See these. Who? Who are these people here? That's Sam Spade. What? On the radio. You know, Howard Duff. He plays you on the radio. Howard Duff? Why don't I play it on the radio? <laughs> You're not the type, I guess. Yeah, look here. Sam Spade dictating to Effie. Hey, she's not bad, you know, not bad. Oh, really? 
by the accuracy I saw. What is it? Levine Tuttle. Levine. <laughs> the name is so accuracy. As Bill Spear, Spade Pedosa, gives final instructions. Look at him. He has nine o'clock shadow. <laughs> well, come on. Let's get out of here. Go to the fights. Oh, Sam. Hmm? Then I can't say it. Say what? Well, if you're taking me to the fights, I... I can't very well leave and say goodnight, Sam, can I? Well, you can try. It's expected, you know. All right. Good night, Sam. Grins. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade was written for radio by E. Jack Newman. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Pierre and Rene Garagang. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps her hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep all the gals away. Hiya, Charlie. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for Life with Luigi on WCBS AM FM. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Shaman Spade. Shaman, not Sam? Uh, an old Indian word signifying wise man. And it's true, Effie. I'm a lot wiser man than I was yesterday at this time. Oh, really, Sam? Really, little papoose. Put on some war paint, a few turkey feathers, and your best open-toed moccasins. <gasps> Where are we going, Sam? Why, to uh, Ted's teepee for a rousing repast of ground corn and dried buffalo meat. Oh, well... Uh, don't quibble, Effie. Get the wigwam ready, sharpen my tomahawk, and lay out my herringbone breech clout. I'll be right in to dictate the Chicago, uh, the uh, Shinogma, ah, the Indian caper. From the land of the sky blue water, they brought a captive maid, the Red Wing. Here I am, running skunk. Running what? Skunk. He was a famous Indian detective. You sure you're not making this up? Oh, no, Sam. Oh, no. He was a scourge of Indian lawbreakers. A scourge, huh? Even so, you have two minutes to think of a better name. Oh. Rippling string? Not virile enough. Um, crunching muscles? <clears throat> too, uh, too virile. What is that stuff you've been getting me, anyway? To, uh, Lieutenant L.J. Myron, San Francisco homicide detail. I better take it back. Copy to Chief Black Cloud of Santee, Dakota Indian Reservation. Oh, murder. Attention, federal Indian agent from Samuel Spade, San Francisco, license number 137596. Uh, subject, the Shargagagag, uh, <laughs> the, uh, Shargona, uh, call it for now, the Indian caper. And quiet to you. I was sitting in my office, quiet. I was sitting in my office, doing absolutely nothing when something interrupted me. First, it was a buckskin smell... Then the soft tread of moccasins, followed by the sound of a rattle. His uh, beaded clothes were wrapped in a rich-looking embroidered blanket, and his multicolored headdress reached to the floor. His face looked like the model for the Indian head nickel. How? Who? My name, Chief 
Black Cloud. How do you do, Chief? You, Shaman Spade. Uh, Sam. Shaman, Indian word for wise man, prophet, seer. Sam. Newspaper say you good scout. <laughs> well, they exaggerate, so, you know. Chief need to hire good scout for job. Well, uh, shall we talk? You come for powwow in Chief's council lodge. Now, uh, where's that? Say Mark Hotel, fourth floor. I see. You have reservation. <laughs> <clears throat> well. You ride with Black Cloud. He have iron pony on street made by great Indian chief, Pontiac. <laughs> And he actually had a council lodge at the St. Mark, fourth floor. Outside the door of his room, two braves were standing, arms folded. One of them was the first Indian I'd ever seen with hair on his chest. We entered the room. Indian file, of course. The chief had apparently brought in his own decorator. The walls were covered with hanging animal skins. A weathered canopy of thatch hid the ceiling. And on the floor, genuine hand-woven rugs. No expense had been spared. In one corner of this room stood a full-size teepee. Two squaws shuffled out of it. What else? The young one glided forward and handed the chief a long Indian pipe. Shaman Spade, this fairest Indian maid of all. Only person in world important to Black Cloud. Name, Little White Lilac. Uh, how do you do, Little White Lilac? It's nice to have you here. She wise, educated girl. Graduate Smith College. Nice. All squaws out. Oh. All squaws out. Squaws no good at powwow. Well, you know best, Chief. Now we powwow. Uh, you get paid well. Chief Black Cloud own 130 oil wells near Tulsa. Oh, Oklahoma, huh? Not Oklahoma. Indian land. Union mean nothing. Union temporary thing. I see. Indian here long before white man. This is true. And Indian will be here long after white man. All right, Chief. All right. Chief Black Cloud come to San Francisco village five days ago for powwow with big engineer. Uh, anybody I know? His name... Clarence Hobart, engineer for Arundel and Amaskeek Consolidated Engineering Company. Uh-huh. Fine Indian name. We have powwow four days. Hobart disappear. And uh, you want me to find him, is that it? Chief tired of San Francisco. Want finish powwow. Get back to Santee Dakota Reservation. Clarence Hobart. Okay, I'll see what I can find out. Good. One moment, Shaman paid. Sam. Chief have something you guard for a few days. What's this? This beaded wampum belt, ancient relic of Nipmuc tribe. Nipmuc. Here in Tipi Semak, too many light-fingered chambermaids and bellboys. You uh, want me to hold on to this for you? Yes. Wampum of great sentimental value, woven by ancient wise man Tani Luka. Tani Luka. Tells interesting story in history of tribe. Mm, guard it well. Haven't lost a wampum yet. Uh, is that all, then? One more thing. We smoke pipe of friendship. Oh. I smoke. Here. Now, you smoke. To, uh, to friendship. <coughs> now I know what happens if the bag of Lucky Strike doesn't buy. When I left Chief Black Cloud's fourth floor lodge, there was only one brave standing outside the door. The hairy-chested Indian was probably taking five. The wampum belt was about three feet long, made up of hundreds upon hundreds of little colored beads. They were woven into a picture pattern, very pretty. The interesting story undoubtedly could have been translated instantly and told fascinatingly by Red Rider. But then he has a smart horse. I put the wampum belt in my pocket and headed to the offices of the Arundel and Amistee Consolidated Engineering Company. Fine old Indian names. I inquired about Clarence Hobart. They referred me to his partner, Anderson Watts. <laughs> Hobart disappeared? <laughs> Absurd. Why, you couldn't lose him if you wanted to. He's as wide as a barn door. Yeah, well, uh, Chief Black Cloud seems to think he is missing. Well, now, look here. Are you going to take an Indian's opinion over mine? I might. Well, just because he doesn't show up for an appointment doesn't mean he's disappeared. Why, one day when we were on a cantilever project in New Orleans... <laughs> uh, yeah, some other time. If uh, Hobart hasn't disappeared, where would he be? Anywhere in the world. The man's unpredictable. Brilliant engineer, but moody. Oh. Every now and then he goes off alone to scheme up some fantastic thing like maybe cutting off the Gulf Stream and turning Cuba into an iceberg. I like it. But he always comes back. Disappear? <laughs> oh, no, no. Not Hobart. Yeah, well, uh, can you give me his home address? <laughs> well, here you are. Try it if you like. But I'm sure he's not there. I called this morning and nobody answered. Honest engine. 
I left this utterly charming man and started for the address he had written down. I was taking the shortcut through the alley on Sutton Street when I heard the rattle of beads and a naked brown arm of considerable size reached out of the murk. I grabbed for it, but he slipped out of my grasp and sped swiftly and silently up the dark alley into the fog, leaving me with a handful of Max Factor Number 8 Iroquois makeup. I continued to Hobart's house without further incident. Found it just off Chinatown. Uh, Mr. Hobart? Oh, I thought you might be somebody else. Who else? Eh, take your foot out of the door. Uh, just let's talk a minute, shall we? Want me to call the police? I don't think you will, Mr. Hobart. All right, out with it. What's on your mind? My name is Sam Spade. I'm a private detective. There's an Indian named Chief Black Cloud who's worried about you. I'm old enough to worry about myself. Now, stop bothering me. Go away. Look, I'm going to tell the chief where you are, you know, because that's what I was hired to do. You'll... Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. Confidentially, I've been on a two-day drunk. You know how it is. Who, me? Ah, uh, tell him to phone me tomorrow. I'll talk to him. <laughs> Well, what are you doing here today? This is your day off. I just wanted to show you something. Happy, first do me a favor and put this wampum belt in the safe, will you? A wampum belt? Genuine Indian art. Oh, it's beautiful. Tell us the story. You know what? Yeah. It'll go beautifully with... Oh, Sam, I forgot. Hmm? There's a girl waiting in your office. Well, good. Well, Sam, don't you want me to show you? And there was indeed a girl in my office. It was little white lilac, Chief Black Cloud's fairest Indian maid of all. Only a uh, heap big change had taken place. She still had the Indian color, but gone was the headband, gone the buckskin dress, gone the squatting squaw, the St. Mark teepee. Little white lilac stood revealed in the thin disguise of a modern white woman's cocktail dress, complete with pale face 20 carat perfume. It was a transformation worthy of a high-priced medicine man. But more surprises were to come. Hello. How? I've been waiting for you. Yeah, well, a big brave just returned from hunting party. You can drop the TV talk. I'm civilized. Well, okay. What's on your civilized mind? Chief Black Cloud gave you a wampum belt. I want you to give it to me so I can destroy it. Uh-huh. Well, I, uh, I gave my word to keep it, and I accepted the promise of money for its protection. Now, you wouldn't want me to be an Indian gift. <laughs> I mean, violate my ethics, would you? Sam, if I must tell you, Chief Black Cloud is insane. Not if he keeps you around. Must we have these juvenile references to my personal beauty? <clears throat> well, sorry. Uh, you are Indian, aren't you? Of course. I am a Nipmuc. Nipmuc. That wampum belt is secret to undreamed of wealth. Mm -hmm. Greater than the fortunes of the ten richest families of this country. Wow. Chief Black Cloud is wealthy from oil, but that belt make him more powerful than the Bank of America. You mean he could take my car back? You think this is a joke, don't you? Well, <laughs> I love the way you tell it, though. He's going to use it to destroy modern American civilization. Oh? To pay the white man back for what he did to the Indian. I see. He wants to start a giant Indian revolution. And you want to destroy the wampum to save all this, hmm? Exactly. And now you'll give it to me, won't you? Uh-uh. What happens in the next chapter? Sam, you have to believe me. Why? Why do you think the chief is here conferring with an engineer? He wants to get at that wealth. Hobart's going to make him wealthy? Now, really, little white lilac, isn't this all a little white lie? Sam... If I take you to Hobart and he confirms what I've said, will you believe me? I might. Come on. She took me by the hand and she led me out of the office and up and down several streets until we arrived at a frowsy-looking brownstone. We entered, still holding hands, and came to rest in an apartment that looked just recently occupied. I guess that's what it looked like because you couldn't tell much. It was being lit by either one 10-watt frosted bulb or by fireflies. This is the place. Yeah, a little uh, dim in here, uh, wouldn't you say? I like dim places. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where's Clarence? I'll get him in a minute. First, Sam. Uh, yes, Violet. You've been so nice. I have? I want to find some way to thank you. I'll wait while you like it. I can start by kissing you. Mm -hmm. Please, mm -hmm. Sam. Oh! <laughs> The kiss was great. In fact, it blew the top of my head off. After this, there was a free fireworks display, followed closely by a giant roar that sounded like Niagara Falls with a cold. It was a short feature, followed by a long period of dark black silence. When the curtain came up again, I was lying in an alleyway. 
I was stiff and cold, my head throbbed with pain, my brain was a jumble, my suit was torn and dirty, my patience was at an end, and my anger with little white lilac knew no bounds. I uh, went out of the office and changed clothes and get a drink. The phone was already ringing when I opened the door. <sighs> Sam Spade. This Chief Black Cloud talking from St. Mark TP. Yeah. What's on your mind, Chief? Ten minutes ago, Bellboy delivered to Chief Black Cloud box. Inside box is scalp of Engineer Clarence Hobart. I hung up the phone, fell into my chair, snapped on the lights, and fell out of it again. My office had been massacred. The place had been ransacked thoroughly and looked like the morning after a Comanche smoker. And you guessed it, my safe had been drilled open. The ancient and valuable Nipmuc wampum belt was gone. At this point, I decided what Chief Black Cloud needed was a detective. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before... Get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Now, back to the Chagagagog, Manchagagog, Chabonagun, Gamog Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I found Chief Black Cloud sitting cross legged and looking disconsolately down into a small cardboard box. Both squaws, including Little White Lilac, were on one side of the room grinding corn. Lilac looked through me as if I didn't exist. I sat down next to the chief, looked into the box, and recoiled. It was a real, no imitation, 20th century scalp, and the red hair was certainly Hobart's. Scalp comes with note. Let me see. Note written in Algonquin dialect. I translate. Honor Chief Black Cloud. Return to Santi Dakota Reservation and die proper death fitting to old man. Here you will meet violence unto death. Even as this man did. What's the point across? Uh, look, Chief, it isn't that I'm scared, which I am, but I just decided to pull out of this caper. What? I've heard some things about you that don't sound too good. You hear what? That you want to start an Indian revolution to settle an old score with a white man. Who tell you this? The fairest of them all, little white lilac. She tell you? I've never talked to you. She not only told me all that, but she... Quiet! Speak. When did little white lilac tell you these things? She came to my office today. That's a lie. I never left this hotel. We will see. Kalanuka. You. Yes, Chief Black Cloud. Did Little White Lilac leave hotel today? Little White Lilac with me already. Why, you... Uh, never out of sight. Enough. Go away. Kalanuka speak with tongue of truth. Little White Lilac, I have grown from baby. She also speak with tongue of truth. Somebody lie. Now, look, Chief, I know what I'm talking about. You... Chief does not need help of double-tongued man. Return wampum belt to me. I pay you. All right, I'll, uh... Well? Uh, Chief. Chief, heard enough lies. Return wampum belt. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got a small but biting bit of truth to relate. Somebody stole the wampum belt. Wampum belt gone? Somebody broke into my office, drilled the safe, and took it. You stole? It was stolen from me. Return wampum or you not live until sundown. I'll return it if I can find it. Then you can pay me off and we'll call it even. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. 
Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I walked outside muttering frightful white man's implications. Cutting through the hotel parking lot, I suddenly noticed the chief's iron pony made by Pontiac. There was a leather bag on the seat, sort of an Indian overnight case, and sticking out of it was a blood-stained tomahawk. This was of decided interest to me, and so were the rest of its contents. Somebody had a giant engineering project afoot because there were order receipts for such things as two LSTs, four underwater hydraulic drills, a diving bell, a dredging barge, and a steam derry. Well, back again, eh, Spade? Yeah, back again, Mr. Wash. Still looking for the missing Clarence O'Bard? Not anymore. Well, I knew you'd realize the futility of it. I found him. And I trust you found him in good health. Old Hobart's a bug on health. <laughs> Why, once when we were in Cleveland... <laughs> I uh, think he's dead. <laughs> it was the Ohio River Bridge, John. Dead. Did you say Hobart dead? Scout, anyway. Uh, Mr. Watts, what was Hobart working on with the chief? Well, I don't know exactly. Uh... Well, let's go look at his desk file and see if we can find out. In a bottom drawer, under a lot of miscellaneous papers, we found a large manila envelope marked Black Cloud. It contained some topographical surveys of an area containing a lake. On the back of one of the surveys was written in fine print a series of 37 letters... It looked like a whole group of Indian words strung together, or a code, or just doodling. It started out Chagaga, something or other. I left Mr. Watts sitting in his office with tears in his eyes, a new role for him, and made my weary way back to my place of business. Effie was standing in the middle of the office with a shocked look on her face. Sam, look at this office. How did it get like this? Oh, my files and everything. Come on, I'll help you pick things up. And again, by the way, uh, what are you doing here? It's still your day off. Well, when you were here last time, I wanted to show you something, but you were so anxious to get to that girl. All right, I'm here, and I'll look. What is it? A new suede coat. How do you like it? The color is rough. Well, I suppose... <laughs> Effie. What? What's that you're wearing as a belt? Oh, now, don't be mad, Sam. I, I just had to. It went so well with the coat, and when I saw it, Chief I couldn't... Chief Black Cloud's wampum belt. You didn't put it in the safe. Well, now, Give Sam, it to don't me. don't be mad. Give it please. to me. Wait right here. I'll be gone for half an hour, and then I'll come back and take you out to the best dinner in town. Oh, I should go home and change first. I had taken only four steps down the hall, and somebody hit me from behind. I rolled, and he went with me. We fought a quick, quiet, and decisive fight. And at the end of it, I held him in an arm lock and let him back into my office. Come on. What happened, Sam? You're back early. I had an unexpected caller. Come in with me and take notes. Now, sit there. All right, all right. Now, who are you and what's on your mind? I'm nobody and I got nothing on my mind. <laughs> Spring, you're one of the braves that guarded the chief. Uh, yeah. And you're a phony Indian, lousy makeup, and Indians don't have hair in their chest. All right. My name's Grit Hammond. I'm a cowpoke. I should have stayed where I belong, out on the range. Well, why didn't you? Oh, uh, once I said I'd do anything for that gal, now I wish I hadn't. She brought me here. Why? <laughs> Well, it had something to do with buried treasure. She was going to give me a big cut. Where is it buried? I don't know. She was going to tell me. I took Hammond around to homicide and left him in their safekeeping. While there, I got the latest flash. They had found Clarence Hobart dead and Les Scalp down by the waterfront. There were no clues except the blow on the back of the head and lipstick on his mouth, which was enough for me, having been through the same course myself. Then I proceeded to St. Mark, fourth floor. Little white lilac met me at the door. You can't see the chief. Why not? He's asleep. One side. When the chief sees what I've got, he'll wake up screaming his wampum. You have it? 
after that, she pounced. I pushed her off, and she came back and got a hold of one end of the wampum and tried to pull it away from me, with disastrous results. The wampum came apart, and in a second was nothing but hundreds of beads rolling different directions all over the place. In fact, it was no more. Oh! What happened in Chief Council? Chief cannot sleep. Well, I brought back your wampum, but now it's all over the floor. Wampum belt destroyed? Yes, it's destroyed, you stupid old man. Did you talk to Chief? Yes, stupid. You had the world in your hand. You didn't know it. You wanted it all for yourself, to tear down the earth. It could have been used to live. What are you saying? To live the way I'm supposed to live. Now nobody will have it, not even you or that fat engineer who wanted it. Little white lilac, shut mouth. I've been shutting my mouth all my life. You're a stupid, ignorant, disgusting old man. You'd be better off... big hands were around her throat. He stood there, anger and betrayal in his eyes. Then his hands dropped and he turned away with tears streaming down his face. It was then that the fair Indian maid went for him with a knife. And that was my cue to step in with a pale face weapon. And now, listen to this. Not only Dad, but the whole family goes for America's favorite hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Get a family size bottle or handy tube today. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Little white lilac. Yeah, well, I don't usually hit one, but uh, don't feel too badly, Chief. She uh, helped kill Clarence Hobart. No, Chief believe anything. Yeah. Uh, Chief, why did you want an engineer? Design woven in wampum describes location of hidden Nipmuc treasure. Many, many years ago, Nipmuc tribe live in Valley of the Berkshires. Discover only gold vein in East. Mine gold and keep for decoration. Kennebec Indians want gold. Start out on warpath. Nipmuc Indians bury gold. Move village. Divert stream into valley. Make lake. Gold there today, underwater. Where is it? That secret chief keep locked in head. Chief once had evil plan for gold. Now you forget. Make pilgrimage back to ancient ancestral camp and die. Send me bill. Chief, leave village of San Francisco for good. Period and the power. Oh, say, it's sad. It is, it is. Vanishing race. Mm-hmm. Just think, the days of the Colt and the Winchester are gone forever. But the day of the Remington is still with us. Go to it and tight this up. Well, it's all here, Sam. Except one thing. Mm-hmm. How did the bloody tomahawk get in Chief Black Cloud's bag? A little white lilac planted it there. If anything happened to the chief, she, as the only other living nipmuck, would inherit the wampum. Well, she could have gotten the money by just waiting. Oh, shut up. Sam, hmm? notice anything about the report? Yeah. Hey, you got the name of the caper right. The, uh, Chagaga... Oh, what is it? Chagagagog, man, Chagagog, among the Mog caper. You've been going out with an elocution teacher. Oh, Sam. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get wild root cream oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get wild root cream oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The 
Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Oh, murder. Oh, Sam. Have you had a hard day? Murderous? Fine this morning. I grinned through 25 poses, count them, over dishes of all 25 varieties of Sanderson succulent soup, a meal in a can. Then, uh, Really, Sam? Then I was imprisoned in a plush chair for two hours with a glass in my hand. No. Yes. A Brannigan's bog, the whiskey that smells like old Ireland. It sounds interesting. It wasn't. They wouldn't let me touch it till after. Aw. And for the rest of the afternoon, I've been pulling up my trousers. Woo! For a series of leg art shots, which will bear the legend, Samuel Spade, prominent San Francisco detective, says... McGonagall's grip tight is the garter for me. Oh, Sam, how thrilling to be prominent. Maybe so, maybe so, but fame is a sometime thing, sweetheart. Just a flash bulb in the pan, uh, as you will agree, when you have heard my report on the cheesecake caper. I ought to be in picture. I'm beautiful to see. Oh, Sam. It was at the top of the caper. Yes, and as it developed, it was a snap. Does that make you shatter? Oh, Sam. Well, have you got any photography jokes? No. All right, then. We just saved 30 seconds. <laughs> and uh, by the way, Miss Perrin, statistics prove that nine out of ten private secretaries have the pencil ready when the boss comes in. Oh. Why do you always have to be number ten? Well, I'm ready, Sam. Here, here's the pencil. Well, that's better. Got... <sighs> Two, Homicide Division, San Francisco Police Department. Attention, Lieutenant Kelsey from Samuel Spade. License number 17596. Subject, the cheesecake caper. Dear Kelsey. Cheesecake. Down. Cheesecake, to me, was something that cost 25 cents on the a la carte side of a menu up until now. As a matter of fact, the cheesecake theme didn't make itself felt until sometime after the beginning of this, which was a phone call at high noon, just as I was wondering where I'd eat. Sam Spade. Mr. Spade, I, I gotta see you right away. What are you doing? About to go to lunch. Who's this? I'll, I'll tell you later. i got to see you first. Right now. Well, all right. You want to come to my office? Or... No. No. I'm at Barney's Grill. You know where that is? Yeah, I know where that is. Who will I ask for? Just go in and order a sandwich. Nobody sent for you, see? You just come in for lunch. I just go... Uh, let me get this straight now. Are you hiring me? Yeah. Yeah. Fifty bucks in it for you, Spade. All I got. But remember, you don't know nothing about it, see? You just came by for lunch. <laughs> Wednesday is when they have sauerbraten and potato pancakes at Barney's, but then it had been only that very morning that my secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, had looked at my figure, of which she is usually inordinately fond, and made certain remarks to the effect that a few of my pounds needed devaluating. So I decided on a sandwich. The business crowd hadn't arrived, so I slid into a vacant booth, ordered my sandwich, and waited for something to happen. Well, thanks. Huh? You remember me, Faith, Fred Malloy? Yeah, afraid so. Last I heard, you were in Cleveland. Yeah, but I'm in San Francisco now. Well, Cleveland's gain is our loss. I like it here. Maybe they had a hot spell in Cleveland, huh? Ah, uh, heat never bothered me much. Yeah, you ought to be used to that by now. <laughs> Let's talk about you, Spade. How's business, huh? Please, I'm eating. Yeah, yeah, so I noticed. Uh, you like bodies, huh? As good as the next joint, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're coming here all the time, regular. You ain't here on business now, are you, Spade? Uh, sure, Freddy, sure. Yeah? Yeah, making a little deal. Yeah, yeah. who with? Barney, corned beef on rye. Oh. Hey, sir, one corned yeah. beef on... What's the matter? Oh, uh, uh, the, the cook loused it up, sir. You said rye, didn't you? This here's wheat. Well, that's all right, here. Uh, no, 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 I'll, I'll fix it up, sir. Only fix... Oh, forget it. I said wheat's all right. Now, uh, how about a cup of coffee and I'm all set. Uh, Denny. Yeah? You said you were going off duty. Yeah, I, I know, uh... I, I, I'm just finishing up a couple of orders. I, 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 I'll get my hat. Never mind the hat. Come on, Denny. I'm parked out front. I, I hate to get wrong with cops. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tell the boss I... I already told the boss. Get going. So long, Spade. Just stay there and enjoy your sandwich, sir. Yeah, so long. The waiter, of course, was the guy who called me, a white-faced young kid sweating with his black tie up under his left ear. They walked outside and got into a car parked in front of a restaurant. Of all things, a limousine with a liveried chauffeur. I watched through the front doors and pulled away, picked up the license number, and called the Department of Motor Vehicles. The car belonged to Mike Sheldon, known to the voters of the North Beach section as Uncle Mike, a white-haired, jolly-faced gentleman of dubious means and still more dubious methods who had something to do with politics. What he had to do with a weasel like Freddie Malloy, much less a poor waiter boy at Barney's, was something to ponder. 
I sidled back to my booth and attacked the corned beef on wheat. My uh, teeth, instead of going all the way through the sandwich, which is the way I like it, struck something firm and unyielding. I pulled from between the lettuce and the bread a wax paper envelope. Inside was a $50 bill and a small photograph of a blonde. Denny, the waiter, had scribbled three words in the corner of it. Find this girl. Uh, you care for some more coffee, sir? I got uh, plenty Yeah, more yeah, coffee. yeah. Bring the pot, will you? And, uh, waiter. Yes, sir? Uh, this, uh, Denny, the kid who was just here. What's yeah. his last name? Denny? Uh, it's Weston. Denny yeah, Weston. Yeah, yeah, okay. Where does he live, you know? Well, I'm not sure. I think he has an apartment out around Larkin Street somewhere, but I'm not sure. He's a funny kid. Yeah, what's funny about him? Well, I mean, working as a waiter in a joint like this when his, his sister had all that dough living in that knobby little apartment and all, you Who's know. Who's his sister? Monica Weston. You must have heard of her. Used to be a dancer at some joint over in North Beach. Well, I don't get around much anymore. Well, you saw the papers, didn't you? She was in the papers? Yeah, committed suicide. Then he nearly went off his rocker. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look, is uh, this here his sister? Oh, let me see. No, no, no. Monica was a redhead. This here's a blonde. Well, I'd better get you that coffee while it's out. Be right with you. I examined my sandwich for further clues, found nothing except corned beef, so I put it back together and began to eat it while I scrutinized the picture of the blonde. A nice-looking girl in her 20s, no scars, birthmarks, buck teeth, or anything else to set her apart from roughly 25,000 other blondes in San Francisco. There were a couple of points, though. The picture was about two inches square, showing her head and shoulders, and her hand was up to her face as if she was surprised at something near the camera. On one of her fingers was a ring, which I couldn't quite make out. In the back of the picture were the letters L-P. Now, this is probably the credit stamp of some professional photographer. I abandoned my sandwich, thumbed through the yellow section of the phone book, and stifled a cry of triumph as I discovered the firm of Leonard and Perkins photographers with an office on Bush Street, where forthwith I went. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. I don't think we did that here. You're sure that's not your mark on the back, Mr. Leonard? Well, positive. And anyway, that's not the kind of work we do. Looks like an outdoor flash shot. Ours is all studio stuff. Funny trimming it down like that. Trimming it down? Yeah, this is probably a standard 8 by 10 Someone just caught the center out of it. Thanks very much. Bye. So I went to the telephone book again, but instead of looking for the L-P as the front initials of the firm, I looked for them in the middle, since both ends of the photographer's credit stamp were trimmed off. And I ran across an outfit called Cal Pictures on Harrison Street. Yes, sir. I'd uh, like to speak to the proprietor, please. There's three of them. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Silverian, Mr. Brennis. Take your pick. Uh, Murphy will do. He's out. How about Silverian? Tied up with Mr. Brennis. Uh-huh. Where are they tied up? First door to your right. That's the main studio. Do not enter if the red light is on. Heaven for fun. I have seen photographers at work in my time, but not like this. I saw now why they were tied up. They were fit to be tied. In the middle of the studio was a mass of equipment that looked like a cross between the Palomar telescope and an atom smasher with what seemed to be a stretched out accordion on the bottom. All of it pointed at something lit up by floodlights on a small table. When I got up close, I found out what it was. Brennis and Silveria were photographing a plate of pork and beans. Now, for crying out loud, look at that pork. What is the matter with that pork? What, what's the matter with it? It just lies there. What do you expect it to do, Shemmy? Uh, excuse me, fellas, I, uh... When did we hire you? Uh, you didn't. I only want oh, to, Oh, uh... don't pay any attention to I'm him, not... John. Now, come on, come on, focus down. Focus down. Well, what's okay. the use? Let Why him... waste the shot? You know, you know what he said? The pork's got to have... Get up and go. Get yeah, up well, and go. It's got to look sucking. It's got to look married <laughs> to those beans. What do you want? me to do, sprinkle it with orange sauce. Oh, look, fellas, I really don't want to interrupt. It's no good, Silveri. You uh, know what they're going to run under the shot, don't you? New Spams, New England pork and beans, married in the can. Can I be best man? What? Okay, what do you want? I'm only Sam Spade, a private detective, trying to locate this girl here. A girl. Ever seen her? Sure, sure. Where? Well, this is our shot. Huh? Well, you, you remember, Al, the cheesecake job the other night. Look at it. Oh, yeah. The cheesecake job? Right down at the railroad. Store. Yeah, that was for Norby's Nifty Nylon. You mean this girl's a model? No, no, no. She walked in front of the camera at just the wrong time and loused up the shot. We had to shoot it over. Yeah, we, we had a model with a pair of Norby's Nylons on, see? 
a uh, well-known brand of stocking, and the idea was to stand her up next to a train coming down at the at depot the there. Well, then what we tried uh, to do was get a shot of her fixing a guard, a uh, leg guard, you know. Yeah. Sure, fine. Yeah, with stuff. a lot of admiring glances from the crowd. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, brand new idea, yeah. real train, real station, real people. Human documentary. documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Very so Al sets up the camera, and a model makes with a garter, and I whistle to get the crowd's eye, and we set off the flash. But uh, but the dame here walked in front of the camera. However, it was not her fault. No, no, no it was an awful nice kid. We yeah, told well, her to uh, drop by, we'd give her the shot. Great. Right. Well, uh, what's her name? I, I, I don't know her name. Did she come by? Yeah, a couple of mornings ago. I gave her the print and the negative, too. Got me other copies of it? Oh, I, I don't know. It'll take us a while to check the file. Oh, it's yeah, yeah, well, uh, well, look, yeah. do that, will you? And, and if you find anything, here's my phone number. Yeah, yeah. Now, as I was saying about that fork, John, Again with a your fork, fork told... is your fork. There is nothing you can do to glamorize it. I glamorize the number on So I bought an afternoon paper and went back to the office to take the load off my feet and mull over this latest turn of events. I mulled, decided to contact Denny Weston, my client, found his phone number in the book, and was about to call when the phone went off in my hand. Sam Spade. Spade, this is Denny Weston, the waiter. At, uh, I'm the guy who... Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I was about to call you. Don't. Don't call me, understand? You don't know me. I never saw you. Wait a minute now. I've been chasing that blonde all afternoon. You got your 50 bucks, didn't you? What's the matter? Is Freddy standing there with a gun at your back? Shut up about Freddy. Okay, then let's talk about your sister Monica. Or maybe this blonde you stuck in my corned beef sandwich. And don't let Freddy throw a scare into you. Hello. Hello, Denny. Uh. So, uh, that left me with a set of grim suspicions, a $50 bill, and no client. I put my feet up in the desk and opened the paper. Then I put my feet back down on the floor. On the front page was a picture of my blonde with a caption over it reading, You know this girl. I took the other picture out of my pocket and compared them. They were the same except for one thing. The picture in the paper was taken on a slab in the city morgue. Putting my shoes back on, I read the article under the picture of my blonde. It was simple enough. She'd turned up in the bay near the yacht harbor an hour before with a bullet in her back. The paper said nothing about identification. It didn't have to. Knowing you as I do, Lieutenant, I realized if there had been anything on the body to identify it, the picture wouldn't have been in the paper. Now, pictures, Brennan. Uh, this is Spade. You got anything on that front of the blonde? But well, we're still on the pork and beans. Oh, yeah, well, drop it for now, will you, and check the files. And if you find the print, sit on it or put it in the safe or something. Understand? Yeah, but the pork and the beans... The pork and beans will have to wait until we find who put the lady in the bay. I had a pretty good idea who put the lady in the bay, but why and how to prove it was something else again. So I turned back to the picture, got out my 15-cent store magnifying glass, and took a closer look at the ring in her hand. It seemed to be black, shaped like a shield with a gold center that looked like a dagger and a mask. Five telephone calls later, I found the company that made it for an honor society at the University of California. Blue and gold office. Uh, is that the campus yearbook, the blue and gold? Yes, sir, that's right. Do you uh, publish the pictures of the members of the Mask and Dagger Society? We sure do. Who's this? Uh, my name is Spade. I'm trying to locate one of the members of the society. Have you got the yearbook files in your office? Clear back to 1895. Well, good. Get out the books from about 1940 on, will you? I'll be over in a half hour. We found her in the class of 1941. Her name was Helen McKelvey. <laughs> I uh, understand a Miss Helen McKelvey lived here. No. No, I never heard of her. Now, wait a minute. I... I'm not going to hurt you. You're the landlady here, aren't you? I tell you, I don't know any McKelvey. Well, the city directly lists her at this address. It must be a mistake. Oh, I don't think Please, so. I don't know anything. I tell Come you. Come on, now. I... Sit down. Do you good to get it off your mind. I... There you are. Sit down. But I, I don't know anything. I, I, well, I look, that's know. not going to help any. I told you, I'm on your side. Who are you? Sam Spade. I'm a private detective. Now, uh, you know where Helen McKelvey is right now, I suppose. Yes. 
I do. Well, I'm trying to find out who put her there and why. Then what? I'll hang it on him if I can. That's why I'm here. Now, uh, tell me, what did Helen have to do with Mike Sheldon? Come on. Well, I, I don't know much about it. She was a lovely girl. Strange. You know, she kept things to herself mostly. Mm, what kind of things? She was doing some kind of political work in the North Beach district. You mean she was working for Mike Sheldon? Oh, against him. Oh? They were trying to defeat him, expose his rackets and his gambling, and heaven knows what else he was involved in. Heaven knows indeed. She took it all so seriously. Petitions and leaflets and telephone calls. I see. I kept telling her she was working too hard. And your health would go. And it did. The last election time... She spent a week in the hospital. But it was all useless. Sheldon was too big, too powerful. Why, he never even heard of her. I can guarantee he didn't know her by sight. I know. And then last week, a strange thing happened. I arranged for her to spend the weekend with my sister in Palo Alto. Mm-hmm. She came back Monday, terribly excited. that at last, she had a weapon against Mike Sheldon. What did she mean? I don't know. But it wasn't just Sheldon. It was his whole organization. She sounded crazy, like she was going to tackle them all by herself. Then what? And she packed her suitcase and moved out to some hotel. She wouldn't stay where. I was worried about her. I looked to her room afterwards. And that's when I found this clipping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Last Thursday's Chronicle. Does it help? Police seek motive and show girl suicide. Investigation of circumstances surrounding the suicide of Monica Weston. Nightclub dancer moved into his third day without producing a reason why the girl apparently took her own life Friday night by leaping from a southbound train. Train! I took off the headquarters where, as you'll recall, Kelsey, we went over the file on the showgirl capers. You'll also recall we came up with nothing that wasn't in the newspaper. The girl had apparently climbed aboard the train at 3rd and Townsend, eased down the aisle to the end of the car where a porter had left the door open, and flung herself off on a straightaway stretch near South City, where the train hits it up around 70 miles an hour. She'd been pretty, unaccountably prosperous, and hardly a candidate for suicide. But nothing had turned up in her background to set her up as a candidate for murder, either. So that's where it stood. Two dead young ladies and a missing cheesecake photograph of Norby's nifty nylon. Feeling this is enough for a day, I limped back to my apartment. I tossed my hat on the bed and started to pour myself a drink. Well, you never want to do that, Spade. Huh? Oh, Freddy. <laughs> Dumb stunt tossing your hat on the bed is bad luck. No, it's not so bad, Freddy. Well, well, I expect to go home to a cold, empty apartment and I find you. <laughs> How about a drink? Oh, no, thanks. I didn't come to drink. Oh, how'd you get in? Walk under the door? Oh, in a gay mood, ain't you? I'm a cheerful type. Had a busy day, Spade? Oh, ran a few errands, uh... Say, uh, you know, there's an ugly rumor running around town, Freddie. Huh? They're saying Uncle Mike Sheldon played sucker for this Monica Weston dame, that she was shaking him down and he got tired of it, what with the election coming up and all. Yeah? It's a fact. And they say she didn't commit suicide at all. Well, where'd you hear this? In Union Square, while I was feeding the pigeons. You think I'm kidding, huh? You think I'm kidding? Now, wait. You know what happens to boys who play with guns, Freddie? Shut up. Go on, go on, answer it. Okay. Hello. Mr. Speed? Yeah? Uh, Silver at Cal Pictures. Uh-huh. Uh, listen, about that uh, cheesecake shot. Oh, now, Luella, don't take on. So I didn't mean it that way. Luella? Uh, uh no, no, I'm talking about the uh, cheesecake shot down at the depot. Luella, honey, the girl is only a good friend. Uh, it's all your imagination. Well, uh, it's not uh, my imagination. We found the print in the files, and it's here, the... Secretary just pulled a boner. Whatever do you mean? Uh, someone named Mike Sheldon called, and she told him that we had it. Now, he's on his way here to pick... No, uh, no, no, listen, Luella. Don't uh, do it. I'll be right down. Sorry, Freddy. No, no, no. You ain't going nowhere, Look, Jay. Freddy, this girl, she's all worked up about nothing. I, uh... Even the pigeons, You want to know what you were doing, Spade? What? I'll tell you. 1.30 p.m. Went to a photographer's on Harrison Street. 3 p.m. across to the campus at Berkeley. Then after four to a rooming house on Bay Street, and from five thirty to seven at headquarters. 
Even the pigeons, sir. You're just like Luella, Freddie. Your imagination's running away with you. Come on, have a drink. Now, I told you, I don't want a drink. The bottle was half full, but it seemed like a good investment. Freddie took it just over the left ear side and sat on the floor. I dragged him into the closet, locked it, and took off the cow pictures. Right, I'll have it your way. Well, I... if we lose a news bomb, New England being account, don't come sniveling to me. Where's the picture? Uh, oh, well, hello, Spade. Oh, come on, John. Now focus down on it. Let's get this uh, thing. The beans. Two days' work. Hey, what's the big idea? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, fellas. I accidentally hit it with my elbow. I'll buy you a new can tomorrow. Where's the picture? On the table there. <laughs> Light and looked at it. The blonde was in the foreground, blocking out the model with the garter. But the shot wasn't entirely worthless since directly behind her, about to get on the train, looking squarely into the camera, was Monica Weston, the dead showgirl. And with her, with his white mane of flying, was you know who. Now, wait a minute. You can't find him like Shut up. It. All right, hold it, boys. I ducked out of a circle of light as they came in, Sheldon first and three others. The gun in my hand made me feel better, but not much better. They closed the door, and the room was pitch dark again, except for the spot of light in the center. Okay. Okay, Spade, where is it? I know you're in there, Spade. You're a little late, Sheldon. We sent it to headquarters. Yeah? Well, I think you've got it right here. She had a negative, you know. Mailed them around like postcard. I'm not worried about the others. Come on, now, let's have it. You hear what I said, Spade? Yeah. Come and get it. Okay. Now, hold it, boys. Okay, Spade. I'll come and get it. Except Sheldon, whom we found when we finally got the lights back on, trying to untangle himself from A, the floodlight stand, B, the table that had held the pork and beans, and C, 50 feet of light cable. So Varia was sitting in the middle of everything, sobbing softly. Three brand new crates. 450 bucks worth of flat. And our last can of nuts, bones, pork and beans. Uh... And I've killed you if I wind to that. Now I have in your hands my account of the affair, plus the cheesecake photograph, plus Michael Sheldon, who is, I admit, a fairly solid adversary. But of course, this is fairly solid ammunition. Uh, period, and a report. Oh. Uh, F, uh, make an extra copy of that for Denny Weston, if and when he ever comes out of that holy duck dinner when Sheldon started making with a threat. Oh, if I'd had the least notion you were in such peril. I've been worried to death. Mm. The peril didn't start until the next day, sweetheart. The next day? Yeah, well, that's when Brennus looked at me, squinted, and said, uh, You know, Al, this guy's got just the face for Brannigan's Bog, the whiskey that smells like old Ireland. Oh, how awful. A uh, fate worse than that, sweetheart, but that is all behind me, while directly in front of you is, of course, the... That's right. Mm. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll have it right away. The blonde, Sam. Yeah. What was she trying to do with a picture of Uncle Mike with the other girl at the station? You mean, why didn't she go to the police like any normal human being? Oh. Well, it's hard to say, Ep. She was really a sincere reformer. From here, it looks like she was trying to work up a partnership with the dead showgirl's brother. Maybe put the squeeze on Uncle Mike and force him to come across with names, numbers, and salaries of the members of his graft machine. Besides, uh... What? She was a woman. Come here. A mad, unpredictable, illogical creature. Mm. Oh, Sam. Effie Perrine, the non-alcoholic secretary that contains lanolin. Well, that's better than Brannigan's bag. The whiskey that smells like old Ireland. Good night. Sure, it's a fine and brother of the girls you are, and I'll be saying good night, sweetheart. <laughs> It 
Adventures of Sam Spade stars Howard Duff as Spade, with Lorene Tuttle as Effie. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin and new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo. Sam Spade Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. Uh, you've heard of pulling a rabbit out of a hat? Yes. Well, I pulled one out of a pickle. What happened, Sam? What happened, she asked. Well, goodbye. Oh, don't go, Sam. Don't you feel like talking about it? Frankly, no, but it's expected of me. Uh, sharpen a carrot, roll me some rabbit punch, what? get the hutch ready, for I'm about to hippity hop through the door with a load on and a flopsy, mopsy, and cottontail caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Say, Mother, if you get a special thrill out of buying things the whole family can use, then stop at your drug or toilet goods counter for a big family-sized bottle or tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite family hair tonic. Dad, Junior, Sis, yes, and you yourself, Mom, will find Wild Root Cream Oil ideal for grooming the hair neatly and naturally, for relieving dryness and removing loose dandruff. So, Mom, ask for it tonight or tomorrow for sure. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! What's the meaning of this? Of what? My desk and my chair shoved over to one side of the office. To make room for the other desk and the bookcase. There'll be no other desk and no bookcase or no anything else. But, Sam, I thought you... Don't say it. Don't even think about that name. You understand? Oh. It's deliciously silent in here, don't you think, Eff? Sam, weren't you and he supposed to go Stop. in the park? Effie, would you like to have your mouth dry cleaned? No, Sam. I'm sorry. I spoke harshly, forgive me, but the past hours have taken their toll on my nerves. Perhaps I should unburden myself. We'd all feel better. All right, sir. Unburden yourself? I'm still in command here. Oh. To Mrs. Wellington Van Cleve Montague, Knob Hill, where else? City, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. What else? Subject, the Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail Caper, or How Fritz Crockett Saved the Day. My dear, dear Mrs. Montague. It all began Thursday afternoon when I entered my office and discovered a tall, wiry young man sitting in my chair with his feet up on my desk and sampling my office bottle. Hi. The pose was so familiar for a minute, I thought it was me. Hello, Sam. I'll be with you in a minute. Have a... Thanks, I think I will, the one you're sitting in. You see, the detective sits in that seat and the clients sit over there. Well, that qualifies me for this seat, then. I'm a detective. I see. Well, uh, the detective we like in this office is Sam Spade, see? He pays the rent, he hires the secretary, he earns the money, and he sits behind his desk. Now, on your feet. Okay. But with two detectives around here and only one detective's chair, it's going to get a little crowded. Mind if I have a drink? Out of my glass? Oh, sure, sure. Here. You know, we'd better make a note to get another glass, too. Mm. And some scotch. I don't care much for that bourbon. No self-respecting detective drinks scotch. And uh, put this down. We'll need another desk and a new paint job on these walls. Oh. Uh, I think something bright. Robin's egg blue, maybe. Mm. Soothes the nervous clients. And a bookshelf. Uh, You got that, Effie, dear? Or am I going too fast? I'll put it all down, Chris. Desk, paint, bookshelf, scotch. Et tu, Effie? Uh, She's a doll. Wait a minute. That's my line. 
After I work with you a while, Sam, you'll appreciate me. So long. I'm great. Bye. You need me. Why? Because we'd be an unbeatable team. With my talent and your luck, we couldn't miss. Luck? Ever hear of Fritz Crockett? Chicago Fritz Crockett? Yeah. Never heard of him. Oh, Sam. Look, you're making a mark in your hometown. Now, why do you want to work for me in San Francisco? I lost my license in Chicago. Got caught on the hot side of a political battle. Worked for the losers, and the winners framed me for my license. Oh, gee, tough kid. That's I tough. can't get a license in any state until I clear that mess up. And so I have to work under somebody else's. Vegas, but why me? Because I've kept my eye on you, Sam. I like the way you're developing. I think you could work well with me. Gee, thanks. Well, uh, your application's received. Now, uh, give me a couple of years to think it over. What's huh? the matter, Sam? Afraid I might cut your reputation in town? You found me out. But anyway, bye. Chicken, huh? Look, you want to compare a scrapbook sometime? A really good detective's got to be an actor. I play any style. Listen, we're following a Russian countess to recover Gorky's original manuscript of the Lower Depths. I meet her in the lobby of the St. Mark, disguised as an itinerant caviar salesman. Countess Natasha Mishakov. Oh, here in San Francisco, my dear. How long has it been? Eight years, twelve years. Have you forgotten little Andrea so soon? Uh, Andrea, no, Andrea, Andrea, sorry, sorry, no casting today. Well, look, you gotta be an actor, Sam. Look, we're dealing a mortal blow to the gun-running career of Don Jose Ortega Sanchez, the notorious bandit king. Oh, uh... Don Jose, you have run your last... Peace love in border countries. Yeah. I am powerless to prevent your execution. <laughs> Die like the proud Espanol you are. Cigarette? Uh, Fritz, for heaven's sake. I you... help you, Sam. Look, you've been captured by a mutinous crew off an English tramp steamer, and I burst through the door. Get your blooming bloody hands off that man. This one I can do myself. Off a mo, Tigger. <laughs> I don't know exactly why I sat there listening to the guy, but I did. He was a sort of a one-man theater guild. He ran through 28 dialects, played a scene in which James Mason and Montgomery Cliff were trapped by an Armenian rug merchant and were saved by the voice of Gabriel Heater on the radio. Then he played all four of the Marx Brothers arguing with the Andrews sisters. Then, after the intermission, he told me a little bit about himself, regaling me with spine-tingling accounts of his Frank Merriwell-type achievements on the football field, in professional boxing, and hockey. It was pretty thrilling stuff, but nonetheless, I was about to usher him out when he came up with a particularly good bit of dialogue. I have a job for us. Yeah, well, so... John, where? Yesterday, Sam, I met an old friend from Chicago. She remembered me from an important cocktail party. Saved it for her, the party. Everyone was absolutely dreary until I became de rigueur with a brace of amusing anecdotes. The, the, the job, Fritz, the job. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, she wants us to guard a valuable hunk of jewelry at a party tonight on Knob Hill. What's the money? A hundred apiece, plus mingling with notch dancers and all the caviar we can eat. Well, well, it's better than I expected. In fact, Now, I here's have... what I want you to do. Oh, wait a minute. What's this here's what I want you to do? This is the Sam Spade detective agency, named so because Sam Spade is the man who gives the orders around here. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, this is a costume party, and we have to wear costumes. It's in the deal. Good. I'll break your leg, and you can go as the man who came to dinner. Sam, I already have the costumes. What? Right here. Crockett, what would you have done if I didn't go with you? (laughs) The thought never entered my head, Sam. What are the costumes? Sam, 100 clams apiece is a lot of dough, isn't it? Agreed. You are about to confront the reason we are being paid so much. What is that? Your costume. You are to go as a rabbit, a white rabbit. Here's the suit. Oh, and here's the head. Notice the shocking pink ears. No, the deal's off. It's been swell for us. Now, wait a minute. I am also going as a rabbit. See? You will go as Flopsy, and I will go as Mopsy. I will not go anywhere dressed in that ridiculous outfit. One hundred dollars, Sam. I will... Well... Sam, let's talk this over. Now, look, I will talk to you as a businessman might talk to you. Now, Mr. Spade, you take your ordinary type detective, and you have got a pretty solid (laughs) suit. We talked and talked, and around 8 o'clock that night, I found myself still talking and walking up the steps of your Knob Hill mansion, Mrs. Montague, cleverly disguised as Flopsy the Rabbit, paw in paw with Mopsy Crockett. My headpiece covered everything but my eyes, nose, and mouth, and I was grateful for that. When I passed the doorman, I was tempted to say, ah, what's up, Doc? But uh, Fritz said it ahead of me. He walked in as if this were his personal hutch, and you, Mrs. Montague, cruised over to us. Here, my little bunny twins, aren't you both just darling? Yeah. Which one of you is Mr. Spade? Uh, well, I'm Mr. Crockett, Mrs. Montague. Mopsy. You remember me from the Nesbitt soiree, Ronnie and Benita, or uh, maybe it was Gypsy introduced us, Nespa? Oh, yes. 
Oh, and Flops, the here must be Mr. Spade. I've always wanted to meet him. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Montague. I am the straight man. How do you like my costume? Well, There's not another one like it in town. I'm sir. the only wooden nymph in San Francisco. The trains will swoon. They will. Oh, uh, you... Uh, Mrs. Montague, perhaps you'd be disposed to outline our job. Well, of course, Mr. Uh, uh, Crockett. Uh, myself, Mrs. Arlington Crippen McGill, and the famous Spanish artist Julio de Riego are going to pick the woman with the most fascinating costume. Search no farther. It could be no one but you. Flatterer! Oh. I'm not eligible. Oh. Then, at 10 o'clock, we will have the grand parade. The winner will leave the parade wearing a small jewel-studded crown. Oh, it's darling. Diamonds and emeralds and all sorts of amusing things. Well... This crown once belonged to Josephine of France. Imagine. Uh, Mrs. Montague, I hate to be an old killjoy, but are we here to uh, guard the crown? That's right, Flossie. I mean, Mr. Spade. Oh, it's all right. Oh, of course. I don't expect any trouble, but it's so valuable. I can't take any chances. My husband picked it up in Iran. He's in pickles, you know. Well, you know best. Uh, where is the crown now, Mrs. Montague? Oh, in a wall safe in the master bedroom on the second floor. Here's the combination to the safe written down. I'd uh, rather not have the combination, if you don't mind, until it's time to get the crown. Oh, now don't you be silly, Mr. Spade. Except for the crown, there's only fifty or sixty thousand dollars in the safe. Oh, well, if that's all. Now I... the safe is behind the Degar original. Now, until I need you, go and enjoy yourself. Well, we'll go. Maybe I'll even let you dance with little me. <laughs> Fritz and I synchronized our watches and decided that until we were needed, we would lose ourselves in the crowd and keep our big rabbit ears open. Everybody was masked and loaded, and it was all very gay. I brushed elbows with pirates, northwest mounted police, unmounted, a gorilla, an Arabian princess, four Pocahontas, and assorted historical characters from Julius Caesar to Mike Romanoff. While I was dipping a carrot into the punch bowl, a girl made her way over to me. I knew it was a girl immediately. You could tell. I uh, tagged her as a burlesque queen, but uh, she didn't talk much like it. Are you an he-bunny or a she-bunny? Uh, I'm a he-bunny. Would you like to dance with me? I'd be delighted. Who are you? Uh, I'm not supposed to tell until the masks come off. Uh, for now, just call me Flopsy. Flopsy? How cute! <laughs> you Americans have the cutest ideas. Yes, uh, speaking of ideas, uh, what do you represent? Oh, I am a folie berger dancer. Do you like me? Well, from where I stand, it would be next to impossible to dislike you. <laughs> Such a sweet compliment. Uh, believe me, it was easy. Uh, uh, tell me, have you uh, been in this country long? Uh... A few weeks. My family has sent me on a tour of America. I see. I am here as a guest of Monsieur Montagu. Now tell me, you are a detective, are you not? As much as I regretted doing it, I hastily detached myself from Miss Foley's Berger of 1949. How she knew I was a detective puzzled me. I saw Crockett talking with a paunchy red devil and a middle-aged Christopher Columbus and stopped by. Uh, they were big businessmen, obviously, and so, so was he. Well, now, you take your ordinary harsh tape of breeze, if oh, double duty punch in every time. It was impossible to interrupt him, so I moved on. Finally, I sat down to rest in a dim corner of the library, and I no sooner did than a large green pickle with two bandy legs sticking out of it sat down beside me. Want to buy the pickle? Uh, uh, no, thanks. No. Go ahead, it's free. I only eat carrots. Thank you, just the same. I suppose you know who I am? Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know. Well, I shouldn't tell you, but I'm lonesome for somebody to talk to. Yeah, my wife's well. dancing with another man. Sometimes I think she only likes me for my money. I find that hard to believe. Uh, I have millions, you know, just millions. I'm Horace Montague, the pickle king. I've sold more pickles than any living man. Congratulations. You like my costume? Uh, never smelled anything like it. Uh, I came this time as just an ordinary new pickle. Sometimes I come as a dill, sometimes I come as a gherkin. Oh, jolly. Yeah. Once I came as a sweet-sour mixture, yeah. and I got very confused. Uh, well, that's up to you. I guess all I really have is my money, but I get tired of being so rich. It was fun in the early days. I was a pioneer, you know. You uh, started, I suppose, with just a wart. Mm. <laughs> yes, that's very funny, very funny. Yes, well, uh, keep laughing, Horace. I have to be running along. Thank you for talking to me. I was beginning to feel like an extra in Alice in Wonderland and headed back for the solace of the punch bowl. I saw Mopsy Crockett standing with a Foley's Berger dancer and went over to him, but he suddenly turned and hopped away faster than I could hop after him. Why the coyness, I couldn't understand. When I finally caught up with him, ten minutes later, he was waltzing with Anne of Austria, who was hanging on his every word, and that was a lot of hanging. Until you've tasted my lead 
Pfannkuchen, you have the, the spirit of Goethe, Schiller, Heine, all baked in one kuchen. <coughs> Mind if I cut in? If you must. I mean with the other rabbit. Uh, come along, Mopsy. Well, of all the three. Uh, excuse me, darling, I come later back. Hello, Sam, what do you hear from the mom? The idea of avoiding me. Me? Avoid you? Oh, I don't know what you mean. Frogger, don't you remember just ten minutes ago, my chasing you all over the floor? So help me, I don't. Oh, there you are, my little bunny. Yeah, here we are, Mrs. Montague. All right, you can give me the crown now. I'm almost ready to announce the winner of the costume contest. Uh, we haven't taken it out yet, Mrs. Montague. You have it, where you just said you were going to get it. I didn't. Did you, Fritz? Not I, Flopsy. Now, Bunny, stop playing jokes. One of you came up to me a couple of minutes ago and said you lost the combination to the safe, so I gave it to you again. You said you were going to get the crown. Now, where is it? I don't know, but let's find it. When we arrived in the master bedroom, the worst had happened. The Degas original was down off the wall. The safe had been opened. Believe it or not, the fifty or $60,000 habitually kept in it wasn't even touched. But you, Mrs. Montague, weren't worried about the cash. Oh, it's not there. The Josephine crown is gone. Oh, this is frightful. What will Horace say? We're sorry, Mrs. Montague. You're sorry I... you were supposed to guard it. It's your fault. Maybe you stole it yourself. Mrs. Montague, we did nothing of the kind. I distinctly remember saying you were going to get it, and I did give you the combination uh, again. I know. Uh, oh, it's uh, Horace. Uh, Horace, what happened, hubby dear? Uh, I was walking down the hall and a bunny came running out. Dragged me into a room, made me take off my pickle. Oh. And he hit me on the head with something, then he took off his bunny suit, jumped right into my pickle and ran off. Oh, my head. Crockett and I dashed down the hall to the room the pickle king had abdicated. On the floor was the limp, unfilled costume of a rabbit. The Montague's party not only had a flopsy and a mopsy, but it also had a thieving cottontail. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men... And women and children, too. And now, back to the Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I left Fritz Crockett and you, Mrs. Sam, attending to Horace in your master bedroom and pounded down the stairs through the guests and out the front door. I was standing there wondering where to pick up the tracks of a rabbit turned pickle when I saw the Foley's Berger dancer come running out of the Montague mansion through a side entrance and enter a taxi. I jumped into another cab and followed it, divesting myself of my flopsy costume en route. She went almost to the west end of O'Farrell Street and entered a shabby gray apartment house. I followed. I knocked on every door until I found hers. Yes? Uh, it's me, uh, the he bunny, Flopsy, remember? Why did you follow me here? Voila, because you're so beautiful. May I come in? No. Thanks. I said no. Did you not hear me? Yes, but have no fears. I'm bonded. Uh, how did you know there was a detective, a detective's heart beating under my rabbit suit? I am not going to answer. You have no right to come in here. Come on, huh? Uh, I think I overheard somebody say it. Now, if that is all you wanted to know, please go. Why did you leave the party early? Because it bored me. 
I thought America was not a police state. Why am I being questioned? Because somebody stole the Josephine crown that belonged to Mrs. Montague, you see. I heard that it was stolen, and I am delighted. But I did not steal it. What's your name? Charmaine Roger, and what is yours? Sam Spade. Why are you so happy that the crown was stolen? Because it does not belong in the ugly home of a rich American party giver. Oh. A childish woman who thinks only of her social position and her money. Mm-hmm. Where does it belong? In France. Where it was made and where it was appreciated. I see. How much is it worth? Money? Almost 52 million francs. In sentiment, more than one can say. Now, will you leave me alone? You're saying that the crown means more to a Frenchman than money, hmm? How would you like it if your Abraham Lincoln's desk was being used by some French businessmen to serve cocktails over? I get the point. I tell you again, I do not know what happened to the Josephine Count tonight. Do you believe me? Hmm. I did, but only because when she left the party, she wore only her costume, and that costume wouldn't have hidden, uh... Well, she couldn't have had it on her. I, uh, went a block up the street, picked up a cab, and sat in it until she came out five minutes later. She was now in street clothes and carrying an overnight case. She drove to Castle Street, and I followed. She went into a restaurant called La Parisienne. I waited a discreet moment, then went in. She was nowhere to be seen. But a tall, lean, black-haired individual approached me with a menu in his hand. Good evening, monsieur. I regret to say that we are just closed. I'm not interested in meeting you. Where's the girl who just came in? Girl? In here? Don't dummy on me. She walked right in here 30 seconds ago. Brown hair, red coat. Charmaine Roger by name. You have made some mistake. You can see there was no one here. I have made no mistake. Now complain, will you? Monsieur, complain yourself. Please, let me go. No girl came in, but if one did, there is no place to hide but the kitchen. All right, then show me the kitchen. Monsieur Bernot. Monsieur. Oh, Oh, my. Spade. Well, I didn't take you long to get here, Mr. Montague. Well, I... Uh, please. Don't move, Mr. Spade. I have a knife at your neck. Yes, I feel it. Shall I take care of him, Monsieur Montague? No, but no. Put down your knife. Thanks. Mr. Spade and I will sit down at the table and talk quietly. You can go. As you say, Monsieur. But I will keep out an eye. Let's keep an eye out. Sit down, please. Right. Spade, while you're here, I have a personal matter to take up with you. About the Josephine Crown? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to report that as yet I haven't found it. Good. I'd be happy if you never found it. Oh? Uh-huh. Does uh, Mrs. Montague know you feel this way? No, and I'd be equally happy if she didn't know. Mm-hmm. In other words, you want me to stop looking for it. Uh, that's the idea. Oh, you could make a pretense of trying to find it, but no more. That's interesting. I'll pay you a good fee if you do this for me. Why don't you want it found, Mr. Montague? Uh, well, I'll talk to you man to man. Please do. Uh, a, f- a French girl showed up in town. Charmaine Roger? Well, then you've seen her. Quite a bit of her. Uh, at the party. Uh, well, she's young and beautiful and... To add to the point, I was indiscreet. I see. She turned out to be more designing than I realized. A black man? Of a sort. She didn't want just money. She wanted the Josephine crown. And uh, you let them steal it? Well, I told them I'd get them into the party and furnish them a car, and the rest is up to them. Why didn't you just give them the crown? Well, I couldn't. My wife values it too much. It's her prized possession. She even wears it around the house when just the two of us are there. Oh, that's cute. Now, will you forget about this space? I'm afraid not, Mr. Montague. I'm hired out to your wife who asked me to guard it. I did a bad job, so it's up to me to get it back, you see? No, Spade, I... I can't afford a scandal with that girl. Well, you'll have to work that out for yourself. Very well. I'm sorry. I must admit, Mrs. Montague, I underestimated your husband. For at that point, he produced a gun out of thin air and very professionally relieved me of mine. He called the proprietor, Bonneau, who appeared with Charmaine Roger. They held an immediate kangaroo court. Sentence was about to be pronounced. When the front door burst open, and in swept a tall character in black beret and cape and sporting a handlebar mustache. Uh-huh. Prominently pinned on his cape were a brace of French war medals, including the Croix de Guerre and so on. His entrance held everybody bug-eyed, including me. Keep your mouth shut, Oh, what a joyous, charming gathering have we here. Oh, the glow of warm friendship fills the room like a cottage fireplace in alsace lorraine Ah, no, it cannot be. Can I believe these weary eyes of mine? Is it not truly my intime ami, Monsieur Montagu? Uh, I, uh, mm-hmm. I kiss you on both cheeks in happiness. Uh, who is uh, I, I don't seem to remember. Oh, but you have not so soon forgotten me. We met at the legation in 38. Oh, those years. Do you not recall the nights in Montmartre and the days in Montmartre? Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, parbleu! 
When he bent over to kiss Montague again, his mustache fell off. As usual, Crockett had overplayed. And before he could straighten up, Bono hit him in the back of the head and he fell flat on his face, out cold. That was my cue to go into action. I turned over the table and wrestled with Horace and Bono while Charmaine was striking at me with the heel of a shoe. I got to the gun first and everything came to a sudden lull. At that point, uh, Fritz Crockett came too. Oh, mes amis... Where did the sudden darkness come from? Yeah, well, you can drop the dialect, Crockett. Oh. Yeah, I wish I had a picture of you there on the floor for your scrapbook. Oh, it was in the act, Sam. All in the act. Yeah, well, you think you're well enough to hold this gun while I make a search? Oh, leave it to me, Sam. Everything will be under control. Now, stand back, everybody. I'm in charge here. The U.S. government is not entirely without influence in Washington. <laughs> Josephine Crown hidden in the baking oven and called the police. I was afraid the incident struck a blow at Franco-American relations until a search of Charmaine Rouget and Bonneau produced two tickets not to Paris or points French, but to Rio de Janeiro. And you know the rest, Mrs. Montague. Your husband went home and you forgave him. He made a superb gesture and contributed to international harmony by returning the Josephine Crown to the French Historical Society. And when you asked who might be the man to guard the crown safely back to La Belle France... I was overjoyed to be in a position to recommend to you, Fritz Crockett. I hope he marries, uh, Soubrette and stays over there. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam. Isn't that Fritz Crockett an exciting man? Don't let's talk any more about him. Let him get his own program. The first person in his office to mention his name again is a rotten egg. Now go type that up. Don't buy a different brand of hair tonic for every member of your family. Get the one kind they all like. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Get a bottle or tube tonight and ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Oh, thanks, Sonny. Sam's Space Detective Agency. Oh, it's for you, Sam. Hello. It's me, Sam. Fritz. Oh, no. I'm at the airport. I just wanted to tell you I'll be out of town for a while. Won't be using the office, so just take the whole thing over. Well, that's very generous of you. And you can use Effie if you need her for anything. Well, I'll never be able to repay you. Oh, that's all right. You did a pretty good job on the caper today. Thanks. I was just talking with Mrs. Montague. And I told her, I said, if you want to... You're not even listening. I've heard enough of him for one day. Come here. Tonight, she'll have to be satisfied with my one arm. Oh, that's good enough for me. Oh. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, filter and in the flesh. Any messages, phone calls, letters, a telegram? Or... Just the usual. A bill from the landlord and a notice from the telephone company. Well, dispose of them as usual. You sound awfully chipper. Have you been on a case, Sam? Did you make some money? Yes, I've been on a case. No, I did not make any money. Oh, your client got murdered before he could pay you? Wrong again. My client was a woman. She did not get murdered and she could pay me. Huh? And she did. But you just said she didn't. True, Effie, true. Things are not what they seem. Well, I'm a little confused. You just said that... And she... I meant every oh. word of it. Stop registering bewilderment. <gasps> all, all is paradox. So, uh, sharpen your pencils, straighten your seams, get out your notebook, and prepare to be confounded by the contradictions I shall contradictate to you during my report on The Honest Thief Caper. I'm not looking over for the oh. clover. Oh, oh, Sam, hello. Look alert, girl. We've many things to do. Up, up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you say the strangest things on the phone. Don't I, I? <laughs> I don't believe I quite understood what it was all about. An astral misunderstanding. I didn't understand it myself. Uh, uh, date? Uh, Two. Uh, Sergeant Frank Nilgus, uh, robbery detail, San Francisco police. From uh, Samuel, pay license on one, two, seven, five, six. Uh, you're fast today. Subject, uh, Ben Comiskey. Who? Ben Comiskey. C-O-M-I-S-K-I. Sam! 
I went to Elbert High School with a boy named Ben Comiskey. Is he the same one? Very likely, yeah. Oh, Sam, tell me, did he turn out bad? Is he good? Did he get married? Down, Effie. Sam, I knew this boy. I want to know. This is one mystery you're not going to solve by reading the last chapter first. Dear Frank, it was one of those days. The sky was black and it looked like rain, but when I put on my trench coat, the sun came out. At breakfast, it looked like I'd ordered fried eggs and I wound up with pancakes. Also, I discovered I was wearing one blue sock and one black one. After that, I gave a cab driver a five instead of a one and let him ride off with a change. And there was one other thing. Sam, bank just called. You're overdrawn. Then nuts, Ev. I made a deposit two days ago. I checked, Sam. You didn't. You're nuts, too. I made out the slip myself and I... Oh. Give me, Sam. I'll take it right down. Uh, yeah, better do that, Angel. Yes, excuse me. Oh, oh. Can I help you, miss? Is, is this, this Mr. Spade? Uh, come right in, miss. Sit down. Uh, uh, Miss Perrine, you may go and uh, uh, do that. Hmm? Uh, instruct them that if such a mistake occurs again, I shall take my account elsewhere. Yes, sir. Now, uh, uh, please sit down, Miss... Uh... My name's Louise Miller, Mr. Spade. I, I want to hire you. How much will it cost? Well, now, Miss Miller, let's uh, let's talk about it a little well, first. I haven't much time, Mr. Spade. I have to be at the office in a half an hour, and I have to cross town. You see, I... Well, Mama thinks I should forget all about him, but I can't, and I... Well, here, I've, I've got $95. Will you please do something? Just something? Oh, come on, now, come on. I'm sorry. I... That's all right, now, uh... Who is he? What's he done? And why does Mama want you to forget him? Ben. Ben Comiskey. Hmm. My... We were going to be married pretty soon. We we even picked out our furniture. We... No, no, no. It's all right now. Go on. What's he done? They say he held up a store two nights ago. They, they picked him up on the street today. He's, he's in jail. Mm-hmm. Well, if he's innocent, I'm sure they'll find that out. He, he won't even see me, Mr. Spade. He, he won't see anyone. He, Ben's good and kind and sweet, and I love him, and I want to marry him, and I want you to find out why, he, what it's all about. Look, Miss Miller, I, I think you should be in the office of a good lawyer. I'm sure He doesn't that... want a lawyer. He, he won't even see the public defender. He, he doesn't want anything. Oh, please, please, Mr. Spade. I, I just want to die if Ben went to prison. I'd... I just want to die. <laughs> I'm uh, no sentimentalist, but faith is a thing we're a little short on these days, so we came to terms. It was a grade she could pay me after the job was done if there was any job to do. She left for work, and I phoned you, Sergeant Milgus, and found out Ben Comiskey had already been arraigned and was being held in the city jail. When I dropped in 20 minutes later, you walked me back to his cell. What's it all about, Sam? I don't know. Just looking into it. Hey, he won't tell you anything. No? Kept his trap shut all the time he's been here. As far as we've been able to find out, no previous record, no background. Well, maybe it isn't so bad for him at that, huh? First degree, Sam. Liquor store proprietor, man named Potter over on Army Street. Identified him in the morning lineup. Mm. Just like that. Picked him out of a dozen guys we hauled in. Then what? Yeah, we send a couple of the boys out to Comiskey's room and find all the dough in the dresser drawer. 900 quants. Mm. Now what? Take it easy, Comiskey. This is Sam Spade. He wants to talk to you. Ben Comiskey was tall, dark complexioned, about 29 or 30 years old. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features were regular, not good, not bad. I've seen plenty of hold-up men and gun-toters in my day, and he wouldn't have been cast in the part in my movie. I... Didn't know what I expected to say to him or what I expected him to say to me, but I didn't expect what I got. What are you trying to do? Get out of here. I just got here, man. Well, you can just leave. Hasn't a citizen got any rights, even in jail? Well, they start to lose them when they use a gun to make a living. I don't want any lectures. I haven't got any to hand out. I'm a private detective. A friend of yours hired me. She thinks you're a pretty nice guy. Louise, huh? Why won't you see her? She's nuts. She ought to have a head felt. What's she worrying about anyway? I'd say she was worrying mostly about you. And I'd say it's the sick kind of worry that gets into a girl when she loves somebody. She shouldn't. She's nuts. You said that. Did you uh, rob that store? The guy who runs it says I did. I suppose I did. Why? For laughs. 
The complaint says you make 65 bucks a week in an architect's office. You can eat on that. Look, Spade, go back and tell her this. I didn't want furniture at $10 a month for the next 80 months. I didn't want a car the same way. I didn't want her working and me working and getting nothing but wrinkles. Tell her I got caught and to go and find a guy who can pay the way. Is that all? That's enough. You're charged with armed robbery in the first degree. That means not less than five years. I know it. Shut up about it. Why'd you turn down a lawyer? Hadn't you heard, Spade? They're holding up my indictment. I'm a prize pigeon. They think maybe I knocked over ten or twelve other places in town. Did you? Sure, sure. But don't worry about me. And tell Louise not to worry about me. I've got a million bucks salted away, and I'm going to buy my way out through the DA's office. Okay. Have it your way, Ben. But an hour later, I found myself strolling around Ben Comiskey's old neighborhood. A man named Gabrini, who owned a grocery store, remembered him and liked him. A woman in a bakery shop told me how he'd gone into the Army as a private and been discharged a first lieutenant. A phone call to a Mr. Henderson, a light architect, revealed that Ben Comiskey was in line for a raise and promotion. All in all, I was getting a composite picture that didn't look quite right. I decided to try his mother's place. It was on Lombard Avenue, a street that starts on the waterfront. According to the penciled note above the doorbell, it was out of order. The slot in the mailbox read, Mrs. Anastasia Comiskey. Yes. What is it, please? Uh, you're Mrs. Comiskey? I'm busy now. I fix lunch for my son. He come back from Cincinnati. Please. Oh, uh, well, uh, Mrs. Comiskey, I'm here to talk to you about Ben. He's your son, too, isn't he? Yes. Ben is my son. Well, uh, I'm trying to help him, Mrs. Comiskey. Why? He has no money. I have no money. A friend of his, Louise Miller, hired me. Oh, Louise, she's a foolish girl. Very foolish. Her heart should not be with Ben. I think he's a very lucky man to be loved by somebody like that. If not for her, Ben would not be in jail, in trouble. Oh, you don't want to help my son. She don't want to help him. She'd leave him alone if she wanted to help. Ben is bad. Not good like my son, James. James is always good. Times he's away, he sends me money. From what I hear, Ben's always been pretty good, too. Always one good son, one bad son. What's going on, Mom? Oh. Who's this? He's come to ask questions about Ben. Huh? I'm Jim Comiskey, Ben's brother. Oh, my... Uh, you run on in, Mom. I'll talk to this gentleman. All right. Get out of here. Look, I'm just trying... If you've got any questions to ask about Ben, go to the police. They can give you all the answers. And stop bothering my mother. She's been through enough in the last two days. If I catch you around her again, I'll break you in half. The man who slammed the door in my face had the same angry look and the same angry glare of Ben Comiskey. The angry Comiskey brothers definitely wanted nothing that looked remotely like help, it seemed to this casual observer. I went back to my office to wait for six o'clock. That's when I intended to call my client, report my opinions, and drop the case. But at 5.30, she called me. Mr. Spate? Yeah? This is Louise Miller. Oh, yes. I was just going to call you. I'm afraid I haven't been able to do much. It looks like... I know, Mr. Spate. I, I just telephoned downtown. Ben pleaded... Ben pleaded guilty at the indictment this afternoon. He, he's going to be sentenced tomorrow. And that, to all appearances, Sergeant Milgus, was the crop. But two hours later, and for the second time in one day, I found myself doing what I didn't think I'd be doing, walking around a dull, gray, two-story apartment house on Adams Place. My ex-client's address, to be exact... I was wondering what a lonely, distraught girl would be thinking the night before her boyfriend was shipped away to prison. I found out. I got a whiff of it as I walked down the hall. It was coming out from under her door. I had to use my shoulder. The room was acrid and stinging with gas fumes. And Louise Miller was stretched out on the floor in a six-foot kitchen. When I picked her up and carried her out, I wasn't sure whether she was dead or not. Ten seconds after I'd found Louise Miller, I'd called a police ambulance, and in a matter of minutes, an intern was working over with a pull motor. 
Her breathing became regular and her pulse picked up, but she was still unconscious. Lieutenant Kelsey of Homicide showed up and said it was obviously a suicide attempt, which is his kind of ingenious thinking. I thought not. If she were going to commit suicide, she wouldn't have called first to pull me off the caper. She'd have let an insignificant detail like that take care of itself. Now, she was too strong to pity herself and too sure of what her intuition told her to believe even Ben Comiskey's confession. For that kind of faith, I owed it to her to poke around the ashes while they were still hot. I did, and turned up a live coal in a faded blue shirt and wrinkled brown pants. Bert Singleby, by name and by vocation, manager of the Greystone Arms Apartments. What kind of a girl was she? Oh, nice, clean, sincere. The kind mothers always want their sons to marry. Boy, I wish I'd listen to mine. Yeah, uh, did you know her boyfriend, Ben Comiskey? Oh, salt on earth. What? I can't understand him pulling a hold-up like that. But then, you know, the war did strange things to me. Yes, I guess it yeah. did. Well, I almost stayed in Europe and married myself up to a French doll myself. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but Sandra, that's my wife. She'd have hunted me down in Tibet. It was easier to come home facing music. Yeah, well, about Louise, uh, you know any reason why she might commit suicide? Frankly, no. no. I met her in the hallway tonight, and she said, Mr. Singleby, she said, Ben didn't do that hold-up because I'm pretty sure I know who did. Well, I figure she's just keeping up a front. But if she did really know that Ben didn't do it, she wouldn't have turned on the gas now, would she? No, she wouldn't. Uh, did she tell you who she thought did it? No, that's all she said. She's a quiet girl. Not like my wife. Now, Sam. Yeah, uh, did you see or hear anything that might have been suspicious or unusual around her apartment tonight? Now, look, I don't want to go around breaking up any homes or spreading dirty gossip around. Unless it involves Sandra's relative. Uh, Mr. Singleby, I promise you, sir, that I'll treat any information you give me confidentially as long as I can. All right. Now, listen. Sandra told me not to say anything because it's, you know, it's a lot easier to rent a suicide apartment than a murder apartment. You know that? Confidentially, I'm a humanitarian. But if you tell anybody I said this, I'll, well, I'll just lie about it. I'll never tell a soul. Well, we were out of butter, see, so I had to run down to the store. Well, when I passed the mailboxes outside, a guy is standing there. He asked me which apartment Louis Mil or Louise Miller was in, and I said 12B. What do he look like? Oh, we'll see now. A uh, 5'10", medium build, tan suit, dark shirt, sort of a uh, wide brim hat, kind of flashy. Mm -hmm. Wore three or four big rings, diamonds they looked like. Three yeah. or four big diamond rings on each hand. The Iceman. Why didn't you tell all this to the police? Bert! Bert, who are you talking to? Don't you dare say a word about that poor girl. That's why. That is why. Sandra always says, keep your mouth shut and you keep out of trouble. But me, I don't know. I just love... Bert, her. stop! Talking too much and close that door. Yes, Sandra, dear. I'm closing it. The Iceman. I'd heard about him for years, a Chicago import, but I'd never bumped into him before. He'd been headquartering at the Red Spot Cafe, the uh, kind of a place that Skid Row winos visit when they want to slum. It was dark inside, but I strode manfully to the bar. Something? The Iceman here? What do you want him for, huh? He's a friend of mine. You're a friend of whose? What are you giving me? You got bull written all over you from the top of your stupid head to the bottom of your flat feet. He had the tan suit, the flashy rings, the dark shirt, and the wide-brimmed hat. He stared at me with eyes that were icy and insolent. He rubbed the knuckles of one hand into the palm of the other as if he just ached for a chance to bruise them, which I was sure he did. Four guys sauntered over to lean on the piano, and as ugly as they were, I knew it wasn't a barbershop quartet. Two more left the bar and stood behind him, and a few others got up from nearby tables and joined the group. I should have brought my team, but I hadn't. You're a friend of mine, huh? Well, if it isn't Claude Bettering, the juvenile delinquent of 1940. Is that so? Now, you're a real brain. Who are you, brainy? Sam Spade. Oh, now, ain't that a pretty name? You got something on your mind? I just wanted to talk with you about what you did to a girl named Louise Miller tonight. Never heard of her. Sounds cute, though. Girls are a lot easier to push around, aren't they, Claude? Call me Ice. Claude? <laughs> some guys are just as easy as some dames. Where have I been all night tonight, fellas? Here, Ice. You heard that, Spade? I've been here all night. Any of you guys ever hear of a Louise Miller? No. Uh... Eh, sorry, nobody ever heard of her, see? Well, she has a lot of friends who have. The police, the people down at Mercy Hospital, and me. And uh, none of us are going to forget her. Or uh, what happened to her. And who did it. Got something you'd like to do right now, maybe? Yeah. But I'll pick my time. All right. Enough of this cheap chatter. I don't want to be seen talking with you too long. I got my reputation to think about. 
Now blow before I take one hand out of my pocket and push your stinking face back through that door. You'll need both hands, Samson. <laughs> Go on, you creep. Fellas. All right. As I went rapidly through the door, Claude Bettering was standing, oily smile and all, polishing a couple of his oversized rings on his lapel. It was a picture I said I wouldn't forget, and I didn't. I went and rented myself a car, parked it down the block from the Red Spot Cafe, and waited almost all night. I knew that Louise Miller was not the kind of a girl who would have anything to do with a guy like Bettering. And if he came to her apartment, this must have been for some unloving purpose. Probably to keep her from telling who actually did the holdup Ben Comiskey had confessed to, if she found out the truth. Finally, a bunch of palookas came out, Bettering included, climbed into a car and drove off, me after them. One by one, Bettering dropped his men off at their hotels and apartments until he was finally alone. He uh, stopped at a brownstone on Hobart, and I caught him just as he opened the door of his apartment. Well, the tough guy. You're going to find out. Don't think I'm easy. And he wasn't easy. He was three inches shorter and 25 pounds lighter, and wherever he had picked up his reputation for toughness, he earned it. But I never enjoyed a fight in my life any more than that one. I batted him through his knees and then to the floor, and he still wouldn't give up. You stinking creep. Why did you beat up Louise Miller? I didn't. Why? I didn't. Why? I didn't. Why? The apartment house manager identified you. He's a liar. Who did you do it for? Nobody. Who? Nobody. Who? You stinking creep. I'll push your face in. Who? Who? Push your face in. He went out. Quite a guy, the Iceman. I used his phone to call the police and tell them to pick him up for attempted murder. Then, with dawn coming up and my energy going down, I went back to the city jail, got a pass, and woke up Ben Comiskey. Why don't you stop messing around in my business, Spade? Did you ever really love that girl of yours? Get out, you sadistic jerk. Well, she's in Mercy Hospital now. You can send her a card. Write something nasty on it. So long. Spade. Yeah? What's she in the hospital about? What do you care? Tell me, please. Somebody turned on the gas in her apartment and tried to kill her. It's nothing, really. Please. Who did it? Who did it, Spade? I think it was a guy named Claude Bettering. They call him the Iceman in certain circles. But why? That's what I'd like to know. Who's Bettering? I don't know. Your girl believed you were innocent, Comiskey, but you said you weren't. My guess is that somebody figured she knew something and tried to shut her up. I think uh, Bettering was hired by somebody. Spade, look, I, I don't have any dough, see? But I want to get out of here for one day. Do you know anybody who can raise the bail? I, I won't skip, and I'll pay back anything you want. Why? I got to see somebody. I don't think I can. Who do you want to see? My lousy, dirty, low-down, no-good brother. He hired Bettering? Who else? He did everything. He's always done everything wrong. He held up that liquor store, but he's on parole, a two-time felony offender. One more rap and he'd go up for 20 years. I did this for him. Yeah, look at me. I did it for him, and he tries to kill my girl. Your mother said he was a good boy, hardworking, lived in Cincinnati. Me again. I told her all that. She believed it. I started the whole stupid lie and had to go through with it. I could explain two years, three years to her, but not 20. He promised he'd go straight. He promised... I see. I even sent him money I earned and said it was from him. Oh, you never saw anybody like me before, did you? No, I haven't. Get me out. Get me out, Sam, and I'll drag him in by his back teeth. Thanks anyway, but I'll do it myself. Spade, let me do it. Let me do it, please. I drove over to Mrs. Comiskey's house and knocked on her door. She came out in a house coat, hair must, and sleep still in her eyes. Yes? I'm uh, sorry to bother you at this hour, Mrs. Comiskey, but is your son home, Jimmy? Jim? No, he went He went out last night. He didn't come back yet. I see. Uh, when do you expect him? Well, he didn't say. 
He didn't have to because I saw a closet door move and I was in and across the room. In a second, I pulled the door back and Jim Comiskey came out, gun and all. I'll kill you. Jim! Jim, don't! You're going crazy! She hurried across the room, threw herself between Jimmy and me and started wrestling the gun away from her. Jimmy! He put one hand flat on her face and knocked her halfway across the room. I went at him. He shot, but it went into the ceiling. I didn't give him a chance to do it again. Don't! Don't! You held up the liquor store, didn't you? Uh, yeah. And hired Bettering to kill Louise Miller? Yeah. And you're going to take your own rap from now on? Yeah. Yes, I will. And he did. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam. That poor old lady. Yeah. yeah. She lived in a dream world built by a son who had too much heart and not enough common sense. But, Sam, that, that man in the liquor store identified Ben as a holdup man. Well, when he saw the both brothers together, he realized he'd made a mistake. At night, with a hat pulled down and a collar up, anybody could have confused the Comiskey brothers. Sam, why is the world so cruel? Because people live in it. Now go on and type it up, huh? And if you don't mind my saying so, it's a lesson to everybody. If you say so, Ed. Honest, Sam, I'm just infuriated. Now, now, don't go too far. Misplaced love, devotion, it just isn't right. Now, hand me the glass. Well, this kind of thing could be going on all over the world. The glass, uh... If it weren't for people like you who step in and take things in hand. The glass! Oh! Here you are, Sam. Thank you, Miss Brain. Honestly, Sam, look, well, just honestly, that's all. Are you finished? Well, I... Well, just, uh, I have some sociological feelings, too. I'm just not an automat, a secretary who turn on and off with... Come here. Come here. With each new case, I have feelings. Effie, I just kissed you. I know what... Uh, huh? I just kissed you. Oh, Sam. Delayed reaction. Must be the heat. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Sam State Detective Agency. It's me, F. Is uh, Carlos Salceda, the Mexican consul, called? No, Sam. Well, he will. Uh, tell him it's not what we thought it was. To hold everything, I'll get to him as soon as I can. Yes, Sam, you sound so tired. Are you all right? Well, I am, and I'm not. There were too many windmills to chase, too much language I didn't understand, and much too much venganza, which is Spanish for vendetta, which is English for vengeance. In any language, it's dynamite with a short fuse. Then you knew what it was all about all along, Sam. It was revenge. It was, and it wasn't. Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand. What about the girl? Is she all right? She is, and she isn't. I am confused. Exactly par for the course. But don't worry, F. It'll straighten out like star spaghetti when I come down to say it with flowers, dictating, as I will, my report of fury and ferment on the red Amapola caper. Amapola, my pretty little poppy. Oh, Sam. This That's is all Sal- key as I'll be today. <laughs> uh, 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 Mr. Salcido called. I told him what you told me to tell him. Uh, for more, I couldn't ask, yes. He understood what you meant perfectly. I don't understand a thing. You will. You know, I may have to trade this stuff in for tequila. <sighs> no messing around there. Straight to the point. A virtue some people might do well to cultivate. Just tell me one thing, Sam. Was it a sour cake? Let's not tarry after the point, remember? Pad ready? Uh-huh. Pencil poised? Knees crossed? Yes, Sam. Uh, but... Skirt a little bit higher. Oh. But all I want to know is... All right. Uh, date, fill it in. To Detective Lieutenant Kelsey, Homicide Detail, San Francisco Police, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Red Amapola Caper. The following is, as you requested, a detailed account of the 31 hours, 16 minutes I spent on the case of Amando Rios and daughter. I trust it will answer all your questions, solve your commissioner problems, and enable you to speedily dispatch your duty as one of the city's finest. May heaven help our city. So come back with me to 3 p.m. yesterday, the approximate time I stepped into my office and saw, standing nervously by the window, a Mexican girl in her early 20s. Her clothes, though neat and clean, were rummage sale specials which had seen better days. Her bare legs were too thin, her features too drawn. 
But the midnight color of her hair and the largeness of her eyes told me she could have been beautiful if things had gone another way. I'm glad you have come. I couldn't have waited much longer. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were here. My name is Andrea Rios. I would like to hire you. Mm Mm-hmm. But I do not have much money. Much money may not be needed, Miss Rios. What is it you want? Your time, Mr. Spade. You see, if you accept this job, I must have all of your time from now until tomorrow morning. If you cannot accept, you must tell me now so I can get someone else. I see. I can only pay $30. I know it is much to ask for $30, but... You can ask for more or for less. The job may be difficult for you. You will not be able to sleep. Well, I can make that up on somebody else's time. Then you will help. Yes, I think so. I uh, would like to hear more about it. We will go to my father. You will learn more there. She led me to the nearest streetcar, headed for south of the slot, and paid the fare. Twenty minutes later, we were walking through the San Francisco that's left over, where the liquor is cheap and one cigarette is property. The sounds of a jazzed-up Spanish song caught my ear, and the beer signs turned to cerveza. The building Andrea Rios picked to go into was old enough to give the termites indigestion. A faded sign said, La Casa Azul. She knocked on the door of room 12. Yes. Andrea, Papa. The weather-beaten face that stood in the doorway figured to be 60, but the age should have come from concern. He wore a black sweatshirt, pants to match, and a dirty white sailor's cap. Inside on the table sat a bottle of high-octane joy juice, that witch hazel with a misnomer, tequila. The lemon and salt stood alongside. On the bed lay a duffel bag with the blocked letters Santa Susana. Esta es el hombre, papá. ¿Cómo se llama? Señor Spade, el detectivo. My father speaks no English. I see. ¿Tienes confianza en él? ¿Es honrado? He asks if you are an honest man. <laughs> It's a question no man can answer with complete honesty. ¿Qué le has dicho, André? ¿Qué sabe? Nada, papá. Siéntese, hombre. ¿Un traguito? My father says to you, sit down and have a drink. Uh, tell father I will, but I'd enjoy it more if I knew why I was hired. Yes, of course. To spend the night here, Mr. Spade, with my father. To keep an eye on him all the time. Protection? No. Well, there must be more to it. We want you to be able to testify to my father's whereabouts this night. If it should become necessary. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen this night? Something. You want your father in the clear? Yes. Well, that sounds fair enough. That's all there is. I'll have that drink now if there'll be enough to last. <laughs> the window pane came flying in and the ugly muzzle of a forty-five silencer attached stuck through. I yelled, so did Andrea. <laughs> but the gun yelled louder and with more effect. The bullet struck Andrea in the side. She lurched crazily, then folded in her father's arms. He began to mumble her name and cry. I jumped to the window. Pulling away was a black Buick sedan with driver unidentifiable. So were the license plates. They were covered tightly with a cloth. It was a pro job from beginning to end, and a clean getaway. Well, Andrea was still alive, but not by much. I turned up a phone in the lobby. One nickel got me to the emergency hospital. The other brought me homicide. When I got back to the room, Andrea was still lying there, but she was alone. Armando Rios, her father, had gone. And I thought I knew why. Revenge, huh? Exactly, Lieutenant. I think Rios knows who shot his daughter because I think the bullets were meant for him and she got him by mistake. Huh? I think, therefore, that Rios has got revenge on his mind. Now, uh, let you have Rios picked up before he does something he can't get out of. Uh, yeah, I'll make a note of that. Also make a note as follows. I, Lieutenant Kelsey, will check the Mexican consul for background on Rios because I, Lieutenant Kelsey, believe Rios is a Mexican national. Uh, not so fast, sir. Furthermore, I, Lieutenant Kelsey, will make a close check of all incoming police calls for the rest of the night because something is going to happen for which Rios wanted an alibi. When I find out what Sam is, I will graciously inform Sam Spade. Uh, Sam, how do you spell graciously? I went to the offices of several Mexican-language newspapers, told them the story, and asked them to give a place of prominence to the fact that Andrea was alive, asking Armando Rios to go directly to the nearest police station and wait until contacted. I then went to the Maritime Service and queried about the Santa Susana. I was told it was a sport fishing vessel owned by its captain, Jay Mortigan, with office in the Ocean Building on the Embarcadero. The nameplate on the Titian-haired secretary's desk said Janice O'Dell. Yes? Could I help you, please? I think so. 
this the office of the Santa Susanna? Oh, you're planning a fishing trip. Well, then you've come to the right place. Santa Susanna has excellent accommodations, is thoroughly outfitted for an extended cruise in the Bay of California, where, as you know, exist some of the greatest fishing waters in the world. Uh, if it's the same to you, miss, I'll do my fishing here. My name is Spade. I'm a private detective. I am trying to locate an Armando Rios. Rios? I said something? You know him? He's uh, got a berth on the Santa Susanna. Well, he has... At least he had... What's he done, Mr. Spade? Well, it's uh, what he will do that bothers me. You say he had a berth. Would you explain, please? I, I... Just a moment, Mr. Spade. Captain Morgan. There's a private detective out here asking about Amanda Rios. Rios? Well, send him in, Janice. Come on, move lively. In here, Mr. Spade. Thank you. My name's Morgan. Captain Mortigan. I skipper the Santa Susana, the finest sport fishing vessel ever to touch salt water. Everybody's got a commercial. Miss O'Dell says you're asking about Rios. I am. I'm uh, trying to locate. And so am I. I've got steam up and a dozen people waiting. Rios knows those Mexican fishing waters like no one I've met. And where is he? Jumped ship, if you ask me. Scampering around San Francisco or dead drunk in some infamous den from that cactus poison he drinks. If the storm's over, Captain, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Where does uh, Rio's room when he's in San Francisco? Uh, stays right on the ship. Did you know he had a daughter? No. And you don't have any idea, I suppose, why Rio's jumped ship? It's a woman. That's my guess. It's always a woman. But that is just a guess. All right, Captain, I'll make a small size deal with you. If I find Rio's, I'll notify you. If you find him first, notify me. I'll leave you my card. Mortigan agreed, and I left, pausing only long enough in the front office to give Janice O'Dell my phone number in case she saw Rio. She gave me her phone number, and it was a fair exchange. Twenty minutes later, Lieutenant, I was meeting with Carlos Salcedo of the Mexican consul's office. A wire he had sent to Mexico City had brought results. So, Mr. Spade, you have not yet found Amando Rios, but are still desirous of preventing him from consummating his revenge. Uh, I fear perhaps you are too late. Uh, what information have you got, Mr. Salcedo? First... Amando Rios was arrested in the Mexican state of Sinaloa for the growing of the red amapola. You are aware of what that is? Amapola means uh, poppy from the song of the same name. Exactly. The red poppy grown for the production of narcotics. The arrest occurred on August 19, 1946. Rios served three years in the penitentiary as a result, convicted mainly on the testimony of an Ernesto Sabado, who Rios claimed, as you say, framed him. <laughs> Now, look at this. An inquiry from the office of the district attorney of Marin County, California, requesting information about a Mexican national whose dead body was discovered two hours ago, washed ashore at Point Bonito. A Mexican national whose name is... Ernesto Sabato. Precisely. Yeah. And you think perhaps uh, Rios killed Sabato? A distinct possibility, Mr. Spade, since he had motive. Well, that's exactly why I don't think he did it. Rios knew Zapata was going to be killed sometime tonight. That's the reason Andrea hired me, so her father's whereabouts could be accounted for and so he could not be accused. Now, Mr. Salcedo, I don't think Rios killed Zapata. Well, I hope you are right, for his sake and for his daughter's, who we both hope will get well. The one who killed Zapata is probably the same one who drives a black Buick sedan who took those pot shots at Rios and caught Andrea instead. The same one who Rios has now got a vendetta against. Ah, uh, venganza. However you say it, it's a sucker's play, but how do you stop him if you can't find him? Thank you, Mr. Salcedo. I must admit, Mr. Spade, I do not fully understand your concern over Rios. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm not sure of it myself, but he got a rotten shuffle. I got a night's pay, so I might as well work for it. Besides, uh... well, I'll let you know what develops. The next four hours, dear lieutenant, were spent in questioning the following. A, two members of the crew of the Santa Susana. B, assorted residents of La Casa Azul. C, Inspector Gruber of the Marin County DA's office assigned to the Zabato case. Some total of information garnered concerning the whereabouts of Armando Rios and or the identity of the gunman he was after. Zero. I was tired. I was depressed. I had a headache. Five minutes to eleven, a coin of mine dropped into a payphone in a booth by a gas station closed for the night. My intention was to find out if you had turned up anything and to ask how Andrea was, but you never got to hear my honeyed voice. Hang it up, Spade. It was a voice that wasn't familiar. The forty-five with silencer affixed, however, was. It didn't take me long to start perspiring. Leave the nickel, Spade. You won't need it. 
Good evening. I've been wondering about you. I'll bet you have. You're uh, sort of a novelty, you know. The only myopic gunman I've ever met. What's that mean? You're nearsighted. You got the wrong person back at La Casa Azul. Boss will have to send you out again for Rios. I don't like you, Spade. I don't know you, but I don't like you anyway. Guess I'll kill you so I'll never have to take a chance of knowing you. Now, come on. Step out, gumshoe. He urged me out of the phone booth, up the street a few paces to the head of an alley with a blind end. There he parked himself in a fire plug. I wished him all sorts of bad luck, and he told me to start walking into the alley. Mine was small choice. But as I moved away from the gunsel toward the alley's end, my eyes searched for means of escape. All right, Spate. That's far enough. Now I'm going to pick your eyes out. Turn around. I stood frozen for a moment, then spun and looked. The gunsel had pitched onto the sidewalk, but the forty-five was still in his hand. I moved up to him slowly with a maximum of caution and took a closer look. He was as dead as he could get. A knife in his back had done the job. That's when I looked up the street and saw a figure in fast retreat. It wore a black sweatshirt, pants to match, and a dirty white sailor cap. It looked very much like the venganza of Armando Rios was accomplished. You arrived at the scene of the crime, Lieutenant, where you took over in your own masterly way. By the adroit maneuver of looking into the dead man's wallet, you uncovered the fact that he was a Los Angeles import named Max Rapper. You then examined the knife in his back and discovered, as I had previously, the initials A.R. for Armando Rios cut into the handle. That, plus the fact that I and other witness had seen Armando Rios flee the scene, made it open and shut. Rios was now wanted for murder. When we got to your office, a message had been received by Sergeant Pole House from Dr. Pennington of General Hospital. It said, one, Andrea Rios was going to live. Two, she wanted to see Sam Spade. Was it all right? You had no objection, but I had a problem. What to say to her? Could I say it was nice she was going to get well, and, oh, by the way, your father just killed Max Rapper, and the state will do likewise to him, or what? My mind still hadn't lit on anything it liked when Pennington walked me down the hospital corridor toward her room. Yeah, she's a lucky girl, Mr. Spade. Could have gone the other way. Yeah, would have been unlucky. I'll wait outside. Don't stay too long. The jet black of her hair gave contrast to the whiteness of the room. Her face had lost much of its color, but none of the anxiety had gone out of her eyes. We talked chit-chat for a while. It was easy to see she had a question she wanted to ask, but had trouble getting it out. Finally, it came. Mr. Spade, have you heard... I mean, is there any news of the death of a man called Ernesto Savaro? Yes, the police found his body washed ashore some hours ago. My father did not kill him. No, he's clear on that. I can testify. Oh, that is what I was worrying about. Now, Mr. Spade, I can tell you what you do not know about my father and Ernesto Sabaro. I already know. Carlos Salcedo, the Mexican consul, told me. The Red Amapolo? Yeah. Oh, it was an unfortunate affair for a great many people, Mr. Spade. Buyers from the United States came to Sinaloa. With money, the peasants were lured into growing the poppy. Mm -hmm. Many knew no better. Many did not know what it was for. They knew simply to grow the red flower brought more money than to grow food. When the police came, they suffered. The buyers were nowhere to be found. Anyway, it's all right now. My father did not kill Ernesto Sabato. No, Lieutenant, she did not learn about Max Rapper's killing from me, or that her father was now a fugitive wanted for murder. I also didn't ask her some questions I could have asked, like, how did she know Zabato was going to be killed? Did Rapper do it, and why? Somehow it didn't matter. It had turned sour all the way down the line. And besides, Zabato was Inspector Gruber's problem, not mine. Twenty minutes later, I walked into my apartment, uncorked the live one, and started at the top. Four fingers down, the phone began to ring, but I didn't pay any attention. The sky was just beginning to light up with morning, and I remember saying to myself I was still technically on the Rios case, but actually there was no case to be on. When I couldn't stand the phone rings any longer, I lifted the receiver off the hook. Sam? Sam? Hello? Sam, this is Janice Adele. I just saw Rios. Well, uh... He's going to kill Captain Mortigan. Mortigan? Why Mortigan? He went to the Santa Susana after him. Pier 32. Rios is wild. Stop him, Sam. Why call me? Call a cop. Hello? 
Hello. Twelve minutes later, I was moving through the early fog of the waterfront looking for the Santa Susana. Black letters on a bobbing white bow led me to it, but no signs of life came from aboard ship. A quick tour had me believing it was deserted and that either Rios had caught up with Mortigan someplace else for what reason I didn't know but could guess, or that Janice had given me wrong information. Moments later, however, in the boiler room, it was clear she hadn't. The furnace was open, coals were spread on the floor, and so was a dead Captain Mortigan. Slouched in a chair with his eyes closed in a daze was a worn-out Armando Rios. He should have been. He'd had a busy night. Rios? Se murió. Ah, wake up, Rios. Se murió. El capitán se murió, señor Spade. In any language, he's dead, if that's what you mean. You couldn't be any clearer. Es él. Es el hombre. Es su culpa que Andrea fue cerrado. Ahora está muerto. Y no he obtenido la venganza. Venganza. Too much venganza. You fixed it fine. Andrea's going to feel swell about it. Oh, what's the use? Come on, Rios. Hello. Hello. Who's down there? Kelsey? Oh. Oh, it's you, Sam. What are you doing here? Got a call from a girl named Belle something. Odell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is this Rios? Well, what have you got to say for yourself? You ready to sign a statement? He doesn't understand you, Kelsey. Oh, dummying up, huh? He doesn't speak English. Well, he won't get off that easily. We'll sweat it out of him. No lo hice. No lo maté al capitán. Yeah? That's what they all say. Well, look at this. He's carrying a gun. Gun? Why would he use a knife if he had a gun? Don't ask me. I don't speak Spanish. Now, what's all this coal doing on the floor? Eh, it's messy. Looks bad in photographs. Yeah, well... Wait a minute. Lieutenant, you've done it again. I picked up a lump of the coal. There was a small hole bored into the center. Examination of others revealed the same thing. Curious, you'd say? Not so when you start thinking about, one, the red Amapola, two, the fact that Zabato's killing still remain unexplained, and three, and bingo, narcotic smuggling. A phone book gave me an address on Jackson, and a rap on a door got me a quick reply. Oh, Sam. Mm-hmm. Good morning, Janice. I didn't wake you up, did I? Well... If so, you must sleep in your clothes, and that suitcase on the bed must make it kind of cramped. What are you doing here, Sam? Uh-huh. Heavy, all packed. Just going on a little vacation for a few days. Where to? Well, I... Without a plane ticket on the dresser? Uh... Hmm. Las Vegas. Hot there this time of the year. Of course, it's hot here, too, for some of us. What do you want? I want you to open your suitcase. I won't do it. Then I will. Sam, don't do it. Uh-huh. Well, what's this, Janice? No, I've already guessed. How much worth? Zabato was killed by Rapper on Captain Mortigan's orders because he knew this was coming in on the Santa Susana and probably wanted a cut to keep his mouth shut. Rapper and Mortigan got theirs, not by Rios, but by you. So you could fall heir to this. Poor old Rios, old and wanted. He might have muffed his revenge, so you took no chances. Did them in yourself with Rios, your nice, fat, convenient pigeon. Sam. But the police are going to find it harder and harder to get a case against Rios, and easier and easier to get one against you. These narcotics in your possession will go a long way. Sam, listen to me. Just as long as I've got a gun in my hand, I'll listen to you, baby. There's over $100,000 worth here, and I know where to unload it. Mm Mm-hmm. And what's in it for me? Half. And something else. Yeah? Me. Uh Uh-huh. That would seem to be worth considering, wouldn't it? Sam, a chance to make something out of yourself and not grub around for a few lousy bucks all your life? Gonna turn me over to the cops? Not just any old cop, Janice. I want something befitting your character. I'm going to turn you over to Lieutenant Kelsey. And that, Lieutenant, brings you up to date. Uh, period. End of report. Awful girl. We'll talk about it later, F. But... Later, later. Go type oh. it up. Well, here it is, Sam. Can we talk about it now? We can. How could that girl have thought for one single moment she could turn a man like you into her accomplice? Very poor judgment. To sell dope yet. Yet. Do I look the type? I should say not. You're upstanding and clean cut. Well, thank you. Maybe she was nearsighted, too. Anyway, I'm glad it's over and it had a happy ending. Well, I'm glad if you're glad. Now, uh, rush that over to Kelsey so he can look good in the eyes of the commissioner. Then phone Mr. Salcedo and tell him the lieutenant's got all the facts. And one thing more. Yes, Sam? Uh, have the florist send a bouquet of flowers to Andrea at the hospital. Oh, Sam, that's very nice of you. Think so? 
One thing still more. Close your eyes and have the floor send a bouquet of flowers to you, too. Damn! Easy, Ed. How do you know it's not coming out of your salary? That's true, too. Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic and the new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo present The Adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam. I'm glad you're back in town. So am I, Effie. So am I. Confidentially, I didn't think I'd make it. Uh, Confidentially, that is. Was it dangerous, Sam? I should say it was. Why, for the past 24 hours, I've been at it hammer and tongs over hill and dale, through shot and shell. It was enough to turn any ordinary man's blood to ice and his hair pure white. Oh, that sounds terrifying, Sam. I wish it had been only terrifying, Effie. It was blood-curdling, spine-chilling, hair-raising. I was bored. It was also rural and countryfied. Well, what happened, Sam? Tell me. You've heard of the Martins and the Coys? No. And the Boston Massacre? No. Custer's Last Stand? No. Well, put them all together and they spell uh, what I'll shortly be in to dictate, a report which I call in a burst of clever literary plagiarism, the Farmer's Daughter Caper. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, starring Howard Duff. Produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. To look your holiday best, friends, be sure to use Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite hair tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. What's more, it's non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Get Wild Root Cream Oil in the big family size bottle or handy tube. Ask for it at your drug or toilet goods counter very first chance you get. For the holiday and all year round, use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I'm right here, Sam. Pull up all the shades. All right, Sam. Now, turn on every light in the place. But it's there. Do what I say. All right, Sam. Now, uh, check the closets. But what for? For snipers. What do you think? All right, Sam. Nobody here. Okay. I guess it's safe to come all the way in. What's this all about, Sam? I don't understand. Effie, it's just that I don't ever want to be caught in the dark again, especially when people are shooting at me. I want to see every nook and cranny of every square foot of land that surrounds me. Sam, who was shooting at you? Where? (sighs) They were shooting from the left, from the right, from up above, down below, everywhere. (gasps) Death was winging in on every breeze that blew, and they all blew my way. Oh, Sam, now stop this. I'm just dying of curiosity. (sighs) When my time comes, I hope that's all I ever die of. Ready? Uh, date this week to Mr. Elliot Parson, Parson Drive Yourself Garage, 1618 St. Charles Street, San Francisco, 13, California. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the farmer's daughter caper. Dear Mr. Parson, I fear you have an explanation coming, one that you can pass along to your insurance company as to why the car I rented from you last week appeared as late as it did and in the condition it did. As you know, I rented said vehicle to drive to Middletown to bail a client out of the drunk tank. On the way back, a native showed me a shortcut, and I'll get him if it's the last thing I do. Dusk was falling, and so were my eyelids, when I saw a sign that said, Tourists Invited. Behind it stood a ramshackle farmhouse in a surly woodland setting. I should never have knocked on that farmhouse door, but then I wouldn't have had any story to tell, would I? Good evening, young man. Uh, Good evening, madam. I'm afraid I need a room for the night. Well, of course you do. Land sakes, you're tired, I can tell by your eyes. Been on the road long? Too long. Land sakes, of course you have. Come in, please. Thank you, ma'am. 
You'll find this is the homiest tourist home in California. Really like mothers, eh? Like your grandmothers. Huh. No electricity, no phones, just quiet. I see. Now, I have two rooms, a $3 one and a $5 one. Which one do you think you'd like? Uh, what's the difference? One less blanket, one squeaky spring, and with the $3 one, you might have to take a walk. I'll take the $5 one, thank you. I'm Mrs. Elkins. Mrs. Burt Elkins. Who might you be? Uh, Sam Spade. Spade? Land sakes, that's a very unusual name. <laughs> and who are you traveling with, Mr. Spade? Uh, I'm alone. Oh, I mean what company? We only accept traveling salesmen. You realize that? Oh, uh, yes. Well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, traveling for the makers of Mouton Mustache Wax. Oh, oh, use it all the time. You are well-groomed, madam. But <laughs> you will go far, young man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but before that, I'd like to go to bed. Well, come on. This way. She led me upstairs to my $5 room and left me. As lumpy as it was, the bed invited me, but I decided to shave first and thus facilitate an early start in the morning. I poured myself a drink out of my traveling bar kit and then stepped in to shave. It wasn't easy because all I had for light in there was an oil lamp. When I came back to the bedroom with a lamp in one hand, I stopped short in utter surprise. I'd heard about these things in traveling salesman stories, but I never expected to see it. She was sitting in an armchair, smoking a cigarette. High heels, silk stockings, light rayon dress, and a face right off the cover of Cosmopolitan. Hello, Sam. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, uh... Mary Smith. Huh? Hope you don't mind me just barging in. Well, no, no. Well, no, that is... Uh... Afraid I'll bite you? <clears throat> it never entered my mind. Well, I might. I'm so tired of talking to myself, I need someone like you. You know... You're not bad to look at. Who, me? Where do you live? What do you do for a living? Well, I guess you'd call me independently wealthy. I wish someone would. How nice. San Francisco? There must be some fog on my lapel. Look, Sam, I'll give it to you straight. I want to get out of here, go to San Francisco. Could you take a passenger tomorrow? Well, uh, what would your mother say? She's my aunt. What do I care what she says? I, I don't belong on a farm... Out in the west, wet pasture ruins my nylons. I'm a city girl, Philadelphia. Why did you leave? My parents died. Look, Sam, I won't be a burden to you. I just want to get to San Francisco. After that, I'm on my own. Sam, take me with you. Please take me with you. You won't regret it. <clears throat> uh, what am I going to do with this lamp? Who cares? Oh, Sam. <gasps> <clears throat> what? Oh. I thought I'd find something like this going on in here. And what I, I... Get out of here. Go back to your room, young lady. Go on. Now, Mr. Spade. <laughs> it does look bad, doesn't it? Oh, I'm not blaming you, Mr. Spade. Nan, sakes, it's her. She ain't responsible for what she does. She's like this all the time. Oh, I see. Now, when I go out, you just lock your door. Just keep it locked. But, ma'am, this is a $5 room. A sleepless hour later, I heard something slide under my door. I looked and found it was a note that read, Mr. Spade, Sam, please unlock your door, and when the house is quiet, I'll come and see you. I'm desperate, terribly, terribly desperate. Don't leave me. Give me a chance to tell you what it's all about, please. Stupid me, I unlocked my door, dressed again, and waited. An hour and a half later, I heard my doorknob turning in the dark. The door opened quietly and quickly. Sam... The things that go on in this house, they're insane. Oh. I've been here three months. When my father died, I had no money, and because Aunt Maud was my only relative, I came here. And ever since I came, they never let me out of the house for more than an hour. They never let me see anyone or do anything. Why? I wish I knew. Five days ago, Uncle Bert left early one morning. He hasn't come back since. Aunt Maud says he's away on business. He doesn't have any business. Well, even so, that doesn't seem strange to me. Oh, then there's my dog. And what about it? It... It disappeared the same night Bert did. He told me it ran away. I know it didn't. I've had it for three years. It never ran away. Well, what do you think? Well, I, I was sure I could hear it howling somewhere for two or three nights. Then the howling stopped. I think I know where it is, but I don't know why. It scares me. Well, where do you think it is? Sam, you're going to think I'm crazy right out of my mind, but... Well, about 150 yards behind the house, there's a hillside with an old cave in it. Oh, an old cave. I don't know what it's used for, but yesterday I saw the whole front end of it closed. Closed with dirt. Sam... 
They buried that dog alive in that cave. I know it. Oh, wait a minute now. Uh, did you ask Mrs. Elkins? Yes. And all she said was the dog ran away and mind your own business. She told me to leave the cave alone. Sam, let's go out there and look. Please. Well, uh... So big, brave, stupid Sam, idiot boy, allowed her to show me the back way out of the house and we sneaked to the barn together. She found a shovel and we walked to the cave. When my eyes got accustomed to the dark, I saw the entrance had been covered with dirt and recently. I took the shovel while she stood watching. I cleared half of the dirt away and worked as quietly as I could, but apparently not quietly enough. A flashlight suddenly hit both of us in the face and a shotgun barrel flashed in the beam. Get away from there before I shoot your head off. Uh, Point that thing someplace else, please, ma'am. Just what do you think you're doing, mister? Uh, Digging. Mary, you get back to the house. No. And Maud, I won't. Get back to the house before I count three or I'll put a load of buckshot right through you now. One. And Maud, my dog is in there. Two. All right. All right, I'll... Now, Mrs. Elkins, suppose you put that gun down and tell me what this is all about. I got one thing to say to you, mister. Get in your car and get out of here and don't waste any time doing it. But, madam, Your suitcase is in the car and your five dollars is with it. Yeah, but... Now get, before I shoot you as a trespasser. And I could do it, mister. Land sakes, I could do it. Now get. So I got under guard to my car. I got in and drove off. And this is the driveway with a shotgun still pointed at me until I was out of sight. I turned left at the first crossroad, parked the car, and cut through the woods back to the farm. I could see a light in the living room. Nobody was in or near the barn. And when I got to the cave, there wasn't a sound anywhere. I picked up the shovel I dropped and started digging again. Thirty minutes later, the shovel broke a small hole through into that cave, and a stifling blast of fetid air rushed out, and something leaped out at me in the dark. And it wasn't the dog. It was a human hand on a human arm. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of America's favorite private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen... Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who actually purchased Wild Root Cream Oil were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Farmer's Daughter Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. In a night already full of surprises, I should have been ready for the next one, but I wasn't. The loose earth, which had blocked the entrance to the cave, suddenly fell away, and I fell with it. Then I heard something like nothing on earth. Nails dragged across my face, taking skin and flesh with them. I twisted and went down, and something went down with me. The snarl became a voice. Oh, bury me alive! Bury me alive! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! And he did his best, which was pretty good. Finally, I got a good hold on him and sat on his chest. After that, I lit a match and looked at a tall, thin man in his middle 40s. He was caked with mud from head to foot. His hands were impossibly torn and bleeding. I could guess why. Judging from the stubble on his face, he'd been bottled up in that cave at least five days. How he was still alive, I didn't know. He acted like a madman, and he had every right to. But surprise, when his eyelids fluttered open again, he read a very sane line. I'm all done in. You got a drink, friend? Not on me. They hit me on the head and left me there. They thought I'd stay in there forever. 
forever. Who put you there? Who did it? <laughs> but they couldn't keep me there. I dug my way out tonight. Tonight. I dug my way out. Tonight. <laughs> The force of the bullets knocked them halfway back down the incline to the cave. All I could do was hit the dirt. Finally, when it seemed safe, I broke cover and ran smack into somebody carrying two bags. Oh, no. No, please. Please. Let's have a look at you. Sam. Sam, it's me. Sam, I knew you wouldn't go away without me. I knew it. I couldn't stay in that awful house any longer. Look at that now. Who was that shooting at? I don't know. Where's your aunt? House, I suppose. I slipped out the back way. Any visitors tonight? No. What is it? What is it? I think I found your Uncle Bert. Come on. I led her back to the cave entrance and showed her the body of the man I dragged out. I watched her face a long time as she looked at him very carefully. It's not Uncle Bert, Sam. Really? No. It's Mr. Linden, a jewelry salesman who came to the place a few nights ago. Five nights ago? Yes. Yes, come to think of it. The same night your uncle disappeared. Tell me, did you ask Mr. Lennon to take you back to San Francisco the same way you asked me? I, I... Did you? Yes. He said he would. He got up early and left without me. He didn't get far. What kind of car was he driving? I don't know. I don't remember. Do you drive a car? Yes, but Here. I'm... Mine's down the road about 500 yards. Go to the nearest phone and call the highway patrol, a sheriff, anybody who represents law. Got that? Yes, yes. I know exactly what to do. <laughs> To make sure we were both thinking of the same thing to do, I followed her in the dark, watched her get into the car I rented from you, and drive off. Then I turned around, put a new clip in my gun, and walked back to the old homestead. It was still very homey. By the light of an oil lamp, Mrs. Elkins was peacefully knitting what looked like a shroud. Why, Mr. Spade? Why, Mrs. Elkins? Land sakes. Land sakes. Now that we got that out of the way, let's get down to business. If you're here to make trouble, young man, believe me, I can handle trouble. My kind of stock know about trouble. Well, uh, suppose you tell me about the trouble I just had, or haven't you heard all the shots that were fired around here tonight? Shots? My, my. My, my. Seems I would have heard gunshots. Seems you would. Look, uh... I've got a sheriff on the way. Have you, Mr. Spade? Why? I suppose you didn't hear the shooting. Oh, yes, yes, I'd forgotten. Was anyone hurt? A man named Linden. He's dead. Linden. Linden. Now, that sounds familiar. It should. He stayed here five nights ago. He was a jewelry salesman. Yes, yes, now I remember. You say he's dead? Somebody tried to bury him alive in your little cave. How awful. I do declare. I thought you would. Well... You must be joshing, Mr. Spade. I'm not joshing at all, Mrs. Elkins. Well, well. Buried alive, you say. Look, uh, let's talk just like plain folks. Where's your husband? Where's the jewelry samples you probably stole from Linden? Is there anything else you want to say? Gunshots, eh? Well, well. <laughs> I left the sweet old thing knitting and rocking and made my way through the house looking for guns, jewelry, and killers. I got downstairs in time to see Mrs. Elkins disappear out the front door. When I tried to follow, I stumbled over the rocking chair, which was indeed a lucky thing for me. After a few minutes of silence, bravely crawling on my stomach, I followed the shadows of the house until they blended into the shadows of a large, hulking building, which happened to be the barn. Inside, I bumped my head on the radiator of a car. Naturally, I didn't find any keys in it, but I did find a familiar jewelry salesman-type mud-soaked corpse. When I was trying to remember how to cross ignition wires, I heard the hum of a motor and saw two headlight beams swinging up the driveway. They lasted as long as any other lights. The car came to a lurching stop, and a thick-set figure in a Stetson hat stumbled towards me, tugging at a gun. That burned gold flame cuff thing, I... Undo the flap. Oh, thanks. Huh? Put your hands up, whoever you, you are. You be the sheriff? You're dead blame right on the sheriff. You're dead blame right on the sheriff. Who are you? What's the idea of shooting the lights out in my car? My car. Oh, you Slade? Spade. Well, I'm Homer Pickett, sheriff of this county. Homer. The girl come, woke me up, said all sorts of funny things going on around here. Said there'd been a murder. Now, who's killed? What's going on, Stan? Sam. Well, uh, for one thing, somebody's been trying all sorts of ammunition on me for size. You don't say. I do say, Mr. Sheriff. <sighs> Why? Because I found a man in a cave who'd been left there to die. Want to look at the corpse? You can look at him right here. He's sitting in this car. Oh, good. So, yeah. How'd he get here? 
Uh, somebody moved him here. Shouldn't have moved a corpse till the police examine it. I didn't move it. Huh? Now, listen closely. Listening? Huh? I found the man. He was still alive. Then somebody shot him. Shouldn't have moved him. Then they tried to kill me because I found him. When they didn't kill me, they decided to hide his body. Illegal. They probably intended to drive away and dispose of it so there'd be no evidence when an efficient, smart, alert, courageous police officer like yourself came around to ask questions. Hey, hey. Well, that sounds reasonable. Who's behind all this? Well, uh, Mrs. Elkins threatened me once and tried to kill me once. Mom! Well, land sake. Well, that's her, yes. I want to talk to her. Where's she? Roaming the countryside with a gun, no doubt. Well, we'll have to clear all this up. See what it's all about. Now, who's this fellow in the car? His name's James Linden. Got a pencil? Better write that down. Tilden, huh? Linden. Well. Uh, by any strange coincidence, Sheriff, you happen to know a man named Dundee, San Francisco homicide? Lieutenant Dundee, old Tom. Old Tom, yes. Shucks, I learned everything I know about police work from him. Yeah, well, that's fair. And law's law. Dundee always said... Yeah, I've heard him turn... say it, Sheriff, but... And I am to enforce it around here. One side, Mr. Slade. Spade. Uh, hey, uh, 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 you'll be sorry. Well. Uh, now, look here, all you Elkins. This is Homer Pickett talking... And I ain't no small-town constable. I'm the sheriff of this county. You'll get a square deal from me, but first I order you in the name of the law to throw down your guns. Well? Oh, oh, oh my, my. Oh. You all right? Nothing but my feelings hurt. Oh, I warned you. I, I, I thought that'd do some good. Well, now you know. Hey, look, maybe it did do some good. I- came across the farmyard as the first light was showing in the eastern sky. Her hands were above her head. One held a shotgun. Mark, get back where you belong, Mark. We could hear, but we couldn't see him. Maud stopped, hesitated for a moment, and then began running towards us. She almost made it. No! I ran out to drag her back, expecting any second to be the target for the night. There was a sudden and curious silence as I pulled her into the barn. She was still alive. Thanks, that man's been missing everybody all night. Never thought he'd be able to hit me. Easy. I come from good stock. I'm no criminal, Mr. Spade. Sheriff, you know that. Yeah, I know, Maud. I know. Let me take a look at you. You'll be okay. No blame Bert too much. He wanted to have money once in his life. So when this man came along with all the jewelry, Bert went out of his mind, I guess. He put the man in the cave. And the dog, too. So the dog wouldn't call attention to him. And then he took the man's car, went into San Francisco to try to sell the jewels and the underwear. No luck, huh? Bert says they laughed at him. The jewels were just paste. Stampos. And he came back and found me at the cave, and he figured he had to knock us both off. I just stuck by him all the way. Now he's like a tiger that smelled blood. No telling what he'll do. You will have to get help, Spade. Roadblocks, bloodhound. No. No, this is his land. He won't run. He'll hide here. Where? Why, in the cave. Well, I uh, reasoned one that no matter how much a man loved his land, he was not going to let himself be trapped in a cave with only one exit. And two, it followed, therefore, that if he did hide in the cave, there was more than one way out, which the late Linden hadn't found. Sheriff Pickett volunteered to watch the front of the cave while I looked around for a rear exit. After a 20-minute search, which netted me nothing, I remembered the car parked inside the barn and how quickly Elkins had carried Linden's body to it. I went back there and took a look around. In a corner of the barn, I found a trail of dirt leading to a bale of hay. When I moved the, hay, the bale, I found, you guessed it, a trap door. I pulled it open, caught a familiar whiff of used up air, and lowered myself into a black hole that turned out to be a passageway. I cautiously made my way forward in the darkness for a few yards. Who is it? Who is it? I pressed back against the dirt wall, listening to him approach. When I figured he was close enough, I threw a cloud of dirt toward him across the passageway. His gun flashed and lit up the whole place for a second, and I fired three times at the silhouette. I waited, then I went towards him. He was lying on his back. 
I kicked his gun away, and when I bent over him to feel his pulse, he suddenly came to life. <laughs> Something crashed against the side of my head, and everything became darker than the inside of a cave. The next thing I knew, I was looking at a pair of red-rimmed eyes. Several minutes had gone by. Oh, you was a goner for sure. <clears throat> you ain't used to this country fighting, are you? Yeah, is this country like a sheriff? Uh, yeah. Give me. Here. <coughs> yeah, country liquor. Tell me, Sheriff, did you by any chance... Well, sure, of course I did. I got him, Slade. Perry and Andrew report. Sam, hmm? do you mean to tell me you let a little country sheriff outdo you? Well, Effie, Homer Pickett's coming up for re-election next fall, and besides, you might think I was egotistical if I told you how it really ended. But your reputation! You're the greatest private detective of them all! And so I can afford to be generous. Now, not another word. Scoop, type that up. If your supply of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic is getting low, better make a note to get some more tonight or first thing tomorrow. Remember, Wild Root Cream Oil is the famous hair tonic that grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Always keep a big bottle or tube on hand. And ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Let me see. Let me see here. F, you rewrote the ending. I had to, Sam. You're much too modest. And Sam Spade, with a knot of cold fury in the pit of his stomach, a vindictive fire in his eyes, stepped wearily over the loose rocks in the cave floor to do battle with the thing that loomed up in the darkness ahead. Mm -hmm. The thing's roar filled the night with terror. But Sam Spade, dauntless and knowing not fear... Stepped up to the monster, laughed in its hairy face, and with one quick convulsion of his powerful shoulder muscles, dropped the thing in its tracks. I see. Well, is that the way you think it ended, Effie? Oh, Sam, I guess I was being a little foolish. I'll change it. No. No, as long as you've done it this way, we'll leave it this way. Can't waste paper. No, no, I'll change it, Sam. Leave it! Oh! Sam. Yeah? I copied that ending out of an old black mask magazine. I copied that of an old whiz-bang. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Good night. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> the Adventures of Sam Spade are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade was written for radio by John Michael Hayes and E. Jack Newman. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Pierre and Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when producer William Spear presents another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy speaking. Here's an exciting new shampoo that's grand for all the family. And here's our own squeaky to tell you about it. Look at your hair. Is it stringy and dull? Does it only cover your skull? The Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo is just the thing for girls like you. Gleams your hair. Know what I mean. And leaves your hair squeaky clean. Squeaky clean? Squeaky clean. Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo. Stay tuned for The Summer Symphony with Katherine Grayson on NBC.
response to requests representing millions of listening friends, the National Broadcasting Company is pleased indeed to bring you again The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Hello? Me, sweet... What number have I got? The Sam Spade Detective Agency, but... Oh, oh, well, me, sweetheart. Something's happened. Call me later, Dwight. Dwight, yet. Look. I didn't know you. You were in town. You didn't write to me or... Effie, Eff. Eff? This is me in the flesh, Sammy the Spade. Oh, oh now what? Goodbye. Effie, I'm in a payphone. My nickel is running out. Oh, Dwight, how can you be so cruel and play jokes at a time like this? Wait, wait, listen. Ella, you listening? Yes. I am not dead. Don't believe everything you read in the papers. Huh? Or here on the radio. Yes, yes. You were at my funeral. Is that what you were about to say? Yes. And it was lovely. Don't believe that either. Stay right where you are, sweetheart, because I'll be there, alive and handsomer than ever, with an account of a caper which proves you can kill some of the people part of the time. My exaggerated report on the death of Sam Spade. <laughs> NBC welcomes back to the air a character who has captured the public imagination more completely than any other since the birth of Sherlock Holmes. William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Ain't it grand to be blooming well dead? Candles at my feet, candles I'm at sorry, my head. We're not open for business today. I mean, Mr. Spade's office is closed right now because. because. I'll wait. I'll wait. Oh, you look just like Mr. Spade. What's your name? Spade. S P A D E. Spade. Sam never told me he had a twin brother. He doesn't. But then you. I'm me, Sam. Oh, no, you. Oh, wait. Come here. Now, do you believe me? Well, I, I you know what? Oh, what's the use? Oh, oh, you're so much like him. Oh, never mind, never mind. Now, get your pencil and paper and take it. Date, November 17th, 1950. To Miss Effie Perry. That, that's me. From Samuel Spade. That's me. License number 137596. You must have been the last one to see him alive. Did he tell you to give me a message? Shut up. Subject, my death. Dear Effie. Since the sight of me in the flesh, breathing, hungering, and living doesn't convince you, maybe this report will. Think, if you can, back to last Monday. Now, if you recall, it was about 11 o'clock when on the flimsy pretense that we needed stamps for the office, you drew $2 from petty cash and stepped out to buy a pair of step-ins. And that's when my client materialized. He was small and thin and carried with him the unmistakable odor of stale flowers. His black alpaca suit, string bow tie, elevator shoes, and white gloves had no bearing on his conversation. Oh, dear. My name is Chester Swan. Are you sure? Y- yes. Uh, my name is Spade. What can I do for How you? How tall are you, Mr. Spade? Six feet in my feet. Wait. 178. I but... always notice a man's bone structure, don't you? Oh, always. Open. But... Huh? Open. Let me see inside. Oh, oh. Uh, I guess? Mm-hmm. Uh, all right? Fine. Oh, well, now that you know me this well, Mr. Swan, what can I do for you? Oh, dear. Perhaps I... Perhaps I shouldn't have come here at all. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Well, really? Oh, dear. Oh, hello again, Mr. Swan. You wanted to talk to me? Yes, but I... I, I, I can't talk now. Uh, Mr. Spade. Still here. There. I, I live at 8516 Claremont in Berkeley. I'll be there tonight. Oh, dear. This time, as he made his exit, he left $50 on the edge of my desk. And so, stupid me, I was at 8516 Claremont at the close of the day. It was a small white cottage with green shutters and a white picket fence. There was a hill in back and a brook in front. The sun was beginning to set on it, and it was all very picturesque. In fact, so much so that a girl with red hair, blue jeans, purple smock, oils, and canvas was making it immortal. She liked me immediately. Here, hold this. Certainly. Like it? Oh, yeah. This is my first landscape. I'm a sprouting artist. Obvious. Makes your own? Not when I can get somebody to do it for me. Who are you? Oh, I might be a fellow artist. Don't do that. You're a liar. You're Sam Spade. I saw your picture in a newspaper clipping when I was helping Chester clean out his desk before he moved it. Mm, but I... You don't know an easel from a palette. Oh, but I could learn. I take it seriously. Well, then so do I. I doubt it. 
You've never tried to get away, to stand off, to throw off the shackles, have you? No, no, I'll have to admit that the urgency of living, the pressure of merely existing, has had a... Catfish, Sam. By the way, I'm Amy Goodrich. Catfish? The world is full of unhappy people who never try to get away from it all. Well, honestly... Stop it. But I wanted to, really. Honestly, Sam, get away from everything, leave, dissolve. I've dreamed of it. Never return. Cross my heart. Mm -hmm. What are you doing here? To see Mr. Swan. He isn't home yet. His house is a wonderful subject. Look, Sam, colorful, moderate, pleasant. Mm -hmm. That is, until the sun stops shining. But picture it at night in the fog. Mm -hmm. Crushed with barrenness, full of death, brooding, ominous. I'm trying to capture that, too. It's what we've got to get away from, isn't it? Absolutely. You and I... Sam, as you start up the hill on Claremont, there's a green apartment house on the right. I'm in 420. Well, maybe we'll find a way out together. Maybe. I waved her a fond farewell and sat on the steps of my client's house until he showed up at 6.15. He took me inside where the only furniture was an army cot and a portable barbecue. I'm so glad you kept our appointment, Mrs. Spade. I'm so frightened. I've been upset all week long. I didn't know what to do. I just didn't. And what have you been so upset about, Mr. Swan? Well, lately, Mr. Spade, infrequently, for the last week, I've noticed a man. I think he's following me. Mm. Hmm? At first, I'd see him in a car following my bus when I went downtown. Mm. Then he'd be waiting around at the bus stop in the evening when I came back. Oh. I've sold my house, and I'm ready to move. It's unnerved me so much, but... Did he follow you home tonight? No, no, but well, I... Well, would I... anyone be following you, Mr. Swan? Well, I, I, I don't know, Mr. Spade. I don't know. I really don't. All right, I'll try another tack. What does this man look like? He always wears dark clothes and a hat. I'd say he was about your height. Six feet. I remember. Maybe heavier. Same bone structure, though. Yeah. You haven't been to the police. Oh, dear, no. A man in my business can't afford off-color publicity. No? What kind of business is that? The Bonton Mortuary. Oh. Twenty-five years. Ooh. Same location. <laughs> oh, and I've worked hard. So very hard. <laughs> and if there's something behind all this, something that has stopped me from being made the executive secretary of the Undertaker's Breakfast Club when they hold their annual election next month, I don't know what I'll do, Mr. Spade. <laughs> I just don't really know what I'll do. I just don't. I... Oh, go ahead, Mr. Swan. You'll feel better. Just let it all out. Just really do. <laughs> and he did. When he stopped crying, I instructed him to go about his daily habits as always and left, assuring him I'd get to the bottom of it all. I walked down to the corner ostentatiously, which is a neat trick well calculated to throw nefarious observers off the track and lull them into false security. And when the bus showed up ten minutes later, I got on it, rode three blocks, walked back, and took a plant across the street. A clever ruse, as you see, to invite a showdown. Two hours later, a man about my size and dark clothes appeared over the hill and crept stealthily to the front of my client's cottage. He had his eyes glued to the window when I walked up behind him. Hey, let go, let go of me. Come on, you're going inside. Listen, I'm no peeping Tom. No, no, you're the bloodhound type. I'm inviting you in for a real sniff at Oh, your no, party. you don't. I... Well, all right, then. I'll go quietly. No, okay, that's better. Now we'll just walk on. The kick he landed on me wasn't according to Queensberry. I couldn't move for three or four minutes, and by that time he disappeared. When I recovered my faculties, I reported the incident to my client, who cried himself to sleep. After I bolted him in for the night, I stopped on my way down the hill at apartment 420 in the little green apartment house. She was still wearing the blue jeans and the purple smock, and she still had the same ideas. Come in, Sam. You said you were serious about getting away from it all, and a whole day has passed. It was that pressure of living... I'm, I'm here to apologize. Mm, you are not, but go ahead. I'm sorry, Angel. I love to be fooled, Sam. You're forgiven. Uh, how's the painting coming? The, the one of Swan's cottage. Slow. Fog is always tough. Looks nice, though. How long you been on it? Three weeks, all told. Well, then you've had a pretty good plant on the house, haven't you? Ever notice a tall, broad-shouldered guy in a dark suit casing the place? Tall, broad-shouldered? Pretty much like me. Could anybody be pretty much like you, Sam? No, you're right. Sam, is there something wrong? No, no. Well, then don't stand there doing nothing. Do something. Who, me? Amy fixed me a small dinner which had a strong turpentine taste to it. And then we mixed oils and painted and made fudge. 
Next afternoon at the Hall of Records, I did a little spade work on Chester Swan. His application and permit to practice undertaking in the city of San Francisco were dated 1938. Details, unmarried, 52 years of age. Graduated from mortician school in Ohio. Listed one living relative, nephew, Theodore J. Swan, Toledo, Ohio. I was gathering the above information when I smelled whiskey over my shoulder, which is always good luck. It was Al Torrington, who was also in the private investigation racket in this city, and he was leaning, peering from my face to the card that I held in my hand. Uh, did he yeah. get over to you too, Sam? Who got over to me, Al? Him, that thinny with the tears. What's his name? Um, uh, you know, my eyes ain't so good. Swan, Al. Chester Swan. Mortician. Yeah, yeah, that's him, Sam. The same one exactly. Came to my office two weeks complaining about somebody following him. And he did... Nothing about it. Said I was too fat. Oh, well, you are, Al. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. And some other, the boy said he was around there, too. Wanted a private eye, but he wanted a man who looked just right. How right? <laughs> Obviously as right as you are, Sam, because it looks like he picked you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, F, it did look like he picked me. And I thought that over, and I didn't like it. And I called my client at home to tell him he was fired, but he didn't give me a chance. Oh, dear, I'm so glad you called, Mr. Spade. I really am. I call for a reason, Mr. Swan. I'm resigning this case. Oh, dear, Mr. Spade, you can't do that. You really can't. I don't think you've been quite honest with me, Mr. Swan. Oh, dear. Tears I... will get you nowhere. I made a routine check on your reasons for hiring me, and they don't quite fit with the reasons you gave. They really just don't quite, Mr. Swan. It's no game, Mr. Spade. Believe me, he... He's back tonight. Right now, he's standing beneath the lamppost outside my window, and I'm frightened to death. Mm. Uh, please hurry over, Mr. Spade, and let's get this business straightened out. Please, please. And stupid, stupid me, I went over. And I found that little white cottage on the hill looking grim and gaunt in the heavy fog. Amy's words about it being crushed with barrenness, full of brooding and death, came back to me. And Mr. Swan's frightened words about a mysterious man in dark clothes waiting beneath the streetlight also came back to me. Particularly when I noted there was no streetlight near the house. However, there was a light somewhere in the rear of the house, and the front door was ajar. Oh, Mr. Swan! Mr. Swan, are you here? Oh, Mr. Swan, it's me, Sam Spade. Are you here? Mr. Spade? Is that you? Are you out there? Where are you? Ah! Ah! Things happened fast. I turned around to find the front door filled with a man in a dark suit. He had something in his hand. It looked like a roll of cotton candy, but it felt different. <laughs> it only staggered me against the wall, but it made me forget where my arms were. Easy, Spade. Easy does it, boy. Easy. He let me down to the floor gently. I could still see the lights somewhere in the back of the house, and I could hear him talking way off. Take off his coat. Quick, quick. Give me the needle. I, no, hurry. I, hurry. I can't watch. I... I'm going upstairs. The needle went somewhere in my left arm, but not before somebody pull my coat off, and for no reason I could think of at the moment, also tried to pull my finger off. Well, I couldn't dwell on it. By that time, the stuff in my arm was going other places, and I was going with it, even though there was action all around me. This ought to do it. No, no, stay away from me. Get out of here. Vaguely, somewhere, somebody was shooting Roman candles or having blowouts or playing bebop. I just didn't care at all. I just didn't. The first thing I saw was sunlight. It was the kind you see in a picture. It was a picture of a little white cottage with green shutters. You guessed it. I was in Amy's apartment where we made fudge together. I got to my feet somehow. I knew the best thing to do with me. There was a fire escape and a window. I got out there and I weaved against the wall. He's gone! He's gone! Oh, what do you mean he's gone? He couldn't have gotten away with that load he was carrying. I don't know, I don't know. He was unconscious when I left Well, don't just stand there. We've got to do something. There might be trouble. Now, let's get going. I didn't wait to find out what they were going to do. I made my way down the fire escape and started walking for the street. And, and that's when I noticed my shoes didn't fit me anymore. They weren't mine. And neither was the gray flannel suit with the label marked Tidkeys. And neither was the blue shirt. And while I was at it, the ring on my finger engraved Emerson High, 1936, wasn't mine either. 
My new belt buckle had a big letter T on it, which is not my initial. It really isn't. And I didn't have any use for the eyeglasses in my coat pocket either. You were out when I walked in the office, F, but you'd been there. There was a black crepe done up in a white satin ribbon hanging on the door. The desk blotter was drenched with salt tears. And a newspaper folded back to page 13, and I'll sue the chronicle on this if it's the last thing I do, gave me a two-inch spread. Item, November 15th, 1950. Fifteenth? What happened to the 13th and the 14th? Detective perishes in Berkeley fire. I read it through once. Then twice... It was my obituary. You are listening to the first in a new series of adventures involving radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Later tonight on most NBC stations, Duffy's Tavern comes your way with another merry half-hour session starring Ed Gardner as Archie the manager. There's a full serving of laughs garnished with chuckles and whipped up by Archie and his unpredictable friends, Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the waiter. It's just one of the many great Friday evening entertainment features on NBC. It's Duffy's Tavern, your cue for better listening where the three chimes always mean good times. Make it a Friday evening habit to tune early and stay late at your favorite NBC station. And now back to Caper Over My Dead Body, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I left the crepe on the door and went out to buy a new desk blotter and some more newspapers. The Hobo News had the best story, which wasn't much. Samuel Spade, licensed private investigator, perished Wednesday night in a fire in a vacant house in Berkeley. His warm friends will feel regret at the passing of a man who was always kind to the poor. None of us ever asked Sam Spade for a handout without receiving a kind word and bon mot as he turned us down. This was nice, but I wanted more figured I was fairly safe to wander about unrecognized. My ill-fitting attire acquired from my unknown benefactor would be disguise enough when combined with my two-day beard. Engine Company 16, Berkeley Division, had handled the fire, and half a block away was a grog shop called the Shamrock. I waited for a fireman to come in. Bartender. Bartender! What kind of a place are you running now? I've been here five minutes already. All right, shut up, Patty. You just arrived. Well, it seemed like five minutes. A, a, a wee bit more there, if you uh, don't mind. That's enough for you, Patty. You're still on duty. I am not. I'm off now. The chief said I could be off. He says every day I receive such a shock to me system. You received your shock three days ago. And I'm still shaking, man. <coughs> oh, the sight of him was terrible, terrible. Burnt as black as the good saint's beard. All twisted and horrible in death. He was probably dead drunk and didn't know what happened to him. And were you there fighting the flames and finding them like me? Hmm? Oh, it was terrible, terrible, terrible. <sighs> terrible. It wasn't that bad and you've had your limit. And who says so? I say so. Oh, you do, do you? And who are you? Your brother-in-law. Well, now. Well, maybe I can spot you one, Pat. I never drink with strangers. What's your name? Uh, old Doolin. Well, you heard the man. Go ahead, pour. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. <coughs> hey, fireman, you had a terrible experience three days oh, ago. Oh, that I did, Mr. O'Doolan. That I did indeed. That I I've did. I've heard it a dozen times. I'll be at the other it end. It was three of the nights bar. ago, Mr. O'Doolan, and we get a call to the house on Claremont it is a fire. Well, sir, when we get there, it's about all gone. Can't understand why it went up flames so fast. Would. It was the funeral pyre of a man who lived in sin. Huh? A detective fellow. Sam Spade, he was identified as. Ooh. Oh, one moment, fireman. I've heard fine things about him. Ah, some of those uppity police fellows from the Division of Homicide said he was a nice fellow. But some of the boys at the fire station and myself, well, we got our own ideas about that. Oh, what kind of ideas, Patty, me boy? What kind of good can any man be accomplishing in an empty house late at night, I ask you, Mr. O'Doolan? Oh, 
Oh, he was done to a turn he was when I burst in the door with me axe. Save Sid in the trouble. Charred. Empty whiskey bottles scattered all about. Sin, no Dolan, sin. He'd gone to sleep with a smoke and cigarette that set the whole place off. Vice rampant. <laughs> From there, I went downtown to a telegraph office where I sent a wire to Toledo on a long chance. And while I was waiting for an answer on a not-so-long chance, I slunk into the Bon Ton funeral parlor to pay my respects to the departed. I stood in the back of that dimly lit chapel and scanned the scene. Three of the boys from Homicide were there, blowing their noses. Two chorus girls I thought had long since forgotten me were there in black deep v-necks. My insurance man was there looking awful worried. One chronicle reporter with photographer and a shoeshine boy from our building and the bailiff from the courthouse just to mention a few I could make out. And you were there, Effie, up front near a closed casket. I made out a bar of flowers from robbery detail. It said, goodbye, Sam. Maxie from the city morgue was the only one who looked at ease. <coughs> All right. Does anyone wish to, uh, you, miss? Many called him shaman. But I called him friend. Uh. On this, his last caper. <laughs> I was touched, Effie. And I would have stopped the whole thing then and there. But I had to find out who was in that casket. I reeled out the front door with tears in my eyes and slid around to the back door and into Chester Swan's private office. And there I made a phone call and got an answer to my telegram, which caused me to make another call to his bank. By that time, most of it was right in place. A search through his desk revealed nothing and a safe standing in the corner the same. But then my answer walked right in the door. Oh, Sam, darling, I was so worried when I found you'd left that I saw you at the funeral and I thought you'd be here. And the guy who was with you? Was he worried, too? Oh, him, him. That was Dr. Jesslin. Sam, you'd been out for two days and I didn't... Oh, Sam, you're safe. You got away from it all. You've escaped, darling. Yeah, yeah, they're burying me right now. I'm dead. It's so wonderful, Sam. Only one thing. Where do you fit? Hmm? The caper. I was supposed to burn up in that fire, and what was left was supposed to look enough like Theodore J. Swan, class of 1936 Toledo, Ohio, to let beneficiary Chester Swan collect a nice pile of insurance money. Sam, what are you talking about? Who, who's Theodore J.? What did you say? Chester's only living relative. They're burying him right now. Somebody lost his caper. You want to tell me? Darling, I, I was at the house the night of the fire, working on my foggy picture. You didn't see me when you went in, and later on you didn't come out. And I went over... And I was on the floor, and a man was bending over me. He changed clothes with you, Sam, and I screamed, and he pulled out a gun, and I hit him with a hoe. And I drug you out on the lawn. And then what happened? I put, put you in my car and took you home. I, I was going to phone the police, but I decided it was something you were working on, and I went back to the house, and it... And it, it was burning, and you knew the man you'd hit on the head was in there. Believe me, Sam, I didn't know the house was going to burn down. I wouldn't kill anybody, Sam. I only wanted to... You only wanted to help me, and you did right, Angel. Oh, Sam. That's all right. I'm your witness. You didn't start the fire. You mean somebody really started it? Chester. He thought it was me lying on the floor in there. The bank tells me he's about to go busted. He figured this one out with his nephew to scare up some insurance, though. I'm about the same Hold size. Hold me, Sam. Hold me. It's been horrible. This is the kind of thing I was trying to paint. Now I'm smack dab up against it and I'm sick. I'm scared. Easy, easy. Sam, you're really dead. There's our way out, Sam. Just leave oh. now. Let it go the way it is. They all think you're dead. Oh, dear. Huh? But we know different, don't we, Mr. Spade? He was holding a Navy Colt revolver in front of him with both hands. I couldn't make up my mind to rush him and count on his bad aim or stand still and be a perfect target while I tried to talk him out of it. Either way, he was a crazy man with a gun. He was getting ready to use it. Sam, he's going to kill us. Mr. Quiet, Spade. Amy. Because my nephew was stupid enough to wear your watch and your suit when he exchanged clothes with you, I'm going to lose the bon ton. And that puts you in quite a spot, doesn't it, Mr. Swan? Until a moment ago, yes, but now. Mr. Spade, the newspapers all say you're dead. A death certificate says the same thing. All of your friends are following your casket and my nephew's corpse to the cemetery at this very moment. 
Everybody expects you to be dead, Mr. Spade. Thanks to you, Mr. Swan. But now, nobody'd miss you if, if I killed you. I'd miss you, Sam. But I'd have to kill you, too. Oh. Did you notice you were still wearing Theodore's clothes, even his ring? Why, Mr. Spade, I, I could kill you and put you in a fire somewhere and collect my insurance on Theodore now, couldn't I? No. Why, that's a terrible thing to think. Huh? Oh, you're not reasoning properly, Chester. You really aren't. How would you explain Amy? You just said you'd have to kill her. And what about the coroner's office? You know how they are. But if I... But yeah, really... don't forget the medical examiner's got something to say, too. Not to mention but... the fact that you'd have to really burn me up to cover up the bullet hole. I... And furthermore, Chester, when you shoot me, oh. if you happen to hit a rib and chip off some bone, they'd no. know I was shot before, and then homicide would be in on it. Oh, no, stop, then... stop, stop. Nothing works for me. I'm a failure. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Swan. Let it all out. You'll feel better. <laughs> And he did. And he's still crying in his cell downtown. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam, you were so brave. You actually stood there and talked that crazy man out of, out of murdering you. You were wonderful. True, Effie? Amy thinks so, too. She's uh, going to do me in oils when they let her out of the pokey. Amy's in jail? What for, Sam? Oh, technical charge of an involuntary manslaughter. They'll spring her as soon as the coroner's inquest is completed. Dear Amy. Did she make good fudge, Sam? Fudge? Oh, that was the least of it. Oh? What do you mean? After the fudge. What the... Panucci. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Say, go type that up, sweetheart, while I see if there's any mention of my miraculous resuscitation on the radio page. <laughs> go, go, scoot, scoot. There certainly is a mention of Sam Spade on the radio page for Friday. Sam Spade is one more in the list of great shows to join up in NBC's Parade of the Stars. Have you heard the big show? This Sunday, the big show comes your way once again on NBC. Listen to just a few of the star names who will be appearing this week. Bob Hope, Jimmy Durante, Perry Como, Jose Ferrer, Mindy Carson, Eddie Cantor, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC once again will be the lady who invented the snappy retort, Tallulah Bankhead. Yes, it's the big show. It's big in music, big in drama, and big in comedy. Be sure to hear the big show Sunday. Typed up. Good. I will sign it and you will keep it always to remind you that I'm still here. Oh, Sam. Living, breathing, brave, and handsome. A paragon. Mm. Sam, what will we do about the mail? The mail? What mail? Where? Which... All the letters and postcards and telegrams and all that came in when people thought you were... Well, when you weren't good... When they thought you were... Oh, there have been enough tears tonight, Oh, Sam, it's so good to have you back. Will you be the same as you always were? Well, I'm going to try it. Well, because then you can't help but be, like they say, the greatest... Private detective of them all. We'll see. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by E. Jack Newman. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Frank Wirth. Join us again next week, same time, for another Adventure with Sam Spade. Hear the magnificent Montague, then visit Duffy's Tavern on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective 
station, sir? Tis I, sweetheart. Sam! Oh, I was worried to death. This office, glass all over the floor, holes in the wall. That was just business going on as usual during altercations, Eph. Well, what was it all about, Sam? They tried, Effie, just tried to pluck my feathers and cook my goose. On Thanksgiving, too. How could they? Oh, they were a mean lot. Are you all right? Hale and hearty. Every giblet in place and not a feather ruffled. Did you have a nice Thanksgiving? Oh, it was heavenly. Mama had a turkey dinner, sage dressing, cranberry sauce, candied yams. Hard cider? <laughs> a little. Come clean, Effie. Well, I, I, I had two glasses. Ah. Everyone was there. Cousin Gertie, Dwight, Mrs. Floss. I was disappointed when you didn't show up, Sam. Did you have Thanksgiving dinner? Sure. Where? At the Helping Hand Rescue Mission, where there's plenty of free parking and never a cover charge. For further details, consult the report, which I will presently be down to dictate... On a tasty chronicle of foul play, the terrified turkey caper. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam Spade! <laughs> Oh, you were waiting for me. Having Thanksgiving dinner at a, at a rescue mission where Mama cooked a perfectly wonderful... Thank your mother for me, Eph. Tell her I'll be over to break wishbones with her tonight. And to atone for my social indifferences, here's a little something I brought for you. Oh, Sam! You shouldn't have. It's beautiful. What is it? A blunder bus. A blunder what? Bus. As in step to the rear of. Oh. Well, what does it do? Shoot, Eph. It's a gun. Our founding fathers used it in foraging for feathered food when they settled this abundant continent. And it's mine. To do with what you will. Where did you get it? Pencil poise? Yes, Sam. But who gave it to me? Pad open? Oh, yes, but I don't know. Knees that... crossed? Did you meet a founding father? Don't peek. Date, November 24th, 1952. Detective Lieutenant I.C. Kelsey, Homicide Detail, San Francisco Police. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, Turkey. Dear Kelsey, this was a big week for the cranberry pickers, the butchers, the sage makers, and the stomach pill people. But for private detectives, it was strictly from hunger. My office door opened only twice a day, once to let me in and once to let me out. And when on Wednesday I heard a knock on the door, I went into a paroxysm of delight. Come in, come in! Come in! Andre Vu! Andre Usted! Erin! When I ran out of languages, I got up from behind the desk, walked to the door, and opened it. Standing there was a small, middle-aged man with a pink, bald head. His blue serge suit needed pressing, and he was nervously fingering a strawberry birthmark under his left ear. Uh, Mr. Samuel Spade? I am. May, may I? May I have a moment? Will you I? may have several, but not in the corridor. It's not in my lease. Oh, I'll come in. Good, good, good. <laughs> Well? Well, you'll have to excuse me, Mr. Spade. I, I've had so few dealings with private detectives, I, I find it hard to begin. Well. I, oh, perhaps I shouldn't have come at all. Goodbye. No, 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 wait a minute. Maybe I can help you. Well, well, you see, I, I, oh, what's the use? You won't believe me. Nobody does. I'd really better go. Oh, now, wait, wait. I'll believe you. All I ask is a chance. Now, now, let's start with your name. Oh, what, my name? Yes. Yes. Yes, my name. To begin with, you won't believe that. Uh -huh. oh, but I can verify it. Yes, I can. It's on the registration book of the old Colony Hotel in the 1943 phone book and on my old driver's license. Well, I'll have to know it before I can verify it. Oh, yes, yes, of course you will. It's, uh, it's Tom. Well, now that's not so hard to believe. Oh, you haven't heard the rest of it. It's Tom... A turkey. <clears throat> there, you, you see, I told you you wouldn't believe it. I'd better go. No, no. Uh, let me be the first to believe you. Now, Mr. Uh, uh, Tom, uh, what's your problem? Oh, dear. Dear, that's even harder to explain. Well, now that I don't believe. But uh, take a breath and jump into it. Uh, breath. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Turkey, and they're going to kill me for Thanksgiving. Well, I had asked for it, and I had gotten it. 
and I sat back wondering who had gone to all the trouble to play this funny joke on me. I was looking at my hand to see if there was any itching powder on it where he'd shaken it when my phone rang. I lifted the receiver, swung around in my swivel, and gazed out onto the street. It was Al Kuchel calling, a private eye whose reputation was shadier than a mushroom cellar. Hiya, Spady. Al. Haven't seen much of you lately, Spady. Now have to get together. Yeah, well, so long. Wait, wait, I'll tell you why I called. I've had a pest in my office, keeps coming back. Thinks he's a turkey somebody wants to dress. I brushed him, but your name came up, and I just wanted to warn you. He might be in to see you. I'm confused, Al. I never knew you to turn your back on a buck. Oh, I don't want any of this one. His buttons are loose. My advice to you is to bounce him. Well, we've never traded advice before, Cucho. Why now? Well, after all, we're in the same racket. If we can't help each other... Oh, then... sure, Al, sure. I appreciate it. Give me a ring. We've got to get together sometime. Yeah, when I get a free night, we'll Jimmy parking meter. Yeah, we... Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Parking meters. I'll see you later, Spady. I turned back to the desk, and what I saw in front of me was an empty chair. Tom Turkey had taken wing. I got up and walked to the window, and a minute later, I saw him come out of the building downstairs and start to cross the street. And then I saw something else. A large four-ton truck was tearing down the street, picking up speed. Instinctively, I shouted a warning. And at the last second, Tom Turkey scrambled from in front of the truck and disappeared into the alleyway. The truck roared up the street, and on its side was printed in gold letters, Haynes, you drive it. There was nothing to say it wasn't coincidence, this near mishap, but somehow I found myself intrigued and wanting to hear more of the little guy's story. He said the old Colony Hotel. On the way, I stopped at the library, found an old 1943 phone book, and looked. He was listed. Thomas Turkey, it said. Out of curiosity, I rang the number. Hello? I wonder if you can help me. I'm inquiring about a Mr. Turkey. Turkey? This ain't his number no more. I know. Haven't had any calls for him for years. Screwy name. Yeah, I know, I know. I knew a woman named Rabbit once. Mrs. Rabbit. About Turkey, could you remember what he looked like? I don't. Hey, Manny, what Turkey look like? Uh 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 Yeah, yeah. Small man, around 50. Nice fellow, Manny says. Strawberry under his left ear? Strawberry under his left ear, Manny. Yeah. Yeah. Strawberry under his left ear. Well, thank you, madam, for your information, and thanks to Manny. Well, you're welcome, but I don't know what you're going to do with it. Old man Turkey's dead. Been dead for years. Curiouser and curiouser, I thought. They had described the man who came to my office 20 minutes ago. And now he'd been dead for years. I continued on to the old Colony Hotel. Room, 75 cents, it said. Tom's room was 114. Who is it? Sam Spade. Oh, come in, Mr. Spade. I'm... I'm sorry I ran away. I didn't think you really believed me. Well, I'm not sure I do yet. Tell me, was that truck an accident? Oh, I don't think so, no. They, They made three attempts before to kill me. Somebody tried to push me in front of a train, and then a wheelchair full of cement dropped off a building and just missed me, and then I was shot at. Oh, who were they, and why would they want to kill you? I don't know. I just don't know. Look, let's tack. Tack? Tack. I dialed your old phone number, and the people who answered said you're dead. Oh, a lot of people think I'm dead. Yeah. Look, do you still want me to work for you? Oh, yes, yes, please. Well, you'll have to tell me more, then. I yes, can't... I... I guess I'd better tell you everything... Oh, it's, it's hard to talk about, Mr. Spade. It's not easy to admit to someone you've been a foolish man. You see, I just turned 50. I was quite tired of the life I'd led. Proper, dull, and unfruitful, except in money. My business was wearing, and so was my wife, Henriette. This has a traditional ring. Anyway, to make it short, I decided to run away. One day I drove to work. I parked my car in the middle of the Bay Bridge where the suicide note left it and disappeared. Where did you go? Oh, all over the world. I took a job on a boat. I did. On a boat. And then I settled in San Paulo, Brazil, under another name. Now you're back. Why? Maybe I got lonely. Maybe I got wiser. Maybe... Maybe I felt I paid enough for my mistakes. Let's just say I'm back. I want to be with Henrietta. Have you seen her? I checked into this hotel and wrote her a letter saying I wasn't dead. I was back in San Francisco, and I I wanted to come back to her if she still would have me. But I told her I wouldn't bother her unless she wanted to see me. That she could contact me here. 
That was a week ago. And you haven't heard from her? No, no. And almost right away, these attempts on my life began. I see. All right, what's her address? 3118 Monroe. Oh, she's taken her maiden name again. Black, Henrietta Black. Oh, come on, let's go. No, no, I'm not going to see her until she asks me. Well, look, you're going to my apartment. Nobody will bother you there. And you're going to see Henrietta? That's right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spade. You, you do believe me. I think I'm really ready to face the world again now. I deposited Tom in my apartment with instructions to open the door for no one but me. And then I proceeded to 3118 Monroe in the high rent district. I was ushered through a comely portico by a Japanese maid who told me to wait in a study heavy with mahogany. In a moment, two people came in. The woman wore a black dress, silver pendant, flat shoes, and a complexion the color of apple meat. She was Miss Henrietta Black and or Mrs. Tom Turkey. The man turned out to be Leander Luce, the lady's attorney, business manager, and canasta partner. You say you have something important to discuss with me, Mr. Spade? I do. I hope you don't mind my asking Mr. Luce to be here. Not at all. Well? Mrs. Turkey, I've just talked to your husband, Tom. Mr. Spade, if you please. I say something? A rather feeble attempt at comedy, Mr. Spade. Well, I wasn't trying for laughs. You are Mrs. Turkey, aren't you? I was. You undoubtedly still are. I've expected to hear another one of these cruel jokes about my name. At Thanksgiving time, Mr. Spade, someone was always going to stuff Tom, baste him, dress him, slice him. This season, they're going to kill him. They are not going to kill him. He is already dead. He's not dead, Mrs. Turkey, and you should know it. I should? Yes, he sent you a letter saying he was back in San Francisco and wanted to see you. Mr. Spade... This has gone absolutely far enough. Not quite. What about the letter? I know of no such letter. I see. Well, thank you for your time. I'm sorry I bothered you. Well, you used bad judgment in coming in the first place. Yes, maybe you're right. There was falsehood in this someplace, Lieutenant, and it stuck out like a fat girl in slacks. The only thing to do was to go back to my apartment, get Tom Turkey, and confront Mrs. T with her husband in the flesh. But when I got back to my apartment building, I spotted in rapid succession, one, an ambulance, two, a police car, and upstairs, outside my half-opened apartment door, I spotted three, you. I've been expecting you. What's going on, Kelsey? Yeah, serious, Sam, serious. Who's that bald-headed man moving around the apartment? That's McCracken, the new medical examiner, checking a stiff on your rug. <laughs> I stepped around you, Lieutenant, and pushed the door all the way open. I saw McCracken kneeling over the body and a couple of men from Homicide taking photos. I moved into the room feeling nothing good. A little guy had given me a job, and while I was yakking with his wife, somebody got to him. And in my apartment, where I'd stashed him, McCracken stood up and I looked down at the body. Then I looked again. Who I saw wasn't Tom Turkey at all. It was the late private eye, Al Kuchel. are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. You Friday fans of Sam Spade, there's mystery on Saturday evening, too, on NBC. Tomorrow, the man called X sets out on another mission of danger and intrigue in some far-off corner of the earth. Herbert Marshall stars as the man called X, a man without a name who travels the world over, protecting his country's interests. He lives by his wits, and his business is danger. He is the man called X, tomorrow over most NBC stations. For Top Sunday listening, it's another broadcast of The Big Show on NBC. This Sunday, your stars include Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Mindy Carson, Ed Archie Gardner, Ed Wynn, and many, many more. And Tallulah is your MC as usual. This Sunday, it's the big show on NBC. And now, back to the terrified turkey caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. While the men from Homicide were taking pictures, etc., you and I, Lieutenant, were going round and round on the question, if I didn't kill the man found in my room, who did? 
And you were sufficiently impressed with my insults, Kelsey, not to hold me for the murder. We bowed to each other, and I left. Thinking back to the truck that had almost run Turkey down, I went to the Haynes U Drive truck rental garage. Yeah? What do you... I mean, what do you want? I'm a detective. Could you give me a list of names for everybody who rented a truck from you during the past few days? Sure. He handed me a big registration book, and I read every name for the past week. For the first five days, they all seemed to be nice, normal, abnormal names. And then, under the rentals for the day before, was the name of John Smith. John had given his address as 7200 Kearney. And I happen to know that Kearney only goes up to 2000. The dispatcher said that Smith had returned the truck about three hours before. And he remembered him as an ugly, heavy-set, and rough-voiced character who looked like an ex-longshoreman. They had already washed the truck, so the fingerprints were all out up. Well, it's Mr. Spade again. Look, I'd like to speak with Mrs. Turk... Uh, Miss Black, if you don't mind. Come in. Come in. Thank you. This way. Into the den. Right. Well, I was sure you'd look into this affair a little more and realize that it was just a blind alley. A hoax of some kind. Where's Miss Black? Oh, she's upstairs lying down. The whole affair has upset her, and uh, she asked not to be disturbed. I think the wisest course of action for you, Mr. Spade, is just to let the matter drop. You can't let a murder just drop, Mr. Lewis. The police wouldn't hear of it. Huh? Murder? Who? An unfrocked private detective named Al Cucho. Well, what does this have to do with Henrietta Black? Al Cucho called me earlier today and said that Tom Turkey was a crackpot, a little man with delusions. He tried to top me off taking his case. He sounds like a perceiving man. Well, he didn't perceive ending up in my apartment with a bullet in his head. Well, that's too bad, but I still don't I left see... Tom Turkey in my apartment for safekeeping, and when I returned, he was gone and Kuchel was dead. Well, that explains itself, obviously. This detective knew that Tom Turkey was a phony, and Turkey killed him. It can figure that way, and a number of other ways. Mr. Spade, I have no desire to sit here trading subtleties with you. As yet, no one has demonstrated that the real Tom Turkey actually exists alive. Now, until you do have something more concrete and less mythological, Miss Black requests that you do not come around opening up old wounds. You've made an eloquent point. Just tell me one thing. If I can. When did Tom Turkey disappear? I mean, what month, what day? It was, uh... Oh, yes, uh, 1943, uh, November. But I'm not sure of the exact day... I think it was in the third week. Could it have been on Thanksgiving? Very possibly. Very possibly. I returned thoughtfully to my office and did a little rapid mental arithmetic and came up with a number seven. From November 23rd, 1943 to November 23rd, 1950 was seven years to the day. And I pondered this. What did the number seven mean to the life or death of Tom Turkey? I had just hit upon the answer and was crying Eureka when my office door opened, unknocked, and a visitor came in unannounced. He was ugly, heavy set, and looked like an ex longshoreman. I waited to see if the voice checked. You, Spade? Who shall I say is calling? Yeah, Captain John Smith. And here's my calling card. The first. The first bullet grazed my shoulder and tore the padding out of my coat. The second bullet hit the water cooler and it crashed over, water and all on top of me. Where the third bullet hit, I wasn't sure at the time because darkness came rushing through my head like a freight train. When I opened my eyes again, I expected to see St. Peter checking my ID card. But all I saw were the dust balls under my desk and a fly bathing himself in a pool of water spreading slowly over the floor. There was blood on my hand, but it came from a glass cut. I was in shambles, but alive. Captain John Smith had shoved off, obviously thinking his bullets had done their work. Homicide, Lieutenant Kelsey. Sam Kelsey, have you found anything more about Tom Turkey? Nothing, Sam. Frankly, I'm beginning to wonder if there is such a guy. Well, clever Kelsey, a few minutes ago, a gorilla by the name, believe it or not, of Captain John Smith just tried to kill me in my office. Oh, go on, Sam. I find it hard to think. You find it hard to think, period. Really, Sam? 
Did you get him? No, but my office is a wreck, and there's a hole blasted in my wall big enough to put a basketball in. Well, what did he use, a bazooka? I figured dum-dum bullets. Dum-dum? Well, that's illegal, ain't it? Kelsey, doesn't it strike you as significant that every attempt on Turkey's life has been vicious, as if someone not only wanted to kill him, but also mutilate him? Yeah, yeah, now that you mention it. Somebody probably wanted to make identification difficult. Even dead, they didn't want anybody to know who he was. Now, listen carefully, Kelsey, this yeah. is real deep. Tom Turkey disappeared on Thanksgiving of 1943. A person has to be missing seven years before he can be legally dead and his insurance collected. Now, if someone had Turkey insured, they could collect the day after this Thanksgiving, if Turkey didn't show up before. You mean somebody's trying to kill him for the insurance? I would say so, Kelsey. I would say so. Now, hurry up and find him. When I put down the phone, I heard a heavy pounding. For a minute, I thought it was in my head until I turned to face the door, and standing there was a small pilgrim with bandy legs in black stockings, pantaloons, white-collared coat, and stovepipe hat. Hallelujah! He wore silver buckles, and what he was pounding on the floor was an 18th-century blunderbuss. Hallelujah! Have I got the right place? Well, offhand, I'd say so. If you're looking for Captain John Smith, he just left. Pocahontas is expected any minute. <laughs> now, don't you go trying to confuse me. I'm too thirsty. What's on your mind, Pilgrim? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a fellow named Dan... Uh, uh, oh, I'm so thirsty, I forgot. Sam Spade? Uh, yeah, that's it, that's it, yes. Oh, oh, you broke your water bottle, huh? Yeah. Good, good. That stuff's poison anyway. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> hey, say, uh... Do you happen to have any hard cider around? Fresh out. Oh. I'm kind of thirsty, you know. Any type of corn squeezings? Here. Try this, Dad. Well, well, yeah. Good, huh? Oh, mm. You like that, huh? Oh. <gasps> <sighs> <sighs> Well, follow me. Uh, but before we go, do you suppose we could have a little something for the road? It's bitter cold. I gave him a little, but not too much, because I didn't want him to lose his way. He walked me right down Market Street so he could look in the liquor store windows. He said it gave him a comfortable feeling to know there was so much good in the world. And then we turned right a few blocks until we came to the Helping Hand Mission. Across its gray front, a banner promised special holiday food and comfort to the unfortunate. And on the street in front of it, there was a brass band sending out signals to the fraternity that any minute the great feast of Thanksgiving would begin. The band members and other volunteer workers were all dressed as pilgrims, a quaint conceit. My pilgrim led me to a dark corner of the club room, and sitting there unhappily was none other than Tom Turkey. Hello, Mr. Spade. Oh, hello, Tom. What happened to my apartment? And why did you run away? Well, I was afraid. You told me not to answer the door until you came back. Yeah. Well, somebody knocked on the door and said it was you, so I opened it, and two men came Tell in. Tell me, was one of the male Kuchel? Yes, the detective. Yeah. The other man was a big, ugly-looking fellow. And when they saw I was alone, they started arguing. About what? Well, the detective said that now that he'd brought the ugly man there, he wanted his money. Yeah. The ugly man pulled a gun, and they started to fight. Oh, dear, I... I slipped out the door, and when I was halfway downstairs, I heard a shot and kept on running. Well, Al Kuchel is dead. Oh, my. I thought so. This was the only place I could think of to hide. Oh, when Henrietta finds out I've been mixed up in a murder, she'll never take me back. Henrietta. Hey, tell me, did your wife ever have any insurance on you? Oh, be before I ran away, she did. A $50,000 policy, but... Oh, that would have lapsed by now. Maybe, maybe. Did it have a suicide clause in it? A suicide? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, no. No, it didn't. I, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, you'd like to talk to Henrietta, wouldn't you? All right, here's her phone number. Call her up and tell her where you are. Oh, dear, I... I don't think I could. I'm too frightened. You've got to do something to help yourself. If you don't, by midnight, you might be a cold turkey. Oh. I'm sorry, it just slipped out. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> Well, he went and made the call. When he returned, he said that a man had answered who said Henrietta would come down and pick Tom up. He didn't want to wait, but I sat on him. The pilgrim brought us a dish of turkey dinner, saying he couldn't stand food himself, and we munched a spell. 
In a little while, a limousine pulled up in front of the mission with someone in back whom I couldn't see. The chauffeur stepped out and came in inquiring for Tom Turkey. It was Captain John Smith himself. When he saw me, a look of shocked surprise came over his unhandsome face. Hoping to catch him off balance, I dove at him. It was the liveliest thing that has happened at the Helping Hand Mission in years, and we had a good house, too. Money was even changing hands. And when I heard the odds starting to go against me, I realized I'd better come up with something. Here, use this, partner. And I did. The bandy-legged pilgrim shoved his blunderbuss right in my hand. And I swung. Smith dropped like pheasant on the wing. I looked up. The passenger from the limousine was just coming in. Here, yeah, what's the meaning of this? It means, Leander Luce, that you're not going to carve Tom Turkey up for your Thanksgiving insurance policy. Hallelujah! Hey, hey, drumstick, anyone? <laughs> Period, end of report. Sam, I don't understand. Well, it's as plain as the cranberry stain on your dress, Seth. Huh? Luce, as Henrietta's business manager, had her power of attorney. And secretly, he kept making the payments on Tom Turkey's insurance policy. Oh, and then he'd collect for Henrietta and keep the money himself. Effie, sometimes your lightning mind frightens me. <laughs> now, go type that up. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs with the chimes later tonight when Ed Gardner stars in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie, the manager, will definitely be on hand to serve his blue plate special of grilled English language. This Sunday, the big show comes your way again. Tallulah will be your hostess, and the stars include Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Ed Wynn, Meredith Wilson, and many, many more. It's the big show, Sunday, on NBC. <laughs> The man who killed Al Cucho and tried to kill you, was his name really Captain John Smith? No, Effie. Could we have a Thanksgiving caper without a Captain John Smith? It wouldn't be right. It was a coincidence, wasn't it? Well, if you promise not to tell anyone... I won't. His real name was Michael Giuseppe Yablonski Smith. I called him John for short. You're so kind. Mm -hmm. Are we going over to your mother's for cold turkey snacks? Well, all right, but I don't think there'll be much left. Oh? You see... Uh, my cousin Gertie couldn't find a little boy. Mm -hmm. And Mother phoned and said they just found him. Mm -hmm. He was inside the turkey, eating his way out. Effie, <laughs> is there no way to curb that tongue of yours? Yes, sir. There's one way. Well, come here. Mm -hmm. <sighs> oh, good night, Sam. <laughs> good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Larry Roman and John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Hear the magnificent Montague, then visit Duffy's Tavern on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam, 
Would you mind telling me where you are? Not at all, Effie. Not at all. Let's see. Uh, I'm at the ill rig Dana Rabby Tile Sea Grog. I don't understand that, Sam, but I think I caught the word grog. Oh, you're shrewd, Effie. You see, I'm on the inside, and the lettering is printed on the outside. Uh, now, if you'll wait, I'll go outside and read it the right way, and then come inside and... Never t- mind. I've already guessed. You're at George's Elite Bar and Grill. Trapped. Sam... After me, you promised me you wouldn't. I, uh, me? I promised? Me? You did, Sam. You promised faithfully to stay away from bars. You know how hard television is on your eyes. Have you got your glasses? One in each hand. Fill them up, George. Oh, Sam, I heard that. What will people think? Uh, They'll never know, Effie. I always drink here under another name. Oh. Just a little of the hair of the dog that bit me, Effie. But don't worry about me. Although it's true I have been dogging it and have been hounded from tree to tree, I am frisky as ever and will be in to unleash my canine chronicle, namely the dog bed caper. Or he who lies down with dogs gets up with murder. Or, condensed for easy reading, <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie? Here I am, Sam. Here I am, Sam. Effie, did you ever write poetry in school? Well, well, I was known as Emily Dickinson of Central High. I thought you had a touch of internal rhyme scheme there. <laughs> I doodled a little poem about you today. Really? Well, redoodle. There was a detective named Spade with oodles of brains in his head. Clever, clever. But when he took up drinking, he forgot about thinking. Now give me the punchline. And Effie has stayed quite unpaid. <coughs> well, a little rough, but you... Did you get the idea, Sam? Never could make any sense out of poetry. Ready? It's getting close to Christmas, Sam, and I... Pencil poem? I used my last pencil, and I don't really have enough money to Please, buy any... Please, Effie, I have no head for figures. All right, I give up. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the dog bed caper. Oh, Sam, I hope this is going to be all about dogs. I belong to the tail waggers, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I've read all the books by Jack London. Yeah, 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 I just think... Down, be... Effie. Strangely enough, you will not meet a single dog in this story. Actually, this narrative has little indeed to do with our four-footed friends or their beds. And I'd change the title now, except that it's already gone out for publicity. Dear Dundee, it all started with a phone call to my secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, a doll, requesting my inimitable services at the investment counseling firm of Cameron Incorporated. Clearing everything off my desk, two shoes with feet in them, my own, I went over. The firm of Cameron Incorporated was obviously not for the pushcart set. It was plush, ankle-deep rugs, imported drapes, and the receptionist. She had a plushness all of her own. I said hello in my plushiest voice, and she liked it. She said so. Oh, I like the way you said that. Say it again. Life is too short to go back even for a moment. The past is a dead thing. The present dying. Only the future alive and vibrant. However, hello. Is there something? There is. Uh, Could I ask a question? Why not? I will rephrase the question. Uh, What time do you stop working this evening? Around six. Care to have... Why not? There's a little bar around the corner, okay? Why not? Why not, indeed? Bring your own money? Well, come anyway. Your name? Celeste. Mine's Sam Spade. Who's Mr. Briggs? He called Major me. Briggs? Why, he's our chief accountant. I just happened to have my door open. Did I hear someone inquiring about me? This is Mr. Spade, Major Briggs. How do you do, Major? Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you in person, Mr. Spade. I'm the man who called you, you know. I'm grateful, sir. Now, what is it I can do for you and Mr. Cameron? Oh, it's not for me that I called. I haven't a worry in the world. And it's Miss Cameron. Oh. Old Cameron's been dead for many years now. I see. Uh, Whatever she wants, Mr. Spade, do a good job. We are all counting on you. Uh, Will you please announce, Mr. Spade, Miss Roberts? Certainly, Major. Uh, If you'd excuse me. Nice to have met you, Major. Miss Cameron? Yes. Miss Spade's here. Send him in, please. You're on, Sam. Have fun. Think I might? Why not? 
That girl had the most beautiful double entendre in town. Well, to get on, Adela Cameron was a career woman, around 29, although the tailored suit made fine detective work difficult. No makeup, severe hairdo, and in spite of all this, chic. In fact, as we shook hands in a most businesslike manner, I had the feeling that something warm might well spring up between us. Something like a warm mutual dislike, maybe. But something. Most men simply cannot be told anything in confidence. They gossip. That's a switch. I don't appreciate your humor, Mr. Spade. I accept your apology. I will tolerate you because of your reputation. All right. I'm going to give you a very difficult job to do. Uh, Miss Cameron. What is it, Major? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Courtney Pierce is on the phone Mr. And... Spade, this is Major Briggs, our chief accountant. We've already met. Uh, Mr. Spade. Now, Adela, Pierce wants us to unload his short-term governments and buy American cattle. He's dividend crazy. Amcat's de declaring one in January, and he wants it. Well, let him do it. Well, I just want to protect your interests. You know what will happen to Amcat after February... They'll drop ten points and he'll blame us. I went through this with your father when you and Greg were... That's old. right, Major. Well, tell him we advise against it. But if he persists, ask him for a release in writing. Mm, that's what I thought you'd do. That's the way your father would have handled it. I just want to protect your interests, my dear. That's all. I know, Major. I know. I just want to protect your interests. Well, don't worry about us. You know, we're not children anymore. All right, my dear. Where were we? Oh, you were giving me a difficult job. Oh, yes. Here is the business address of Mr. I.J. Barco. He's a wealthy manufacturer, a client of ours. I want you to find out everything about him, especially anything unsavory. Sorry, I don't do divorce or blackmail cases. Mr. Spade, this is not a divorce investigation. All right, what is it then? Why do we want a client shadowed, I believe is the expression? That's it. Because we believe he is investing money through us for some racketeers. If that were true, we would, of course, have to drop him. But we don't want to lose his business just on suspicion. I see. Find out anything you can about him. I'll give you $50 a day in expenses, one week guarantee. Will you consider the job? I have considered and taken the job. By the time I'd reached the door, she had already forgotten me and was hard at work on some papers. Outside, I planned to dally a few moments in idle chit-chat with Celeste. But before I had the chance, I was accosted by a husky young chap whom I'm afraid was a Princeton man. What were you talking about in there, Spade? Oh, you have the advantage, sir. Who are you? Gregory Cameron. Now, come on. What was Adela telling you? Well, if you step to one side, you can walk around me and ask her. Look, don't pull that cagey private detective routine on me. I pack a little weight myself. Well, pack it somewhere else, sonny. I asked you a question. I expect an answer. <laughs> There's your answer. Any more questions? He didn't feel much like talking then, and I was so irritated I walked out without saying goodbye to Celeste. When I reached the street, the white-haired old gentleman, Major Briggs, hurried out behind me. Uh, Mr. Spade, please don't think too badly of that boy. I've known him from the cradle. He's in a difficult emotional state at yeah, the moment. Yes, sure, sure, sure. As far as I'm concerned, Major, it never happened. Uh, you're a kind man, Mr. Spade. I could tell that when I first saw you. You're just the sort of man Miss Cameron needs. Well, I hadn't looked at it that way. If you require anything, don't hesitate to ask me. I've been with this company 40 years before those two children in there were born. And I know how difficult life can be at times. I just want things to go well for them. I'll do my little part, Major. Uh, bless you, son. Bless you. I started to work. The card Adela Cameron had given me revealed at my quarry, Mr. I.J. Barco, was of all things a manufacturer of dog beds. I sat down on a hydrant to think this over and then followed the scent of horse meat on over to his factory on South Dolores. It was built in the shape of a large dog house and outside stood a billboard with the message, A survey of independent dog tracks, kennels, and canine core proves that dogs choose Barco beds two to one. I had to get a look at Barco himself, and so ruffling up the hair on the back of my neck, I trotted into the building, sniffing and wagging my tail in a very friendly manner. 
It was very easy to see, Mr. Barco, after I lied a little about my connections. What was that name again? Senor Don Jose Martinez Sada Morales, but you may call me Sam. And you represent a group of retail outlets in South America. Oh, I do indeed. We have our eye on your dog beds, Mr. Barco. Well, now, let's take a look at our catalog here. Now, say you had a great day and you'd want something regal like this uh, Louis XIV. Ever see a more beautiful bed? Well, not lately, but Mr. Barco... Down, boy, down. <clears throat> now, here's a number that's very big this season with English Bulldogs, a Sheraton natural wood finish. Lovely, huh? Arriba. And, of course, if it's an Irish terrier, here's a purely gag present for his sense of humor. A, a Murphy, Murphy bed. bed. Get it, Sam? Irish terrier? See, si, see. Si. <laughs> well, of course, we, would, we wouldn't ask a dog to sleep in a Murphy oh, bed. Oh, Mr. Barco, I'm afraid I don't see anything here I like. What's this? Do I understand you, sir? You are refusing this small speck of comfort to the one unselfish friend that man can have in this selfish world? Well, I'm not refusing anything. I just don't have The unselfish to... friend who, if fortune drives you forth an outcast into the world homeless, will ask no higher privilege than to be at your side to guard against danger, well, Mr. Barclay... faithful unto death. There by your graveside will be found the noble dog, My his head side? between his paws, his eyes sad but watchful, faithful... <laughs> We shook paws, and I felt his nose to be sure it was cold. It was, and I left. I rented a car and took up a station outside the Barco factory. About four o'clock, he hurried out, jumped into a long, low vehicle shaped like a dachshund, and mushed off. I followed. An hour later, I was phoning my first report to Adela Cameron's secretary, Celeste. You went to the city hall. What did you do there, Mr. Spade? License bureau. Marriage, not dog. Really? Where'd he go then? Grocery store, where he bought one bottle of olives, one bottle of vermouth, and one bottle of gin. I wonder what he's going to make. What recipe is that? Well, now he's in an apartment house on Post Street, just across from the drugstore I'm in, and judging from the groceries, intends to stay a while. He has laid in provisions. Uh-huh. Well, I guess that's all we wanted to know. What? Uh, Miss Cameron just told me to call you off the case. You'll still get your guarantee, though. Major Briggs will send you a check. Well, that doesn't make sense. Sam orders his orders. All right, all right. What about tonight? I'm afraid not. Some other time. You mean... You mean it's all over? The half-daring, half-shy kisses on the Oakland Ferry? The, the warm, passionate spring nights at Fisherman's Wharf eating abalone? The... Hello? Well. Puzzled, as who wouldn't be, I walked slowly back to my car. But before I had a chance to get in, I saw I.J. Barco hurry out of his apartment house. But he didn't enter his car. He came right for me. Hey, hey. Just a minute, Spade. So sorry, my name is Don Jose Martinez, Sada Morales, yet. Don't kid me, Spade. I'm not as stupid as I acted today. Huh. Look. I know why Adela Cameron is following me, and you don't. And you'll never find out any more than the other four detectives did. I was the fifth choice? What? I shall speak with my agent about this. I'm going to tell her in person that this foolishness has to stop. If it doesn't, she'll live to regret it. Now, one more thing. I presume you're going to follow me. Well, I'm turning right on market and heading out to 1217 Ridgewood Place. You shouldn't have any trouble. <laughs> And with that, he spun on one heel and trotted to his car. He took off, but when I went to my car, it wouldn't turn over. And when I lifted the hood, I found out why. All my spark plugs were gone. I picked up a new set at a service station, looked up Adela Cameron's address in the phone book. It was 1217 Ridgewood Place. And a good half hour later, I got there. Barco's car was out in front. No one answered the door, but it was open. Adela Cameron was a crumpled heap on the living room sofa. Oh, Sam. Sam, help me, please. All right, all right, Miss Cameron. Let me look at you. Are you hurt? No. No, I'm all right. It's him. Where? The bar. I hurried into the bar and was met with a strong odor of scotch. A bottle of it had been broken. And holding the neck of the bottle in one hand was I, J. Barco. He was on the floor. His hand slowly opened. The glass rolled out, and he died. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade.
Act Two of tonight's Sam Spade in just a moment. Meanwhile, here's news of other goings-on on NBC. There's no doubt about it, it's the big show. Not just any big show, but the big show. Brought to you every Sunday night over most of these NBC stations. An hour and a half of the very best in comedy, music, and drama. Your stars this Sunday on The Big Show include Fred Allen, Margaret Truman, Douglas Fairbanks, Danny Thomas, Mindy Carson, and many more. All presided over by the glamorous Tallulah. No wonder it's The Big Show. Saturday night on NBC means mystery with the man called X. A man without a name who travels the world over on missions of intrigue and peril. Herbert Marshall stars as The Man Called X tomorrow and every Saturday evening on NBC. And now back to the dog bed caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. It took three bullets in the chest to finish off I.J. Barco. He'd apparently been standing there pouring a drink. Barco broke the bottle as he fell. I couldn't find any other signs of violence or any gun, so I went back to Adela Cameron. She was beginning to calm down. I don't know who did it. I just don't know. Well, it couldn't have happened more than a minute ago. And you were in the house, weren't you? No. No, after I left my office, I... I stopped in the store for some things. Then came home... When I was driving down Ridgewood, I heard some sounds. And you thought they were a car backfiring. How did you know? I've heard this script before. Don't you dare accuse me of killing that man. It's not what I think that counts, but what the police accuse you of. Sam, I heard those sounds. I came in the house when I went into the bar. You didn't notice Barco's car out in front? Oh, I suppose I did. I don't know. I, I don't remember. Uh-huh. Who are you calling? Homicide. Sam. Sam, wait a minute. Just a minute, please. Wait for what? I, I want to tell you some things. All right. Go on. I kind of get the feeling I was hired to put the finger on the dog's best friend. That's not the way it was. The last thing in the world I wanted was for him to be killed. Murdered, I mean. All right. What did you want? I'll tell you the truth. Why I really had you watching Barco. I'd be curious. We handled his investment account. My brother, Gregory... We ran into each other. I heard. Well, Greg took $150,000 of Barco's money and invested it. Without my knowledge, in the television company. I hear that medium's making money. But it turned out this company was just a front for some men who wanted to build a gambling syndicate up north. You mean your brother didn't know that? He knew, but there was supposed to be big money in it. He was going to give Barco a good profit and take the rest for himself. And Barco found out and threatened suit or something. He never would have known, but the deal fell through and the gambler said the money was gone. Then he asked about the investment. What could Gregory and I tell him? What did you? Unfortunately, the truth. We said we'd make up the money with interest, but he only gave us 90 days. We couldn't get it by then. So you didn't shoot him. Your brother did, eh? No, Sam. No, he couldn't have. I know, Greg. He'd have more sense. In my brief meeting with him, I didn't think he had any sense. Just one more thing before I call the police. Sam, Sam don't call them. Help me get him out of here. Somewhere. No dice. Oh, Sam. Sam. Sam, don't let my whole life... Stop be it, stop it. You set me on Barco to find some blackmailing material, yes? Yes. And then why did you suddenly call me off the job tonight? I didn't. Your secretary said you did. I didn't. I didn't tell her anything of the sort. Can I have that phone now? So I called you, Dundee. Before you arrived, I looked through Barco's pockets for something to do and came up with a picture of him and a girl taken outside a marriage chapel in Las Vegas. The girl was Celeste, Cameron Incorporated's plushy secretary, several years younger and two shades less voluptuous. Her address, 627 Finley, was supplied by a now hysterical Adela Cameron. No one answered Celeste's door, but I heard a shower going inside, so I took the liberty of entering. Persona non grata. Is there somebody out there? There is. Come out and see. Oh. No false moves now. Keep that towel right where it is. What you... Am I doing here detective work? And I must say I've already found out a great deal. Well, Sam, I'll admit I did express some interest in you, but if you recall, I told you not tonight. It's my only night off. Sam, please leave. I don't want any difficult scenes. All right, we knock off the cute touches and get down to business. You were married to I.J. Barco, right or wrong? Wrong. Wrong, it's right. You were married in Las Vegas at the chapel of the Flamingo Hotel, uh, uh, the towel. 
I was only married one day. My parents had it annulled. I was underage. Well, you don't have to worry about him anymore. He's dead. No. Shot three times at close range. Oh, no. In Adela Cameron's house. What? Not by you, of course. Although, on the other hand, as you would say, why not? I didn't do it, Sam. Suppose I... you spill. Uh, he wanted me to marry him again. Why? Well, I... I know all about the money the Camerons misused. He found out Greg and I were in love. I should have known. He said he'd forget about the entire 150000 if I'd marry him for six years. 25000 a year, that's a good price. How can you talk like that? Practice, I guess. So, Gregory had another good reason for killing him. He didn't, Sam. I know he didn't. Anything that would stand up in court? I don't think so. Suppose we say you called me off Barco's tail so Gregory could get at it. I didn't. I called you off because I was supposed to meet I.J.'s apartment tonight and give him his answer. I couldn't do it with you there. Flimsy, flimsy, but it might hold. The truth. I was going to see him, but I changed my mind. Any particular reason? Well, you saw him. Would he be the kind of man I'd marry? Well, you did once. Well, it looks bad for Greg. Because someone at Cameron Incorporated knew Barco was going to be at Adela's house. Sam, will you do me a favor? Maybe. Give me an hour. Then I'll go wherever you want. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Why an hour? Because if I'm going to live with myself, there's something I have to do. Well? Please, Sam. If you do, I'll give you some information you might want. For example? There was someone at Cameron Incorporated who knew that Barco was going to Adela's house. <laughs> She must have known I was going to wait outside and tail her, but she didn't, because without once looking over her shoulder, she emerged from her apartment house, slithered into her car, and led me directly down to the railroad station. She met a man in the waiting room, threw her arms around him, whispered something in his ear, and they hurried out to track seven. There was a transcontinental train getting up steam. She kissed him, and he climbed quickly up into a pullman named Aurora Falls. And almost as quickly, I climbed in the other end. We met in the middle. What are you doing here? I came to take you off the train, Greg, before you made a big, big mistake and left town. Now, look here, Let's not Spade. go through the intercollegiate tough talk again. Are you coming off, or am I going to carry you off? You're going to carry me off? And I did. Celeste was gone, and he revived when he hit the cool air. I let him out of the station as unobtrusively as possible. Then we went down a side street to where my car was parked. That's where he began to show signs of life. Spade, look. You're all wrong. Guy's got a right to leave town when he wants to. I'm going to sue you from here to the city hall and back. Shut up and get in the car. Celeste just told me about Barco. You don't think I did that, do you? As I get it, you and Celeste were leaving town together, right? Yeah, she told me to go on and she'd come later. That was unwise of both of you. Come on, get in. Spade, I didn't kill Barco. Nobody said you did. Now, if you'll kindly get in the car and give me an address I want, and you know... We'll go see who did kill I.J. Barco. He gave me the address I wanted and said I was crazy. I told him why I wasn't, and he began to see the reason of it. Never have I gone to pick up a murderer with more distaste. When we knocked at the door, I had a gun in my hand. But it wasn't necessary. Oh, come in, Mr. Spade. I knew you'd be along sooner or later. I don't like what I have to do, Major. Major, it can't be true. It, it just can't be. Uh, come in, Gregory, my boy. Come in. A little Madeira first before we start to talk. Madeira? How can you talk about wine when a man's accusing you of murder? Oh, I don't think it's so unreasonable, Greg. After all, I did kill the unfortunate Mr. Barco. And this might be the last Madeira I shall ever have. Uh, Mr. Spade. Thank you, sir. Uh, Greg? I don't want any wine. Spade, he's out of his mind, and so are you. I'm afraid not, Greg. Oh, that was a vintage 1900 Madeira you wasted, Greg. Twice as old as you. Stop it, stop it. I'm I... sorry about what happened, Greg. I would have spared you and your sister this unhappiness if I could have. But destiny was against us all. You knew he was going to Miss Cameron's house, didn't you? Yes, just before I left for the bank with the weekly deposit, he called for Miss Cameron, and I took the call. I told him she was gone, and he said he was going to her house. It was to be an ultimatum, the money in 24 hours or exposure. But you, you didn't have to... Uh, kill to... him? Certainly not. It was a crime of passion. I take the weekly deposit to the bank every Friday, and I always carry a gun. Silly me carrying a gun. 
Never had to use it, but the bonding company requires I carry it. Well, I went directly from the bank to Miss Cameron's house. I wanted to help her face Barco. Was she there? Uh, oh, no, Mr. Spade. She'd apparently stopped downtown to do some shopping. So I faced Barco alone. I asked him point blank to give these young people more time, but he just laughed at me. He said the only time they'd get would be in jail, so... It happened. Well, I hadn't intended to, but I became angry. Suddenly found the gun in my hand, and the thought crossed my mind. My life is just about over. And yours, Greg, is just beginning. It was easier to pull the trigger than I would have realized. Oh, Lord. Uh, more Madeira, Mr. Spade. Thank you, Major, but no. Well, allow me to present the bottle to you as a gift. I'll get my hat and coat. Greg, my boy, I'm sorry. You're sorry. Major, I, I wish I'd never been born. <laughs> Period, end of report. Oh, Sam. I wish I hadn't either. Hadn't what? Been born. That poor, poor man. Yeah, sour racket. It is, it is. And poor Gregory. He'll have to go to jail for, for <laughs> something, too. He will, Eth. He will. How about typing it up? Well, I hate to, but I guess it's my duty. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial on this NBC station this evening as Archie the manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his remarkable friends serve up another blue plate special of grilled English language, fresh laughs, and whimsy a la mode. Another Friday fun favorite is The Delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as the beleaguered Chester A. Riley. <laughs> See. Uh huh. Murder is all in place. Gunshots indicated. Dundee's grammar edited. My astuteness emphasized. <laughs> yeah, you've learned your job well, Effie. Oh, I'm glad you're pleased, Sam. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's this? What? P.S. Dundee. Hands off Celeste Roberts. She's mine. Effie? What's the meaning of that? Well, well, you are going back to see her, aren't you? After the way she threw herself at you, no? Do you think she's my type of woman? Oh, Sam, I think every woman's your type. Every woman but me. Now, Effie, come here. <laughs> Would I have you working in this office if you weren't my type? Why, yes, not. Well, then let that thought be your comfort. The world can have all the Celeste Roberts it wants, as far as... Oh, I can't go through with it. You see... Sam, you can have her if you want to. But in the end, I know you'll come back to me. I never doubted it once. Oh, Sam. You don't know how much you mean to me. Yes, I do, Effie. Three weeks back salary. Oh, you... Uh, you. Uh, 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 uh. Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes and Dick Powell. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Hear the magnificent Montague, then visit Duffy's Tavern on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> Sam Spade, 
Hey, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart, bounce along space. Bounce along space. The only cowpoke in the West with so much daylight between him and his saddle, the California Limited can pass under without ever slackening speed. Oh. I'm rough and I'm tough and I'm ready, gal. I'll outshoot, outride, and I'll court any man in boots. Or barefooted either, as a matter of fact. Choose your weapon. What's come over you? Where have you been? Where the air is warm and the women are warmer, if in the end comes swift and sudden. Oh? I took Horace Greeley's advice, sweetheart. I went west. Where? With Sam. I mean, are we already done? I mean, Keep I your mean... reins tight, gal. I calculate to bowleg my way through the door, garbed in my 12-gallon hat, my buckskin shirt, my worn Levi's, and my twin six-guns with extra-large hammers. To dictate my report on the dry gulf taper. <laughs> or they went that away. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! Come here, prairie flower. Are you the new school marm? Oh, oh, oh. oh! What's happened to you, Sam? You're so strong, so, so, so virile. Virile? Not only that, so beat, Effie. So absolutely beat. Oh, is there anything I can get to? Uh, not unless you have an in at the local cushion factory. Shall we see? I'd like to get it over with. Painful. You mean it gives you a headache just to think of it? It's not my head that I was referring to. You ready, little partner? Oh. Ready, please. Date, fill it in to Lieutenant R.C. Halliday, robbery detail, San Francisco Police Department, City. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, a Wild West caper, or hop along Cassidy can have it. Dear Halliday, I should say at this very instant, I should be cramming for my entrance exams to the mission home for saddle store private detectives. But knowing how this report will tidy up your files, I shall proceed in a standing position. It was late yesterday afternoon when, for me, the bell tolled. That was when I first heard the pretty voice of the girl of the Golden West. Uh, Mr. Spade, you are Sam Spade, the detective. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, who... Uh, Mr. Spade, I'm calling about my grandfather. He... But you don't even know who I am, do you? I cannot tell a lie. I don't, ma'am. Uh, my name's Penny Brewster, and... I... Oh, I hope I can tell you the story before Grandfather comes to the phone. The story? Yes, you see. Oh, here he comes. Play along with him, Mr. Spade, please. And remember, you're not Sam Spade, the detective. Oh. You're Marshall Spade of the California Rangers. Marshall? Wait a minute. I... Yes, I... And you must look the part. In a I... blue serge suit? You'll think of something. I know you will. I've heard private detectives are terribly clever. Well, I... I... Marshall Spade? That's right. Buck Brewster talking. Yeah. Then he says you're the straightest shooting pokey since Billy the Kid. T-Rex? Huh? Oh, sure, sure. T-Rex, Buck. T-Rex. Claims you and a horse fly along like you was one. T-Rex? Buck, at one time or another, I've taken a flyer on every nag in the game. Trotters included. Then you're my man, Marshal. Get up here fast. This shooting's liable to start any minute. <laughs> we we have a bad connection on this phone. I thought you said the shooting's liable to start. I any... ain't got no time to waste on useless palaver, Spade. Just get up here. I'll paint the whole picture when I see you. Get up where? Where are you? Why, in Dry Goats. Where else would I be? Well, that's... Well, where is Dry Goats? Take the main trail north out of town till you spot the Oak Circle. Then bear right. Yeah? I'll go down now and leave a change amount to the circle. Uh, how far would you say this circle is from San Fran? Oh, about a half day's hard ride, I reckon. Half a day's hard... Uh, look, Buck, I, I don't think I'd better. I'm out of condition, you know. I haven't been riding lately. Oh, I... sure. That ain't what my purdy granddaughter tells me. Purdy, eh? Half a day's hard ride. About 20 miles, huh? I don't remember any time along there. Don't worry about the town, Marshal. It's here. Just get in your saddle and get to loping. You're sure there's a town there? Please, I ain't got time to argue geography with you. Now listen. Them $50 gold pieces clinking together, and I got a whole summer full of them. Are you coming up here? But tell them to take to the high hills. <laughs> Sam Spade rides again. <laughs> I 
I made two stops before I hailed a cab and told the startled driver to proceed north on the main trail out of town at a corner newsstand where I riffled through a Western story magazine to determine what the saddle and sagebrush set is wearing this season, and at the Hitch and Post costume shop where I donned what I thought was a rather colorful facsimile of the same. We drove out 101 at a smooth 55 for almost half an hour before I spotted a circular clump of trees, complete with horse. As we reared to a halt, the driver looked back at me and shook his head. I'm taking down your description, Buster, just in case they ask. Black 10-gallon hat, purple silk shirt, orange dang gold chest. Boy, I've seen everything now. You obviously aren't an Esquire man. Now, this wardrobe was personally endorsed by Mr. T. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you sure you want to get out here, Buster? At this very spot, Buster. But there ain't nothing here, but nothing. Wrong, my good man. For you, there is this. For me, yonder seed and the dusty trail on your right. Listen, journey back to the fort and keep an eye peeled for the Indians. A fruitcake. I've been hauling a fruitcake. He drove off and I staggered on the sides of my ankles toward the horse, the mount that Buck had left for me. Now, this ornery critter took one look at my costume, and as I swung up into the saddle, he shuddered, then closed his eyes, and bowed. Hey, wait for me, horse! Hey, horse! Horse! It was approximately seven miles later, and I was beginning to feel better because I was paralyzed from the waist down, that we flashed past a sign that read, Dry Gulf City Limits, Beware of Flying Lead. And then came Dry Gulf Copper, ramshackle buildings lined at solitary dusty streets, roofs sagging, walls leaning crazily inward. There wasn't a human being in sight. Dry Gulf was a ghost town. We clumped past the Golden Spur Cafe, Whitey's Tonsorial Parlor, the Lone Ace Gambling Casino, and Gurkin Saddle and Harness Shop, all deserted before my horse plowed to a halt in front of the Red Dog Saloon. I dismounted and hobbled in. Inside, the Red Dog was a spider's paradise. Cobwebs covered everything. A Jesse James Wanted poster tacked on a wall. An 1835 calendar bearing a picture of Sam Houston. Even a bottle of red eye standing on the bar. I was uh, washing the trail dust out of my throat when a familiar object on a shelf behind the bar caught my attention. I shoved the bottle hastily away from me and rapidly blinked my eyes. But what I'd seen was still there. A brand new oak tape television set. Uh -huh. And then somebody shoved another familiar object right into my ribs. For your sake, I hope you're Marshal Spade. The same, and also for my sake, I hope you don't have a nervous trigger finger. Mighty careless, Marshal, drinking with your back to the door. Let me look you over. Turn around. Uh, I said no. All right, Buck. Here we are. Well, why in tarnation are you rigged out like that? Well, perhaps these aren't my best colors, but, uh, oh... How about this shooting you spoke of? What's the trouble, Buck? Oh, it's that low-down snake, Blackie Tolliver, Marshal. Blackie Tolliver? Oh, you must have heard of Blackie. Yeah, this is him here. Blackie Tolliver, sought for the robbery of the Cattlemen's National Bank, Oklahoma City, June 25th, 1894. Mm-hmm. Mm, rough ornery, Cayuse. Cayuse. Mm. But he left. We crossed trails first when he pulled that job. Me being the sheriff in 94, it was up to me to chase him down. But he wrangled himself a pardon, slippery snake. And then? Well, four years later, I hit Tombstone, all trying to settle down. He had a little filly all picked out, but it never happened. What did? Oh, that creeping, crawling Blackie Tolliver, sweet talked her into leaving town with him. Your girl ran off with Blackie? To get hitched in Dawson City. Oh. Then he stranded her there, sick and broke. I burned the letter getting to her when I heard. But I was too late. Oh, I'm sorry, but but... That's a long time ago. Well, I vowed I'd get that sidewinder. I chased him all over the west. But if you couldn't catch him, then then three days ago I seen him again. Here in Dry Gulf? No, no, on TV. What? Yeah, some program was telecasting about a new bank opening in Frisco. Oh, no. 
And there, their biggest life was Blackie right on the TV. You could recognize him on television? Amazing. And you know what he was doing there, Marshal? What? Blackie Tolliver, who's held up more banks than I've got fingers and toes, was the guard in that bank. <laughs> you mean he pulled a switch, huh? Trailing with the law now. Quick as the TV was finished, I read him a letter. I challenged him to a shootout here in Dry Gulch where no one could interfere. And as soon as he's a shows up, I'm going to cut him down. Well, what makes you think he'll show? Well, two of his gang were skulking around yesterday looking to lay out for him. You mean two of his gang? How do you figure that? Well, it's simple. I sent him that letter when then they shows up. The first human to set foot in Dry Gulch in ten years. Yes, sir. Now, uh, if Blackie's got a gang, I might need some help, see? Uh, That's where you come in. If things get too rough, you're going to step in and swing the tide. Me? Why, I haven't swung a tide in years. Penny! Penny! A girl now entered the Red Dog. A girl, and I do not use the term loosely. Golden hair framed a face that belonged nowhere but on a ranch romantic cover. And her plaid shirt and jeans encased the sort of figure that lonely cowpokes dream of. The sort of figure, as a matter of fact, that lonely private detectives dream of, too. Now, this is my granddaughter, Penny, Marshal. Pretty as a new saddle, ain't she? Howdy, Marshal. I've heard a lot about you. So I've heard. Uh, show the marshal where he'll bed down, honey. And keep your eyes open, Spade. Them varmints are liable to strike any minute. Well, you can run along now. Okay, Buck, you'll uh, be here. Well, I wouldn't be nowhere else for the next half hour. Now, he's brush Sandy coming on. Sage brush Sandy? Yes, sir. The best thing that ever happened to TV. Oh, no. The greatest six jockey this side of the Pecos River. Now, if I can just find him. Now, we remove the tape from the oven. Now. Ready? Oh, dear, what a mess. Well, for a big substitute today. Dad rather cook an expert. Oh, Dixieland. Yeah, Dixieland. Musical murder, that's what it is. And San Francisco police have no clue to the whereabouts of two armed gunmen who late this afternoon forced the guard to open the doors of the Park State Bank and escape with a suitcase full of currency. Cooking at first, Dixieland bank robbers. Where in tarnation sage burst Sandy? You can't. Oh. And just listen to that record he's just spinning. <laughs> now that's real music. Now we must. Let's. I take it Sagebrush Sandy's program doesn't do anything for you? Well, let's say the fresh air does more. <laughs> I'm glad you stayed, Mr. Sage. For a minute, I was afraid you were leaving, Dry Gulf. Where were you? Outside the window you were trying to reach. You mean you heard all the things Buck said? Then? Uh-huh. We turn in here. Ah. Uh-huh. This is the Overland Hotel. Uh, you're not worried about your grandfather? Oh, no, Mr. Sage. There's nothing wrong with it. It's been like this ever since I can remember. Oh? Well, here you are. Not the fair amount, exactly. Oh, charming, charming. Uh, about Buck. Grandfather is a very old man who's trying desperately to live in the past. That's why he bought Dry Gulch. You mean he bought the whole town? Lock, stock, and barrel. It was, well, a dream he'd had for years come true. A chance to live out his life in the sort of surroundings he loved. And the uh, Blackie Tolliver, the demon bank robber who came back on television the other day. <laughs> I've heard about Blackie Tolliver since I was so high. The showdown with Blackie is all Grandfather talked about. And when it doesn't happen, there'll be no living with him. Unless he can be convinced Blackie was just too scared to face him. And I'm to convince him? Why me? Who could convince him easier than Marshal Spade of the California Rangers talking to him man to man? Oh, I see. Well, uh, look, I I can't take his money for this. Play it, James, for tonight. Tomorrow you can leave and forget the whole thing. You will help me. Won't you, Sam? Her face was only inches from mine and getting closer every second when the silence of dry ghost was shattered by shouts and the sound of pounding feet. I crossed the room and peered out in the twilight. A man was running from the Red Dog Saloon to the hotel. But nowhere near fast enough. All four of the shots that lanced out from the Red Dog caught him directly under my window. He staggered drunkenly and then fell face up in the street. 
I looked down at him, two thoughts were inescapable. A, his was the same face Buck had shown me on the poster, so there was a Blackie Tolliver. And B, whatever game Penny's grandfather was playing right now was apparently one he was playing for Pete. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Have you met our new baby yet? I mean, NBC's new baby, The Big Show. And what a baby it is. The biggest baby you ever heard. And he's not crying either. Why should he cry with stars like Tallulah Bankhead, Jimmy Durante, Clifton Webb, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, and a host of others to make him radio's greatest spectacle ever? This Sunday and every Sunday, meet The Big Show. An hour and a half of comedy, music, and drama. All this and Tallulah, too. No wonder it's The Big Show. And Sunday evening over most of these NBC stations also means Theater Guild on the air. Now back to the Dry Gulch Caper, or They Went That Away, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Blackie Tolliver was still alive but unconscious when Penny and I reached him moments later. His forced breathing was the only sound to be heard along Dry Gulch's single street. Wherever Buck had gone after the shooting, whatever he was doing, he was quiet as a mouse. I examined Blackie as best I could in the dusky light. He was wearing a Park State Bank guard uniform, and it was soaked with red. He needed medical attention fast. He died, and we'll call it murder, won't they? Let's not talk about that now. Won't they? What else could they call it? Like he didn't have a prayer. He isn't even carrying a gun. But grandfather just... Oh, Sam, what are we going to do? Right now, we're going to get Blackie to a hospital. That means we'll need horses and some help. There's no one to help us. Well, there's Buck. You saddle the horses, I'll find him. If we take him to a hospital, he still might die. And what are we gaining? But if we didn't, no one would ever know that grandfather... Penny. Oh. I'll saddle the horses. Sam, please don't hate me for what I was thinking. <laughs> I carried Blackie to the hotel porch and did what I could to make him comfortable. Then I started looking for Buck. Buck's TV set was still on when I reached the Red Dog, but it was playing to a dark, empty house. I turned away to continue my search, and then I stopped. The music tearing at my eardrums was pure Dixieland. Musical murder, as Buck called it. I checked my watch. 6.23. Only 23 minutes since Penny and I left the saloon. That meant sagebrush Sandy still had seven minutes to go. I could see Buck taking a powder after dropping Blackie, but I couldn't see him forsaking his beloved Sandy for Dixieland before he did it. I was wondering who had switched channels when I saw what I'd missed before. A sliver of light shining under a door at the back of the room. I cat-footed my way across the red dog and had almost reached the door when for the second time since my arrival in Dry Gulch, I felt a gun barrel pressed against my spine. Don't stop, Snoop. Just keep moving right on through the door. I'm sorry, sir. I can hardly hear you with that music. All right, so we can turn it off from you. Thank you. Thank you. Now? Now move. Well, you insist, but I can only stay a moment. Okay. What happened? I thought the population of this town was but one. So did I, Al. I got rid of the old timer, but on the way back, I ran into this G. Apparently, the census taker's overlooking him. Yeah, it only proves you can believe no man. We are given positive assurance the place is deserted, yet traffic suddenly becomes unbearable. Well, perhaps I was being over-friendly, gentlemen. We Westerners get carried away now and then. Now, if you'll excuse me... Oh, I'll... that's no... Yes, friend. You have just arrived. Well, really, boys, it's far past my usual bedtime. So you sleep in tomorrow. Sit down. Leave us chat. There were several things in that candlelit back room I could have chatted about. I could have told Al Perino, short, swarthy, and one of the best-known bank boys in the business, that I'd recognize him as soon as his friend herded me through the door. Or perhaps mention the currency stacked high on the table before him. Each packet held together by a paper binder with the words Park State Bank of San Francisco stamped very neatly on it. Now, 
Suppose you tell us about what you're snooping around for. Gentlemen, this is all a grievous misunderstanding. I merely happened by to remind you of the annual rodeo to be held at Devil's Elbow this coming Saturday. An innocent, friendly gesture. Tell us more. A most colorful event, the rodeo. Bronco busting, covered wagon races, wild steer roping, and anyone can enter. Now, perhaps you would be interested? Me? Why, I haven't roped a wild steer in almost a fortnight. Your friend, perhaps? Heaven alone knows how long I spent since I roped the steer. I busted a monkey. Well, it was just a thought. Goodbye. Hold it. Please. I'm most unhappy that we misjudge you, Fred. Oh, it's nothing. Every call can't be a happy one. You only make me feel worse. I feel we owe you something for at least thinking of us. Don't you, Corky? Yes, indeed, Al. Yes, indeed. I couldn't think of it. I'll uh, just run along. No, our minds are made up. Give it old Corky. I dove for him as the words left his mouth because I knew what they intended to give me. But I only got in one punch because Corky knew what Al was going to say before he said it. That gave him a slight advantage. And it was all he needed. When I came out of it, I was lying in total darkness. And I wasn't alone. Oh, that blasted varmint. She wouldn't like it loose and get my hands oh, on him. Oh, oh, oh. Varmint. Let me loose. Uh, just a minute, Buck. I'll uh, give you a hand. Uh, there you are. Hey, how'd they get you, Buck? Oh, I was watching the TV and I heard a car and then Blackie and them two that were skulking around yesterday they drove up and they walked right into the red dog as if they were him in the stairs. Who was carrying the suitcase? Blackie was. Uh, and the others was walking along behind him with their guns drawn, protecting him so I couldn't get to him. Uh, so I sneaked around to the front of the red dog, hoping I could surprise him. Well, it was me that got surprised, though. Well, what happened, Buck? Well, they was in the back room, and Blackie was hollering about a double cross and a fair cut. And that's their kind of talk. And then the door busted open, and he came a-tearing out across the room with that little critter right behind him. Well, that'll be Al Torino. He's the one who got Blackie. He what? Got Blackie. You mean that wall-eyed critter's been messing around my reign? Remember we heard on TV about the Park State Bank being knocked over? These yeah. are the boys who did it. Well, I'll be your... And Blackie was the hostage that announcer fellow was talking about. Uh -uh. He was the bank guard and they took him. No, no, Blackie was in it too, the inside man. He had to be. You think Blackie opened them doors for him without any persuasion, huh? I'll give you odds on it, Buck. And they didn't just happen to pick Dry Gulch as their hideout either. Blackie must have suggested it after you wrote and told him you were up here all along. You didn't know it, but you were handing him a perfect hideout. Yes, but why would one of his own gang drop Blackie? Perino and the other one apparently figured a lot of money for three it would be even more for two. Yeah, I guess. Hey, hey, listen to that. Oh. Them varmints are fixing to pull out. Come on, let's go get him. I'm right with you, Buck. Hey, hey, hold up. Hold up, you bushwhacking dudes. Hey. Oh, Dad Raddit, with too late, Marshal. There they go, tearing down the back road. Is there any way we can cut across country and head them off? Oh, uh, no, not a foot we can. And by the time we saddle up some ponies, they'll it be long. It pains me to even mention this, Buck, but I sent Penny to do just that some time ago. You did? Yeah. Well, what are we waiting for? We galloped up draws, down canyons, through streams, over cliffs, and across deserts. The only place on me that felt good was my head, where Corky had sat me. And finally, Buck, riding ahead of me, pulled his pony to a halt and waited for me to catch up. Somehow, I slid south off my horse's neck and was back in the saddle again when I drew abreast of him. Well, we ain't gonna have to trap them dudes after all, Marshal. Huh? No, Cripple Creek done it first. Cripple Creek? The driest creek in the West. It crosses the road up ahead of peace. <laughs> and right now, them critters is sitting hub deep in sand. Come on! Let's start riding circle. Riding circle? Indian style. Oh. Round and round the car till we pick them off. Oh, no, Buck. We're going to handle this my way. And it won't be on horseback. Here. What fancy plan have you got? None. It's very simple. We leave the horses right here. You get as close to them as you can along the road, and I'll circle around behind them. Now, don't show yourself until I go after them. You got it? Well, all right. But I still think circling's better. <laughs> I left him there and dodged from bush to boulder to tree, working my way to a position behind Al Torino and Corky. I had just reached a rock formation that overlooked the road right over their car and put my 38 out of its hiding place beneath the purple silk shirt when I realized that Buck wasn't going to do things anyway but his own. All right, you city-fied tow 
Make you say! You'll find her out! Buck stood in the headlight glare, crouched low, slightly behind Perino and his henchmen. His hands were an indistinct blur as Perino spun around, digging for his left arm tip. He was fast, but it's almost impossible to outdraw a man who uses a breakaway shoulder holster. I was on my feet running toward the car when Buck staggered backward, a look of surprise on his face, and then crumpled to the ground. I fired as I ran, and Crosby Turtle's face was still falling forward when Al Torino caught the last of my bullets and followed him down. I reached Buck and lifted him into a sitting position. His eyes were bewildered as he looked up at me. You got me, Marshal. Easy, easy, Buck. Now let's have a look. Oh. Here we are. Yeah. Oh, Buck, you were lucky. Just grazed a rib. You got me, Marshal. Yeah, I guess I'd better hang up my shooting irons and just concentrate on tending Penny. You know, Buck, I've been wondering how you wound up with a granddaughter anyway. If the filly Blackie ran off with meant so much to you, how could you... Marry up with somebody else? Oh, shucks, Marshal. (laughs) Penny's grandma was twice the woman that first one was. Best in the West. Well, then how come you held a grudge against Blackie all those years and wanted to shoot it out with him? Oh, I didn't really, but that is all. A man's got to have a little excitement in his life, don't he? Period. End of report. Sam. What a fantastic story. It is that if, it is that, but uh, go type it up anyhow. Are you sure you aren't making up the whole thing? For the doubting Thomases, I have a matched set of saddle scars to prove the truth of each and every statement. Oh, I think you'll wait for it. I'll, I'll type it up right away. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC later as Archie and his delightful friends cook up another mad and merry session at that remarkable restaurant, Duffy's Tavern. This Sunday, the big show comes your way again on NBC, the best in comedy, music, and drama, with unpredictable Tallulah as MC, Jimmy Durante, Clifton Webb, and many more. Here it is, Sam. Hmm. No questions? Well, one, if you don't mind. Ask, ask. Ask. Um, Blackie died, I suppose. Indeed not. He'll be up and in fine fettle by the time his trial rolls around. But you went galloping across the desert and forgot all about him. Who took care of him? The doctor. Who else? The doctor? Yeah. What doctor? In a great time? Oh, oh, besides forgetting Blackie, I also forgot there was a phone in Dry Gulf. That's how Penny contacted me in the first place, remember? And she called the doctor. Mm hmm. Mrs. Penny. Mm hmm. You, um, sort of liked her, didn't you, Sam? Oh, she was all right in a beautiful, gorgeous sort of way. Oh, I see. We uh, never did get to sit down and talk things over, Ask. In fact, I never got to sit down. I still have it. Poor Sam. It's like Mother says. We all have muscles that we're not accustomed to use. And then when we use them, they don't... They do indeed, oh, yes. Sam. Hmm. The things you have to do to make both ends meet. Oh, shut up. Come here. Oh, Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Wally Mayer was Buck. Script for tonight's adventure by Don Perry. Musical starring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Hear the magnificent Montague, then visit Duffy's Tavern on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. <laughs> what was that laugh? Uh, nothing. That was my teeth chattering. Oh, is it cold now? Out where I was, Effie, I've been swimming. In December? 
Oh, Sam, you caught a chill. That's true, Aunt. I caught a real Russian chill. They're not keeping San Francisco Bay as well heated as they might. The bay? <laughs> Sam, you were swimming in the... Where else, Aunt? But... Oh, Sam, you've been drinking. Only brine, Angel, and what kelp juice I could scavenge. Kelp juice? Oh, it was a taxing experience, Eph. A lesser man couldn't have come through it. <gasps> Lay out some dry clothes for me, mix me a hot grog, get out your pencil that writes underwater, and prepare to take down a narrative of international intrigue and espionage, which we will call, let's see, uh, the 25123-5679 caper. What? Or the Russian's number is up. NBC invites you to listen to the greatest private detective of them all as William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! Here I am, Sam. Mm. I was just calling the janitor to see if he could turn on some more heat so you could... Oh, you're not so very wet. Well, I had a dry martini on the way over. Dr. Ames called you a few hours ago. Dr. Oscar Ames. Did he? That was nice. He was worried about you. Mm-hmm. Wanted to know if you'd been found yet. He said you two were on a ferry boat, and that he just stepped in to have a cup of coffee, and when he came back... Yes, he... Effie, yes. Well, can't keep the FBI waiting. The, the FBI? Who well, else? You don't think I was playing around with kids on this caper? Oh, no, 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 Sam. I knew they were grown up. I'll take it down, then. In this one, your Uncle Sam was working for his Uncle Sam. They fill it in. To Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. Care of J. Edgar... Oh, no, that'd be too much. Well, why not? From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, Boris Kargaminsky. Uh, how do you spell that, Sam? Kargaminsky, K-A-R-G... No, I don't mean that. I mean Boris. Oh, I should have known. B-O-R-I-S. Dear sir, last night I let my secretary off at 5.30 so that she could go and do some Christmas shopping, although I've told her repeatedly that all I want this year is money. The fog was rolling in off the bay, and it was bitter cold as I came out onto the street, pulling my overcoat collar up around my ears. Seemed like the night for spaghetti. A wonderful spaghetti dinner and some pleasant Italian hospitality down at Mama Pizza's restaurant on the Embarcadero opposite the ferry building. So that's where I went. But Mama Pizza had more than hospitality on her mind when she met me at the door. Sam. Oh, I'm so glad to find you. I'm just calling your office. Well, what's the trouble, Mama? Someone been stealing ravioli? Please. It's my cousin, Tony. They tried to kill him. Oh, what happened, Mama? Come on, Sam. You eat with us. Ah. Our table. I make Tony tell you. He's gonna feel so good, but he can talk, all right. You're gonna see. <laughs> She led me to the back of the restaurant to the table where the family generally sits. Her daughters, Angelina and Patty, were there with plates of food in front of them. But they weren't eating any of it. They were staring in awe at the man who sat next to them. He was small to start with, but he was even smaller, hunched down in his chair miserably, staring, unseeing, into a glass of wine. On the table in front of him was a battered old concertina. The top of his head was swathed in a clean, new bandage. Sit down, Sam. No, sit no. down. This is my cousin, Tony Calucci. Tony, my good friend, Mr. Spade. Hello, Tony. Hello. Go on, Tony. You tell Sam what's happened on you. Sam, mm-hmm. you have your dinner at the same time. Yeah. Don't forget. Tonight, you're going to be my guest. What do you like to eat? No. Calapini, cacciatori? Well, I don't care, Mama. What's that on, the, on your plate, Angelina? You going to eat that? Well, pass it over, then. Waste not, want not. That's what I always say. Now, what happened on you, Tony? Well, I'm on the boat. Yeah, what boat? The ferry boat. Oakland ferry boat. Uh Don't you never hear my music on the boat? Ah, you play the concertina on the ferry ride. Sure, but no more. Hmm? Tonight on the six o'clock boat... Oh, boy. Tonight on the six o'clock boat, what? I'm a play inside the first by the sandwich place. Oh. And everybody say, oh boy, Tony, you good. You play good. Play some more. Mm. Ten cents a year, five cents, two quarters even. Mm. Then I go upstairs. Oh boy. Oh boy. And? Then I go out on the deck. It's a very misty, foggy, black. I can't see nothing. Now, I'm a very happy. I feel like I play some more. So I'm a walk away back and you know, up and down at the deck and I make a music. See, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden 
I hear somebody, some say something to me. I can't see nobody. But I hear him. What do you think he said to me? What? What? Cospedor. Cospedor? As in bar? Cospedor. Well. So I'm said back to him, Cospedor. I still can't see nobody. Then I hear him say, is that you play Boris? So I get mad. I say, no, I don't play Boris. I play Pagliacci. Tosca, Trovatore. But I don't play Boris. That's a foreign stuff. I see. Then, then... I'm, I'm sorry I say that because this fellow, he sounds like he's foreign. So I'm just going to say, look, mister. Oh, boy. What, Tony? What? Patron! I get a head on the hit on the head, the smash a pattern. I fall down, I'm a bleeding. I drop my concertina, my head's got a big hole on the top. I let out a big yell. Then I'm a blackout. Oh boy. People come running around and I go to the lock, there's a doctor on the board. They carry me down the stairs and he fix me up. Otherwise I'm a die for sure. Well, what did it feel like? What did he hit you with? Well, it feel like a baseball bat. My doctor is Oh, 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 look, here's the doctor now, just to come in. Hey, Doc! The doctor looked in our direction when Tony called and strode over to the table, a big six-foot-three blonde guy in the Joel McRae, Gary Cooper tradition. You had to like him right away. No bedside manner to this doctor, although he could have had as much of it as he liked. He was all business and no kidding. I thought I told you to go to bed and stay there. Well, Doc, I just well, you want... You may have a concussion, Tony. I'll be back here in an hour, and then we'll take some x-rays. My name is Sam Spade, doctor. I'm a friend of the family. Oh, Ames. Dr. Oscar Ames, how are you? Yeah. Dr. Ames, Mr. Can I get you something to eat? Tonight? No, thanks, Mama. Smells wonderful, but I haven't time. Oh, I'll have a cup of coffee, maybe. Sure. Oh. You want time to make a Tony go to bed? Yeah. Go on now, Tony. Go lie down. I'll be back, and we'll check you over. Get some rest in the meantime. All right, all right, my Dr. Ames. I don't know. X-rays, the whole thing. I don't know how I'm going to pay you. Never mind that. That's why we charge our Knob Hill patients a little extra, so we're able to do something like this once in a while. This will be on me, Tony. You're a good kind of man, doctor. I, I don't know what to say. You... you go on and lie down, Tony. You're embarrassing that doctor. All right, all right. Screwy thing, this one, isn't it, doctor? Sure is. Here's to your coffee. Oh, thanks, Mama. Yeah, sure is. Homicidal maniac, looks like, Mr. Spade. Oh. Spade? Sam's? Are you the detective? Yeah, that's right. Well, I know about you. You did something for a colleague of mine, Murphy. Dr. Raoul Murphy. Murphy, Murphy. Yeah, I did a job for him last summer. Yeah, he gave you a great send-off. He yeah. said, said, what is all this tonight down here? Detectives? Police? Police? How do you mean? Well, I think there were police. Five or six plain clothes guys. They were waiting here on this side when the ferry pulled into the slip. They're still there holding the boat. I just left them. Well, what were they doing? Talked to all the passengers as they came off. Asked us for identification. Mm-hmm. Hey, what do they think about Tony's little experience getting knocked on the head? Oh, they were mighty interested, naturally. Especially when I told them how I thought the wound had been inflicted. Which was? Gun butt. Gun butt, eh? Well, I'd say so. Lord knows I saw enough of those in the war. The Russians used to club prisoners over the head that way to save ammunition. Huh. And then fling the guys into the river. Oh, hey, I've got to go. Take that dreary ride again. What, the ferry? Yeah, I've got a patient over in Oakland. I had to come back over here to pick up some serum. Phoned my nurse, and she met me just out here. Well, nice to have seen you, Sam. Oh, tell, uh, what's his name, Tony. Hey, wait it? a minute, Doc. Mm-hmm. I, I've got nothing to do. I'll ride over with you. A little air won't do this dinner any harm. We crossed the street and went into the ferry building. Everything was normal enough in the main waiting room where I stopped to buy cigarettes and a pocket flashlight. But outside on the dock where the Oakland boat was waiting to take off, there were a number of extra characters whom you wouldn't think would have chosen a dismal, chilly night like this for waterfront lounging. There wasn't anybody I knew, and in any gathering of plain clothesmen, local variety, I generally spot one or two familiar faces. Dr. Ames and I got aboard, followed by three of these gentlemen. The broadest one, who was built for endurance, exchanged pleasantries with us as the boat moved out into the water. Hello, Dr. Ames. I see you didn't miss the boat, like the old saying. No. Oh, you're one of the fellows I talked to before when we landed. Yeah, that's right. I don't think I got your name. Connolly. Oh, Connolly, this is Mr. Spade. Yeah? Would that be Lieutenant Connolly or Sergeant, maybe? That's Connolly. No special title. How's the little fella doing, Doctor? Colucci? Tony? He's under care. 
He, uh, talk anymore? Say anything interesting? I didn't talk to him. Mr. Spade here did. Oh. Really? Really. What do you have to say? Well, you see, I'm an old friend of his family. What he told me was in confidence, and I'd really have to know a little more about who I'm telling his secrets to. I see. Spade, your name was? Still is. Nice to meet you, Gospadine. Gospadine? Means nothing to you, huh? It might. Gospadine sounds like another word. Somebody might think you said cuspidor. <laughs> That's very funny. Hey, uh, are you going to stay out here on deck? We haven't made up our minds. Is that okay? I ought to go inside, have a little coffee at the snack bar. It's comfortable. Ride's over before you know it. Out here it's foggy, wet, and miserable. Uh, well, I'm going in. I'll see you later. Goodbye, Doc. Well, maybe he's right, although I must say he's not my favorite man in the world, that Mr. Connolly. It is strictly pneumonia weather out here on deck. Shall we go in? Not just yet for me, Doctor. I think I'll stretch my legs a little. Doc, tell me, where was it that Tony got caught? On the upper deck, I know, but which side? Uh, we were turned around now. Uh, starboard. Just about directly above where we're standing. Yeah, right. Uh, 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 uh. Don't point, Doc. Our friend Connolly and his boys are on their way out to see us. Uh-uh. No, they went back in. Do you think they're as mysterious as they seem? Oh, definitely that. You know what made them turn back just now? Decide it wasn't necessary to check whether we were still here? No, what? They can't make us out out here. It's too dark. But they can see two lighted cigarettes. Sam Spade detected. Mm-hmm. Look, even in the face of pneumonia, you want to get up there and look around where Tony was, don't you? I do. Well, then hand me your cigarette, and I'll smoke them both a yard apart, and we'll both be here. Except you. Oscar Ames, M.D. Masterful thinking, Doc. Go ahead, I'll be here. So I trod the slippery stairs to the upper deck. The fog was as wet as rain. I couldn't see any more than inches ahead of me with my flashlight. Finally, I stopped about a midship and looked down over the rail. Ames and his two cigarettes, tiny red dots of light that grew brighter every now and then as he puffed at them, were almost directly beneath me, so I knew I was just about right. A sudden noise over my head made me shoot my light up toward it. It came from a piece of canvas that had suddenly ripped loose, the canvas that covered the top of a lifeboat. I got up there somehow and perched precariously, holding onto two steel supports with one arm. The piece of canvas had been ripped open with a knife, a hole large enough for a man's body to get through. And that's what was in there, sprawled in the bottom of the lifeboat. A man's body. He'd been stabbed in the neck. This was the man who had slugged Tony. Or so it seemed, because the gun was still clenched in his right hand, barrel reversed. There was nothing in his pockets, just a handkerchief and two dollars in change. But my flash caught a speck of something white in one of his shoes. It was a bit of paper with two typewritten lines on it. I let myself down to the deck, rubbed the circulation back into my arm where I'd been holding on, and prepared to read the note. And that's when my flashlight went dead. I groped about, cursing them for not checking their batteries until I found a faint, ghostly glimmer of light overhead, out over the edge of the ship on the outside of the rail. I climbed over, steadied myself against lurching, and lit a couple of matches. It said, International Postcard Shop, Geary Street, SF. Greeting card for Boris. I put the bit of paper in my pocket and turned to climb back over the rail. And then something came at me from the flat. It caught me full in the center of the forehead. And as I staggered, came again like a block of wood right on the top of my head. It made it burn with sudden fire. Tiny points of light glittered in the blackness came rushing toward me and grew larger, and I fell crashing over the side. <laughs> they tell you a lot about what you remember when you're going down for the third time. You know what I remembered? I remembered that Gusped Yin is Russian for comrade. Sam Spade, detective. <laughs> You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Imagine the greatest names in stage, screen, and radio. People like Bob Hope, Rosalind Russell, Meredith Wilson, Frankie Lane, and many, many others. Imagine an hour and a half of the very finest in comedy, music, and drama. Imagine all this rolled into one wonderful program, presided over by the distaff dynamo, Tallulah Bankhead. 
Well, NBC has the program. It's the big show, heard every Sunday night over most of these stations. All this and Tallulah, too. No wonder it's the big show. And Sunday evening also means Theater Guild on the air. This Sunday, Theater Guild presents Boomerang, starring Kirk Douglas. And now back to the 25123-5679 caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I found myself mechanically keeping afloat somehow and trying to get out of my overcoat. My eyes burned. I felt heavy and logged, as if I'd swallowed gallons of water. My head began to clear a little, but with returning consciousness came increased pain. Pretty bad, too. From out of the misty blanket, from every direction, in a dozen different keys, from near and far, foghorn sounded. I knew that by now the current had swept me out of the path of the Oakland ferries. The water was chilling me. I turned over and began swimming, just hard enough to keep the blood circulating. The lights of a boat came into sight suddenly, and I threw back my head and yelled. But the horn crying its warning drowned me out, and the boat went on, and the fog closed in behind me. And then I found myself full of a strange and wonderful weariness. The water wasn't cold anymore. I was warm with a comfortable, soothing numbness, and I knew what to do. I'd swim until I didn't hear the noise of the horns anymore, and then in the quiet of the friendly fog, go to sleep. So I began to doze. And then some lights came out of my eyes, and I wanted to stay in the dark, and I turned my face down into the embrace of the water. And then I, I wasn't where you'd expect at all. I was lying on a baggage truck that was moving. People were crowding around, walking beside the truck, staring at me. The guy in uniform, wheeling me, noticed I had my eyes open. Well, hello, pal. Welcome back to the United States. Hello, what part of the United States? Just landing in Sausalito. Uh, Lay still. We'll take you over to the hospital. Sausalito. How long before this boat gets back to San Francisco? Right away. Well, I'll tell you, I'm going with Hey, wait, sir. You ain't in no condition. Thanks, I'll be okay. Half an hour later, shivering and shaking in my wet clothes, keeping my mouth clamped tight so my teeth wouldn't sound like a dice game, I climbed into a taxi at the ferry building and went to my apartment. There I swallowed half a pint of whiskey and rubbed myself with a coarse towel until my skin was sore. Then I looked in the pocket of the soggy suit I'd hung up to dry. It was still there, a piece of paper from the dead man's shoe, damp but legible. International Postcard Shop, Geary Street, SF. Greeting card for Boris. I got up to put on a dry suit and then changed my mind. Put the wet one back on. Good evening. Good evening. Are you the proprietor here? Yes, that's right, sir. Six years at the same location. Mm. Oh, you, uh... My goodness, is it raining out? You really got... Ah, uh, to... dowsing? Yes, I did. Nice collection of postcards from all over, eh? Yes. South America, every place. Yes, mm. yes. I pride myself on having the most complete possible selection... Uh, was there something you had especially in mind? Yes, there was. Oh? I'm looking for a greeting card for Boris. You... <clears throat> What's the matter? Didn't you hear me? Uh, yes. Didn't you understand? Well, I... Well, what? It's only that I didn't exactly expect somebody like you. What I did you expect? expect? Somebody slinking around in a false mustache, wearing dark glasses and an Inverness cape? No, I... You know, I... you know, with your type of thinking, you may not be the right man for this job, Gaspagian. Now, now, wait, please, Mr. Luboff. I, I thought you were dead. You drowned. Yeah, who told you that? Well, you know. Yeah, well, I didn't drown. I jumped in the water when I heard him coming. You can see how wet I still am. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, so you escaped. Easily. Enough talk. Hand it over. The greeting card for Boris. Uh, very well. Let's see. That's San Francisco, of course. <laughs> He turned and reached down onto the counter. I slipped my hand under my armpit and held my thirty-eight ready in case he came up with something similar. But all he brought forth was a box marked special. On this, he expected something and handed it to me. I took it with a knowing expression on my face, but I didn't know from nothing as to what it meant. All it was was an ordinary postcard, that's all. A picture postcard showing the Golden Gate Bridge. Underneath it, the caption, 
Wonder Cities of the World, number 25, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, San Francisco. Nothing else. I was afraid my mouth was open. What's the matter? Matter? Don't you know how to read the name? It's so difficult, of course. Idiot, certainly I know how. I was just admiring the work, that's all. Oh, it is excellent, isn't it? Yeah. Look, you'd better go now. You've been in here an awfully long time. We don't want no, to... No, of course we don't. I'll go, Vespadian. Vespadian, I'm sorry to have been overly cautious. There is no such thing as over-caution. Yes. Thank you. You were so... Well, you seem like an American. So do you. <laughs> I strode out onto the street, clutching my postcard, but I shoved it inside my sleeve a moment later because who I saw standing under the misty glimmer of a streetlight waiting for me was my heavy-set, mysterious friend from the ferry boat, Connolly. I turned my head around and glanced down the other end of the block behind me. Two other guys were there, sure enough. And they advanced slowly toward me with their hands raised, palms out, as if they were showing me they weren't carrying guns. I reached my hand inside for mine all the same. But I never got to use it because Connolly rushed me from the other side. I, uh, I caught him on the chin and he went down, clattering into an ash can. The other two boys grabbed me and held my arms behind me. Connolly got up, rubbing his face, and I waited to get murdered. But no. All right, Joe Lewis. Bring him along. And so they did. We didn't go far, though, just around the corner to a little hamburger place that had a sign on the door saying closed, although there were lights inside. Connolly knocked on the door, and a fellow with an apron came and opened it and locked it after us. Connolly gave him a nod, and we sat down at a table while he brought us coffee. Spade, we've checked on you. You seem to be okay. You stand in good with the department, friend. What department would that be, friend? This department. Hmm? F-B-I. Oh, ho! Now, maybe you can help. Anyhow, we don't want you going around making a noise and messing it up for us, so here it is. I'm all ears. Did you ever hear of a man called Boris Kargaminsky? No. Well, not many people have, even in Russia. Boris Kargaminsky is the top Soviet agent in America. He's the head man. He organizes and runs everything for them here. I see. Now, he came to this country seven years ago and vanished. We've been trying to find him ever since. False passport, of course. That didn't help. There's nothing anywhere on Kargaminsky. No pictures, not even in Russia. No fingerprints, nothing. Every lead we had, dead end. And then we got word last week... Go ahead, drink your coffee. Oh, I'm too interested. We got word last week that another agent, an unimportant little guy named Lyubov, was on his way to San Francisco and that he would definitely have to contact the big gun. Hmm. Something to do with the Chinese war business that only Kargaminsky is big enough to handle. Well, our man tailed Lyubov all the way out here and then he lost him. The Oakland Ferry. Hmm. That didn't bother us very much. He called us, and we were waiting on this end. But in pulls the ferry, and no Lubov. Lubov was a dead man in the lifeboat. Right. He must have been up there waiting to be contacted. Yeah, then he heard Tony and his concertina, thought this might be it. And then when he realized he'd made a mistake and uncovered himself, he conked Tony on the head. Right. Yeah. And his Soviet contact got scared of investigations on the boat following Tony's hue and cry and stabbed Lubov. So, now we're back where we started. Every passenger on that ferry was okay. What's that you're looking at? Picture postcard. Found a message on Lubov about the International Postcard Shop and a greeting for... Hey. Hey, a greeting for Boris. Boris Kargaminsky. Now, let me see that. I bulldozed the guy in the shop to let me have it. Looks like nothing. It's just a picture. But he said he... He said I could read the name. Give me it. Golden Gate. No. Well, these numbers. Wonder Cities of the World. Number 25123-5679. Hey, wait a minute. What? They print out the guy's name, Boris. All right. B O R I S. Leave a space. K A R G A M E N S K Y. Now put numbers. Uh, oh, wait a minute. The top number is nine. Yeah. All right. Put uh, one, two, three, four, five over Boris, and then start again. One, uh -huh. two, three, up to nine over Kargaminsky. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Now what's the postcard? Two, five. One, two, three, five, six, seven, nine. Okay. What's two? Two. Two is uh. O oh, five, S O oh, S. Now Kargaminsky. One, uh, K two three, A R O S K A R. Well, well, I guess we know the rest of it. Five six seven nine A M E S. Correct. Correct. Oscar Ames. Doctor Oscar Ames. Hmm. What? I was just thinking. He was worried about me catching pneumonia. <laughs> I 
I called Mama Pizza, and from what she said, we knew where to go. We picked him up at the emergency hospital. He was just finishing the operation on Tony's head. We watched him through the glass, and the other young doctor standing alongside us said he was one of the greatest surgeons they'd ever seen. When he unrolled his gloves and took off his operating mask, he looked up and saw me, alive, and the other boys with me. His scalp tightened for just a second, and then he smiled. It was when he reached into his bag that we rushed him, before he could get the little red bottle to his lips. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam. A spy story. Yes, it was, Eff. Everything. A, a chase and being thrown in the water and mysterious people and, and a cold message. I'm glad it kept you awake, Angel. Sam. Hmm? What is it like not to want to be in America? Not to want to live the way we do in America. Well, I can't imagine, sweetheart. I can't eat. Sam, about Dr. Ames. Yeah? Do you think that, um... I mean, the way you described him, Earl, do you think you made him sound too sympathetic? Oh, I described him as he was, that's all. But will anybody think that, uh, well, you know, he, he was attractive. But you missed the whole point, didn't you? Spies don't go around wearing monocles and talking with heavy accents and acting like spies, not the good ones. It's the attractive, lovable, trustworthy strangers that are dangerous. Now, if you'd met Dr. Ames at a party somewhere, you'd be out with him at a nightclub right now, cooing over a drink and giving him the plans for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Sometimes don't I can't... Don't get mad, Sam! I don't even know where Brooklyn is. Lucky for our side. You don't hate me, do you, Sam? Oh, come here. Oh. Well, does that answer your question? Completely. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by William Spear. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC later as Archie the manager and his delightful friends cook up another mad and merry session at that remarkable restaurant, Duffy's Tavern. This Sunday, the big show comes your way on NBC again, an hour and a half of the best in comedy, music, and drama, with guests Bob Hope, Martin and Lewis, Rosalind Russell, Frankie Lane, and unpredictable Tallulah as MC. Go ahead, tell them about The Thing. Oh, yes, Sam Spade and Effie asked me to remind you about The Thing. The Thing for Kids for Christmas. You know, The Thing can be anything you think an underprivileged child would like for Christmas. In your town, there are civic groups who are cooperating with this Thing for Kids campaign. Send your new or used toys to the collection centers in your town and help make some child's Christmas brighter. It'll make you happier, too. Thank you. again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Enjoy the magnificent Montague, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC. Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Merry 29th of December. You too, Sam. Did you take the little boy home? Yep. Straight home? Well, not exactly, F. Had to make a couple of emergency stops, but we got there. What do you mean, Sam? Well, I got my weekly nod on the head, for one thing. Sam, just taking the little boy home? Like I said, F, we were derailed. There was a dash of poison, for instance. A couple of pounds of thousand-buck notes. And an infernal machine that nearly blew up half the mission district. But other than that, we had a peaceful ride home. Why, Sam, this sounds like a cheap 
Burr. Which is just what it is, Angel. Get out our special holiday bottle of Napa Valley wine, and we'll get in our premature regards to the new year, following dictation of a report entitled, The Prodigal... Prodigal, uh... Sam? Are you sure that's the right word? Certainly, I'm sure. The wanderer will return to the roost. You and your big, fat roost. With our last bedtime story for 1950, namely, The Prodigal Panda Caper. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie, Miss Perrine. Oh, coming, Sam, coming. Oh. I've been looking in the dictionary. Oh? Sam, you've fallen into the trap. Again? Prodigal. Here, now, see? Prodigal. Oh. Given to reckless extravagance. It doesn't mean wandering at all, see? Now, people think just because the prodigal son wandered that just... What are we talking about? Well, the prodigal panda caper. How can a panda be given to reckless extravagance? Well, let me see. Hmm. Oh, here. Definition three. Prodigal. Yielding abundantly. Luxuriant. A panda? You mean one of those black and white... You're right, oh, my... right. See note below, it says. You ready for the note below? Where's my pencil? Mm. Oh, all right, Sam. Okay, fill in it. Two. Master Roebuck Dozier, 2318 Delaney Street, City. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the, the prodigal... prodigal panda, panda caper. Right. <laughs> Dear Roby, I'd spent a relatively pleasant day running down a case of slow pay in North Beach and flushed with success had returned to my office for a final check of the file. Underwood, Helen, Usher, Roderick, Varden, Dolly. Where are the... Oh, Spirit's Holiday. Yes. <sighs> I sat down, put my hat and my feet on the desk, and was loosening my collar when I noticed just to the right of my off ankle one large bag of jelly beans. Sighting past it, I saw in the corner chair an open copy of a magazine featuring on the cover a blonde in a low-cut dress taking a 38 slug from a slack-jawed thug in the background under big red letters spelling out thrilling crime comics. And behind all this, sound asleep, was you. Hey, hey, Sonny. Sonny. Hey. Hey, wake up, will you? Come on, Revely's blowing. Huh? Oh. Hi, hi. How long you been here? Oh, a long time, I guess. What's your name? Roby. Short for Roebuck. Well, what can I do for you, Roby? Well, I've been to the police. They wouldn't do anything. They said I should come to you. You mean you got a job for me? Yeah. Dangerous? Yeah. A hoist. You mean a heist. What was it? My panda bear. Oh, someone stole it? Yeah. It's not mine, really. I bought it for my little brother, Barney. Mm -hmm. He's five and he's always wanted one. So when I got the junk money, I junk went... Junk money? Oh, bottles and papers and stuff. Oh. I collected it from the neighbors and earned six stars and 15 cents. And Barney wanted the panda bear, so I bought it at Lacey's department store today, and they stole it. Who stole it? Well, there was this man in the checkered coat and the lady in the red silk dress, uh -huh. just like the story in the comic here. Oh. The man looked like that, but the lady looked different. Mm -hmm. She had black hair and a red dress. And her eyebrows went up this way instead of sideways. Oh. I was walking down the street with my panda bear, and the lady called me over to a car she was sitting in and started to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And right away, the man in the checkered coat ran up and grabbed at my panda bear, and they chased me up a fire escape. And the man pulled out a big black gun and said if I didn't come down and give him the panda, he'd shoot me and Barney and Mom. So I came down and gave him the panda. Well, that's quite a mouthful. Oh, excuse me, Roby. Hello? Sam? Yeah, Dundee. This is Dundee. Oh. Sam, there's a little fella about eight years old on his way over there. No, he's here now, Lieutenant. What's the deal? Uh, he gave us quite a story. Well, how'd it go? Oh, we took it down. I got it right here Good. somewhere. Let me see. It's about a man in a checkered coat and a lady in a red silk dress. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Quote, I was walking down the street with my panda bear, and the lady called me over to her car. She okay, was... Dundee. He hasn't changed it any. Yeah, we got hold of his mother... Runs an elevator in the Rust Building. Good. She says he reads too many comic books. You better send him home. Okay, Lieutenant, thanks. Come on, Roby. You gonna send me home? Lieutenant Dundee called your mother, old man, and You he... don't believe me either. Oh, it's not that, Roby. It's just But that... I can't go home without the panda beer. What do I tell Barney? I promised him. My own brother. Oh, 
And he's home now, waiting? Yeah. Well, tell you what I'll do, Roby. You let me put you in a taxi and send you home, and I'll take the case. You'll get my panda back? It wouldn't be at all surprised. So if Barney's face hits the floor, just tell him Samuel Spade Incorporated is working on it. Only one thing. Huh? I haven't any money left. Oh, you got jelly beans, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, you can pay me off in jelly beans. Now, come on now, let's find a taxi. Which we did, Roby. Like the psychology books said, I didn't discourage the child imagination, but I did try to tout you off thrilling crime comics and onto Alice in Wonderland. This, I could see, would take some doing. It was almost closing time when I got to Lacey's, but I talked my way past the man at the door and hustled up to the sixth floor and the toy department. The clerks were doing whatever clerks do at 5.30, but I found a handy floor walker. Dear me, Mr. Spade, I just don't know. I just don't know. You mean you counted your cash and everything, but you oh, can't... it's not that, Mr. Spade. Oh. I am perfectly willing to uh, stretch a point to please the little fellow. Uh-huh. We, uh, <laughs> we like to think we are human here, you know. Well, that's nice. That uh, you like to think so, I mean. But you see, something very strange happened this afternoon. Uh, come over this way, sir, by the escalator. Oh. We had the giant pandas at uh, this counter here. Twenty-five of the large size. I assume that's what you're interested in. I guess so. Then what then? Well, for Christmas, they didn't do anything. Just sat here, huh? Yes. Mm. But would you believe it, sir? This afternoon, all 25 were sold. Well, how do you account for that? New Year's gaiety? Well, if you want my personal opinion, it's Miss Greenbrier, the new girl who came to work yesterday. She is uh, endowed with... uh... I know just what it takes to sell pandas. Well, uh, how about the junior model? Uh, Medium. Yes, now, let me see. There were a few under the counter here. Good. Where? What? I was wrong. Here is a big one. Well, lucky me. How much? $5.79 plus tax. I'll uh, make the slip out and uh, you can get your change over the big... An impressive panda bear, Roby. It was hard to figure out how you could lose anything that big and harder still to figure out how I'd explain this kind of thing to people who stopped me on Market Street. Be that as it may, my floor walker friend took my cash, tore off the sail slip, and I was about to set sail with my panda when I heard him make the kind of a noise floor workers make when they see what he was looking at. Uh, Miss... Miss Greenbar... Miss Greenbar... uh She pointed weakly, turned pale even by floor walker standards, and sagged to the deck. I turned in time to see Miss Greenbrier collapse at the top of the escalator and watched her come down, draped across three steps like the cover of one of your books of bedtime stories, Roby. She was the last passenger of the day, or so I thought. When I looked closer, I saw she wasn't the passenger. She was freight. At the lamp counter on the floor above, busily adding up receipts as if nothing had happened, was a dark type built along dragon lady lines. Be closed, promptly, I want to know about the girl who just went down the escalator. Miss Greenbrier? Yeah, notice anything strange about her? Why, is she ill? Yeah, did she look ill? I thought there must have been something wrong. I said hello to her and she didn't pay any attention to me. It was only a second ago. Where'd she come from? Uh, around the corner. I think she'd been at the wrapping desk. She had. It was a ten-sized sheet of heavy brown paper, a batch of metered postage tape, and a shipping label addressed to Master Frankie Carson. 281 Avenida Ruiz, Havana, Cuba. Downstairs, I found my floor walker friend had come around and was bending over Miss Greenbrier with an impressive-looking gent with gray at the temples. Good heavens, it can't be. It just cannot be, that's all. I'm afraid she is, though. In laces, it's, it's unheard of. Why should she be... Good heavens, in my department, too. Excuse me, floor walker. Hmm? Oh, uh, 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 this is Mr. Spade. He was with me when it... Oh, dear. I'm uh, Dr. Kempthorne. I was exchanging some Christmas gifts when... Any idea what killed her? Well, it's pretty hard to tell without an examination, and I don't have my things with me. Heart, possibly. Natural causes? Well, well, of course. Why, do you have reason... There are more natural places to die than at the top of an escalator. And in my department at Lacey's, too. Good heaven. Well, who can say? Have to look up the girl's history. If she had a heart condition, well... Sure, sure. Meanwhile, I'll call homicide. They've nothing better to do. For a minute, I thought I'd been reading too many comic books, Roby, but things settled down when they pulled out the records and found Miss Greenbrier had had a heart condition of long standing. And the medical examiner wrote it off as natural causes. So hoping you would consider a jelly bean bonus for promptness, I picked up my panda and went. Outside, I'd gone about ten steps when... 
Oh. Hi, Humphrey. <laughs> it was Larry Healy, the cop who drives for oh, no. Lieutenant Dundee, sitting in a patrol car. Oh, you and Bogart. Now, who's it for? A little kid in the mission. Uh, how come? What do you mean, how come? I'm buying a panda bear for a little kid in the mission who likes panda bears. Does that have to be explained? <laughs> okay, Sam. Okay, okay. Hey, it just hit me. The bear ain't turned out quite right. He needs a necktie. Oh? I just happen to have one here my brother-in-law got me for Christmas. Here, give me. Uh, now, let's see. Sure, yeah. Ooh. Uh. Larry, Larry, how long has there been bad blood between you and your brother-in-law? Bad blood? Listen, even when we were friends, he gave me ties like this. <laughs> there. There you are. On your way, Sam. Thanks, thanks. Taxi! Taxi! <laughs> cab let me out near the end of Delaney, and I started walking up the row of dingy pre-earthquake flats towards your house, Roby, at the end of the street. Parked at the curb was a discordant note in this hard-pressed neighborhood, a sleek, custom-built red convertible, one of the kind that looks like it can go 90 miles an hour standing still. The same can be said for the dame in it, also a discordant note. You see, San Francisco is a very big, large city. You just don't run into a dame at the lamp counter in Lacey's and a half hour later in a dumpy neighborhood in the Mission, unless she wants it that way. Well, hello. Hello, dragon lady. Oh, silly. You, uh, you must sell a pass on the lamps. The car? Mm-hmm. But uh, don't try and explain that now. Just tell me why you followed my cab. Follow you? Why, Mr. Stewart? Come on, come on, what is it? You're embarrassing me. I know. Since that moment at the lamp counter, you can't get me out of your mind. Well, that's a perfectly normal reaction. No, no, but... it's not that. It's... Oh, dear. The panda bear. You want it in the worst way. <laughs> oh. You're kind of attractive as men go, Mr. Spade. Could you give me a light, please? Sure. Holding the match up to her cigarette, three things hit me. The black hair, the red dress and eyebrows that went up instead of sideways. At that point, the sleeve of a checkered overcoat with a big arm inside it came around under my chin from the rear, and the fourth thing hit me. How long I dwelled in Panda Land, I don't know, but it was real nice while it lasted. I was a panda, too, I remember, and I was going somewhere with a big overstuffed private detective under my arm when a lady panda batted her big brown eyes at me and began pulling my nose. She seemed to have a very, very high voice. Wake up, Mr. Spade. Raffle is blowing. Oh. I call Lieutenant Dunley, Mr. Spade. Sound is way... Lucky. Hey. Over here. Good, Christopher Sam. What happened? Well, well, it was this way, Dundee. I was walking down the street with my panda bear, and the lady called me over to the car she was sitting in and started to talk to me. And right away, the man in the checkered coat up... You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Van Heflin stars this Sunday in State Fair, another outstanding 60-minute production by Theater Guild on the air. Co-starring in this exciting broadcast is one of the leading families in show business, Jean Lockhart, Kathleen Lockhart, and daughter June. It's a gala New Year's Eve broadcast when Theater Guild presents State Fair. Sunday over most of these NBC stations also means another hour and a half with Tallulah Bankhead in radio's greatest spectacle, The Big Show. Among Tallulah's guests will be Ken Murray, Gloria Swanson, Margaret O'Brien, Jose Ferrer, and many more. <laughs> Now back to the prodigal panda caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. It was a humiliating experience, Robey, riding back to headquarters in black defeat. A dear, good Lieutenant Dundee, however, with the soul of patience and understanding. What do you take me for, Spade, an idiot? Look, Dundee, all I want you to understand is that this dame and the hopped-up convertible... I've had three rides on that merry-go-round now, and I'm sick of it. The dame in the red dress and the guy in the checkered coat. They take your wallet? No. Your watch? Other valuables? No. Just my panda. Sam, are you trying to tell me there's a hot panda racket going on? Dundee, boy... 
Look closely now as I take off my hat. What? There. See? Now, as you know, my head ordinarily does not come to a point. But this protuberance was made by a gun butt, not by imagination. So someone slugged you. I believe that, Sam. But this panda bear thing... Mm. Dundee. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. You were saying something about my panda bear, Dundee. Yeah, maybe I ought to take it back. That dame at the store this afternoon, the one who sold him? Miss Greenbrier. Yeah. Mm. I just finished the postmortem. No heart attack. She was poisoned. <laughs> It's a strange thing, Mr. Spade, very strange. I leave my business thoughts at the store. Floor Walker, just try and remember the dragon lady's name, huh? Dragon lady. My good gracious, I, I can't remember my own name. I'm so upset. Oh, now concentrate now. Look, dark hair, up-tilted eyebrows, red silk dress. Works in lamp department on seventh floor. I can picture her so plainly. Mm, dark hair, Floor Walker. Dark hair. Upshot eyebrows. Eyebrows and the red dress. Yes. Red, yes. red, red. Scarlet. Scarlet. Scarlet, that's it. Easy now. I got a list of employees right here. I'll tell you. Scarlet, Scarlet, Scarlet. Uh, Scarlet Townsend. Scarlet Townsend. That's the dame. Floor Walker. <laughs> Scarlett Townsend! Yeah, she lives here, right in this room. Move out! Good day! Well, how come? Huh? I said, how come, landlady? Why'd she move? Me! Oh! I tried to keep her on the right track, but at her age, you can't tell her nothing. So when she bring that no good thing around here, I put my foot down. I said, Scarlett, I said, I said, Scarlett, I said, you're What's out. no good day? What no good dame, landlady? Crystal McCall. Oh. Here. I found this just now as I was cleaning the room. Picture of Crystal McCall. Now, ain't that a swell way to have your picture taken? The name rang a bell, and so did the picture. Crystal herself and they all together. When I got around to the face, I made a startling discovery. Crystal was also the late Miss Greenbrier. Well, don't look at it all day, young man. When did you see this girl last, line, lady? This morning. Oh. She and a fella in a checkered coat come around to pick up Scarlet in a big red open car. Know the fella? Nope, never saw him before. But I'd sure know that car. Oh, oh you ought to see it. You're not telling oh, me a God. thing, landlady. I have. <laughs> In Los Angeles, I'd have been dead, but San Francisco is not a convertible town. I found a free phone and began calling the dealers, figuring a bright red custom-built convertible is something you remember, whether you see it or sell it. An hour of this got me nowhere, and I'd begun to wonder if the car had been smuggled up from the unmentionable side of the Tehachapi when the wind changed. Sold the yellow one a while back. Thanks, but near misses don't count for anything. But the buyer had it painted red. Special job. Well, you're improving. Who's the buyer? Kim Thorne. Dr. Kim Thorne? Right. Dr. Jules Kim Thorne. Lives on Motley Drive and Bulling Game. That's the only red one I know. Great. That's the only red one I need. <laughs> Mr. Spade, this is utterly unbelievable. And I certainly don't intend to stand here all night discussing the pros and cons of panda bears. All right, Kim Thorne, let's slide over into your field. Meaning what? The sweet young thing at the store. It turned out dirty. The heart attack? The poison attack. Well, suicide, you suppose? What do you suppose? Well, I'm sure I don't know. Look, why don't we hold hands and tell the truth, huh? You'd better run along, Spade. I've had about all of this that I intended... Look, the dead dame was Crystal McCall. Does that mean anything to you? No. The same Crystal McCall was running around with a hood named Frankie Casella, formerly of New York, now of Havana, by Department of Justice request. This is all very interesting. What has it to do with me? She was riding around in your red convertible this morning, for one thing. That's a hot car, you know. I took a close look at it two hours ago and got slugged. I don't know how you score these things, Kim Thorne, but in my book, this calls for a couple of answers. You're right. 
You're right, it does. Where's the car? It's gone. Who has it? My chauffeur. This is the last straw, I guess. There's no point in covering up for him any longer. Who is he? Lenny Flegel. Oh, an ex-con, isn't he? Yes. I thought I could straighten him out. He's been missing for two days this time. He just took the car and left. I knew he had something to do with that girl in the toy department at Lacey's, so I went there today. I guess I was too late. You think Flegel killed her? I don't know. I don't know. Where, uh, where did you see the car? Near the end of Delaney Street. What's the license number? 49H822. Oh. oh. I'd better report stolen. If you need me to testify, please... Feel uh... free to call. That I will, Dr. Ken Thorne. Bye. <laughs> What I had in mind, of course, was to call Lieutenant Dundee and have him slap a 24-hour tail on the good doctor, but something intervened. Halfway down the walk to the street, my eye fell on a round plastic object about the size of a nickel lying in the grass. Clearly, the eye of a giant panda. Since two other eyes were obviously watching me through Dr. Ken Thorne's front curtains, I continued gaily on to my cab, drove up a half block, got out and walked back. Just in time to see Ken Thorne pull away from the curb in his other car, heading towards El Camino and points north. Well, this left me free to prowl at will, and four matchbooks later, I had found two more eyes, a pocket full of panda skin, and a goodly scoop of panda upholstery. The trail led to the garage. It was no wonder his car was stolen. He must have had to leave it on the street all night because there was no room for it in the garage, which had been turned into a kind of panda abattoir. Crammed to the rafters with panda bears, all the giant size, too, in various stages of disabilia. Legs, arms, eyes, and innards. A sight to chill the heart of any but the sturdiest private detective, Ruby. But I braced myself and carried on. Homicide, Dundee. This is Sam, Dundee. Sam, where are you calling from? Phone booth in a drive-in on El Camino. Listen, the license number on the red custom job is 49H822. And the guy driving it is Lenny Flegel, an ex-con. Don't so... talk to me about that car. Larry Healy picked it up tonight going 90 on the Bay Shore. Great. Lousy. Why? What happened? Next time I see one of them panda bears, I'm going to spit right in its eye. So Larry pulls the guy down, and first thing he sees is the panda bear with a necktie. What about the dragon lady? Uh, she came second. All Larry can think of is the hot panda bear. Figures they stole it, so he takes it back to the patrol car to return it to the kid. No. Yeah. By the time he got the exhaust smoke out of his eyes, they were gone. Oh, what's that license number again? 49H822. You sure? Positive. I'm looking right at it. I... Oh, Sam. Dundee. Yeah? We're all at Anderson's drive-in on El Camino. Put it on the air. Which just shows you how slow I can think, Roby. The red job was staring at me with its big chrome eyes outside the plate glass window. Flegel and the dragon lady, bless him, were having a Saturday night blue plate displayed attractively on the tray racks hung from the car doors. I sidled out of the phone booth and through the kitchen, thereby coming up on the car from behind. More coffee, honey? No, we better get going. Ah, oh, plenty of time. Mind if I join you, Flegel? Huh? Oh, I... He reached and I pushed, and instead of his gun, he came up with half a hamburger. It was too harsh a light for the dragon lady to operate effectively, and by the time Larry Healy and the Powell car pulled up, they decided to do it the easy way. You all comfy back there? Lovely, Larry. Flegel? Uh, dragon lady? Shut up. What about the red job? What are you going to do with it? Larry? Oh, oh I'm pounded till the lawyers are through talking. Sam, you want to go by way of Delaney Street? Yeah. Why Delaney Street? Larry delivered the panda. Huh? Sure, to the kid. Roby Dozier. We'll have to go and pick it up. Lenny. Yeah. What's it worth, Leo? Fifty thousand? A hundred? The little kid's got it? Yeah. Oh. Marcel will be disappointed, Flegel, with the tax boys watching both him and Crystal. It looked like a safe way to get some of his dough out of the country to him. Wasn't my idea. I hated him. I did eight years for him, Spade. I could have killed him. Shut up, Lenny. I don't care anymore. To heck with it. Look, it wasn't me. The guy who's running things for him here is Dr. Kempthorne, but Crystal had the dough. He killed her. He took her to lunch today Lenny. and he... Go ahead, Lenny. So he poisoned her. Then what? She'd fixed up one of the pandas. He didn't know which. Stuffed it with bills. Eighty, a hundred thousand. I don't know. Anyway, 
You'll find the money in the red car under the back seat. Under the seat? What are you talking about? It's in the panda. The kid's got it. Look, why do you think I'm telling you this, you stupid flatfoot? I fixed that thing for Casella myself after we took the dough out. What, kid? It's got a bomb in it. I don't remember much about the ride from then on, Roby. All I could see was a white line unwinding in the headlights. But somehow we got to the end of Delaney Street and around that corner again. Roby! Roby! Over here, in the alley. Roby! Roby, are you hurt? No, just resting. Where's the panda? Well, I'm through with pandas, and so is Barney. Next junk money, I'm going to buy him an elephant. What happened? Well, the policeman brought it. Yeah? I started home with it when a car drove up, and a man with gray hair got out. Kim Thorne, what then? Same thing. He grabbed it and got in his car and drove off. He's around the corner there playing with it. Go ask him. I don't care anymore. Around the corner? You mean he... Period. End of report. What a, a highly inconsiderate thing to do to a panda, F. But I'll give him one thing. What thing? He had the good grace to park in front of a vacant lot before starting to tear it apart. Oh. And, of course, to coin a phrase, he saved the people some money. And now, if you're a good, efficient girl and run that through your infernal machine, who knows what uh, I'll have in store for you when you're through. Ah. Ah, 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 ah. No jelly beans, the work is done. Now, scoop, scoop, scoop. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Friday means another visit to that entertaining eat establishment, Duffy's Tavern. Archie, the manager, and his whimsical friends have cooked up another fresh half hour of laughs and typical Duffy's Tavern madness. And you're all invited. There's also another delightful adventure with Chester A. Riley, played by William Bendix, tonight on The Life of Riley. Keep your dial set to NBC for the very best in radio entertainment. <laughs> Official? Yeah. I like the black ones. Lay off, lay off. Well, you're no fair eating all the black ones. You're my favorite still now. Mm. Ah, Master Robot Dozier. Mm, pays well. Sam. Yeah? I hope Roby appreciates you. Oh, well, he's just a kid. How can he appreciate me? Oh, I appreciate you, Sam. Oh, I appreciate you too, sweetheart. You're so pretty and so efficient. Am I, Sam? And so good about not kidding me all the time for your back salary. Yep. If when I stop and think of you, I go all choked up. Me too. <laughs> Black one. Come here. Huh? Angel? Yes? It's all yours, dear. The rest of the jelly bean. Happy New Year. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> 